<laughs> I was reading through your website, and it gave me the confidence to speak out about what I saw as a child. At age 12, I saw the angel of death, or what have you. I witnessed him come to a woman whom I had no knowledge of or have ever spoken with, take her away by giving her direct eye contact. Here's what happened. It was before summer in 1989. My family was poor and we were being evicted from an apartment in Washington, D.C. We had to go to court to talk about it with the judge. In the waiting room at the courthouse in D.C., there was a woman sitting beside me with a large oxygen tank and a mask over her mouth. She was really heavy and she wore a purple flower dress. I sat beside her. I remember I noticed her oxygen tank and wondered what was wrong with her. Then I heard a knock on the glass, which was right behind me. The seating arrangement was like the chairs were facing the waiting area, but your back was to a glass wall that if you looked through, you could see the security guards checking people in through an x-ray machine. I looked up when I heard a knock. Three knocks. Then I looked up, and so did the other woman with the oxygen tank. We looked up at the same time. The angel of death looked at me with eye contact, then looked directly at her. He stared for about three seconds at both of us, me first, and then her. When he looked at her, she wheezed a big, uh, then she fell on the ground in front of her chair. People, adults, started running to her and they said, get those kids out of here. And I just kept saying, you did not see that man scare her? Then I looked down the long hallway. He walked down and only saw his long black coat that looks like what judges wear. A black hat, black cape or cloak, and black shoes from the back. He did not look back and his arms were swinging. When I ran to catch up with him, he was gone. The security said no one came in with all black on, and they insisted I was crazy and to take me home. I still remember how he looks. He was a medium complexion black guy that was medium built and was older looking. The woman was white. This is a true story. And I'm not just saying that because I want you guys to believe this. It's because it is true. Thank you for reading. This is only one example of an encounter I had in a house I lived in. My daughter was only about six months old, and my husband and I were living with his parents at the time. On one particular morning, he had left for work, and I decided to lay on the couch until my baby woke up. I left the door to the upstairs open as well as our bedroom door, so I could hear when she woke. I fell asleep on the couch. Shortly after I fell asleep, something woke me. As I opened my eyes and looked up, I saw what appeared to be someone wearing a black hooded robe going towards the stairs. I watched the figure, I sat there frozen, turn and go upstairs. At this point, I was freaking out. My baby is up there. I got up and started running towards the stairs and I yelled for my mother-in-law to help. She was sleeping in the room off of the dining room. When I got upstairs and went into the nursery, my baby was lying there, limp with her eyes rolling in the back of her head. I grabbed her and ran downstairs. She was lifeless. We put 7-Up soda in her bottle and forced it into her and left it for the hospital. By the time we reached the doctor, she was okay. No one could explain what had happened. When they looked at her at the hospital, they thought we were nuts. She was laughing and having a great time, getting all of the attention. So, what was that? Had I beaten the angel of death, or was she in trouble and that spirit was warning me? Whatever it was, thank God I still have my daughter. A little after 8 p.m., I was in bed, exhausted and waiting for my husband to come back from the kitchen with snacks. I dozed off for a few seconds, and when I opened my eyes, I saw a hunched over figure carrying what looked like a walking stick. He was standing sideways, so I saw his left side only, but his hair was gray and must, and he was wearing a ratty, moldy looking cloak around his shoulders and partially over his head. As I stared, he just faded away. It was really disturbing. I didn't know if it was a dream or what. 
My husband came back a few seconds later, and I didn't know what to do. Finally, I told him, and he joked that it was the angel of death. I thought he looked a little like the guy from Akalog, death row tool cover, but not quite. The next morning, my daughter told me first thing to call dad immediately. His older brother in Italy passed away that morning. I asked what time, his time and our time. I saw him about four hours before he passed. The strange thing is that even though there are 11 children, the only other sibling, another brother, passed away 28 years earlier, on the exact same day. I've not seen him again, but I've experienced visits by scent mostly, and he has visited a few times, mostly to tell the other siblings to call Italy and take care of his widow. I had spent time with this man, and he really liked me and even gave me a memento of his. I believe he somehow knew I could see things others couldn't. He knew I could, and did, carry out his message to my husband and for him to make sure his siblings stay in touch with her, too. Oh, and by the way, he did have a stick that he used to carry with him. Upon ever thinking of the paranormal, my initial feeling is fear. I am not, maybe never will be, comfortable with my encounters with the supernatural. I've always been what you would call overly scared when it comes to the subject of ghosts, but that doesn't stop the supernatural from paying my frightened self to many visits. For some odd reason, most of my encounters have been while being just in the midst of falling asleep, or they will wake me out of my sleep. For this reason, I've always tried to convince myself that they were just my imagination. I've come to cope with the fact that they have been happening more frequently. The past homes I've lived in have been older homes, so you would think that if I were having encounters, the history of the home would be to blame. But I now live in a newer home, and I'm recently being visited by a close friend of mine who passed away almost two years ago. My first encounter when I was about 13. I was lying in bed, almost asleep, when I heard what I thought was my little sister talking and playing in my room. I told her sternly, Holly, get out of my room. But when the little voice in rummaging through my belongings in the corner didn't stop, I opened my eyes only to see that the little voice wasn't my sister's. It was a little girl whose face I couldn't really make out being that she was a little ball of light. Some of her features were distinctive, but I could clearly tell what was happening. I jumped out of my bed and ran for dear life. My mother is a big fan of the supernatural and always says, Elizabeth, you should try to talk to them if you see them. Ask them what they want. Is she crazy? My first experience made me run, much less strike up a conversation. We eventually moved into a much older home where I experienced a lot of lights turning on and off by themselves and the frequent sounds of someone walking up and down the hardwood stairs. But I grew used to it and never had any more visual experiences until recently. My closest friend, Morgan, passed away in a car accident almost two years ago at the young age of 18. I believe that she hasn't crossed over because she is confused. Her life was taken so quickly that I believe she is lost and she is now visiting me. She has come to me two times in the past month and I have a feeling that she's going to come again. Anytime I have an encounter, it scares the wits out of me. Again, this encounter came in the midst of falling asleep. I was actually having a dream about her, and I don't know if it was a noise that woke me up, but in my groggy state, I opened my eyes and someone was standing in front of me. I know it was her, but couldn't make her out. I heard her talking to me, but it was very muffled. I was scared to death, of course, so I closed my eyes and tried to fall back asleep, blowing it off as my imagination until I woke up. The same night, I was having yet another dream about her. I'm a very light sleeper, so any noise, touch, etc. will wake me up. While dreaming of her, I popped awake instantly while catching a chill and having something touch my back in the dead darkness of the night. I tried to scream, but nothing came out, so I hugged my infant son closer and went back to sleep. My way of dealing with my encounters is to be very still. If you call that dealing, I would like to not be so fearful of the supernatural, much less my best friend. Please help if you can.
This is a story of a young woman that got killed on the highway in the town near us. Some people say a gang of men attacked and murdered her when she got stuck on the highway late at night, and some say she was killed by a moving vehicle on the same highway when she got struck there at night. A guy who said he'd encountered her late at night was basically driving home at night on the same highway the lady got killed on. While he drove, he noticed a young woman hitchhiking, so he decided to give her a ride. He picked her up and asked her where she wanted to go, and she said she wanted to go home. She got into the car and he noticed the temperature dropped, so the man offered the lady his jacket. When he got to the young lady's home, she wanted to give him his jacket back, but he refused, saying he would pick it up the next morning since it was still a bit chilly. The next morning, the man went back to the house of the young woman and he found an elderly woman at the house and so he asked if he could fetch his jacket from the young woman, whose name was Sheila which he later discovered. But the elderly lady refused and looked confused and told him that Sheila had died years ago and she used to live there. She told him where she was buried as she did not believe the old woman. He then got into the car and drove to the graveyard where Sheila was buried and lo and behold he found his jacket draped over the headstone of Sheila. One night, some friends and I were driving around, and we decided to check out an old bridge that was supposedly haunted. The story behind it is that a girl hung herself from the old one-lane bridge in the country. My best friend, Tommy, is into ghosts and believes heavily in them, and I decided to call him out. I was telling him that he was a coward and nothing would happen if we went there. As we turned down the foggy, beat-up one-lane road, I ridiculed him about the whole situation. As we came to the bridge, a black cat scurried across, and in my headlight, the green eyes of the cat glanced at us eerily. As we crossed the bridge, my friend told me that this was a bad sign. I again replied with sarcasm, and told him that must have been the ghost. We passed over the one-lane bridge so that we could turn around down the road and come back over the bridge facing the main road. My friend Tommy then convinced me to leave. We drove around a bit more, and I convinced him to go back with me. We went back, and like the first time, we crossed the bridge, turned around, and drove back towards the bridge. We then came to the bridge once again, and I decided to stop my vehicle on the bridge. I went to put the car into park, and glanced into my rear view mirror. When I did this, my jaw dropped. A fog-like figure shaped like a basketball head with a human body walked behind my car, turned towards me, and looked at me with the same green cat-like eyes. It looked upset, and I've believed in ghosts since. The anger in the cat's eyes shot fear down every limb in my body. I then hit the gas and flew out of there. Now I am a 3 plus 0 student at the University of Finley in Finley, Ohio. I'm a baseball player at the university, and I'm about 6'2 and 200 plus pounds. I'm not scared easily, and I get chills whenever I think of this. I can't even tell the story to friends without coming to fear, and the image is ingrained in my mind. I feel like I have upset something, and I now believe in demons and ghosts and would like to learn more. On January 8th, I was hanging out at a local shopping complex with a couple of friends of mine. My friend, Mary, turns to me and begins telling me a story of a bridge just over the North Carolina and South Carolina state line called Catswoman Bridge. She was telling me that a number of years ago, a woman was driving home one night and just before she was about to cross the bridge, a cat ran out in front of her. Trying to miss the animal, the woman swerved and wrecked her car in the woods just before the bridge. The next morning, local police found her car sitting, upside down, underneath the bridge, Upon investigation, police found a woman's body being beaten by a group of cats. My friend, Mary, continued to tell me that if you park your car in the center of the bridge and turn off the engine, you can hear the faint sounds of a vehicle crashing into trees at the end of the bridge. I'm in total disbelief. She continues to tell me that if I go to start my car to drive away, then my engine will not start unless it is pushed to the end of the bridge. I decide, okay. Let's test this. We drive to the bridge and I park my car in the center of the bridge. As I go to turn off my engine, 
My other friend, Robin, starts crying with fear and begs for us to leave. Not wanting to upset a close friend any further, I put the car in drive and began to drive away. As I drive away, there was a very thick fog that completely obscures my vision momentarily, and I decide that it's time to go home. However, the only way to go back home is to drive back over the bridge again. I turn my car around and begin to make my way over the bridge. The moment my front tires are on the bridge, my engine dies. Now, this could have not been a mechanical failure due to the fact that I was driving a 2005 Chevy Impala. I apply my brakes to prevent wrecking my vehicle, but my brakes wouldn't work until we rolled over to the other side of the bridge. After we get to the other side, I stop my car, put it in park, and restart my engine. Just as we are about to pull away, we all see bright lights that appear to be car headlights beaming upwards at an angle as if it were a car that had run off the side of the road. Scared out of my wits, I drove as fast as my car would get to get off that side of the road. When we got back to my house, we look over my car as soon as we get out. To our surprise, there were cat's paw prints all over my car, the hood, roof, and trunk. There were also streaks that looked like someone had tried grabbing the car with their hands. There were also complete handprints on my back window. None of these prints were there prior to us going to the bridge. I set my car through a car wash almost an hour or so before we went to the bridge. I tried doing a search on the bridge and I found nothing. At first I was skeptical about the validity of the bridge, but after this, I will never drive over that bridge again. Thanks for reading. I was in the Navy at the time and stationed in Norfolk, Virginia. I was driving to Houston, Texas on leave and had been on the road all night and alone. My diet had consisted of just coke and it was coming on 2 to 3 a.m. I remember seeing something out of the corner of my eye, so when I turned to look, I was surprised to see what appeared to be a runaway slave sitting in my passenger seat. He had an unkempt fro and bib overalls with no shirt. He kept looking around frantically as if someone was chasing him, then he was gone. I then noticed something out of my other eye. When I turned, I noticed hovering outside my car was an older white man with a sunburned face and neck, wearing a khaki shirt and sporting a crew cut. Out of the two apparitions, him I did not like. Now things started getting interesting as he proceeded to yell or chant something at me through the window as I was traveling about 70 miles an hour. The next thing I knew, I was transfixed on my windshield as it starts to turn white, like at the beginning of a movie when the screen goes white. Oblivious to everything, the slave man starts yelling at me to look out. I snap to and am literally inches from plowing into the car in front of me. Then everyone was gone. A few minutes later, the white man shows up again and everything starts over and ends the same way. Finally, the third time it happens, I couldn't snap out of it as quickly. I felt the car shaking and bopping about as the white man chanted and the slave man yelled at me to look out. When I did snap out of it, I was in the median between the two roads headed for a bridge. Of course, there was no bridge for people on the median, so I slammed on my brakes took the keys out of the ignition, covered my head with my jacket and prayed. I fell asleep for a couple of hours and when I woke up, I drove home without incident. That was trip one of two. I've had slight hauntings all my life. Just little things that I'm sure mostly everyone has had happen to them. That is until my family moved into a home in De Pere, Wisconsin. The home is in an area rich with history. It is supposedly where the last Dufane was found. I've heard stories from other people who lived in this area, and a lot of them have problems with their homes as well. Here is my story. We moved into the home when I was about 13 years old. At first, we loved the house and how big it was, but in the first few minutes of running through it, I could almost sense something was really odd about the house. It was just a spooky feeling that I had when entering some of the rooms. Our dog would freak out a lot and bark at imaginary things and would refuse to enter some rooms. Our friend would refuse to spend a night because they felt something evil in the home 
and some claim to see demons and shadow people. I came home to find my best friend sitting on my porch shaking and crying. She told me that she was in my bedroom and heard my mother's bedroom door slam shut. She went to investigate and found that there was no reason for the door to slam like it did. So, she opened the door and set a heavy clothes basket in between the door frame and the door itself. She left the area, only to hear the door slam shut five seconds later. She went back and found the clothes basket had been flung inside of the room. We also had an unusual fire that should have killed all of us, but for some reason, I woke up to discover its TVs would flip on and off by themselves also. Alarm clocks would never stop the correct time either. I almost felt like the house had a good and evil battle going on with it, and we were caught in the crossfire. My sister and her friends would hear moaning noises a lot too. We finally told her mother that we needed to move, and she did not put up a fight. The day we moved out, she confessed to us that when she was sleeping, she would wake up to a feeling like someone was sitting on her and strangling her. She even felt the fingers once. When we got to our new house, the neighbors came over to greet us. They asked where we had just moved from. We gave them the address, and they got all very pale and told us that they too had lived in the same house and asked us if we had any problems living there. We compared stories, and almost everything was the same. The home is almost always for sale or rent. It just seems nobody wants to stay in it for very long. I did meet the current owner once, and he told me he has had no problems with the home, but I'm sure that he either is not noticing, or maybe the demons have finally left. It just seems like every home I lived in has the same little type of hauntings with it, or I'm just sensitive to that kind of energy, which I could live without. I have many things I could post here, but some I'm not ready to share yet. Hello, my name is Tiffany, and I have some uncertainties maybe you can clear up for me. When I was six years of age, my father was killed in a car accident on his way to work. To this day, I strongly feel his spirit remains with me. For the record, I love my father dearly, still do, and miss him so much. In the spring of 1992, as a class project for our psychology class, we had to take notes that night of the dream we had if one was had, and share it with the class the next day. I still to this day cannot decipher if what I had was a dream or a near-death experience. I dreamt I sat in this tunnel. I had all my favorite childhood memories within it. My stuffed bear, my ball, my favorite tricycle, etc. Also in that tunnel was my father, dressed in a white gown, sitting on a chair. I knelt down next to him and listened to him tell me Tiffany, I love you, and I need you to understand this is not your time. I told him that I loved him and missed him so much, but he told me that I couldn't go, because then I couldn't tell my mom what he wanted me to share with her. He told me, I understand you miss me, but you have to understand that one day we will all be together, and that time is not now. You have to let your mother know how much I miss her and care about her, as well as the rest of you. I have six siblings. The light in this tunnel was absolutely beautiful. I've never seen anything like it before. As I was drifting away from him in the dream, I was waking up, sobbing uncontrollably. Of course, I had to go and share this with my mom, and she was speechless. Since then, I've only had one other dream with my dad and siblings in it. Of course, real as ever, and again, so upset I couldn't be with him. I'm just not so sure if the first one was an actual dream out-of-body experience or near-death experience. It was just amazing. My second experience, when I was 20 to 21, I became pregnant. I lived with my cousin and her boyfriend in Ballsville, New York, in an apartment on Downer Street. One night, while I was close to my expecting date, I woke up to a woman without a face in a white gown, almost like a nun sitting at the end of my bed. When I sat up, she immediately disappeared. She showed up a few times after, almost as though she was watching over me. It didn't matter if I moved my bed from one side of the room to the other, she still found her way. To this current day, I still feel like I have family who have passed on watching over me. I've been told I have an older man, usually sitting at my kitchen table with a cigarette in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other, 
which sounds much like my grandfather. I can't tell you how many times my fiance, two older sons, and myself have put our cell phones, digital camera, flashlights, anything with batteries on the kitchen counter, and within hours, the batteries are almost drained. We don't place these items up there as often as we used to. I, many times when family is going to pass on, see the individual in a dream the night before, and that's when I know their time has come. I've had dreams which include the dead met for other people, and let me tell you, they physically drain me. Oh my god, sometimes it's fun though. When relaying the message to the rightful person and seeing their expression when I tell them something I have previous knowledge of and don't know what it means, but they have an understanding. It is just amazing. It seems to bring relief to them. I don't know if you can sort any of this out, or if any of this makes sense to you, but I know this stuff has happened to me, and it doesn't scare me. It seems like more of a wake-up call. Thank you for your time, and have a great evening. Thank you for listening as well. I sincerely appreciate it. My children and I had a very bad experience with a demon in a house that we lived in. My son became very scared one night as he viewed a ghost of a man with a sword sticking out of its side. This ghost was standing in the doorway of my son's bedroom very late one night. He said this thing was just giving him the feeling of such terrible dread and hatred. It made my son feel like it was going to kill us. My son started sleeping in my daughter's bedroom and that thing started going from room to room looking for my son, and so it started coming into our room and scaring the daylights out of me. I felt the hatred and anger. I know that it would have killed us if we had not gotten our pastor out there to help us. When our pastor pulled into our drive, he said he felt the anger and hatred just emanated from the house to the outside. He knew what we were up against, and we immediately started saying prayers to Jesus and his army of saints to fight for us. It ended up working so well that while we were living there, we had no more problems. But whenever we drive by, we cannot even look at the house. I know this was a short one, but I appreciate you listening. Hi, my name is Diane. Growing up in Detroit, my family lived in a house that was haunted. On several occasions, my whole family would hear loud crashes that could only be described as boxes of dishes being smashed. Everyone in my family experienced several ghost contacts in one form or another. On three different occasions with three different family members, a man about 60 was seen wearing a plaid flannel shirt. This man mainly stood there looking at the person, never attempted communication or harm. I was about eight when he appeared, and I was the first one to see him. Although my sister, who was seven years older than me, was not present, I tell this to you now so later you will understand. My relatives from out of town were visiting and the adults were sitting in the living room after dinner. I was extremely quiet in the hopes that only a child can have, that they would forget that I was there. I was sitting on the couch and the front door was open, with the screen door closed. I saw the man wearing a red plaid shirt, staying at the front door looking in. I told my family, and they thought I was overtired, and put me to bed. Later that same week, my older sister was getting into the shower when she saw a man in a red plaid shirt standing in the bathroom with her. She freaked out and told my mother, who this time listened more closely. She then revealed that she too had seen the man in the red shirt standing in the kitchen by the sink, looking like he was getting a glass of water. All family members routinely heard footsteps throughout the house, especially going up the stairs into an attic bedroom. The steps would continue across the floor. All my family members experienced this together and separate on several different occasions. My sisters whose bedroom it was for a while admitted she was scared to sleep in that room and was frightened very often thinking that someone was coming into her room. I later had that same bedroom and became so afraid of it that I began sleeping on the living room sofa. On several occasions, dishes in the house would break when put in a certain china cabinet. And on two separate occasions, a silver meat platter in the china cabinet, whose doors were kept closed, flew across the room at my mother. Lights turned off in the basement would be on. When we would wake up every morning, the dryer would routinely come on by itself. And even after the electric was checked out, this still continued. 
The basement had an old coal room that had been converted into a storage room with paint cans and stuff. This room had a negative feeling, and no one in the family liked to even go in there. Likewise, no one in the family wanted to go under the stairs, although no one had a mysterious occurrence in those places. Every family member in that house had heard their name called on different occasions many times when they were home alone. One occasion comes to mind. My father, who was home alone, was working in the basement. My mother's sister and I were out shopping at the mall. He distinctly heard the front door open, even though it was locked, and someone walked across the living room and the kitchen. He walked upstairs and found the front door locked as he knew he would. It was then that someone called his name. He answered, and no one said anything after that. Another all-family experience came when we all went to visit my grandmother who lived across town. We even brought the family dog. We were returning home, and as we pulled into the driveway, I saw the drapes move back like someone was watching us return. I said, did you see that? And my father countered, what did you see? I told him, and he and my mother and sister agreed that this is what they saw too. My dad went into the house first, while we waited in the car. Everything was just as we left it with the doors locked. On one occasion, I woke to having a woman staying at the foot of my bed. She disappeared as soon as I got a good look at her. Her name was Anne. She said she had lived in that house. No one in the house ever saw Anne again. This house had an addition that was a former dining room off the back, and built-in china cabinets that would fly open on no occasion even after my mother put hooks on them, thinking the wood was swelling. Music was often heard playing softly. In all, it was a weird place to live, and we were all very glad to move, but we did live there over 20 years. My parents moved into apartments, as I did in a different location, while staying with them because I had become extremely ill. I had a unique experience of a ghost nurse who took care of me. My parents were asleep, and I was lying on the sofa, so hot but loose. I could hear them snoring from the bedroom. I heard soft whispers shuffle across the floor and felt a cold hand lovingly touch my forehead, checking my fever, a comfort. I was not afraid really, and somehow thought grandma is here, but I had no evidence of this. I remember keeping my eyes closed, just knowing my nurse did not want me to see her. I was very conscious of my parents snoring and knew it was not them. When the feet shuffled off, I opened my eyes and got up and looked at my parents. They were sound asleep. The whole situation lasted maybe two minutes, yet I started to improve that night. Hi, I don't have any pictures or sound files, but I just wanted to share my story and maybe you can give me an idea of what on earth I saw. When I was six, I shared a room with my older brother. He was fast asleep, but I couldn't resist. I remember tossing and turning. I had this toy closet with a short door on it. I looked at the door and saw a large hole in it. It was black with no real shape and had a hole in the middle of it. The only spot that wasn't black. Anyway, I get up and shake the curtains, trying to see if it was a shadow. I put my hand in front of it. I move my toys and dolls. What is making the shadow, I thought. I stood in front of it and just stared. It then moved off the door and just hovered in front of me. Now, this is where it sounds really stupid, but remember, I was only a kid. I asked if it wanted to play chess. I was frightened, but didn't know what else to do. I turned and ran and looked, seeing it coming from behind me. I look up at my door. My room had no door, just an opening, and there was a black shadowy figure, like the smaller one, but in the shape of a very, very tall man. He was blocking my way out, but I didn't care. I ran through him and into my parents' room, under their covers, and never peeked out. Years later, when I was around 14, my best friend spent the night with me in that same room, and told me she woke up around 5 a.m. to see a tall, shadowy man looking down at us in the darkness. She thought it was my father. My father never comes up into my room. He never has. I know this is real. I wasn't dreaming or just imagining things. 
Have you ever heard a story similar to this before about a black figure that changed shape? I've never seen them since, but I'm still curious. After reading some of the experience others have shared, I wanted to highlight a few of my own. I tend to be very observant of activity around me, whether I see it or not. Some people think it's an overactive imagination, but if they felt and saw some of the things I have, they would think otherwise. I guess my first experience would have to begin with what I consider my guardian angel. To start off, I lived in a fairly average house with three bedrooms and two bathrooms which was built in 1960. There were no previous owners. My room was at the end of a long hallway with my parents right next to it, quite convenient for late night toilets. When I was around six years old, I had my first experience with a world other than my own. I remember it so clearly. I had been asleep and had a disturbing dream. I woke up, about to call for my mother. At the time, my bed was on the opposite wall of the door and I could see my parents' room and most of the hallway. Before I called out what I saw, what I thought was my mother came into the room. I had a distinct feeling of peace immediately. I saw her clearly wearing her bathrobe with the blue and white stripe down the center and rollers in her hair. She walked into the room and up the length of my bed. When she reached the head of the bed, I put out my hand to her and felt nothing but cool air. She just looked down, smiled, and vanished. It did not frighten me that she was gone, just the opposite. I felt relieved and immediately fell asleep. The next morning, when I awoke, I saw my mother in the living room and noticed that she did not have any rollers in her hair. I asked if she had worn anything the night before, and she said no. I then asked if she had come into my room that night, and again, the answer was no. I did not say anything further in case she would say I was just dreaming. I knew then as I do now that I was not dreaming. It wasn't until a few years later that I told her when another strange thing happened to me as I lay in bed. I was about 15 at the time and still having trouble sleeping. My room had since been rearranged differently with the head of my bed moved to the diagonal corner from my door, still viewing my parents' room. As I lay waiting for sleep to take me, I had the strangest feeling overcome me. This has happened twice since. I was laying on my side, staring at the opposite wall, when my vision began to tunnel. I felt my body began to go numb, and could hear, distinctly, my heart beat slow. At first I thought I was slowly falling asleep until I realized that I was very much awake. I was still staring at the wall, and I could make out my hand laying in front of me. I tried to move but could not. I tried to call out and could not. I thought I was dying. I could still hear my heart slow and was watching as my eyesight dimmed. Just before all that went black, I heard a distinct voice which I thought was my mother call my name. I heard it several times before my body and mind were together again. As soon as I could move, I sat up to see if my mother was in the room. She was not. I then went into my parents' room where both were sound asleep. I was extremely perplexed and exhausted after the ordeal. The next morning, I told my mother about the night before and about the time I was six. She told me that it must have been my guardian angel coming in a form that was soothing to me. I have now been to college twice and had other strange activity that did and did not include my angel. That can go for another time and never forget that the young are always prone to see and hear what we cannot because they are more open to the world than elders. It's not always an overactive imagination either. Thanks for reading. I've only had one paranormal experience. It happened last October when my boyfriend had temporarily rented a trailer. We had lived there for almost two months and nothing out of the ordinary had happened. One afternoon, he decided to take a nap and I was in the living room watching TV. I started hearing this really strange continuous screeching noise. It sounded like it was coming from inside the wall beside his bedroom door. When I walked over there, it stopped. I sat back down and started watching TV again and it started back again. This time, I walked into the kitchen. The bedroom was right beside the kitchen, and I started opening the bottom cabinets, and once again, the screeching stopped. 
I never said anything about it to my boyfriend because I didn't think a lot about it at the time. A couple of days later, we were in the kitchen eating breakfast, and he told me that the day before, when he was there by himself, that he heard a weird, loud screeching noise. He said he tried to find it where it was coming from, and it would not stop when he'd look. I told him that the same thing had happened to me while he was asleep a few days earlier. We both talked about ghosts and laughed about it, pretty much dismissing it as a joke. A few minutes later, his mom came and stayed all night and was asleep on the living room couch. This particular night, we were sleeping in the bedroom on the opposite end of the trailer. It was really late, probably around 3 a.m., and we had been laying there talking when I started hearing this noise. It was kind of like the screeching, but much quieter, and screeching at intervals, like footsteps. I thought my boyfriend had his hand dropped over the side of the bed, making that noise with his hand against the plastic on the mattress. I said, Brian, quit making that noise. He said, I'm not making that noise, and held up both of his hands. He looked at me as scared as I looked back at him, and said, get up and get dressed. As soon as he said that, you could actually tell where the screeching was moving through the room to the corner beside the bed and feel this undescribable presence and all of a sudden the screeching just went crazy and so loud it was right there needless to say within a split second it was the only one there now can you imagine two grown adults running into the living room to wake up his mom she said she hadn't heard anything but that, we scared her to death running through the living room at 3 a.m. in the morning like we were on fire. We sat up in the living room for the rest of the night and moved back to his mom's house within the week. So far, that's the only experience that I've had. I'm the only one in my family who believes in ghosts. I have plenty of reasons too. Many of these experiences I've never spoken of to anybody until now. My friends and family wouldn't believe me if I began to tell them. Because I have so many different experiences with what I believe are ghosts, I think I'm meant to know of them. I feel like I have a connection with the dead. All of this probably sounds pretty unbelievable, especially coming from someone as young as I am, but it all happened. When I was very young, like maybe three, I remember being watched. I remember shadows by the closet door. I think it was the shadow of a man. He watched me every night. Usually, he would just stand there. Once or twice, he would move towards me, and I ran into my parents' room, where they would let me stay. The shadow followed me into that room, too, but I felt safe with my parents. For the next couple of years, I don't remember much. When I was five, I lived on a farm in Nebraska. It was a really quiet area. I remember seeing a young woman, late teens, early 20s, running through the woods, laughing and giggling. If any of my experiences were to be blamed on my imagination, it would be this one. Though it was only my imagination, I don't understand how it appeared in my memory with such vivid detail. Later that year, I moved back to my home state, Virginia. Virginia is a pretty amazing state. It is one of the first places people came to when they discovered America. And it is also full of historical sites from both the Revolutionary War and Civil War many battlefields and cemeteries. Anyway, when I first moved back there, my mother, my brother, and I were staying with my grandparents. It's a pretty old brick house. Before my grandparents moved into it, it was owned by my great aunt Clara. Ever since the first time I stepped into my grandma and grandpa's bedroom, I always get the chills. Even now, I dread going in there alone. When I was younger, the eyes of the picture of aunt Clara would follow me they will follow me across the room. My brother has always been just as scared of the room as I have. He will never tell anybody why. To this day, he refuses to go into the room. I remember the scariest was when I was five. I was napping on grandma's bed, and I was dreaming about great aunt Clara. All I remember about the dream was that she was wearing all black, and she was reaching out to me. I woke up sweating. The room was so dark, but I made out her figure standing at the front of the bed, reaching out to me like in a dream. I got up and ran out of the room and into the dining room where I was pushed headfirst into the leg of the large solid dining room table. 
I turned to see who had pushed me, and nobody was there. I had to go to the emergency room for stitches in my forehead. I never told anybody about seeing her because nobody would have believed me. Shortly after, we moved. I've been tempted to write what happened to my family many times, but it seems far too unreal. We were not allowed to talk about this out of the house when I was a child, and my mother only told our house guests about our visitors when they experienced something in our house. Our childhood home was built in 1898. My parents bought the house in 1974 when I was only 6 months old. The house was very large and had been converted into a double. My grandmother moved into the upper level. Strange things began to happen shortly after my family moved in. My mother had her first experience one night after she sent my older sisters to bed. From her bedroom door, she could look out and see into the kitchen's hallway and into the bathroom. My family had only lived in the house less than a month when my mom saw a little blonde haired girl walk into the bathroom. All of my sisters have very dark brown hair and this was clearly a blonde haired child. My mother panicked and yelled to the little girl but the door shut. My mom jumped out of bed. In her mind, she was thinking that this little girl was a neighbor's child that my sisters must have snuck in the house. When she opened the door, there was nobody inside the room. My mother nicknamed the little girl Jessie and I have no idea why. My mother had many experiences in the house and with the younger children, myself, my younger sister, and younger brother. When we were very small, it was as if we were playing with someone else. I don't remember this particular incident, but my mom did. But I do remember that in my oldest sister's bedroom in her closet, there was a paneled off section that led under a hallway steps to the second floor. I remember talking to someone that we called the lady under the stairs. I always thought that it was my mom or grandmother, but I later learned that that was not the case. When we told my mom about this, she would not let us play this game anymore. I do not remember being scared at all though. My younger sister and I would always go into our hallway and play with the lady on the stairs. I have very little recollection of this, and at the time, I would have been about four years old, and my sister would have been about three. When we described the woman to my mother, she forbade us from being in the hallway alone. I never took the ghost stories to heart, and was very carefree as a child. I always felt safe. However, I did finally have a bizarre experience that I could not explain or rationalize away. My grandmother had a stroke when I was 15, and my mother gave my older sister's bedroom to my grandmother since it was on the first level and safer for her. She had no control over what she was saying and was rapidly deteriorating. My parents did not lay any ground rules for us kids that summer, as things were in havoc, and my brother and I had stayed up all night watching Nick at night in the living room. I could see into my grandmother's room, and we also kept an eye out for her should she use the bathroom or want something to drink. I was just starting to doze off when I thought I saw someone in my grandmother's room. It was a blonde haired girl who might have been 10 to 12. I have no idea the age. I thought I was just seeing things or that I was really wiped out and my mom's stories were starting to get to me. I walked out into our kitchen and my oldest sister was eating a sandwich and I told her what I saw. She laughed at me and told me I must have been dreaming. I thought maybe she was right because I just never believed what my mom had been saying about the girl she had claimed seeing on several occasions. Now here's where I realized I was not a complete nutcase. I said before that the house was very big. Well, my grandmother started screaming and my sister and I ran into the room. My grandmother was up and headed for the front door. She was screaming about fire and the little girl. We could barely make out what she was talking about. But she kept repeating the little girl said I was going to hurt the baby and I have to go before I cause a fire. That was the most intelligible sentence that my grandma had said in over a month. My sister kept saying what little girl? And my grandmother said clear as day, the little blonde haired girl. My grandmother was 72 years old and short of hearing. She was also three rooms away when I literally whispered this to my sister. We woke up my mom because we did not know what to do. My grandmother ran out of the house and refused to come back in. She stood on her porch. My parents took her to the hospital and she was placed in the nursing home because even the mention of our house sent her into hysterics. The baby she was talking about is my younger brother who is the baby in the family. My mom decided to turn the house into a one family home again 
and had us kids. There were six of us do the work. We did not mind as we wanted to help and it was a good way for us not to think about my grandmother all the time. My younger sister and I would be the only two sharing a room, but that was fine with me as we were very close and we were excited. Again I was up and could not sleep, so I went up to the room that would be ours. It had been my grandmother's and I was scraping wallpaper off the walls with a putty knife. We had started this project the night before and I was bored, so I went up to get some work done. I was scraping the walls and had been doing so for about a half an hour when I heard a funny noise sounding like the scraping noise I was making with the knife, but different. It's hard to explain. I thought someone was playing a trick on me, so I began to scrape the wall and very quickly I stopped. However, the sound that I heard continued and it was the sound of scraping, but it was coming from across the room. I don't know if whatever was in the room was mocking me or playing a game, but the scraping kept going on. Whoever or whatever did not care that I heard them. I screamed. I thought it was one of my older sisters. I ran down the front stairs and opened the door and the house was completely quiet. Everyone was sound asleep, snoring. I woke up everyone in the house. I was terrified and I never slept in that room. I would hear things in the house until I was 18 and moved out. As for our house restorations, my mother began working on the kitchen and back hallway that led to our attic. While doing so, she found where the house had burn marks and was scorched. My mother mentioned this to one of her neighbors, a woman who had lived on our street from the day she was born. In the early 1920s, our house had burnt very badly and had been rebuilt. At that time, it had been converted into a double. A little girl and her parents lost their lives in the fire. My other sisters had things happen to them too. One of my older sisters was looking out of the living room windows. Something grabbed her shoulder and called her name. One more thing. Please don't think I am nuts, but I have not had this happen to any house or apartment I have lived in since. And one thing I did notice was that whatever was in the house was not frightening to me in my youth, but only became frightening when each of us hit a certain age. Why? I have no idea. This was also something I thought that was weird. This little girl was never visible upstairs, and the woman only was spotted downstairs once. The neighbor who was alive when the house caught on fire remembered that the little girl's name was Jessica. My mom had been calling her that for years, and had never known what the little girl's real name was, but had just called her that because it seemed right. I've been reading the stories on your site for a while now and decide the sheer experience of my own. I'm afraid it's not particularly exciting or dramatic, but I feel it's a good example of the attitude you need to take when dealing with spirits. I've been told on more than one occasion by people who claim psychic abilities that there are spirits present in my house. This really comes as no huge shock, as the core of the house is a farmhouse that is over 120 years old. Although I've never seen a ghost myself, I am familiar with the sort of chilled feeling that people describe when they are in the presence of spirits. It is not truly the same feeling as normal reaction to temperature, but something that seems more internal and comes and goes independently of environmental changes. I have very commonly experienced this sensation, usually beginning before someone else remarks about their perception of something otherworldly. Several years ago, one summer morning, I would come home in the early morning from working the night shift. I was getting undressed for bed and placed my bedroom door in a three-quarter closed position that I usually keep in to provide some cross ventilation. Let me explain that my bedroom is a rectangular room, approximately 10 foot wide by 16 feet long. There is a set of double windows on the far end of the room. My bed is crossways in front of the windows with the head on the longer wall. The door was on the other end of the room and due to irregularities from different additions to the house. There was an approximate 4 inch step down when entering the room from the hallway. At the time of this incident, there was no central air in the house, so the only cooling method was to open windows. As I was getting ready for bed, I saw the door swing shut rather firmly from the three quarter position. At first, I dismissed this as just being the breeze, as I was feeling a slightly chilled feeling on what was a rather warm morning even though I didn't really notice much in the way of the air current. I was very tired and somewhat groggy and only wished to get to bed as soon as possible. 
I put my door back into the position I had it in and went back to getting ready for bed. Almost immediately, the door swung shut again very firmly. Even though I really did not notice the breeze, the door swung quite freely on its hinges and I did not think much of the fact that it kept shutting. I then took one of my work boots, the common style most everyone is familiar with that laces up about 9 inches above the ankle and placed it with the toe section underneath the door and the heel towards the doorway and repositioned the door to the three quarter position I wanted it to be in. Moments later, the door drug the boot across the carpeted floor and closed as far as it could with the boot in the way. Now at that point, I realized that there was certainly no breeze present that could exert that amount of force and the chill. I was experiencing was not the normal environmental kind, nor was it in any way cold enough that morning for me to be experiencing a normal chill. Now, I'm not a person who likes to have a sleep interfered with, nor do I particularly like to have my plants of any kind thwarted. Besides, all of my reading and conversations regarding the supernatural and hauntings have always indicated that you have to assert your rights to control your domain when challenged by spirits. With this in mind, I grabbed up a heavy, approximately 12 pound Thor hammer I had cast from aluminum years before in shop class and placed the head of it underneath the door, with the handle sticking up between the door and the doorway. Stepping back, I then witnessed the door drag this heavy hammer, approximately 12 pounds, across the floor the same way it had my boot, until again the door was as far shut as it could be without actually removing the hammer from underneath it. At that point, Becoming somewhat angry, I took the hammer out from underneath the door, placed the door into a two-thirds closed position, slightly more open than I really wanted, and waited. Within seconds, the door started to shut again. At this point, I pointed at the door and said loudly and firmly, no. The door stopped moving and stayed perfectly still. I stood there for a few moments longer, watching the door, and it did not move again. I then said thank you and went on to bed. I think it's important for people to understand that in most cases of encountering a spirit in your home, you simply have to assert your right to be the master of your home. I can't promise that it will always be the complete answer in all cases, but I believe it to be the best way to begin with dealing with a disagreement with a spirit in your home. Many years ago, my family and I lived in a lovely Queen Anne style home. We lived in it for 13 years, 11 of which we experienced paranormal phenomena. Two years after we moved in, we had our first of many odd occurrences. My daughter was in the kitchen and I was upstairs when I heard her call out that the upstairs toilet must have overflowed because water was running down the outside of the staircase. I ran to the top of the stairs in bare feet, only to feel water on the surface of the carpeting. I looked over the top of the railing to assure that the toilet hadn't overflowed, and that was when I felt the wetness on my feet, but there were no water pipes in that part of the house. When I got down the stairs, I found water running in rivulets down the wooden molding. My daughter reached up to turn on the light under the stairway alcove, and as soon as she did, the water stopped. We had to wipe the trom down, and we never found any reason for that activity. Months later, while preparing for bed one night, I heard footsteps running down the attic stairs. The door crashed against the opposite wall, and then nothing. I was terrified thinking that someone was there. They would have to pass my room to get downstairs, but nothing happened. When we finally went to look, the door was against the wall. We even thought that maybe a ball had bounced down the stairs, sounding like footsteps, but there was nothing. Strangely, when we started to think our house had unseen guests, we were no longer frightened. As time passed, we had many more experiences. I heard a woman crying softly but pitifully. Two of my daughters saw images of old-fashioned children dressed in long white nightgowns and mob caps. A visitor to my house saw the same thing and asked me who the little girl was. On another occasion, my nephew was spending the night and thought he saw me standing at the top of the stairs in a long white old-fashioned nightgown and then supposedly, I went down the stairs and didn't come back. My nephew was 16 at the time, and we hadn't told him about the house. My husband thought we were all crazy because he didn't believe in this sort of thing. My daughter came home late one night and was just lying in bed, going over her evening, and looked up to see a male figure suspended over the bed, and as she watched the image dissolve from the bottom up, 
as if it were sand falling. There were other things that happened there, although nothing dangerous. And finally, we sold the house and moved on. It was several years after we moved from the house that we met a family that had lived there years before we did and had very similar things happen to them. But they said their experiences were very frightening and mean-spirited. I sometimes think our guests moved in with us because from time to time, we still get very strange sensations in our present Victorian home. This is my own personal ghost story. This happened when I was about 12 years old, so keep in mind that 12 years have passed, but as long as I live, I will never forget the details. Here goes. I was spending the night with a good friend of mine in a house that was extremely haunted. Stephanie lived in one of those houses that just seemed to be the epicenter of paranormal activity. Her aunt walked the basement steps, an unknown spirit lived in the attic, and there was a tree out back that just looking at it scared me to death. I'm really not entirely sure why the tree scared me so much, but it rocked me to the bone. It was large and had an ominous presence. Stephanie called it the witch tree, but really had no actual reason for doing so, but nevertheless, the tree is not my focus in the story, it just gives a little background information. We went to sleep that night, and about 2am, I woke up with a start. I thought it was just because Steph and I had talked about ghost stories until we fell asleep, but then I had the feeling that I was being watched. I looked up and saw this large pair of blue eyes hovering over me. I know this sounds silly, but I'm dead serious. They just kept watching me. Maybe watching me is not the right word. They kept glaring at me, and all I could sense was evil. I felt so cold, and I couldn't wake Stephanie up. I thought I might have been dreaming, so I closed my eyes and laid there. I looked up every few minutes, and the eyes were still there. I had no clue what to do to make them go away, so I just started praying to God, something I saw in a movie, and never opened my eyes that night again. I woke up in the morning and told Stephanie about them. She had never seen them before, but didn't doubt me. She of all people knew the history of her house. I went on with life as normal, forgetting about the eyes until about two months later. Stephanie came to me and said she talked with her little brother Aaron, who was eight. She said she didn't even mention the eyes to him, but one night they were talking about the house and he asked her if he had ever seen a large pair of blue eyes. She stopped dead in her tracks. Aaron said that to him the eyes were friendly and never glared at him. We just figured out that they saw me as a stranger and focused evil on me. I will never know for certain. All I know is that I never stayed in that house again. In addition to that story, my sister and I were out driving about 9 months ago. It was about 11pm and we passed by Stephanie's old house. She no longer lived there, but I'm pretty sure that her father still did. I turned to Lauren, my sister, and said, Look, La, there's that creepy house. Now, this next part will sound so bizarre, but I swear it is true. All of a sudden, a light shot up from the house, which was completely dark, and two other lights shot up from the other side of the road. We thought they might just be electrical charges. That was, of course, until they started chasing the car. We had to get the mail down the road until they disappeared. Do you have any idea what those lights might have been? Thank you for listening to my stories. Back in 1996, my Uncle Wayne passed away in a tragic auto accident on the interstate near Nina, Wisconsin, between Appleton and Oshkosh. He had been pulling a load of sod with a small pickup truck that he borrowed from a coworker. The truck must have been too small to carry the load because the truck flip killed my uncle instantly. Needless to say, my father flew out to Wisconsin from our home in Pensacola, Florida to attend the funeral of my youngest brother. My father is the oldest of seven children. The story I'm about to tell comes from the mouth of my father. The afternoon before the day of the funeral, my father took his mother and father to the funeral parlor to finalize their arrangements. On the way back to my grandparents' home, my grandmother noticed that her family ring was missing a stone. The stone that was missing was my uncle's Wayne's birthstone. They looked everywhere for the stone and could not find it. Everyone kept saying it was Wayne's way of saying a final goodbye to his mother. The next day, the day of the funeral, 
Everyone left my grandparents' house to go to the funeral, except my uncle Stan. Stan stayed behind to wait for that cousin that was running late. A few minutes later, Stan heard a car pull into the driveway. At the bottom of the driveway was a car that looked exactly like Wayne's, a green Spitfire. My uncle Stan thought how strange it was that their cousin had a car exactly like Wayne's. His car was still parked outside his old apartment at the time. He looked out the window again and saw a man sitting in the driver's seat with a beard. My uncle Wayne had a beard when he died. My uncle Stan opened the door to walk outside thinking it was their cousin, who also has a beard. When he opened the door, the car reversed out of the driveway and quickly drove away. A few minutes later, their cousins pulled up in a totally different car. My Uncle Stan was so shocked that he told everyone at the funeral about what happened. Since this time, no one else had been visited by my Uncle Wayne. A year ago we bought an old Victorian house. The family matriarch had refused to let it be sold, although it was in a dismal condition. When she passed away, the family decided to sell, although it had been with them for 80 years. We began the serious process of renovation, but I was disturbed by the obvious presence of an old woman, dressed in pink, always in the same place, in the same room. I naturally assumed it was the family matriarch Sophia. She was so unhappy and seemed displeased at the disturbance we were causing, so I called in a psychic friend of mine to help her move along. The psychic rang bells, chanted, burned, and we put lit candles in all the doorways and windows. The very next day, it appeared that Sophia had gracefully moved on. A year passed. We finished a renovation and were preparing to throw an open house party. The day before the party, a woman came into the house and announced that she had grown up there. She said she had been coming by to check on her progress, but had always been shy to come in. Something had drawn her courage up to come in on that day. We were very pleased and immediately invited her and her family to come to the open house the very next day. They all came. At one point, I couldn't resist, and I asked this woman if there had ever been ghosts in the house. Oh yes, she replied. My great-grandmother was so persistent, we had to call in a priest to exercise her. Feeling confident, I then told her about Sophia. The woman began to tremble and cry. She said that her mother, Sophia, had always worn pink, and the room and place I described would have been between the beds and the children's room. Rest in peace, Sophia. Years ago, before I was born, my father was sleeping at the head of the bed, I believe and my mother was at the foot by the window as there was no air conditioning, and the light was out, room dark. Well, my mother said all of a sudden, she heard what she believed to be a woman at the head of the bed, jabbering away, could not understand her at all. My mother got terrified and pulled the cover up over her head, and when she did, this thing came right by her ear and just talked. She was unable to make out what the thing was saying. She jumped up and yelled, and slept for a week with the ceiling light on. She asked, and someone told her that they believed the house we used to live in had been moved from another location. Another true story. My mom used to walk me to grade school, about six blocks from the house, and she lost her house keys one day. Well, she traced her steps, even looked by the mailbox at the corner of her house, thinking that she laid them there. No keys. We lived upstairs, 16 feet up, and my dad was in front of the bedroom, and my mom was in my room, laying next to me, and the strangest thing happened. All of a sudden, I had the most peaceful feeling. This is a feeling that's kind of hard to explain, but I'll do my best. So, someone I don't know, it could have been an angel or a dead relative, who knows, but it was right next to the bed on my side and said my name. I was not scared at all, but my mom heard it too and jumped up. I had so many questions, such as who are you, what are you doing, and how do you know me? But at the moment, the phone rang, and Sandy, who lived around the corner, was walking home from church on a Sunday, and said, I found your keys. They were by the mailbox. I know this writing is all over the place, and I'm so sorry if this was hard to understand, but I think you guys got the gist of it. 
These things I can't explain are occurrences of the afterlife, in my opinion. It all started in 1967 when my dad had a stroke in the front room. I was then 10 years of age. My parents bought this old cottage in 1963. The house was built in 1740. There had been no problems in the house prior to 1967. When my dad came out of the hospital, he was paralyzed down the left hand side and was unable to speak. That's when things started to happen in the house. The first thing that happened was my parents were in bed and suddenly all the blankets waved and rolled completely off the bed. Also, the wallpaper in the bedroom would become soaking wet for no apparent reason, then bone dry next day. As the months passed by, my father regained most of the use on his left side, but never regained his speech. Also, my father after the stroke became nasty and violent towards me. I had to put a bolt on my bedroom door, as he would wander about in the middle of the night and come in my bedroom and just stare at me sometimes waving a fist. One night, I was in bed, and I woke up to the bed rocking on its own. I put the bedside lamp on and jumped out of bed screaming. I unbolted the door, shouting to my mother. As she entered the bedroom, the bed was still jumping on its own accord. In front of us, we both ran downstairs, and my father knew nothing as he had some sleeping tablets. We walked a while to calm down, then went back to check. It stopped by then, so I got back in bed and left the lights on. I had no choice. We did have a third bedroom, but to come and go, I had to pass through my parents' bedroom, and as an 11 year old boy, I was scared of what my dad would do next, so I had to stop in that bedroom. One night, me and my mother were watching television. It was about 11.30 PM, when we heard a terrible screaming coming from the small cast iron window which led into the back garden, near the television. We didn't dare speak to each other, and that stopped after about 4 minutes. The next thing I knew, the television, which was on 4 screwed legs, began to walk towards us, rocking from side to side. It only stopped when the main cord pulled tight. We were by then petrified. The screaming noise had woke my father, and he came downstairs shouting, but due to his stroke, the words were not making any sense. He ran into the back sitting room. My mother said go get your dad or he might have another stroke, so off I went. Entering the room, it was pitch black. Everything happened so fast, I didn't think about turning the light on. And then I looked at the back window, which led onto the very private unlit garden. A grey white figure floated past the window, of the side view. It was very defined. He had a three cornered hat, a white beard, walking stick, and a long trench type coat with three buttons on it with no legs visible. I ran out of the room, leaving my father who was looking out of the other window who hadn't seen anything. I ran to the other room to my mother. I was unable to speak properly to her for at least an hour. My father just wandered back to bed. In desperation, my mother contacted a medium. She said the spirit was called Jacob, who was only trying to help us through the difficult time. He had been a gardener who got killed when a horse fell on him, the medium said. Things became so bad, doors banging, strange sounds in the middle of the night, not helped by my father who everybody was scared of. I had an older sister and she moved out in 1968 to get away from the situation. In the end, my mother put the house up for sale in 1972, and that last night, it was terrible. My father was in bed asleep with those sleeping tablets again, so he was unaware of anything. Me and my mother was huddled up in the front room. We stayed awake all night, doors banging, banging from under the floorboards, moaning noises. Then dawn broke at 6.30 am. Everything stopped and went calm. We couldn't wait to move out. After we sold it, nobody lived in it longer than 18 months, till it became empty 25 years ago. Around the time this event occurred, I was around 11 or 12. I am a female, 
And I guess you could say, I live in your basic, small, no, creepy town, where everybody knows each other and nothing super creepy goes on. Although we do have some surrounding towns that are pretty sketch and full of druggies or whatnot. But anyway, here is my story. Me and my mother were visiting a neighboring town of ours, maybe 10 to 15 minutes away. We were there helping out my stepmom set up a reception for a wedding that would be held later in the week. It took place in a building called the Lions Hall, which is basically a place for get-togethers and such. Now something you should know now is that the town we were in was one of the sketchier places and it was in one of the worst sections. Me and my sister were outside of the building walking around and talking when this guy pulled up in a truck. Now my stepmom was expecting someone to help carry in a few things, although she didn't really know him. So thinking nothing of it, we just assumed it was him. So then he got out of the truck and went into the building. We could hear him talking to our stepmom. He was there for a while, but then finally came out of the building and went back into his truck. Now at this point, me and my sister were still outside walking around. We noticed he was staring at us, blankly with no real expression on his face. He sat like that for a while until me and my sister had enough and walked around to the back of the building. Then that's when he started the truck and slowly crept around the building, sort of following us. We went around and around, doing this for probably four minutes or so. We could tell something was seriously off, but then just as we turned the corner to where he was, he was gone, like poof into thin air. We never heard him drove off or anything, and that was enough for us. So we ran inside and didn't go back out for the rest of the day. We never spoke about our encounter to anyone. So as far as I know, weird sketchy truck guy, let's never meet again. A few months ago, I was staying at my friend's house. Basically, I'd gone to sleep as normal. I usually sleep perfectly, but this time, I woke up at 5.35 and felt weird. I took the blanket from my face and looked to the foot of my bed and saw two girls, both blonde, didn't have a face and had little blue penny dresses on. I looked at them for a good few seconds and turned back over to sleep. I told my clairvoyant friend, and she told me she's always thought I had a talent for seeing the beyond. Thank you for reading. I know this is kind of short, but I guess it was a kind of cool story. I'm living in Birmingham, and I'm thinking there has to be some haunted locations that I could go to and feel around given the history of the city. I started doing some research looking for some local haunts, and lo and behold, I come to find out that I live 15 minutes from one of the most haunted places on earth, Sloss Furnace. The factory was built in the 1800s and hundreds of men died there due to the grueling nature of the work. I read about the history and ghost stories other people told about the places and decided that this was going to be my first ghost hunt. My trip to Sloss Furnace occurred over the course of two days, the first day being my first time and all I did was just walk around the place, read the exhibit signs, and explore the grounds. They turned the furnace into a museum that is open to the public, and they also use the grounds to host concerts, weddings, and other social events. They happened to be planning for a wedding the first day I was there, and a few tourists were milling around, so I wasn't completely alone, but the place was fascinating. I was able to walk into a few of the off-limits areas and look around. I pulled out my phone, started recording, went into the boiler room, and managed to catch a few orbs in the footage. It was cool, but nothing to write home about. I left, went home, and that was that. On the second day, at Sloss Furnace. My second day at Sloss Furnace will go down in the history books of ghost hunting. I managed to do what the ghost hunters, scariest place on earth, and countless paranormal investigation teams have failed to do, and that is film an actual ghost. One ghost would be impressive indeed, but what if I told you I filmed at least five ghosts? 
I can almost guarantee you that you have never seen ghost footage ever that comes even close to what you are about to see. When I pulled up the second day, it was a rainy, gloomy Sunday afternoon. As I drove to the gate, I saw a sign blocking the entrance saying that the museum was closed. It was hardly secure, so I just parked my car across the street and walked in through the front entrance. There was a construction crew working on the left end of the facility away from the actual furnace itself. When I walked into the entrance, I could see remnants of the wedding party from the day before. Apparently they weren't responsible for cleaning. I made my way into the boiler room, took out my phone, and started recording again. Here I am all alone in a damp, dark factory, listening to the sound of the rain beating down against the roof, armed with only a cell phone. I walked through the boiler room, filming as I went along, and decided to call it a day. It wasn't until I got home, watched the rest of a playoff basketball game, and looked at my phone when I realized what I just captured. I was able to count at least five ghosts. The best part about it all is that I have proof. When you look at the film, go to the 320 mark, you will see a ghost. Go to 344, you will see a ghost, and up to 350, and you will see a literal ghost scene. If you slow it down, you will see ghosts peeping from different corners. Amazing. This is hands down the best ghost footage you will ever see. Scared stiff is to fear something that you cannot see, and to feel its warmth is a true living hell. In July of 1993, I had purchased a trailer home in a small town just north of Baton Rouge. There I was, all alone, 18 years old and feeling totally lost. My father had just died the month before, and I was numb as a stone. I began fixing up the place, picking up knickknacks here and there, trying to make it cozy. One day while shopping at the flea market, I came across the most unusual set of Tahitian mugs. I had to have them. They had all different looks in their car faces, yet all had the expression of what I felt inside. Hurt, mad, and pissed off at the world. Yes, I thought, they were definitely coming home with me. I know a bargain when I see one. The shopkeeper explained where they had come from. A man in town who owned a bar had gotten into a brawl one night and met an untimely demise. Afterwards, his wife closed it down and got rid of everything inside. So okay, I'm back home with them and I display them on my bookshelf with so much pride, always wondering why is it that my guests aren't quite as pleased with my new selection as I am, and I actually saw a couple of them turn their noses up. Well, taste is all just a matter of opinion, right? It wasn't long after that that I started having a lot of very weird things happen to me and anyone who came to visit. Sleeping in the living room, I could feel warmth behind me. When in the bedroom, the warmth was always right in front of the doorway, and every now and then, I would hear like a creaking like someone was walking. I always blew it off as part of my imagination though. As the death of my father started to really sink in, I started drinking alcohol very heavily. One or two bottles a day of cheap wine just to get to sleep at night. All the while, I am becoming more aware that something is not right here. The creaks are louder and I begin to feel something hovering over my shoulder in the daytime. Then my ex came to town and moved in. I told him about some of the things that I had felt and observed. He listened, yet looked at me like I was simply crazy, but his opinion soon changed. One night, a couple of months later, I was visiting at my mother's and decided to stay the night because it was raining so hard I didn't want to get on the road. He was alone, back at the house, and when I called him on the phone to tell him I wouldn't be home that night, he said, I really want you to come over here. I've been hearing noises all night and it sounds like a man talking. And then right after he said that, I heard through the other end of the phone something slammed the window and he started screaming, you better get over here right now. I finally got up and worked my way to the car and hauled Hightail out of there. That same night, we had a kidnapping report filed on us because I was so hysterical of fear that a passerby walked up beside me in a parking lot and I almost had heart failure. On top of all that, there were more events. Several times, I heard knocking on my front door, only to discover that there was no one there when I answered. My boyfriend heard me calling his name when I was at the other end of the house. 
At times I would see, from the corner of my eye, a large black figure. On other occasions, I'd see a small animal that looked like a rabbit or cat running behind furniture. Sometimes I even saw a book get thrown a few feet across the room by something that wasn't there. And when I decided to get rid of these damn things, the Tahian mugs, one came up missing. I looked all over for it and it was nowhere to be found. At the advice of my family, they said they knew it had to be these things causing me all this grief. I searched frantically with no luck. I desperately wanted all of them out of the house and once and for all. Finally, six months later, I found the lost mug in the exact place it should have been. I remember seeing the dust ring that day as I reached up on the shelf to take it down. I had a bad feeling about carrying this thing anywhere, but I decided that I had no choice but to get rid of it. Well, I had a flat tire the next day. Getting rid of the mugs were not as easy as I thought it would be. I took them back to the store where I bought them from the same lady that acted like she didn't know who I was. She insisted that was not where I bought them, and more than that, she refused to take them back. I begged her and told her I didn't want the money, I didn't even want a credit. I finally left the store with the lady, open mouthed, holding the box and mugs. I thought she must have known something. About three years ago, my mother's next door neighbor was murdered, and at the estate sale, my mom picked up the exact type mug and said, Tiffany, look at this. Her husband had committed suicide a few years earlier in the same house. Coincidence? Connected? Don't ask me, but I can give you one piece of advice. Before you walk across the next gravestone or buy or sell that pretty plate at the flea market, you must show some respect for the dead. When I was 17 years old, my grandmother, who had lived with us all my life, had died, and although there were many unusual events before and after her death, the most unusual occurrence involving my grandmother's death occurred the evening following her burial. My grandmother's funeral had been a trying thing for all of us. My mother was an only child who had never had the opportunity to know her father, and I am sure that the fact that her husband, my father, was stationed at Vietnam and the fact that she could not get into contact with him through the Red Cross only made matters worse. My grandmother was a much loved and well respected woman whose life and death touched many people, and the outpouring of sympathy, the flowers and cards, the visits by friends and relatives proved to be almost overwhelming for my mother. Her grief and confusion was so oppressive that, following my grandmother's funeral and burial in the family cemetery, she confessed to me, my younger sisters of 16 and 13, and my baby brother of 4, that she could not bear to deal with all the people who would be coming to the house that afternoon. She suggested that we go to a restaurant, pick up a bucket of chicken, and go on a picnic. We did exactly that. Dressed in the same clothes we had worn to the funeral, we went on a family picnic, just the five of us, remembering and talking about the woman who had meant so much to each and every one of us. We stayed away from our house till just after dark, and when we were sure that no one was visiting, we entered the house and got ready for bed, as we were all exhausted, both physically and emotionally. The following story was related to me by my mother and sisters the next morning. I was asleep in my very bed, in which my grandmother died. My sisters were sleeping together in their bed, and my baby brother was asleep in my mother's bed. My mother, who had insomnia, was lying in bed and reading. At around 2.30 in the morning, my 16-year-old daughter got out of bed and was heading to the bathroom when she ran screaming to my mother's room and told her that my grandma was sitting on the couch in the living room. She told my mother that they made a mistake and that our grandmother wasn't dead and that they had brought her home. My mother calmly explained that we all missed our grandmother and that my sister had been dreaming that our grandmother was dead. As my mother tried to calm her down, my other sister came running into my mother's room and said that my grandmother was in the living room. My mother now had two excited girls to deal with and explained that my oldest sister had a dream and that the younger girl had heard them discussing that dream. She explained that my youngest sister had a dream of her own after hearing that discussion but both my sisters were adamant and my mother was forced to take them into the living room and prove to them that they were mistaken. My mother got out of her bed and walked down the hall and into the living room where she, herself, saw my grandmother sitting on the couch. 
My mother simply stood and stared at her mother, the woman who had been buried earlier that day, the woman who sat calmly on the couch and smiled at her and my two sisters. My mother says that her first thought was one of joy, that my sisters were correct in their belief that my grandmother had not died. Her next thought was pragmatic and sobering. Her mother was indeed dead, and what she was seeing was a figment of her overwrought imagination. A figment. Brought on by a stale mass of hypnosis, she shared with my sisters in their dreams. As she stood there, my four-year-old brother came walking out of her bedroom and into the living room. Half asleep and rubbing his eyes, he asked why was everyone awake in the middle of the night. At about the same time he asked this question, he looked across the living room in the direction of the couch. Throwing his arms out in front of him, my four-year-old brother yelled Mama and went running across the room towards the couch. My mother relates at this point, my grandmother smiled and simply faded away. I was not a witness to the preceding story, but the same tale is told by my mother and two sisters as to what happened on the night of my grandmother's burial. My brother does not remember the events of that evening, as he was only four years old and too young to appreciate the unique circumstances involving a visit from the dead. Thank you for reading. I was a student at a small university in Illinois. One night, my two friends and I were really bored. It was a late weekend night, so studying was out of the question. We decided to go out and play a childish game of hide and seek. We set out for the field in between the dorms and music building. Being left as a seeker, I quickly found one of my friends, Lynette, hiding underneath a tree, a story in its own right. Laughing over her antics, we realized that we hadn't found Crystal. We stood there, a moment, looking around as to where she might be. We spotted a person walking along the path on the outside of the field, heading towards the music building. The figure was all in black, or what also looked like a shadow. Deciding this was Crystal, we walked slowly to ambush her. Now, the building that Crystal was heading to had two entrances on opposite sides. When going through one door, you can walk straight through to the other. Crystal walked into one of the doors. We decided that Lynette would go into the building on the other side, scare her, and as Lynette escaped out the other door, I would scare her too. As I'm waiting outside, freezing my you-know-what off, I hear someone start practicing scales on their trumpet. I thought nothing of it. It was a music building after all. A few minutes later, the door opened and Lynette was running down the stairs. Where's Crystal? I asked. She looked really pale and was shaking. Can you hear the trumpet player? Wondering why she was asking me about the trumpet player, I responded, yeah, so? Well, I was upstairs following who I thought to be Crystal. I couldn't see her when she went around the corner, and when I rounded the corner is when I heard the trumpet. She took a breath. Well, I went to the only practice room with the light on to go say hi to the person so I wouldn't scare them with my footsteps. And when I got to the room, no one was there. Cal, I mean no one, but the trumpet music was right in front of my face. I felt the air. She grabbed my arm, actually pulled me in the direction of the dorms. When we got around to the front of the music building, I looked up to the second story windows, the practice rooms. In one of the rooms, the light was on, revealing a yellow room. The practice rooms are painted all blue. And right in front of the window was a shadow, arms upheld with a gleaming gold trumpet in his hands, the sounds of the scales falling to us below. I couldn't believe it. I wasn't scared, but more enthralled. In the few seconds that I had stood mesmerized, the shadow stopped playing and turned and bent its head down to us. I couldn't help but stare back. What seemed like a few minutes only lasted a second. He once again picked up his trumpet and practiced his scales. I wanted to go back to the building and go upstairs to see him, but Lynette was about to tear my arm off of my body. I remember her saying over and over again on the cold walk back to the dorms that there was no one in there. So where was Crystal? She found a great hiding place. We found her in the room watching TV. I could have killed her. When I was very young, my father recanted to me the tale of Murder Road, an old bridge out in the boonies about 10 miles south of my hometown. For my own story to make sense, I'd better summarize the story of Murder Road for you, the ever-faithful readers. 
It's been a good 20 years since that event occurred, although I'm not sure of the exact date. Found by the bridge, in an old car, were the bodies of four unfortunate individuals who, by some cruel twist of fate, had been brutally murdered. All four, a family from out of town, had been shot in close range and left in their vehicle. The crime was never solved. A crime such as this is probably no big deal to folks from New York or Detroit or other big cities where murders are unfortunately too common, but in Ottawa, Kansas, population now 12,000, it's a different story. Since my youth, I've been fascinated by this place and the story behind it, and once I was old enough to drive, I made frequent trips to the spot, always alone, usually during the day. It's a heck of a creepy place at night, if you know the story behind it. As my years and my bravery grew, it became common for me to venture to the spot after dark, although usually with high beams on and windows up. It took a lot of guts for me to finally bring myself to stop the vehicle but I never got out of the car. I was making it a pretty routine trip by July of 97. It was a good place to be alone and think. There wasn't much traffic. I approached a bridge and got the usual chills as I got close. The area is pretty much open fields until you reach the bridge, where a thick grove of trees rises up on either side of the small stream that runs through, making it darker and somehow more sinister on the bridge itself. I pulled off to the side of the road, no more than six feet from the bridge. I dropped my seat back and closed my eyes, relaxing. Only a few moments later, there was a tap on my window. My eyes flew open and I sat bolt upright. There was a scraggly looking man outside and he looked none too pleased with me. Out of the car, he mouthed. Terrified, I complied. Turn around, he whispered, and put your hands in the car. I did as I was told. It was unseasonably chilly out, and a light rain had started down. I began to shiver, but more out of fear than anything else. I gasped as something cold and hard was pressed into my neck. From my right came a terrified scream, and I glanced over. In the corner of my eye, I saw a black car, its bumper touching mine. The driver's side window was shattered, and a lifeless body was slumped over the steering wheel. I wanted to scream, but the cold metal of the gun on my neck kept me quiet. There was a sudden, harsh gust of wind through the trees, and the pressure on my neck vanished. I whirled around, my heart thumping powerfully. There was no one there. The car was gone too. Needless to say, I was out of there in a flash. It was some time later before what had happened really hit me. I had nightmares for weeks. I still go out there although not as much. I assumed that I was just out on a bad night, but I won't be there again in July. Thanks for reading. This tale is still very disturbing to me, since it involves my father, who had passed away almost 10 years before the occurrence. My wife and I usually have friends over on a Saturday night, this particular Saturday night happened to be in the month of October, which is a special month for my wife Jamie and my son DJ. It also happens to be a special time for John and Sonia, our friends. We love to sit around and scare each other with chilling ghost stories. On this one particular Saturday night in 1994, we all gathered around my kitchen table to listen to our friend Sonia tell some very eerie tales passed down from her family. We did have a Ouija board to use. But by the time she was done telling her tales, I was shaking so much that I broke the board over my head and threw it away, outside and into the garbage. The conversation of ghosts prompted me to talk about my dead father. In no uncertain terms, I made it clear that I did not miss him at all because he was a mean, rotten man in life. I went so far as to say that if I ever saw his ghost, I would tell him so. Sonia told me not even to joke that way. It's an open invitation to evil, and I should repent immediately. I only laughed and got more bold, demanding an appearance so I could tell him how I feel. My wife and Sonia were so upset, I decided to stop. Later that night, after everyone had gone home, my wife and I went to sleep. My son was already out like a light. I must admit, laying there in the dark, I was fairly spooked. Finally, sleep came but I was awoken at 3 a.m. by a steady and repetitive thumping noise. Thump, then silence for three seconds, then another thump, 
over and over and over. I laid there paralyzed with fear. What could this noise be? I tried to rationalize anything, even wake my wife, but I was too scared to move. Yet, the thump continued, only it was getting louder and louder and louder. I finally realized that I have family to protect, and using all my strength on courage, I got out of bed to investigate. My wife remained in a deep sleep. As I walked through the hall in the dark, I noticed that the kitchen light was on. Hadn't I turned that off? Fearing the unknown, I snuck into my son's room for a baseball bat, which somehow didn't erase my fear. I was almost at the kitchen now, close to an hour after hearing the first thumps. Yes, the noise was coming from the kitchen. Sweat formed on my forehead, and I was shaking like an autumn leaf. I entered the kitchen and turned to the left, where our table sat. I wanted to scream and run in terror, but I was paralyzed. There, at the far chair, sat my father, ten years dead, yet there he was. His right hand raised and came down with a fist on the kitchen table. Thump. That was the noise that I've heard for the past hour. He was looking directly into my eyes, yet his were dead. He stared right through me, then opened his mouth and spoke in a voice I never in my life wished to hear again. Stop. Stop talking about me. Then he slammed his fist down in one final violent thump. The kitchen light went out. I let out a gasp as my heart sank, and I quickly turned the light on again. But he was gone. I caught my breath and turned on every light I could find. An hour later, laying in bed, I wondered, had I dreamt the whole event? The next morning, my wife, Jamie, was up before me. She came in and woke me up and asked me if I had forgotten to turn the lights off before coming to bed. I told her I had. She asked me to come into the kitchen and look at something strange, and I almost screamed. I slowly followed her into the kitchen, trying to hide my fear. She pointed to the very chair where my father had sat only a few hours earlier. I then knew it wasn't a dream. Look at that, she said. Where did all that dirt on that chair come from? It was true. There was a thin layer of dirt on the chair and on the floor surrounding it. I muttered some excuse, and to this day, I've never told my family or friends of this occurrence, and I've never spoken ill of the dead since. My first story begins when I lived in Ohio, USA. I was driving back to my house one day with my friends when I saw a girl visiting a graveyard. She was right at the top by a statue of an angel. The girl looked very young, about 11 years old. She was wearing old fashioned clothes. I went up to the grave the next day. The inscription was written on the angel's Bible. It said in memory of Jane Doe, who died 1832 to 1845, died of tuberculosis. I did not use the girl's name out of respect. I now realize that yesterday I'd seen a ghost. I can see the graveyard from where I live, and I always see a girl visit the grave. One time I went up there to see if I could catch a glimpse of the girl. This time, she was bending over two other graves. I went away because I thought the girl was starting to sense my presence. I came back though and found the two graves. These two were her mother and father. They had also died of tuberculosis. It looked like no one came and took care of this grave, so I would come up there sometimes and clean the graves. When I had finished cleaning the girl's grave one day, I looked up and saw the girl watching me. She was smiling. She followed me home. I wasn't bothered because I knew she was harmless. It was almost like she was an old friend to me. This second set of experiences happened in Wrightwood, California. The interesting thing about the area in particular is that there are constant reported sightings of Indians everywhere. And the women in my family see an older woman around our houses near the children's rooms. 
Townspeople who are aware of her say she is a nurse of sort, and that she checks on the small children of the town, protecting them. The weirdest one so far is the half-Indian. All that is ever seen is the top half of an Indian, had to waste and floating. Most seem to see this figure especially down by the old ranch that sits in Cajun Pass, on Highway 66, between Clegherd Road and Kenwood. That's where the figure would appear. Many times around Thanksgiving, which makes you wonder a little bit. Anyway, my sister has seen him on Lone Pine Ranch Road around Clyde Ranch, the only structure on Lone Pine, until he reached Wrightwood. We have a lot of paranormal activity happening constantly, according to those who are tuned into it, or have that sixth sense. And if one's violent or sudden death brings about that type of activity, then we add approximately 10 spirits every year because of the slippery snow-covered roads like Lone Pine. That, and the lack of common sense that California drivers possess. For years, the ranch my grandpa owns has been the center of many disturbing experiences. Though I did not experience them firsthand, I'm going to tell you some real stories about the place. Now I'm going to start with this ranch was built on an Indian burial ground, or this is what my mom tells me. My mother, Grace, lived there with her dad's sister and two of her brothers. They only lived there part-time. They lived in Sam Louis of Pseudo with my grandmother. They'd go to the ranch on weekends along with my grandfather. My grandmother would stay behind because she hated the ranch. On the 4th of July, my mom had her friend come over. And this is when they were older, maybe in their 20s. And she let her stay in the bedroom with the guy she got close to. So my mom ended up on the couch. In the middle of the night, she sat straight up, like in the horror movies, where people sit straight up, all of a sudden in the middle of their sleep. She had no clue why, but she was so scared to death. She started to look around, and out of nowhere, she started seeing little dashes and wisps of silver light. They would fly right over her, and there would be deep wafts of cold air. She got up and ran to the bedroom. The guy my mom's friend got close to worked at the ranch as a gardener and had experiences like this before seeing he'd worked there a long time. He said he thinks it's an Indian burial ground, but couldn't be sure. When my mom was young, not such great things happened at the ranch. I only know of one, but I'll tell you about it. My grandpa would bring weird friends that he met to the ranch. There was one guy in particular who came, and every time he played a game, where all the boys, including my uncle's friends, would have to play. It was basically a hide-and-seek game. But when he found them, he would pretend to torture them, and he'd throw them in a pool, which definitely wasn't a pleasant thing. My Uncle Martin was so scared of this guy, and he had good reason. This man was an old Vietnam War veteran. You could pretty much call him crazy. My uncle spent most of his days at the ranch, preparing for when he came. He did not want to be found. He had a place ready on this tree with a little stash of candy bars and packet drinks in the ladder that he could pull up after him. When the man came, he found everyone but Martin and looked for him till it was well past dark. Finally, they found him, but he wouldn't come down and didn't. I had lived at the ranch for about six months, and my mom was scared to death of it, so we moved. My dad had lived with us. There was no power, so matches were common. After we had moved, my mom's younger brother Nick and his wife Shelly moved in. They had my little cousins Larry, the oldest, Amanda, second, and Monica, the youngest. 
My cousin Larry had gotten hold of matches when he climbed out of the crib he was in with Amanda. He climbed back in and started a fire, not knowing the consequences, being as young as he was. My aunt Shelly was upstairs taking a nap with Monica, and my uncle Nick was at work. Shelly came out running out of the building and left Monica outside, running back in to get Larry. It was too late for Amanda, and they still have her ashes. Larry lived, but he has third-degree burns that have scarred him permanently. My uncle divorced Shelly due to other problems in their marriage. He got remarried to another woman named Tracy, and together, they had a child named Caitlin Elizabeth. Just a while ago, they figured out she was deaf. My grandpa lived at the ranch regularly till he broke his back. He was riding his horse on a mountain by a steep ravine. Being an experienced rider, he didn't have much of a risk factor. No one knows what, but something spooked the horse and he fell off, down the ravine, and broke his back. Now he's in a wheelchair, and it seems like he'd rather die than not be able to live at the ranch. So far, he's not there, but he's trying to get there. Another bit that interests me about my family's ranch is that it tore my mom's side of the family apart. There have been endless fights about it, and pretty much everyone is turned away from each other. Are all these things a coincidence? I don't know, but I find it hard to think of it that way. I went to Santa Catalina summer camp, but it was also a boarding school. For some reason, there is one room that is never open for boarders. It's at the end of the hall in the fourth dorm, and the story about it was that a girl was going there for senior year and was trying to get into Harvard. When she got the rejection letter, she OD'd on sleeping pills. This happened a year or two after my mom had gone there. When I went there for summer camp, there was a girl who said she had gone in there to turn off a light that was on. This was odd, because no one was allowed to go in there. The two girls were curious about the room, and snooped around. When they opened the closet, there was red writing all inside the walls of the closet. They screamed, and ran out, telling the counselor what they saw. The counselor was clearly scared out of her mind to go into that room. Before she turned off the light, she checked the closet. The walls were clean. Throughout the nights and days at Catalina, the light would turn on without anyone there. The presence was overwhelming and strong. Sometimes just an eerie feeling. You can't prove it. Just feel it. I lived in Springfield, Missouri for five years, and have been a frequent visitor to the Wilson's Creek Battlefield. The place is a presence that you could feel day or night, because it was the site of a good-sized battle, and the park rangers will tell you the same thing of sightings while they patrolled the park, or hearing gunfire and cannons going off. One of the most active spots in the battlefield is the farmhouse that doubled as the field hospital where the wounded were brought in for amputation in the home. But I believe it was a Confederate hospital, if my memory serves me correctly. Last year in June, myself and a few friends were given permission to camp the night at the location so that we could experience the events reported ourselves. One of my friends got his degree in psychology and wanted to see if the reportings were due to the history of the area. And we confirmed everything the park ranger had told us. At midnight, we began to hear what we could have sworn to be low moaning coming from the house. And what we could have sworn were the shadows of several people passing the windows, as well as the footsteps on the front porch. The footsteps would either sound like someone pacing as if on guard duty or waiting, or, it would sound like someone running into the home, such as an orderly or a surgeon, 
But the one thing that remains in my mind was a smell that suddenly just arose around us of blood. It was a heavy smell that lingered in the air, that just made you almost want to scream. Because of that incredible sadness and pain, there was also a constant presence being verified of cold spots that would allow us to see our breath, and this made it very uncomfortable. Because it was an 85 degree night, the presence would get stronger throughout the night. And finally, when we composed ourselves, I looked at the house and said as loud as I could, We know you are with us, and we know the sacrifice that you have made. Please leave this place in peace. My friends, of course, gave me that look that I had lost it, but they immediately noticed that there was a calm feeling now instead of agitation and sadness. Before we left, we placed a small flag in an American flag that we bought and placed them on either side of the front porch of the field house and gave them a salute out of respect for the soldiers. I've since moved to Florida, but still keep in contact with my friends as well as the park ranger, and we still talk about that night as well as the other occurrences they've seen on return visits. I hope this helps to prove the skeptics that there is a presence of lost life on that site, and that they want us to know how, so what happened to him will not be repeated to others. I lived in my newly built home for one year now. It all started when I woke Crocky from sleep. I heard a woman crying and thought perhaps it was my child or neighbor. Her husband would travel often. I realized now that it was a linked experience. It was a couple of days ago and I'd stayed up late watching TV, started to get tired and decided to go to sleep. So I walked upstairs and went to my bedroom, laid down, and was fast asleep. I remember dreaming, and the woman that I heard for a year crying came to me. She came over me and put one hand on my throat and the other on my mouth and face. She began to strangle me. All I can remember after was willing myself to be awakened. I was flailing, kicking, and trying to scream. That is when I finally awoke. My husband was laying right next to me the whole time. He was also awake after the episode. Scared and wondering what the heck he told me. That I was really screaming and tossing all over. You know when you watch someone sleep. And they say they were screaming. It's always muffled. I wasn't. Tonight. Me and my sister were making dinner for all the kids. Hobo dinners to be exact, and we had made all the kids come in one at a time to pick out their ingredients in their own hobo dinner. If you don't know what hobo dinners are, they have an assortment of vegetables and meat, or chicken, and condensed soup wrapped in aluminum foil. We have made the first three, no hitches. Then came little A, we'll call her that. She picked up her foods and we argued that she had to have more than chicken and broccoli. She didn't want to, but agreed. So I folded hers up and put it into an oven with the other three, realizing that when I put it in the fifth one, I would have to move them all. We then proceeded to make the last one, and we never left the kitchen. Upon finishing, I opened the oven and found that little A's dinner was gone. I put it in there myself, and it was not small, not something you could misplace. We searched the entire kitchen and surrounding areas. No dinner. We made her another one, but couldn't get over the lost hobo dinner. We talked about it for a few hours while our husbands researched the kitchen. Then we started talking of related stories, and the woman came up. We joked that she ate it, or her deceased grandma did. Then I told my sister and her husband of my dream experience. My husband chimed in and finished the dream, but I didn't even know the end. He had said that after he had gotten up the next morning, I came out of our bedroom crying and saying that the ghost tried to suffocate me again. Then he said I proceeded to get a glass of water and went back to my room. 
that happens to be on the top floor in my kitchen on the main. I didn't know that happened. Then he also started talking about an old forgotten coal mine and how a girl died in one here in Littleton, Colorado. So we went online and somehow in our main searches came to this site. Do you think that maybe the deaths of the miners and their families are still here? Reminding us of all the injustices they faced in their lives? Or are they just wanting us to take notice and change things? Early last year, me and my youngest daughter was cleaning an empty house to make extra money. Being sensitive to spirit guides, I picked up a presence but chose to ignore it and clean the home. My daughter kept hearing someone tell her to come upstairs, and she wouldn't do it. As evening approached, we headed upstairs to vacuum the bedrooms. Whatever the presence was, it kept on blocking the vacuum from the wall and threw a marble at the wall also. I also felt a cold hand attempt to brush me down the stairs as I was going from one bedroom to the other. I dropped the vacuum and fled down the stairs, telling whatever it was that we would be back the next day. As we were locking the door, we felt someone on the other side trying to stop us from locking up and leaving. The next day, I lit a white candle and stood at the foot of the stairs. I simply stated we were here to do a job and mean no harm to them. I also said that we would leave as soon as the house was clean. After that, we felt them. They let us do our job. The house is rented now, and I won't step foot on the property anymore. I had a very tall black shadow step on the house's porch and speak to me using telepathy. It told me not to come back to its territory, or else it will push me down the stairs next time. Meaning I have small grandkids, that's fine by me never to go over there again. I'm still not sure why I encountered, but I didn't like it. The new tenants can deal with it. As for me, I don't need the money that bad to come in contact with whatever lives in my neighbor's house. First off, I want to apologize in advance for the length of these stories, but I have had a few experiences spread over my 24 years that I think would be worth writing down. I will start with the house I lived in, for nine months when I was 16. This was an old Victorian on a small, and I mean small, plot of land, smack dab in a nice little residential neighborhood. I, who happened to love Victorians, yellow the most, which this house was, was completely delighted. The very first night I was there, things changed. I was alone with my younger sister who was about 14 at the time and also my little brother, who was almost two years old. It was late November or early December, and it was snowing out. My parents had gone back to the old house to get more of our things and to pick up a pizza for dinner. My sister and I sat on a mattress in the middle of the living room floor, reading to our brother with the radio on for some background noise. I noticed that my brother was distracted and kept looking at the stairs, and I was hearing a pounding noise. It wasn't all that loud, and easily I could have ignored it, but I decided to reach over and lower the radio, and that is when we all heard it. It was footsteps. I swear to God to this, that the sound they made was so stereotypical that it could have been used on any of those sound effects tapes people buy around Halloween. It was a heavy work boot type of a sound, but hollow, and it went down the stairs which we had a good view of, but on which nothing was there to the naked eye, and then back up to the hall upstairs, where it completed this little trek again and again. Well, needless to say, we flipped out. My sister and I were about to go outside and sit on the porch to wait for our parents. But we had a little kid with us, and it was cold and snowing. So even though we were completely terrified, 
We turned up the radio as loud as we could and just sat there. I think my brother knew something was up because he was unusually quiet and just played by our feet with toy cars. Well, when our parents got home, we all but ambushed them and begged them to take us back to the old house. They, who have had their own experiences, probably believed us, but not wanting to frighten us chalked it up to our imaginations. Other things happened in that house, like the upstairs attic light would be on all the time, even though no one really went up there. And there was one time I firmly believed that whatever was in the house touched me. I was in my bedroom and had just gotten out of the shower. I had on only a short robe and was bending over to pick up some clothes. And then I felt a tug on the back of my robe. Well, I spun around like a flash and tried to rationalize it in my head. Maybe I caught it on something, but I was in the middle of the room and there was nothing around me. All my furniture was pushed up against the walls. That really flipped me out. To this very day, I have tried and tried to relive that feeling and can't. It was so odd, it's truly hard to explain. But anyway, there were other things, like things would disappear and reappear, and my sister hated her bedroom and would often sleep in mine on the floor. My parents had their own experiences, but it wasn't until we were moving out that the footsteps returned. My mum was downstairs in the basement alone, doing laundry, when she heard someone walking around upstairs. So she went upstairs thinking it was the realtor to find the swinging doors that separated the hall from the kitchen, swinging back and forth. But there was no one there. My dad had a similar experience as well. The other experience has to do with another place we lived in, an apartment in a three-family house. We were on the second floor. This was when I was 18 or so. The first few years were relatively quiet, but it, whatever it was, got really started when I went away to college. The beds and the couches would shake and vibrate for no reason that my family could see. And when I came back home, I too had this happen to me. It was a really odd sensation, like someone had grabbed the sides of the bed and was shaking it. It was not a nice feeling, but lasted anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute and a half. I was not around when other things happened, like my brother's toys would come on in the middle of the night, even though they were off. It got to the point that my dad would get up, grab the toy and fling it onto the porch. My sister also had terrible nightmares, and I had the creepy feeling of being watched while I did dishes at the kitchen sink. I could literally feel someone staring at me from the hallway. When I would get up the nerve to look, no one was ever there. I have a few other stories, but this is the most recent. My sister, partner and I were at a local cemetery that has a reputation for being haunted and I wanted to get a couple of pictures. I had gone previously and have had no luck, but have been there when others have gotten orbs and the like. Well, first off, this cemetery always has toys on the graves. They were dolls and plastic horses. That is easily explained as there are many graves for small children, and people can either be playing jokes or being sympathetic to all the young children who died so young and are leaving them presents. But last night, in addition to the usual toys, there were other strange things, including a dead rabbit lying by a headstone, and a few feet away the torso of a dress mannequin just lying there. I don't jump to conclusions, and that can be all explained easily enough, but they still added to the atmosphere. And when you are strolling about a notoriously haunted cemetery at night, on a backcountry road, and spy dead animals and what looks like a dead body, well, you get freaked out. End of story. But I've done this before, and from the above and other things that have happened, I got over it. My sister was snapping off pictures left and right, and then she and my partner are looking at one and my sister goes, 
there is nothing there. And Rhonda goes, Wait, just turn around. Well, my sister flips and goes, I'm so out. And bolts, and I mean bolts across the cemetery. Across the street, and into the car with Rhonda in hot pursuit. I, mind you, have been left in the dust, so to speak, since I was not beside them when they looked at the photo that spooked them so bad. I trudged after them and into the car. Mind you, I'm a little ticked off because I was having an okay time there. And when I saw the photo, my heart stopped. It is of a headstone, but off to the side of it is a man's face. It is so clear, in fact, that you can make out a white collar and a black shirt, and what seems to be a short black moustache. It is not a nice face, and on closer inspection, there is another image in the headstone of a crying baby with hands over its mouth. Now, I am not sure of the image on the headstone because I am quite aware that anything can cause an image to appear. The grain of the stone, moss on it, etc. But the face, that is another matter entirely. I do not know how in the world to explain that. It's unbelievable. Many years ago, I lived in an old farmhouse. It was pretty big, and I was newly married. We would have friends stay periodically as they needed to. We had many things happen. The one bedroom always had flies in the window. I would spray vacuum and scrub the windows. The next day, the room was always full of flies. My best friend and her husband needed a place to stay for a while, and I let them choose the room they wanted. They chose the room of flies. This one night she was sleeping, and felt someone pushing her to roll over. She thought her husband had gotten up in the middle of the night, and was coming back to bed. When she rolled over, she fell against her husband. She looked to see who pushed her, and although no one was there, she felt the pressure of someone lying against her. She tried to wake her husband, but he would not wake up. She was so scared, she stayed awake the rest of the night until morning, and was too afraid to look and see what was next to her. Finally, when daylight hit, she felt the pressure leave, and noticed the indentation of a body left behind on the bed. They never slept in that room again. We also had dogs that would not go upstairs or downstairs. I was doing dishes in the kitchen and the upstairs stairwell was behind me. All of a sudden, my dog perked up and his hair stood on its back. He started to growl as if he was looking towards the doorway and suddenly bolted for the living room. He would not come into the kitchen after that unless I was with him. My dogs would also stand at the doorway to the basement and would have their hair raised on their backs. I was always scared to go down there. I would get a really bad feeling where I would run down and back up. I would try and get one of my dogs to go with me, even in daylight, and they would not go further than the doorway. We would also hear someone walking through the home, but nobody would be there. The one spirit would be talking, and we would look for the voice, and couldn't even find it. Sometimes it would call out our names, and we would think it was each other and answer, and find out it wasn't anyone calling. We slept in a downstairs bedroom, and I would have a sense of a man standing at the foot of our bed, watching us as we go to sleep. Our dogs even went to sleep with us, and wouldn't even sleep at the foot of the bed. After many strange activities, our neighbor told us that an elderly man had lived alone in the house for a long time. His mail had been piling up in his mailbox, so the mailman contacted the police to have them check on the old guy. He was found dead on the kitchen floor, and had been for quite a while. The funny thing is, the kitchen was never spooky feeling.
My name is Amy, and I want to share something that happened to my family about nine years ago. I have some free time on my hands, so I thought I might as well. As I said, about nine years ago, my husband and I and our four children, ages 12, 11, 9, and 5, moved into the small four-bedroom home. From the day we moved in, we knew that there was something about this home. It wasn't really a bad feeling, but something different. The feeling was almost welcome, like we were meant to be there. We were happy to be there. It was a comfortable house for people who were used to living in apartments. We had bedrooms, a living room, bathroom, and a kitchen on the first floor, and a bedroom with a bathroom and a small porch, plus a larger room with a smaller room off to the left on the second floor. At one time, the house had two apartments. The upstairs had one bedroom with a bathroom, a living room, and a small kitchen off to the left. The first floor had two bedrooms and a bathroom, living room, and kitchen with the access to a basement. At the time we found this house, it seemed like almost a godsend since we were being evicted because we had acquired a dog. And this house had a nice sized yard, and the landlord didn't mind pets. Well, soon after we moved in, strange things started to happen. Well, since I was a stay-at-home mom most of the time due to being the parent of an ADHD child, I was the one to experience most of the phenomena. You see, while my husband was at work and the kids at school, I would hear light footsteps downstairs. But for anyone who has lived in apartments, your first thought is it's the neighbors, until you come to the realization that you are now living in a home, and there is no way you're going to hear the neighbor. It's a single family home for crying out loud. But I put it out of my mind, telling myself that I was so used to hearing the patter of small feet that I could still hear it when no one is at home. We had minor things happen like the footsteps when there was only one person home, things disappearing and turning up, somewhere you knew it shouldn't be, sightings by a friend who had never been to our house, and finally, the sound of a small die-cast toy car falling down the stairs and hitting the back door. For anyone who has small boys, you know what a hot wheel sounds like when it is hit by a surface because you've heard it before. Anyway, this is what my husband and I heard on a nightly basis. One day, about eight months of living there, a friend of my husband brought over a new girlfriend for us to meet. As far as we were concerned, nothing out of the ordinary happened that day until Jimmy, my husband's friend, brought by his girlfriend, China. At this point, I should explain a few things. The bedroom with the bathroom belonged to my husband and I. The large room that used to be a living room, because our computer room, and the little room off to the left, became our daughter's room. Secondly, we did not allow our kids to have friends over, due to things disappearing whenever certain friends come over. Well, the next time the girlfriend came over, she asked us how many kids we had. And I told her three boys and one girl. Then she asked us who the little boy downstairs had been. And I asked her what little boy. She said the last time she had visited us, there had been a little boy in diapers playing Nintendo 64 with my kids. And I told her politely, there was no other child but mine in the home. She insisted that I saw another little boy in diapers today. And the last time I came playing Nintendo 64 with your kids, I told her she was mistaken, as my kids were not allowed to have friends over. Well, of course, she dropped it after that. But to this day, she still swears she sees little boy in diapers in her house. At other times when I was alone at home, I would hear someone knocking on my bedroom door, and I would automatically ask what and realized there was no one home but me when I received no answer. This happened to me a lot. 
At times I would hear someone playing in the boys' rooms downstairs. When the kids were at school, about one year after we moved in, my oldest and I took newspaper routes. About four months after we started our paper routes, I was rolling newspapers before delivering them. When the front page caught my eye, the picture on the front page looked like my house. But there were no toddler toys on the lawn, and I had no toddlers at the time. So I read it, and found out that exactly one year before we moved in, a little boy of about one years of age had died in the home. It seems that Miles had been living there with his foster mother, her father, and her children. One day the foster mother went out and left her father to watch little Miles. While she was out, her father, in a fit of rage, hit Miles while the little boy was at the top step on the second floor, which by the way happened to be near my bedroom door. The little boy lost his balance upon being struck and fell down the stairs and broke his neck. As I read this, little things began to fall into place, and I realized that maybe Miles was still there. The last thing to happen there was about three months before we moved out. It was late, and my husband and I were still talking and watching TV, when again, we heard the little car falling down the steps and hit the back door. I knew my kids were sleeping because that was the only sound in an otherwise silent home. So I jokingly said, all right, Miles, it is late and it's bedtime for little kids and even little ghosts. What I heard next chilled me to the bone and freaked me out so bad, I was almost in tears. As soon as I said that, I heard a little tiny giggle, which my husband also heard, and I probably said, do whatever you want. As I said before, up to this point, we thought we were imagining everything that was happening there and never wanted to believe that we had a ghostly tenant. The strange thing is, we were never scared while we lived there. The feeling there was we were home, and this is where we were meant to live. Unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond our control, we had to move. Otherwise, we would still be living there. It was the most comfortable place I'd ever lived in, and I loved it there. I have other stories that happen to family members, and also myself. Maybe I will share more of this. For now, I hope you enjoy this story, and maybe you can tell me if it was really a haunting. My name is Randy, and I've been reading many of the true ghost stories on your website. And I must say, a lot of this stuff is genuine and it sends chills down my spine. I know from experience. Let's go way back to the 1970s, city of Toronto. My mom and my dad were in a band. My mom left my stepdad for a woman in the band, and we, meaning me and my younger brother, my mom and her lover, moved into a rooming house. Two rooms on the second floor, with a kitchen and a bathroom on a street called Bartmount, near Pepe and Queen. The first day we moved there, maggots came crawling out from underneath the baseboard of one of the walls of my room. My mom and her girlfriend, shrieking and squishing bugs. Anyway, my mom would leave me and my brother there alone at night, so she could play music with the band. Besides, the lady who lived on the first floor had three boys my age, and she would come up periodically during the night, or right away, if we called out. Well, it started that night out. When everyone was gone and my brother was asleep, I would hear the voice of a child quietly muttering or praying, and I wasn't the least bit frightened at first. Now, please keep in mind, this was a long time ago and I don't remember anything in particular it said to me, but it was like an imaginary friend I assumed. Then one night, I was in a mood or something, and for some reason, 
I was being cruel to my younger brother, as children sometimes are, and he went to sleep crying. Now, this spirit or entity took on a much more terrifying persona. It hated me, and nighttime was now a horrifying experience. There were a few things that it did almost nightly, like yanking the covers off, or making it seem as though there was a huge rat underneath the covers, scream profanities constantly, Rattle the dishes that were left to try on the counter. I would beg my mom to stay home and scream for that poor woman who lived down the stairs. Or I would try to keep my brother awake. But he could sleep through anything. The most terrifying thing that ever happened was this ball of light red. But then it changed. As it traveled up and down the wall, spitting electricity. It got so bad that I couldn't even sleep and kids at school were accusing me of wearing makeup. Eyeshadow. I became accident prone and finally got poked in the eye by some girl at school. And my mother sent me to stay at my grandmother's for a month. By the time I recovered, we moved away a few days after I returned. For years, I had never had that happen to me since. It seemed like for a while, and even I forget it happened, but not anymore. There are a couple things I learned from this experience. First thing was that spirit was a child. And secondly, that spirits do exist. And lastly, I'm no psychic or detective or anything, but I bet there's a body buried behind the wall in that room. I've experienced hauntings since I was about five or six years old. The very first time was when my family moved into the house my uncle owned. We lived downstairs, and they lived upstairs. It was a pretty old house. Well, after a few weeks of living there one summer, my dad went to the grocery store. Though it's strange, my parents would leave me alone at the home because I hated leaving the home. The grocery store was on the corner anyway. That day I was alone, and I heard someone walking up the stairs, thinking it was my cousin or aunt's. I went upstairs, where they always left the door open for us. I walked in, and no one was in the house. I checked the living and bathroom, the kitchen. No one was there, but I kept hearing someone behind me. Then out of nowhere, this doll appeared by the door. It wasn't there when I walked in. I wasn't very scared, but just a little shook up. I went downstairs and stayed in my living room, looking out my window for my dad to come home. Well, we ended up moving three years later, when I was eight. This time we moved into a Victorian-style home. Cherry wood and old heaters. Very romantic with a small chandelier. I fell in love with the home. I've always loved old homes. Months after moving in, I would hear someone in the bathroom rummaging or washing their hands. I would walk in there, and no one would be there. Everything would stop. Later, I would be sometimes sitting in the kitchen, eating cereal, and I saw a tall man with another oddly tall woman not dressed in Victorian wear, but still old-fashioned, maybe 1930s or 40s. I saw them standing down the hall in there, looking straight at me. I looked at them for a little bit, and then they were gone. They were misty, and I remember seeing the sun shining through them. It was very calm. Other times that I stayed home alone in this new home, I would hear someone walking up the stairs, and then it would stop if I would call out. One day they didn't stop. I was watching TV. It then turned off, and I couldn't even figure out why. And then I sat on the couch playing with a little music recorder I talked into. I heard my name being called from the stairs. It didn't sound like my dad, but in my head, I was forcing myself to think it was, and I called out Daddy. No one answered. I just kept hearing my name. 
and as I'm walking closer up the stairs, I heard the footsteps in my name. I became really frightened, and I heard a soft chuckle of a man. Well, after that, I had many more experiences now that I'm 18, and they have just stopped. I kind of miss them, and sometimes want to contact them again. That is the earliest of my experience. Just for the record, I'm not alone. I'm normal. I have a normal job. And I'm not crazy at all. I was staying in my friend's house. We all planned to sleep in the living room. Laura, Dave, and myself. I knew Dave was leaving early in the morning for work at 6 a.m. I woke to go to the loo in the night and found Laura had gone to bed in her own room upstairs. So it was just me and Dave sleeping in the living room. It was getting light when I found myself awake, even though I felt tired. I awoke suddenly but peacefully, and I was very much awake. I didn't dream this. I was wondering why I was awake, in my head, not out loud. When I heard breathing, two sets of deep in and out heavy breaths, I instantly thought, oh, it's okay, it's Dave breathing. The next thing I thought was, hang on, Dave's not even here. He had left for work, and straight after that thought came, Laura said her house was haunted. Before I could even ponder that I heard a voice, an older man's voice right in my ear, so close. I could feel him near me whispering. He said, I'll wrap you in my grave. He sounded full of malice and just really hateful. I was terrified and was stuck in that position. I was so afraid. After about 15 minutes, I held my hands over my ears and screamed and screamed till Laura came down, but where I had my eyes closed, when she tried to get me to realize she was there, I thought I was the ghost, and then I screamed even more. She says I was hysterical for a while, until she calmed me down. It was not a dream. Laura then told me her sister used to wake in the middle of the night because she couldn't breathe and felt like someone was sitting on her chest. Laura's mom told me that Laura when she was little, used to ask who the people in her house was when there was no one there but herself and her mom. I had trouble sleeping for months after and still can't sleep on that sign or with the lights off alone. When he said the word rap, I had a visual image of cherries, which I thought was strange. It was like saying something in a German word you recognize when you only speak English. What he said doesn't make much sense. When I told my mom, she thought he might have said the R-A-P-E word and not rap. It sounded like rap though. Well, that's it. Here's a nightmare I had one night. It's very scary, so brace yourself. One night in the cold, harsh winter of the snow belt in Cleveland, Ohio, I was making my tea, awaiting until I was done steeping. As I finished watching my nightly program, I slowly limped to my cold, damp room. Hence, my heating ducts aren't very good, and my room is on the complete opposite side of my house, away from my furnace, and on the outskirts of the other bedrooms. As I arrived in my room, I turned on a portable heater, let my carrier dog in, and limped over to my bed and crawled under the blankets and flannel sheets. It was a freezing night, and my bed was freezing. As I went half asleep, I remember my mother walking in and turning off my heater. After that, I was completely embowed in the satisfying darkness of slumber. I was sound asleep, and not to be disturbed, until my own cries of horror awakens me. As I sit watching TV, 
too big to tell what program it was. I was merely amused watching it, less to the fact that it seemed that there was no screen that I could make out. I zoned everything out. As my mother walks into the kitchen from my long outstretched foyer, the foyer seemed like it was 50 feet long, a great chandelier hanging from the sky, expensive wall murals, and a marble floor, which was mixed in with red. She greets me with a mere kiss on the cheek and a brief conversation. She persuaded me into my dining room, which was empty with beige carpeting, white walls, and a chandelier on the ceiling. She leads me to a window where we look out into the unknown. As we steer into the forest, we notice nightfall is soon to come, and it is just past dusk. The clouds look like they are about to have a long blizzard. As we scan down the sky, I notice that there is already an inch of snow on the ground. The trees were all leafless, and they looked dead because it was that time of the season. As we just stare into the edge of our land and into the rest of the deep wheeled, we notice how gothically beautiful it looks. Just then, we notice a slight change in the landscape. We see deer scattering about, especially away from a certain side of the timberland. Just then, we hear a blood-curdling scream. The scream you hear when somebody is in excruciating pain and agony. It lasts for about five seconds and dies out. I tremble in my dream, even though it does not seem like it. I look at my mother, and she does not make a sound. We stare into the unknown. We look into the woodlot and hear the cry for help again and it ceases after five seconds, then recites. Finally, she grabs my arms and takes me to my room. We sit in there and keep getting these haunting phone calls of a man screeching, screaming, you're next, you're next. She solemnly hangs up and has a trace of fear across her face. Suddenly, the scream is much closer to my bedroom window. Suddenly, I awaken with a jolt. I feel a cold sweat run down my back and notice that my breath shows up in midair. My furry little friend is in a little ball next to me, which means it was too cold for him too. I'm too afraid to fall back into sedation, so I stay awake and stay alert to any little noise in the home. As the clock turns 6 a.m., I wake up and wander into life before dawn. Everything is dark and I can't see, so I turn on the television. I make a cup of morning tea and tremble as I drink it. As I walked out to the bus, I couldn't help hearing the screams in my head and being terrified walking down a 50-foot driveway surrounded by timber. I've had a few experiences as a child, probably being less than 8 years of age, give or take. I found some little glass thing that I liked, and I was playing with it. I don't know what I was fascinated about it with, but I was a child. I lost it, and I woke up that night to go to the bathroom, and there it was on the bathroom counter. I didn't know how I had gotten there. I walk out in the hallway to go back to bed, and I see a figure run into my room. I run into my room, looking under my closet, under my bed, and all over. I find nothing. I go into my brother's room, he's still asleep, and see nothing else. I suppose the figure was returning the object to me. Who knows? Another time. I guess I woke up my mother to get me something to drink. 
after we went down the stairs and turned a corner to go to the kitchen, I'm behind her. And as she is about to go to the other room, I see a little boy, probably about my age at the time, and dressed in old style clothes. I don't know, maybe 17th or 18th century clothes, just old. I asked my mother if she just saw that, and she said, no, Bradley, what did you see? I told her what I would just seen. And she didn't tell me it was my imagination or anything. She believed me. She says that many people in the family have seen things from time to time like that. I've seen other things in those days. But my memory is a little shady about them. But those are my two best remembered. For some reason, I was somewhat scared of what I saw. I don't know why. Maybe because they were so sudden and gone so quickly. I would only see them for about two or three seconds, and they would just disappear as quickly as they appeared. I did live across the street from a cemetery, and someone we sold something to at a garage sale said the plot of land we lived on used to be a cemetery. An old one, judging by the clothes the boy was wearing, an old girlfriend sent me a link to the site, and I thought I would check it out. I came across the link, Children and Ghosts, and I thought I would give you my thoughts after reading it. I stopped seeing these things when I guess I just got a little scared, and just said to myself, I don't want to see these things anymore. After that, I hadn't seen a thing. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I'm not sure if I wouldn't mind seeing anything these days. I worked at a funeral home for six months and saw a lot of sadness and some gruesome things as well. People seem to be most upset when someone takes their own life, more so than a murder even. I got out of that because there is no money in it. It is because of those experiences that I do believe in life after death. Well, I hope I didn't make this message too long. I hope what I told you was helpful to you in some way. Well, let me first explain. I'm not psychic. I don't think that I'm particularly sensitive. I know that some of my friends and I in high school did mess around with some stuff. Ouija boards going to cemeteries, etc. That wasn't the brightest of ideas, but it wasn't meant to be harmful. For whatever reason, I seemed to attract this kind of energy. My parents had bought a house in a brand new development in West Windsor, New Jersey, in 1992. It was built on a former sod farm, Nothing too strange that we knew about. From the very beginning, I'd gotten weird vibes and sensations there. That something just wasn't right. My grandmother's sister, who was very sensitive, did not like coming over. That she never felt comfortable there. I never saw anything outright when I lived there. But I always got some strange vibes. My late grandmother did have a frightening experience. She had fallen asleep watching TV in the family room and awoke around 2 a.m. to two men standing in front of her. She screamed and they were gone. I would get sensations of cold spots in certain spots in the home, especially in the front room. A lot of misery befell my family when they lived there too. Maybe it was a coincidence. Maybe not. In 1994, I lived for a brief time at 50 Main Street in Roebling. It was once a doctor's office, and I believe a post office at one point in time. I had many strange experiences in that home. My husband was going to school at night and worked full time, 
so I was there by myself a lot. There was a room that was used for storage between our kitchen and the garage. I never wanted to be in there by myself. It was a very oppressive feeling, and I had a hard time breathing when I would be in there. There had been several times when I was doing laundry in the basement that I felt as if someone was standing behind me. Every so often I would catch a glimpse of an older, heavy-set woman outside. Since there was an alley directly behind the house, I assumed it was a neighbor. Apparently, no one alive in the neighborhood fit the description. The one thing that did me in was the third floor. When my husband lived there as a teenager, he and his brother shared it. And his brother had put mirrors along one whole wall for whatever reason. I was never able to look at those mirrors. I don't know if I was afraid of what I'd see or what, but I never could. I had originally planned on making the other room there into my sewing room. One afternoon, I was up sweeping when I felt as if someone was in the room with me. I knew I was home alone. It was such a palatable presence. I started to pray out loud. I basically did the rosary, but the feeling did not subside. I did not feel evil. It was just very oppressive. Needless to say, I was grateful when my mother-in-law sold the home and we had to move. As an aside, I grew up in Ridgewood, Virgin County. And I think that it is a one haunted town. There is something very evil in the cemetery across from Ben Franklin Jr. And I knew people would mess around with that stuff that they should have not stirred something up there. One night, we were all hanging out across the street by Ben Franklin Jr. And then I went home. I parked in my parents' garage. I was 17 or 18 at the time. And for some strange reason, the car backed itself out of the garage and landed directly over a ditch. It was like it had perfectly aligned itself to go there. The high school is haunted too. There used to be a room off the auditorium in the tower that was always 10 degrees cooler than anywhere else in the school. Of course, this is where we would go to smoke on a rainy day. There would just be a strange feeling in there. I don't know of any stories behind the building. It just might be a natural energy field or something. Finally, I used to work at the Borders in West Windsor. The shopping center that the store is located in was built over swampland where a bunch of kids from Trenton had drowned on Christmas night when they were fleeing police in a stolen car. The accident happened around 10 p.m. at night. Apparently where the back room in the store is was not too far away from the accident where it happened. There were many times we would hear things outside at night on the loading dock. Of course, when we would open the door, there would be nothing. A lot of times, and especially after 10 p.m., it would be very creepy going back there. I know that some other employees said that they had seen things back there. I never saw anything. I just got weird feelings. I've never really shared any of these stories with anyone before. But I feel like you guys won't do anything to exploit them. Or make fun of me. When I was 15 years old, I used to frequently babysit from a next door neighbor who has five children. It was a Friday night at about 10 p.m. I just put the children to sleep in their bedrooms upstairs. I stayed up for a while watching a few late night shows. At about midnight, I found myself restless and decided to wash the dishes from that evening's dinner. About 10 minutes into washing, I heard footsteps behind me. Without turning around, I said, you're supposed to be sleeping. I received no response and turned slightly to my right. And out of the corner of my eye, 
I seen the outline of a little boy with dark hair, dressed in a t-shirt and shorts, and white tennis shoes. I turned back to the dishes, and was about to repeat myself, when the hair on the back of my neck started to go up, and a shiver went down my back. I quickly realized that the little boy I had just seen was not one of the children. I turned completely about to find nobody there. I quickly walked through the kitchen to the living room and up the stairs where I found all the children sleeping soundly in their beds. There is no way that any of the children could have ran back up the stairs and back into their beds within five seconds and also without me hearing anything. My proof of what I had seen was real, is that all of the children were wearing pajamas, and not one of them had on shorts. Well, this didn't exactly happen to me, but it happened to my grandmother and her mother in the 40s in Brazil. My grandmother was young, and she had just bought her first house with my grandfather, and she had two little daughters. My aunts, obviously. My father wasn't even born yet. My grandmother isn't a person to lie, so this story is no bull. Well, it was around 1945, and my grandmother was preparing food in the kitchen for my aunts. My grandfather was at work, so she was alone with her two daughters. She heard footsteps coming down the living room and down the hall. She thought that was strange because my grandfather wouldn't come home. Only five hours later, she went to greet him, but instead was greeted by a terrible cold gust of wind. She shrugged it off and went on with her life. But until the next day, she was cooking for my two aunts. My oldest aunt was around five and the second was around two. She heard the same footsteps, and she noticed that it was always at the end of her mother's room. My great-grandmother would sleep there sometimes. She grabbed her two daughters and waited outside for my grandfather to come. This would always happen at lunchtime, around 12 p.m. Well, my grandfather was always skeptical when it came to ghosts, so he comforted her and told her he was hearing things. She believed him and went on. The next day, my great-grandfather went to sleep there. She would sleep there to help out my grandmother with the girls, and the footsteps still came. But my grandmother felt safe because she was with her mother and two daughters, so she didn't mind it. At night, my great-grandmother was sleeping, and she felt the bed go down as if someone was sitting down on it. Then, she felt a hand caressing her face. She got the heck out of there, and never returned to that house. They lived there for two years. Soon after my father was born, they moved. So that's my story. I do not believe she was lying, because she isn't a person to lie about that. Thank you. About four years ago, my parents moved to a home in Minapur. We knew nothing about the home's past. But right after they moved in, strange things began to happen. These odd things were only noticed by my mother and my nephew. My stepfather never saw or heard anything strange. And my mother was afraid to tell him for fear that he would put the house up for sale immediately. Mom would notice that the knickknacks in her china cabinet would be missing. They would show up again in the china cabinet, in a different spot. One day she was coming downstairs, and could hear the television on. She thought to herself, that darn kid left the TV on. And as she rounded the corner, it clicked off by itself. She was vacuuming one day and turned the vacuum off, but it kept going on for about 30 seconds. 
basement had motion detectors that would go blip blip when they detected motion. These were going off so often that eventually you didn't even hear from them anymore. Mom would often feel presence watching her when she was downstairs doing laundry. The home had strange things in it, such as holes in the walls that had been plastered up. One closet had the back of it plastered up, and I used a teaser that maybe a body was back there. My nephew, who lives with my parents, used to complain, not be scared, but just complain that there was someone in the room with him. They lived in this house for about two years. When I was 16, a long, long time ago, I went to visit friends who lived in Medicine Hat, Alberta, Canada. I was to stay with them for one week. My first night there, they showed me the guest room in the basement. I was not a jumpy kid, but was uneasy about the accommodations. Once in the basement, you had to cross all the way across the other end, turn down the hallway, and the bedroom was down that hall, with a bathroom directly across from it. My first night there, I tried to convince the dog to come downstairs and sleep with me. He would have none of that. I resorted to carrying the poor creature downstairs, but once we got down there, he bolted back upstairs. It didn't help that the walls were covered in animal heads, deer, elk, etc. This was, and still is, absolutely horrifying to me. More horrifying, in fact, than meeting a ghost face to face. Anyhow, I slept down there the first night without incident. A day or two later, I went into the laundry room, which was also in the basement. Hanging behind the door was the creepiest little puppet. It was actually a marionette that I have ever seen. Now, I'm not going to say this for the sake of dramatics. This hideous thing would be swinging back and forth every time it went into the laundry room. It would stop swinging when it was facing me. If I went into the laundry room with anyone else, it was completely still and usually facing the wall. I could not and still can't figure that one out. Anyhow, one night I decided to take the dog for a walk. Actually, I was sneaking out to smoke a cigarette and out I went. I was gone for one or two hours and when I returned home, the house was dark Someone was showering in the upstairs bathroom, but the kids were in bed. I decided to go downstairs and get ready for bed. The lights were off. I turned them on and went downstairs to my room. As I headed into my room, I noticed that the bathroom across the hall had a light on and the door was shut closed. I didn't think anything about it, but walked into the room and took my nightgown, toothbrush, etc. out of the suitcase. I turned around, and the door to the bathroom stood wide open. The light was off. I thought to myself, geez, I must be in trouble, but carried on getting ready for bed. I eventually made my way upstairs to face the music. My host was still in the bathroom, and I sat in the upstairs living room waiting for him. He eventually came out of the bathroom and came and sat with me. I asked if Darlene was mad at me or something. His reply was that Darlene went to Calgary tonight. They had made an offer on a truck that was for sale, and it was accepted. Darlene had been gone for hours. He could sense that I was puzzled and asked me why. I simply explained what happened downstairs. One thing that always troubled me is the very matter of fact that he stated to me it must have been the wind and got up and left me sitting there. How could the wind just turn on and off and open a door? I slept on the couch upstairs for the remainder of my trip.
in Conway, South Carolina. I lived on Cades Bay Road. You could tell the house out from all the other ones because I was the only one on a dirt road and all the other houses were by the highway. We lived with my grandma, so the house was pretty old. Her parents and her parents' parents also lived in it, and so on. All in all, the house has been through 13 generations. The house was also built on top of slave headquarters. Whoever built the house thought it would be charming to leave some of the quarters still standing. My grandma always told me that the house was haunted, and I didn't even believe her until one night when a date was dropping me off and we sat in the driveway for a little while. We got quiet and all of a sudden we heard a white male voice say, get back to work. Then we heard a whispering sound and a dish or glass break. I then told my date goodnight and ran inside. When I got there, I saw that it was only my grandma in the home. Of course I knew my dad would never behave like that. All grandma did was look at me and say, I told you it was true. My grandma told me that my mom used to lay in bed and listen to an African American woman sing him. Grandma said it was never frightening to her until she found out that there was no African American woman living or any woman who sung like that for that matter in the neighborhood. The kitchen to the quarters must have been my grandma's room because it has a very distinct smell of something haunted. The house almost caught fire one day. Mom was cooking peas on the stove and put it on low. She was gone for about five minutes and when she came back, the knob had been turned high and the pot was on fire. When Grandma died, we moved out of the house and out of Conway. Too many strange things for us to handle. Play, Alabama is a fairly new town. Most of it was farming land. And nothing but swamps before the new middle school and high school went in. About anywhere from 9 to 12 years ago. Things haven't been the same since in the new high school. It is reported that the lockers open and slam by themselves, and you don't want to be out in clay at night. You may see that Indians used to live there before the land was bought and sold off piece by piece. In the middle of the night, sometimes you could hear strange noises outside your houses, and the dogs and other animals in the area will act out for no reason at all. Is this the work of a ghost? No real investigation has been done there, but for us who live there, we know the truth. We all know that Clay is indeed a haunted town. That is not the most haunted place though. I live in the middle-sized town of Grayson Valley, and I've personally had enough experiences to tell you that. I personally believe that my house is haunted. My first experience came when I was about seven or eight years of age. I remember it was a school night, and I just laid down to bed. I don't even remember much about it, but I remember the room becoming very cold, and it felt as if someone sat down on the end of my bed. I laid there scared to move at first, but when I looked up, there was no one there. Ever since then, things have been weird. At first, I shrugged off that experience and told myself it wasn't true. Boy, was I wrong. It happened again when I was about 10 years or so. I was helping my mom carry in some groceries. And as I approached the top of the stairs, I swore I heard the sound of children laughing. I immediately shrugged it off and told myself that I imagined it but my next encounter would leave me speechless. When I was 13, my grandmother, who I was very close to, passed away. Right after she passed, things seemed different. At first it was little things, like throwing things down and then coming back in later to find that they were gone 
and it's somehow been put in the right places. In small things like that. But then something out of the ordinary happened. One night, about two or three days after my grandmother's funeral, I was lying in bed when I happened to notice something shining on the wall. I noticed that it was about the size of a small tomato, and it was a very beautiful blue color. I don't think anything about it, because I figured that it must have been the moonlight shining off of something. But it kept coming back. Night after night it would appear, and always in the general area over my door, just slightly over my wall. Then one night, I got up to see where the light was coming from. I couldn't find a source anywhere. In the way the moonlight was shining, it could have been that. And there was nothing in sight for the shine off of or anything like that. I was totally freaked out, but by the next night it was gone, and I never saw it again. The last great encounter I had was this past summer. I was about 14, and on my way to 15, I had remembered I had just gotten home from school and was doing my chores, which included vacuuming the living room. There was this black fan that was sitting on the floor and was plunged into the wall. I had to unplug it to unplug the vacuum in. The other square plug was being used by a lamp. I began the vacuum. Shortly after I turned around to unplug the vacuum, I noticed that the lamp was unplugged and the black fan had been plugged in, and was running on high. I was absolutely terrified. I ran in my room and shut my door, and didn't come out till my dad came home. I'm an only child, and no one else was in the house with me. When the event occurred, which place is no one there who could have plugged the fan in, other than a ghost? I have since had other experiences that involve strange noises or talking that sounds distant. Sometimes, though, I wonder if there's something more in my house than just me. I don't know much about the history of my house or the property for which it sits on. I only know that before us, my house had two previous owners. First, a young couple with three children, and when she got pregnant again, they had to move. And after them, an older couple moved in. Then after that, we moved in. The house is only about 20 to 30 years old. I know that much, but unfortunately that is all I know at the given time. Maybe my experiences have something to do with my lost family, or maybe that of the previous family who lived there, or maybe I have so many experiences. Because in my family, we have a history of producing mediums and prophets, or people who can sometimes see into the future without any control over how to do it, or when it is going to happen, or sometimes things just come to them. Anyhow, this is my story of Clay, Alabama, and of my possibly haunted house. I hope you will enjoy reading it, and can offer maybe some tips about why these ghosts might be there or whatever it is inside my house. I have to tell you, when I was young, my parents rented a house in Mount Myth, Oregon. I was so happy. We walked all over downstairs. It was cool and I liked it. And like I said, it was an enjoyable experience. Then I took the first flight of stairs. The stairs turned right. They went upright. There was a room there. I felt nothing. Then I went forward. When I walked into the room, I felt a horrible icky feeling. It was terrible. It was dark. My parents did not know what I felt. I did not tell them. It was just icky and dark. In that room, I had a walk-in closet. I felt so much like there was a woman in that closet. I could not ever go in that closet or place any clothing in there. I got in trouble for not hanging up my clothes, but I knew that there was someone in there. 
I got in trouble for crawling out the window in that room. They said that they saw a woman jumping out of the window of my room. I swear I never did that. I slept my whole life downstairs that we lived there on the couch. The couch was directly under that room. I had the icky feeling that there was a woman walking up above me. I ran away. They brought me back. When I was 17, my dad told me to go in the backyard and turn off the water on the yard. I did, and when I looked up in the window, there was a woman standing in the window. Forever. I looked at her for 10 minutes, or at least it felt like that. I will tell you that there was a woman standing here. That looks like you and I do. I wanted to make sure it was not the moon or some weird thing. But I will tell you for a fact, there is someone that lives in that house. I know it is a pub now. I went there. When I started to tell them of my story, they said they knew. They said everyone who ever lived there knows there's a woman who lives upstairs. I swear it is a bad woman. I can tell you more if you want it. I don't know if you still need stories or are updating this site anymore, but here's what happened to me as I can remember it. I was watching TV late at night one summer in my room. All of the lights were off. The only thing that was turned on was the TV. I was watching a show on tape, and I'd paused the tape. Something caught my attention out of the corner of my eye. I looked, and for a couple of seconds, these pair of eyes were staring at me from underneath my dresser. They were these two red glowing eyes looking directly at me. I was only a couple feet away from the dresser at the time, and I was lying on my bed. Whatever it was had disappeared after only a couple of seconds of looking at it. I quickly turned on the lights, thinking that it might have been an animal. But I did not see anything. There is no way for some animal to get inside my room from the outside. There weren't any open doors or windows for an animal to somehow crawl in. I stayed up for months after that, afraid I would see the thing again. But I never did. I was completely shocked when I looked at it that one night. I wasn't afraid though. I know this because I can still see the image in my mind of what I saw. My family and I lived in this house on Marriott Street in Bridgeport, Connecticut. We were never really sure how many ghosts we had in our house. And before I was born, my parents used to have family get-togethers, birthday parties in our basement that my parents had so beautifully redone. They used to be down in the basement with their guests. When they hear about what sounded like someone running upstairs, when my dad used to go downstairs to look, he used to never find anyone there. Then we have this plastic pitcher with a closed and open top. Well, when we used to go and grab it to pour ourselves more water, the top would pop off. Then we would put it down. The top would close. Not only the ghost affected everyone in my family, but it affected my brother and I the most. The ghost or ghosts hated my little brother and would bother him in a night saying they were going to kill him. The ghosts loved me. They really didn't love my brother. Although sometimes when I was in the basement playing video games, I could feel them sitting next to me. Now, I love hauntings and ghosts, but after we sold our house and moved to Wilmington, North Carolina, the ghosts seemed to follow. Even today, I knew that they were there, because sometimes when I look up, I can see a dark fear go over me or past me, and I know they're there. One night, my brother and I were watching a movie in our room, 
in a little boy's voice, in a little girl's voice, could easily be heard in the hallway behind my door. My parents were asleep, and on the other side of the hall, our TV was the only thing on, and when we paused it, we could still hear them. My friend used to live in Mississippi. They had to move to another house due to the rodent infestations in their old house. My friend was about four at the time, but she remembers some of the instances. But her mom told me some too. About a week after they were settled in, my friend would wake up in the middle of the night. When her parents came to investigate, my friend told them that she dreamed that all her toys were burning in the toy chest. Her parents told her that they were not, and they went back to sleep. One night, her mom was watching TV alone on the couch. Late one night, and there was nobody around. She heard someone say the F word, and it sounded like a lady behind her. She turned around quickly and nobody was there. My friend also had dreams of a black dog burning beneath her bed. TVs and lights turn on and off by themselves. After a month, they asked neighbors if they knew the history of the home. One old couple told them that 30 years earlier, there was a young couple who had just gotten married who lived there. The young bride was ironing an outfit for a party in the living room and had starch lover. Her husband was leaving the house for a minute to go pick up something from the store, and he flicked a cigarette, and the star caught fire. It was all over her. He tried to help her put it out, but they died, and the back of the house burned down, and the dog was killed also. Needless to say, they moved out right away. About 40 years back, I became interested in tracing my family's ancestors. This is how I discovered the Tilly Bend Settlement. Situated in the Appalachian Mountains, it really is a beautiful place. The Tacoa River flows down from the high mountains, winding its way into the Blue Ridge Lake. Tilly Bend Settlement is nestled back in these same mountains. One must cross the Tacoa River and travel down a one-lane dirt road that takes you deep into the forest. As you drive along, one begins to notice, windows rolled down, how quiet the deep woods become. This was my first impression of this area 40 years ago. This place has been lost in time because it looks like the same now as then, with the exception of the renovation of Tilly Bend Church I've been here many times, many, many times over the last 40 years. I suppose you could say I'm drawn to the mystery of this place. I will only share a small portion of my research. However, you need to understand this. Tilly Bend Church sits right in the middle of this haunting. This church is not part of the haunting. This church is the house of God and services are held here on a regular basis and demands the respect as being the house of God. In 1756, the Creek Indians lived in this area and got along quite well with this white folk that came to this area from North Carolina. There are census records showing that the white men intermarried with the Creek women. The Cherokee did not get along with the Creeks and forced them out of the area. The intermarried Creeks did not leave, and neither did their customs. In 1820, the Stanleys had formed a settlement over the mountain in a place known then as Stanley Gap. This being told, I can now share with you what I know is fact. Searching for my great-great-grandmother's grave, I ended up in Tilly Road Cemetery. At this time, the church only had services on decoration once a year. The church building was very old, but still in fair condition for its age. There were no glass windows, only wooded shutters, 
and that was common in the days before air conditioning. The doors to this church is what I remember most about this old country church. There was in both of the old doors what appeared to be like someone had shot the doors with a rifle of some sort. My first impression was that someone had done this out of pure meanness. I then proceeded to walk around the side of the church and walked up and peered through one of the cracks between the shutters. Of course, with the shutters closed, and there being no windows, the inside was dark. I could, however, make out the old homemade church pews and the pulpit. I also noticed a high ceiling with the rafters showing. Yes, I thought this church is old, and the welcome sign out in front of the church stated the church was established in 1858. After I looked the old church over, I then headed up the hill to the cemetery. I noticed there were a lot of field stones marking the graves, which is not unusual for very old graveyards. Right in the center is a very old and large oak tree, the only tree that is in the graveyard. I started looking around at the grave markers for my great-great-grandmother's grave. Well, to my surprise, her grave was also in the center of the graveyard, and her grave was the only one under the oak tree. The name on her marker is Elizabeth, so I'm looking around at this graveyard, thinking it looked as if no one wanted to be buried anywhere near her grave. I then wrote the information for her marker down, and that is when I noticed the head of her grave was facing west, which is very odd, because all the people here bury the dead facing to the east, because the Lord will return in the eastern sky. I finished getting the information, and I caught a glimpse of someone out of the corner of my eye. I did not hear a car come down the dirt road, and there were no houses close by. I turned very quick to see who it was, and there was no one. I laughed at myself thinking, yeah, I'm jumping at my own shadow. You see, I don't believe in ghosts, but I did believe in mean people. As I started back down the hill, I noticed another grave. It was called Mary. The birthday was the same as Elizabeth. They both died on October 26th. Elizabeth died 1905. Mary died 1906. I thought, boy, somebody messed up on the dates. I reached my car at the foot of the hill, and as I got in, I looked back up towards the cemetery, and at the tree, I saw what appeared to be a woman. Her dress was long and black. She had on a hat that I can only describe as a granny bonnet. I thought you have got to be kidding. Then it looked as if she stepped back behind the tree. I was curious, so I went about halfway back up the hill and shouted hello. Of course, no answer, so I walked all the way back to the tree, and there was no one there. I hurried back to the car and left. A couple of weeks later, my grandfather asked me if I had went to his great-grandmother's grave. I told him I had, and asked why her grave was facing to the west. My grandfather said, well, she was a witch. I laughed, and I said, really, Grandpa, why is her grave turned around? He went on to tell me this. She was Creek and also a witch doctor for the Creek Indians. The whole settlement was afraid of her. Now she had a daughter to marry, a Tilly, and another daughter to marry, a Stanley. There had been a family feud between the Tillys and the Stanleys, so the two sisters became enemies because of their husband. The feud escalated, and on Sunday morning, the Stanleys went to Tilly Church and started shooting through the doors of the church, killing the preacher, he was a Tilly, and several others in the church, including the one sister who married a Tilly. Now, the Tillys didn't let this go, and one night, they went to Stanley Gap and killed some of the men while they were asleep. Now the sister that married a Stanley, her husband was killed that night. A few months later, she died having a baby, 
Elizabeth Bradley vowed revenge on both the Tillys and the Stanleys for the death of her two daughters. After that, every baby born to the Tillys and Stanleys died at birth. I said, come to think of it, there was a lot of little baby graves, rows of them. My grandpa said, well, after a year of this, the Tillys went to Elizabeth Bradley's house and got her. She was then taken to the center of Tilly Graveyard and hung from the old tree. They cut her down and buried her right where she fell. Right before they hung her, she told them she would come back. Now, after a few months, the little baby started dying, all at birth. People in the Tilly settlement started claiming the witch had come back and had taken up residence and a very old and mean woman. Elizabeth Bradley's sister-in-law, Mary. So on the anniversary of Elizabeth Bradley's hanging, the men went and got Mary Tilly Bradley. They hung her from the same tree. They would not bury her facing west, because she was, after all, not at fault because the witch came back through her, and she was a Tilly. I said, Grandpa, that didn't really happen. He said, you saw the graves, and I'm telling you it did happen, and the older folks here will tell you that it's true. He said, and I'll tell you something else that's true. I saw one of them witches one time, when I was a small boy. My grandpa went on to say that when he was about nine years old, he went to decoration at Tilly, and he described the same very woman that I had seen. This happened 40 years ago, and my grandpa has been long gone for many years now. I've seen a tintype, old picture of Elizabeth Bradley, and I've also seen Elizabeth Bradley at Tillybent. I've kept a record, and I've seen her eight times in the last 40 years. There has been two occasions that I heard a little baby crying as I walk up the hill. Of course, it quits when I get to the tree. Strange how one would think you could only see a ghost at night. I've only seen her in the daytime. Of course, I don't go there at night, and I never will. I've always believed in paranormal things. I've had many encounters with ghosts, and it's never really bothered me. My daughter was born in 2006. Around the time she was one and a half, we moved into a nice older house. The first night in our new house, we were camping out downstairs because our beds hadn't been unloaded from the truck yet. Around 2 a.m., I was woke up because you could hear the sounds of someone walking around in a room above the kitchen. I just blew it off as an older building and such. I walked upstairs when I continued to find her closet doors open and things scattered around her room like someone had been in the boxes. Again, I just blew it off as my kid brother playing a trick before he left. The next morning we were setting up her room and I noticed her sitting there acting like she was playing with someone. It sort of gave me chills because she was actually talking to someone. I just ignored it, but later she started mentioning the man. Three days into living there is when things started happening. Her room has never been warm. I can turn the heater up to 75 degrees. I've bought a space heater. The landlords have came and checked the windows and insulation. Everything's normal. Her closet doors open at random times by themselves. Now at almost three, she still talks about the man in her room. She's informed me that the man tells her she can do things, be bad, and do things after she's told no. She still sits around and talks to no one. We live 14 months, with just little things happening all around 2am. Her bedroom door slams shut, and you hear stomping down the stairs. The laundry room doors open and slam shut. The water in the bathtub turns on by itself. But lately, things have become more aggressive and frequent. 
I decided to decorate her room. I put new curtains up, her new blankets on her bed, and hung clothes in the closet. I walked downstairs, leaving all the lights on, but shutting the closet doors. I was downstairs maybe five minutes. As I entered the hallway, I noticed her door closed, nothing new, but I opened it, and there was this rush of cold air. Again, nothing new. The light was off, and you could feel someone in the room. It was an angry sort of feeling, like someone was glaring at me. I ignored it and turned the light on. The curtains I'd just hung had been ripped off the rod and lay in the middle of her room. Her new blankets and sheets were off her bed, and her closet doors again wide open. My daughter refuses to sleep in her room now, saying the man scares her, that he yells at her. I've placed crosses and went as far as to have my house blessed, and nothing. In the last two months, I've been woken up to someone screaming in my ear. The sound of my front door opening and slamming shut, and my bathroom shower turning on, all in the 2 a.m. hour and on nights my daughter's at grandma's house. There are some stories that my family and friends have passed on, and I think you might find them quite interesting. I'm a great fan of your website. I have some stories that I've heard from family. Here's one that my grandpa encountered. His father had recently died in 1993, and the night of his funeral, he was awoke by something. He didn't know what it was. He was just awoken by whatever it was. He looked over, and his father was standing there, saying, I'm okay. Please do not worry. My grandpa got a drink of water, and his father left. He went right through the door. Then, I have one from family friends. This was when friends Steve and Rita had moved into a new house. They had seen several apparitions that they have not really explained, but really just blobs. Then, here comes the scary part. Here are two stories that I've also inquired from the same person. Rita and her husband and two friends were in the family room in the middle of the day, talking, and all four of them saw a shadow jump from the balcony, slide across the family room, and go under the couch. Steps have also creaked, and toilets have flushed for no apparent reason. This was also a new house, with no history of violence on the property. Now for the second story. A couple of nights later, Rita was sleeping, and woke up to feeling like someone was sitting on top of her, trying to choke her. Steve woke up to Rita's screams, and flipped the lights on. She told him there was a man with a plaid shirt in the room, trying to choke her. No one was in the room. She got up out of bed and went to the dresser, looked in the mirror, and he was behind her. A lumberjack-looking man in a plaid shirt, standing right behind her. This also might sound kind of weird, but my mother Bernadette lived in a new neighborhood when she was little. Outside of the development was a field with a very small house, almost a shed. Whenever my mom took a walk with her grandma, a little girl would come running out of the house and shed and talk with them. She was always dressed old-fashioned with a dress on. She resembled a little girl like Shirley Temple. She said her name was Judy. My mom saw her several times. Her grandma also did too. Years later, when she mentioned Judy to her mother, her mother said that nobody had ever lived in that house. It was used for storage, a shed, and said my mother was making it up, and that it was a story. We have never figured out if it was a ghost or not. My great-grandmother remembered her, too. As a side note, I've passed this particular field many times, and have seen the shed, but have not had any strange things happen to me when passing the area. Like my grandmother has said, 
no one has ever lived in that shed, so I don't know. My name is Rodney, and I would like to share a story with you that happened to me and a friend of mine. First, I will give you some background. It's the early 70s in Inan, Ohio. My friend Mike and I were very close because both of our parents had gotten divorced around the same time we were in our early teens. We shared similar interest in magic and trickery in the occult. We used to save our money and either buy magic tricks from magazines or make magic tricks from plans that we would buy for our act. We appeared on a local after school show for kids a couple of times and in doing so, we got to meet a local famous person named Dr. Creep. He had a Saturday night show where he would host and show scary movies and he also did magic. Dr. Creep was really knowledgeable and had a lot of contact. He told us of a local magic shop in Dayton and gave us directions. We couldn't drive at the time, but I would beg my older sisters to take us there. Discovering that magic store opened us up to a whole vast world of new tricks and illusions. The shop also sold paraphernalia for smoking, and it had a lot of what we now refer to as goth type of clothing and jewelry. Well. As we were getting a bit older, the movie The Exorcist came out, and we thought that what a neat idea it was to put some drama and stage production into the act to make it more of a show. We both attended a vocational school, so there were a lot of talented people there, and we found a couple of girls that liked to dance. We added dancing demon girls to the beginning of the show using black lights dark jumpsuits to conceal the girls under the sheets. The music was Mike's Oldfield's Hearst Ridge. I think that was the title. The stage was very barren when the show started. Only a small table with dimly lit candle and the dancing girls could be seen. The dancing girls dance ended with the meeting in front of the table and Big Flash exploded. And as the lights slowly illuminated, they would reveal a transformation in the whole look of the stage. There was now a 10 by 12 painted dragon silk tapestry hanging beyond the table and two silk banners of Belizebuth artistically lit with airy lighting and I would be standing where the dancing girls had disappeared in my cape. Most of our tricks and illusions were dark in nature. My friend Mike moved to Houston a year before we graduated high school. He got a job at the Galleria Mall in the fun shop. After I graduated, I moved to Houston and stayed with Mike at his mother's house. I also got a job at the fun shop. Eventually, we pretty much ran the place and again, we found a lot of new outlets for magic and the occult. Eventually. We moved into an apartment together as roommates. Our interest in the cult grew, but only out of curiosity, and it gave us an air of mystery to other people. As we made more friends, and our reputations as being a little different spread, we decided to really mess with people. Mike's bedroom had a huge closet, and being young, he didn't have a lot to put in there. We decided to dress it up and make it look like a devil worship after with the banners we had and with the skull shaped candles and the magic tricks. Our plans were when our friends would come over, we would show them that and they would freak out. The very night we did this at about 12, I awoke to a pounding on a wall between Mike's room and my room. I sat up and yelled, what are you doing over there? The pounding continued unrelentingly. I got out of bed and went over to the wall and yelled, knock it off, I'm trying to sleep. The knocking got louder and didn't show any signs of stopping. So I went over to Mike's bedroom door and knocked and said, Mike, stop it. The pounding continued. So I opened the door to see Mike sitting up in his bed, looking at the closet. My eyes went across the room towards the closet, and as my vision passed his dresser, 
I saw the door slowly closing. I asked Mike what he was doing banging on my wall. He said it wasn't coming from the wall between our rooms. It was coming from the closet. I continued looking onto the closet. As I saw the door, it was breathing and jostling as if someone was trying to get out. Then it stopped suddenly. We were scared witless. We gathered up enough courage to both walk over, and we pulled open the door with ease. The closet was freezing. We looked around and saw no one or anything. The apartment we lived in was brand new. No one lived next door. Our neighbor downstairs was gone for the weekend. We asked the people behind us the next day why they were banging on the walls, and they said that they had it and that they didn't hear anything the night before. We immediately started ripping all the decorations down. I'm still very much fascinated with the paranormal, but I will not invite it in. I have another story I will share with you later, but as for now, I hope you enjoyed what I gave you. My parents own a lake house in northern Indiana, and we used to have a neighbor named Mr. Campbell. Sadly, Mr. Campbell was quite old and depressed, and one day, he left a note and enough food and water to last his dogs at least a week. He said his body could be found in the lake. I couldn't remember if it was ever found, though. This story has many parts, all leading to the same conclusion. Mr. Campbell's ghost haunts this property, but he seems to be quite calm and docile. The first instance, well a rich man Richard bought his property, tore the home down, and built a $2.5 million house. Richard was extremely nice and was always coming over for dinner. One day, he told us that he thought his house was haunted. He had an entertainment system installed that requires him to climb a ladder to fully turn it on or off. For that reason, he always left it on and left the ladder in the garage. One day he had guests over and was going to put on the Indy 500, but the system was powered down. He said he watched TV the night before and no one had been in the house. At first he just assumed it was a power outage or something. He got the ladder and turned on the system. However, all of the settings were messed up. The volume was turned down very low, and the radio was on and set to a 50s station. The TV was off because of the radio. When he turned on the TV, it was tuned static rather than the Discovery Channel Richard had been watching the night before. He said he played it off as an accident to his guests, that it kind of spooked him. Later, after this happened, again Richard assumed Mr. Campbell wanted to listen to music, but didn't want to disturb anyone, because no one had heard the music. Richard also had a roommate named James. The thought is that they were lovers, but no one really asked. Richard would travel to Chicago a lot, and James would be home alone. One night, my sister and I were watching TV in our room and saw lights shining outside and heard men talking. We looked out our window and saw about three police cars and about six policemen walking all over the house, looking at windows and knocking on the door. We went outside with our dad to see what was going on and the police asked if we had heard or seen anything suspicious. We said no. Why? They told us someone had called 911 from the house, but only breathed into the phone for a couple minutes and then hung up. We told the police that Richard was gone, and usually when he was gone, James would visit his mother down the street. My dad called James' cell, and he was at his mom's for a dinner and a movie. He said he was planning on leaving soon anyways, and came to talk to the police. James let him in, and they searched the whole house, but no one was there. However, in the kitchen, 
A burner was left in high. James said he made pasta to bring to his mom's and must have forgotten to turn off the burner. After the police left, James said he sometimes got a strange feeling in the house, like he wasn't alone when he knew he was, but that he never got scared. It was more like being watched over than stopped. My sister and her friend were sitting on our screened in porch one Friday night after we got to the lake house late. They saw a man walk from the pier to Richard's house, and my sister called out, Hi, Richard, or James, whoever it is. But the figure didn't stop or reply. He just walked up to the house and disappeared. The girl said a light never came on, and he never heard a door open. The next day, Richard was doing yard work, and my sister mentioned the night before, and jokingly accused him of ignoring her. He told her he had not been home last night, and that he had just gotten back from Chicago early that morning. He also said that James was in North Carolina for the week for his sister's wedding. My sister and her friends were confused, because they had both seen the man, and they were worried they had seen a robber. Richard asked if the outdoor lights turned on, and they said no. Why? He said he has motion detector lights, so if there was a person by the house, the floodlight should have come on, and his alarm didn't register entry last night. The next incident, Richard had to move to Chicago. It had gotten to be too much for him to constantly be driving back and forth. So he bought a flat in Chicago and put the house up for sale. James left too. The new owners are really quite annoying and full of themselves. So no one ever told him about the possible haunting or the house's past. One day Janet came over and asked us if the house had a story. I asked why. She said she had been in the shower when she saw an old man staring at her. She screamed, and he just disappeared. We told her about Mr. Campbell and everything, and she sort of freaked out. They tried to sell the house, but couldn't. She still says the old man watches her every now and then. The housekeeper says she has never seen the old man while she was showering, but that she thought she saw him one day while she was cleaning. He was in the entertainment room, listening to music. She also said that the five dogs will stare at all the same spot for several minutes on end, tails wagging, as if they were being talked to. We still talk to Richard, and he has told us many stories about the house, rearranged pantries, the entertainment system being changed multiple times, and other various things. We think Mr. Campbell haunts the home because he can't move on. My mom says my experience must have been Mr. Campbell trying to get away from Janet for a while. That incident was before the shower, but Janet was already in the home with her husband. We still hear the beeping every once in a while, and we all just say, Hi, Mr. Campbell. You can visit as long as you like. The dog stopped staring and following him after about the tenth time. They'll look up just after the beeping, and just before we hear him leave. I'm a bit of a baby, so I still get creeped out when I'm alone at night, even though I know he has never done any harm. My parents are the last people I think would believe it, but with so many incidents, we think he is there living out his days watching others. Maybe he regretted saying goodbye prematurely, and because of this, this is what keeps him from going to the other side. I was visiting my mother and some friends in Florida, and stayed with my mother while vacationing to cook costs, of course. She works nights at the local hospital, so I'm there alone from 7 p.m. until 7 a.m. when she works. It was a Friday evening and my mom had just left for work. I was hungry, so I went out to grab a bite to eat. I got back to the house around eight and called my friend, who was supposed to come over to keep me company, but he was running a little late. So, 
I decided to keep myself entertained as I waited. I was in my room listening to music and stuffing my face when I heard what sounded like church bells. Now, these bells would have had to be kind of loud because I listened to my music on blast. I turned down my radio to hear the sound more clearly, all the while thinking to myself, there are no churches in the area that I know of, which made this all the more strange. As I listened, I heard the sound fade off into the distance, as if traveling away. I sat for a couple of minutes and turned my music back up and continued eating. About 15 minutes later, I heard something like someone trying to get in through the back door. My mom's house is a little older. I'd say about 40 to 50 years old. For someone to pry open the back door would not be a difficult task. So naturally, I ran to the back door to see what was going on. Once there, I saw that no one was there. But the glass in the door near the knob was fogged up like cold water would do in a glass cup. Thinking that was a little strange, I grabbed the handle to open the door, and I liked the stream bloody murder. The handle on that door was sub-zero cold, and it really caught me by surprise, just from how incredibly cold it was. I stepped out into the porch, turned on the light, looked around a bit for anything suspicious, and when I saw nothing, I reluctantly went back inside. Uncerned, I kept my music to a minimum, just in case anything else happened, as it surely it did. About an hour later, I got a call from my friend. Now this is strange. He lives about five minutes from my house driving, and about 20 minutes walking. Apparently, he came over to the house and rang the doorbell, heard my music playing, and figured that when I didn't answer, I was in the bathroom or something. He called my phone, but it kept getting cut off after the first ring, so he decided to go back home and come back since it's not far at all. He claims that as he was backing out of my driveway, he saw the front door open he rolled down the window to see if it was me. He said as soon as he got the window all the way down, the front door violently slammed shut so hard that my friend thought for sure that the front window should have shattered. I heard none of this. Around the time that he came over was coincidentally the same time I heard the strange bells. So, I was a little spooked and told him to come over. So he said give him about 15 minutes and he would be over. Well, a lot can happen in 15 minutes. I got off the phone with him and went to the bathroom to freshen up a bit. I washed my hands and face and dried them. I was heading back to my room when I heard a faint sound in the living room. I was a little apprehensive to see what was making the sound and started thinking that Perhaps I wasn't alone in my mother's house. From my bathroom to the living room, there is a long hallway. As I walked the hallway, I sensed a presence, and it felt like a large presence, however that feels. Upon entering the living room, I looked up and saw what looked like a clergyman. I could see him clear as anything. My reaction wasn't what one would expect. Looking back on the incident, it seems unusual to me as well. I began to cry, almost uncontrollably, and I still have no reason as to why. That's when I heard a knock at my door. My friend had arrived, and as I stood there, I saw the apparition seem to fade to nothing as he continued to knock and rang the doorbell. I opened the door to my friend, who seemed a little shaken himself. He asked me why I'd been crying, and unsure on what to tell him. I simply said that I saw something sad on TV. He asked if anyone else was in the house because he saw someone leave out the back door. 
I told him it was my neighbor. I've had many things happen to me. Dreams and visions have been a part of my life for as far back as I can remember. But none of them compare to this incident. Weird, huh? I was only about three years old when I first started seeing things in my old house. It started with the noises in the attic. I would hear a rocking chair rocking in the attic directly above my bed. However, that portion of the attic had nothing in it at all. The floor wouldn't even have supported the weight. My old house was a 1950s home. The basement still had an old coal room. However, the coal chute was sealed shut to prevent breaking in. The coal room was directly below my bedroom, and was the only part of the house no one ever went into. I can only ever recall even seeing the door open once. It was an empty, depressing kind of room. In addition to the noises above, I would sometimes hear footsteps in that old room below me, or footsteps on the basement stairs. The first time I ever saw anything was, as I said, when I was around three years old. I woke up from my sleep in the middle of the night to see a young girl standing by my bed. She had brown hair and green eyes and wore a 19th century style green nightgown. She looked to be about eight years old. She frightened me at first, but I didn't get malicious feelings from her, and gradually, I accepted her. She appeared to me often throughout my childhood, and even now, I see her occasionally. The other ghost I saw was much scarier. I wasn't the first one to see him. My younger brother was. He was a tall man, who held a knife in one hand, and wore black. My brother began seeing him when he was about five years old. The man would appear in his closet, began to walk towards him, and then my brother in his fear would scream, and the man would disappear when my parents came running. I have never told anyone about my experiences with ghosts, for I was afraid I would be called crazy. But my brother told us all about what he saw. He saw the man a total of four times, once in each of our bedrooms, and twice in mine. I saw the man twice, but I didn't begin seeing him until I was much older, around nine years old. I always got a fairly bad feeling from the man, and Victoria, the name I gave the little girl, would always disappear before he appeared. I got the sense that she was scared of him for some reason. In addition to this, when my great grandma passed away, I inherited her jewelry box. The first night I had it, I'd left it sitting open on my bedroom floor. When I went to bed, I was around six years old. I was lying awake in bed when suddenly the movie in my VCR fell out of the VCR and onto the floor. A few minutes later, my TV turned on. There was no one else in the room at the time. As I got up to turn it off, it turned itself off. A few nights later, I'd once again been playing with the jewelry in the jewelry box. I awoke to find my basketball bouncing itself repeatedly against my dresser, sideways. There was no one else in my room at the time and it kept it up for over a minute. After that, I became frightened and stowed the box away in the back of my closet. To this day, I will not open it, even though I'm now 16. The scariest thing of all happened when I was 11. I awoke in the middle of the night, unable to move the lower half of my legs. Terrified, I sat up to see a strange black shadow sitting on my feet. It was blurry. That may have been partly because my glasses were sitting on my bedside table. At first I thought it was my black cat, but quickly realized that it was much too big. 
It was transparent. It was about half the size of a small child. But the thing itself isn't what scared me. It's the feeling that I got from it. I felt terrified, like I've never felt before in my life, as if this strange shadow was pure evil. I struggled to move my legs, and then ran into my parents' room and woke them up. It's the only time I've ever told them of my paranormal happenings. My dad came into my room and turned my light on, but of course, the thing was gone. He insisted I was dreaming and tried to get me to go back to sleep, but I slept on their floor for a week straight after that. I've since moved into a new house. My grandma died here, and we moved in afterwards. Because she left it and everything else of hers to us, I don't have as many experiences here. But there is one that really stands out in my mind. I awoke in the middle of the night, and I could feel someone laying against my back. Their knees curled under mine, and their arm around me. I freaked out and literally jumped onto my floorboard and flicked my light on, but nothing was there. My mom was woke up from the commotion, and I told her about it. She told me it was my grandma, who was keeping me safe as I slept. And then a few days later, we drove to the cemetery where my grandma is buried. We took my grandma's dog with us. Once we got to my grandma's grave, the dog went crazy. She began to bark and whine and pawed the windows frantically. We thought it must have been a squirrel or something, but there were no animals in sight, not even a bird. My mom thinks that the dog saw something we couldn't, and I have to say I agree. I've had many experiences, and these are just the ones I was reminded of by reading other stories on your website. I wrote a lot. I tried to narrow it down a bit. I've tried seances and things with my very good friend, who has similar experiences to mine, and we've been successful at this. It really shocks me sometimes, because we'll both get an image in our head, or see something, and we can finish each other's sentences. That's how precisely we see things. I definitely believe in the paranormal, and I hope to show other people the truth. I lived in this area for over 30 years. Robinson Woods is the home of the Chief Chichi Pinque, as it is spelled on the sign, in the site of his burial marker. He was the last chief of the Potawatomi Indians, and he was related to the Robinson family. He died in 1953. There have been numerous ghost hunting expeditions conducted here with reports of drums and shadowy forms of an Indian in pictures in the woods surrounding the memorial marker. These woods are connected to Catherine Woods, west of East River Road, south of the Kennedy Expressway. There's a trail that leads from behind the Chief's memorial marker, going to a small branch of the Dace Plains River. It is along this river that John Wayne Gacy buried several of his victims. Additionally, there have been numerous bodies found here over the years. In the late 1950s, two brothers went missing and were killed, and their bodies were discovered here. The area of these woods, more towards the Catherine Woods side, just south of the expressway, is where the American Airlines flight went down killing all on board. On the east side of the East River Road, there used to be a horseback riding stable called Happy Day Stables, which was the site of many illicit doings. John Wayne Gacy was known to be friends with one of the stable hands that worked there in the 50s and 60s, and he was a frequent visitor there. This stable hand is the one who was responsible for killing the two brothers in the late 1950s, and it's local legend that Gacy participated in the murders. Of course, 
Both Gacy and the other man died without ever revealing the truth of this. These woods have been the site of more phenomenon than can be counted. Generations of kids have gone there to dare each other to face their fears. I personally experienced the drums in the woods, the face of an Indian behind the marker, felt overwhelming fear, anger and sadness and evil along the river behind the trail and horrifying fear around the airplane crash site. That's my story and many others in the rumors surrounding this area. When I was around seven or eight years old, I lived in Norwalk, California with my mom and my soon to be stepfather in a two bedroom apartment. There are two things I remember most about living in that apartment. One was the beautiful princess Kenobi bed I slept in, and the other was the floating woman's head I would see coming into my bedroom from the hallway. I have and will never forget that image. It looked like an older woman with long, coarse gray messed up hair with some kind of hat. The first thing I think of when I remember her face was she looked like a witch, pointy nose, moles on her face. From the moment I started seeing her float in, she just stared directly at me, went around the poles of my bed, and coming right at me. I would always put the covers over my head knowing she was right on top of me and shut my eyes hard and put my fingers in my ears until I felt ready to look again. I've always believed and been interested in paranormal and ghost stories. After my grandmother died, I felt her hand on my shoulder in my then boyfriend's house. I turned around Nobody was there, but for some reason, I knew it was her, and I didn't feel scared. I felt she was letting me know she's okay and with me. Lately, my sister and I have been looking at paranormal sites and researching videos and pictures of ghosts, paranormal stories. Your site is my favorite right now. A few years back, I was at the White Horse Bar in Maloa and was doing a gig. When I was done, I left the back room and walked through the kitchen area, passed by a guy in a white outfit who was preparing food, or so I thought. I put my stuff out of my vehicle, came back in, and was going to get a bite to eat. I asked for a menu, and a barmaid gave me one. I ordered food and the barmaid headed back to make me my food. After a while, she came back with my food. Her and I talked, and we started dating shortly after that. Well, a week or so later, I met the whole crew, three girls, and the owner. I asked where the chef was, and the owner told me they're right here. I laughed and said, what about the guy? They all gave me a funny look, and said there is no guy. I had explained the guy I had seen a week back that appeared to be a cook dressed in white clothing that's similar to a chef and was facing the kitchen stove that I walked by. They all gave me a weird look and from there, the owner talked about seeing shadows going across the back room area late at night and no one was there. He told me the owner prior said a ghostly head was said to appear down from above the bar one time in the past. There was a time that I had to change the light bulb and it had to be replaced. The old one was loose and burned out. I tightened the new one in place and tightened down the fixture. And we were sitting down my girl at the time. And the owner and another of the bar ladies and I joked. The ghost will probably be here to flicker the lights, and the light will burn out. The crazy thing is, a couple seconds after that, the light flickered and went out. The owner got another light bulb, and I took the fixture enclosure off to 
find the bulb loose, but still good. One of the bard's maids researched the property and told us the place a long time ago, back in the past, was a feed store, and that a guy in his teens got crushed to death from fallen feed sacks. I was born in Singapore in 1951 to British and Australian parents. We lived in various cities in Malaysia during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. In 1957, we arrived in Kuala Lumpur, where we stayed until mid-1975. We moved into a company-owned house at Freeman Road, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. The history of the house is as follows. It and the house next door, number 17, were built just before World War II by the late Dato Gunlay Take, a then well-known architect who became an early Malaysian High Commissioner to either Australia or Canada. He built them for his daughters. During World War II, the two houses, along with the large semi-detached house immediately behind, on what was then known as Gulf View Road, were taken over by the Japanese Army Secret Police and known as the Kenta Pai, equivalent of the Nazi Gestapo. The two houses behind were used as Kampai Thai offices, and the three in Jalen Freeman became senior military officers' brothels. The women in the brothels were both Asian and European, the latter being drawn from a pool of captured civilians and military nurses. Comfort women was the term used by the Japanese. Male military POWs were used as gardeners and cooks, etc. These staff, if they fell from favor, were executed and some were obviously buried in the ground surrounding the houses. As some years later, we did find scattered human remains when excavating the gardens for our new orchid beds. On the advice of our doctor, who identified them as human in origin, we quietly reburied the remains. He said that if word got out as to what we had found, we would never get any Malay or Chinese domestic staff to work for us. After the war, the houses were returned to their owners who, knowing what the Japanese had used them for, promptly put them up for sale. They were all bought by large companies, at bargain prices, who used them to house senior expatriate staff. Gunlay Take was no different, and in 1947, sold his two houses to the company my father worked for. The two company houses were three bedroom houses, of two stories, double brick construction. There was also a long narrow room, forming a roof over the carport at the front door. This room was to play a significant role in what we were to experience over the following 10 years. In our house, this room was turned into a large walk-in linen press and storage area. To enter it, one would take one step down. When we moved into the house in early 1957, the first thing my mother noticed was that this room was extremely cold, as if it was air-conditioned. In tropical Malaysia, a non-air-conditioned room this cold is not even practical. Our dogs would never go into this room, and when passing the entrance to that room, always hurried past with tails between their legs. Nobody would really stay in that room for very long. It had a very uncomfortable atmosphere. However, sometimes after running around and playing and getting very hot, I would go and sit on the step at the entrance to the room to cool off. I was five years old and knew nothing about ghosts at this time. The main bedroom on the extreme right hand side of the upstairs part of the house as one faced out towards the main road had its own full bathroom, and the other two, also upstairs, shared a bathroom via separate doors leading from the bedrooms to the bathroom. These latter two were adjoining each other. One was on the extreme left-hand side of the house, and the other at the back with the windows looking out over the back lawn. This eventually became my room. 
All the doors were heavy solid, with solid brass latches. Windows were hinged teak framed, and had a bamboo awning type blind that rolled down over the window to give shade from the sun. Downstairs was a separate formal dining room, lounge room, kitchen, toilet, and downstairs storage room, as well as a storage area under the staircase. The lounge room opened up onto a rear veranda area. Remember, the temperature was over 85 degrees Fahrenheit plus all year round. As per usual, European expatriate practices of the times in India, Malaysia, Indonesia, Hong Kong expats had domestic servants to look after the household chores. All expat houses built prior to the early 1960s had separate servants' quarters on the property. This house had a three-owned building with shared kitchen and bathroom, and it had a car garage building sited at the rear of the property, about 20 meters from the main house. About three months after we moved in, funny things started to happen. The first incident was the appearance of a white cat. Interestingly enough, it always followed the last person who went into my parents' bedroom at night, the bedroom at the right-hand side of the house. This cat made no sound, but appeared from nowhere and scuttled into the room as the door was opened. This bedroom was air-conditioned. A thorough search of the room failed to find the cat, but next night, there it was, entering again. At the time, we had no cats. This cat was seen every night until my parents moved to the middle bedroom, which was nearer to the room that my younger sister and I shared. Their old bedroom was then turned into a guest room. Over the years, visiting guests who stayed overnight with us also saw this cat. One evening, about dusk, my mother, looking through the lounge window, witnessed a woman with long red hair wearing a sort of white nightgown standing near the front gate. She thought that this was unusual and walked out the front door to go talk to the woman. As she walked across the lawn, the woman walked away and went behind the hedge, which formed our front fence. When my mother got to the gate, she looked in the direction that the woman had walked and saw nothing. Three nights later, my father saw the same woman walk into the entrance of the servants' quarters. He followed her, but found no sign of her when he entered the building. She was never actually seen in our house, only on the front and back lawn and in the servants' quarters, but she was regularly seen in the house next door, number 13, and also in one of the houses behind. The occupants of both these latter houses often saw her sitting on the edge of the bed brushing her hair, but there was never a reflection in the mirror. When spoken to, she would turn her head, smile, and slowly fade from view. We also saw an emaciated man in a military uniform. He was seen in her house, both upstairs and downstairs, as well as outside. One evening, my mother saw what appeared to be a body lying under a shroud in the front garden. About eight years later, I also saw this figure, for lack of a better word, on the back lawn at first light one morning, and again at about 3 a.m. on another morning. From time to time, we would also see an old Chinese woman in the lounge room. She was wearing a white starched linen top with black pajama pants, cut in a traditional Chinese style. This used to be the standard Chinese domestic staff uniform in the immediate pre- and post-World War II era. We referred to them as black and whites. By the 1960s, the next generation of Chinese female domestic staff had abandoned this tradition for more colorful pajama suit type clothing. One would look up from reading a paper or a book and see this old woman standing in front of you smiling. She would then fade quickly from view. She was only seen in the lounge, in broad daylight, but never when there were a lot of people around. One evening when in my mid-teens, I arrived home from visiting a friend. As I walked down the drive, I noticed that the lounge room was lit up 
and a man with shiny, neatly combed black hair and wearing a khaki uniform was sitting in a chair with his back to the window and reading what appeared to be a newspaper. I got the impression that he was Asian and thought he was a friend of my father come to visit. Later, I recollected that the furniture in the room was different to what we had in there. When I entered, I found the whole house, including the lounge, to be in darkness, the rest of the family having gone out and the servants retired for the night. Thinking back, I think this man was probably a Japanese military officer. I only experienced this once, and my parents never did. Occasionally, we would also hear a woman's voice calling out in terror. We couldn't figure out what she was saying because she was saying it in Japanese. It was then that my parents realized that what we had seen and experienced were most likely the spirits of those who suffered there. After finding this out, we began to suspect that the cold room I described earlier in this narrative may have been used as a place for the ill treatment and execution of prisoners. My father learned that after the war, health authorities advised that the original septic tank was too close to the house and a new one had to be installed. While digging the new pit, workers had dug up human remains. We left the house in 1967 to move to a new house nearby. The next occupant, also working for the same company, also experienced funny things, but didn't actually see anything strange. This family's dog on several occasions also dug up human bones from the gardens. In the interest of preserving the local peace, they also quietly reburied the remains and said nothing. I didn't find out about what they experienced until many years after they had left Malaysia and returned to England. The company sold the houses in the mid-1970s after my family had left Malaysia. The houses at 15 and 17 were torn down, and a large mansion was built across the boundaries of both properties. However, this was demolished after a few years, and since then, the two blocks have remained vacant. In 2008, they are still vacant. This is a prime land, in an inner suburban area, but the land is still vacant. The house at number 13 is still standing, but is abandoned, and half the roof is collapsed. We wonder just what was found when the site was excavated for the new building. Also, the reason why the new mansion was also demolished, and the blocks left vacant. Maybe the souls of those poor victims still occupy the site, and are not at rest, and reappeared in the new building. I was shocked to see that in Lovejoy, Georgia, there were apparitions. I too had an experience, but didn't think much about it, especially after everybody looked at us. My mother-in-law also saw it, as if we were crazy. We used to live in a new apartment complex. One day, I was sitting on the counter eating lunch, and my mother-in-law was in the living room. As she came towards me to get to the kitchen, we both saw a man going towards the room at the end of the hall. Our first instinct was that one had broken into the apartment. We did get a chill, but at the same time, we didn't seem it was a big deal. We just figured it was the fact that we had gotten scared. I grabbed the phone, and we walked towards the hallway. When we looked, we saw nobody. We thought they had gone into the bathroom or the laundry room. When we saw nobody, we looked in the closet of the room, but again, didn't see anybody. After we came to our senses, we realized that nobody could have entered, because we would have heard the door, and the alarm would have went off anyway. Two guys that slept in that room told us afterwards, they would have trouble sleeping for a long time. On occasion, they would hear the water running, but they thought it was the other one. After sharing these experiences, we have come to the conclusion that this was in fact paranormal. 
We called the leasing office and asked them if anything had happened in that apartment, or if they knew of anything of this nature in that area. They obviously thought we were crazy, and replied that they didn't know anything. Now that I have found this, I feel relieved that now thanks to this, my family believes us. I'm of course referring to your site. Thank you for letting me share my story. There's a lot of things in my life I've seen over the years, but nothing has disturbed me quite like this. It was the weekend of break for myself and my mom, and we decided to go up to Oklahoma City to see my cousins. Everything was great. I got to see some relatives, and nothing seemed quite out of the normal. That is as far as normal went that night. While taking the four-hour drive back, I noticed that the moon was very huge and blood red. Of course, I didn't know about the eclipse that day, so it was cool to watch as we drove to Ferris, which is a tiny town between Lane and Antlers. I remember that my mother pulled into the Veterans Bridge in Aloka when a couple miles down the road, I happened to look up and an elderly couple was standing on the side of the road staring across as if watching something. It reminded me of the Grant Wood painting of the farmer. I remember looking at a clock a moment before and saw it was midnight. The moon was still out and still red. What makes it even worse for myself is that my mother also caught a glimpse of them. I turned around shocked and I felt like if I turned around they would be flying behind us screaming. I've passed by several times since then, and every time, I get a shiver up my spine, remembering what happened that night. I still get teased a bit about it, even to this day, even though my mom was pretty spooked out herself. My dog and I have been traveling the mountains of upstate New York and Pennsylvania for 17 years. So when he left me last February 2007, I brought him to his favorite spot. There was still snow on the ground, and tracking through the woods at this time was very difficult. I tried to break ground with the pick that I carried, but the ground would not permit me. I found a nice spot and laid him under some brush beneath some trees. I told Dylan I would be back. Three weeks passed before I was able to get back to him. When I was driving up the dirt road, all I could think about was how I was going to find him. Being where I'd laid him down, I thought I'd find him in pieces. I was getting sick to my stomach. He was my boy, and this had to be done. When I reached him, it was just like I'd laid him down. Thought this was weird. He wasn't even stiff. It was like he was waiting for me to come back. It was nice being with him, even though he had passed. The rest of the afternoon off and on, I dug his grave, going very deep so the wild animals couldn't dig him up. I took off my coat and wrapped it around him and laid him in the grave. Dusk was setting in, and all of a sudden, I heard children moving all around me, laughing and giggling. I knew this wasn't natural for children to be where we were, for the closest house was at least 10 miles away. I still dismissed this in my mind, as the circle we were using around me kept getting smaller. I would stop every now and then and listen, but I would hear no breaking branches, which should have been happening. Thank God I already had a cross I made, for night was now upon me. When I was tracking up the mountain towards my car, the spirits were in a horseshoe behind me. Every now and then, I would turn around to keep them behind me, but this still didn't stop the giggling. Never heard this type of laughter before. When I made the clearing where my car was, the noise finally stopped. I popped the trunk open to put the pick and the shovel in. Then, I leaned over the hood of my car. There stood five solid white entities 
at the edge of the woods. They were not children. For the past 11 months, I've been visiting his graves to make sure his resting place is kept up and comfortable. Once, I saw a dark figure that drifted across the opening. Another time, this figure was floating seven yards from me. I even heard bullfrogs croaking. I'm an educated man. I'm not crazy. Can't talk to anyone about this without people think I'm weird or mentally disturbed. Either way, this was a tale that I thought you'd enjoy. It's a hundred percent real. I swear my life on it. I know I may only have my word, but it's the best I can do. I've worked at St. Francis Hospital in Peoria, Illinois for over 20 years. I've seen some of the nun ghosts on the seventh floor where the laboratory was when I worked there. The morgue was also on that floor. I was working third shift one night. At times, we took the back elevator, the service elevator, to the floors to draw labs when needed. As I was walking down the hall to the elevator, I saw a nun getting onto the elevator. I yelled out to her, Please hold the elevator, sister. The door started closing. Thinking she did not hear me, I hit the down button as it closed. The door opened, but there was no one on the elevator. There was nowhere else she could have gone, for it was a dead-end hallway to take the stairs, she would have had to walk past me. This was a strange night, and it took place many years ago. Another moment, it was fairly late, and I was again on my way to the elevator. This time, I made it inside alone, and as the elevator was closing, I saw a man in a white lab coat standing all the way at the end of the hallway. At the time, the hallway was pretty dark, but there was just enough light that you could see down it. I knew for a fact that there was absolutely no one else on the floor at the time. The image of the man in the lab coat, and also the nun, will always be engraved in my mind. This hospital has always had a reputation for having had ghostly visitations from previous employees who used to work there. Some of my co-workers have experienced this as well. When I was describing what I had seen to a current co-worker, she was a bit startled from the revelation. That's because one night, she had taken the elevator to the morgue, and when she got down to it, she could have sworn that she saw a figure or dark shadow in a praying position, kneeled over. She said the figure was an outline of a person, no distinct features, almost cloud-like, but could definitely tell it was made to be some sort of person. My theory is that the nun appeared once again to help with the newly deceased transition to the other side. I'd also like to think that the man in the lab coat was a former employee of this hospital. Either way, there's quite a bit of haunted history here and I'm not sure how to deal with it at times. Since I'm fairly used to creepy happenings, it no longer frightens me like it used to, but there's always a bit of excitement in telling these tales to those who haven't heard them before. I believe there is a portal to the other side that humans have access to, and eventually, we'll transport ourselves to this world. As for now, we're just getting a glimpse of the afterlife. This is an authentic story, and it happened to me. I've already posted this on allaboutghosts.com, but I've not heard anything about this place other than my story. Maybe someone out there has had a similar experience, or even paranormal things happen at this place. What made me want to add my story here is when I read the story about Tacoma, Point Defiance Park, Five Mile Drive. This story grabbed me and was almost disturbing to me 
because it is so closely related to mine about a little girl. However, this was no ordinary looking girl. She was looking real, of course, except she had no eyes and was smiling, and then all of a sudden she disappeared. I was searching here to see if there was anything for my spot at Eagle Falls. When I went to this favorite swimming hole mine on Sakoa River, this is a very beautiful swimming hole, almost lagoon-like, where the river flows with falls into a pool of deep colorful water, and under the water, on the side of the walls, there are huge giant flat rocks that drop off down where you cannot see the bottom. The rocks above have been carved into the star-like settings that have become flat, and then go down into where the river wall is. Across the river, which is only about 50 feet or so, there are rocks where people can climb to. There is a rope swing tied to a tree on the side also. It's a popular spot for people to swim in the summer. I really like this place for swimming and floating on my raft of flippers, so I can move faster to swim up the currents of the falls better and ride the river down. This brings me to my story. I was headed towards the place where I was going to do just that, and noticed there were two people to the right of me, a man and a woman, one sitting next to the rope swing, and the other climbing up the rocks. And to the left of me, there was this little girl, about six or seven years old, and standing about three feet away from me, on the edge of the rock by the water with her head turned slightly, and just smiling at me. I am swimming still almost to passing her, and notice she is still smiling, so I smiled. I waved to her and said hi. She still smiles at me, but says nothing back. I looked at her again, this time into her eyes. We locked eyes for a second, and that is when I noticed her eyes were very dark, to the point where I couldn't see her eye color. They only looked like black holes, almost hollow-like. Everything about this girl seemed normal, except for her eyes. She had a cute little swimsuit that was lime green, with little white flowers on it, and a little ruffle around the waist. She was tan, and had golden blonde shiny hair that came down past her shoulders, and also had bare feet. She was alone, there was nobody above her, or next to her. I was thinking that maybe she was standing there watching her mother swing from the rope swing, or something. But as I swam a little bit past her, I suddenly turned to look back, because I feared her being too close to the edge, and wanted to let her to know to step back. But as I turned to do this, she was gone. Now, I was wondering how she could climb the rocks that quickly, and how she could be completely out of sight, when I only turned for a second, then looked back. Surely I would have noticed her walking away, at least if she did, climb the rocks, or even if she had fallen in, I would have heard the sound of water splashing. I was only a few feet away from where she was standing, and I quickly went to the area where I saw her, and nothing. I looked above and further back where some people were sitting by some trees, and looked down along the banks where other people were sitting and with kids, and no one looked like her, or had blonde golden hair, or the same bathing suit on. At this point of feeling very confused, I felt a cold chill come over me, and my hairs and my arms were standing up. I felt a sadness and chilling feeling, and had a vision of the same girl falling into the water and drowning. I even felt some pain and a little bit of anger type emotions, right there where she stood while I was still trying to see if I could find her. I thought, where are her parents? Why is she all alone? So I swam back up to my spot by the river and told a friend I was with what happened, and I pointed to the rock she was on. He said it sounded and even looked like I saw a ghost from the way I was acting. 
I asked him if he would go back with me to look for her, and he said no way. That is way too creepy. I don't want to go over there with you. I'm thinking about how this situation is so crazy, and the fact that it's daylight even. I'm going back to see if I can see her, I said. Determined to find her, I swam back to the spot where it happened, and looked all over the area where people were sitting, and still, no little girl in a green bathing suit. I started looking in the water to see if I could see anything from down there. Nothing. And the girl across the river that I thought was her mother was not. She was with the guy on the rock still. Then again, I get the chill and I'm feeling sad and start becoming afraid of the spot and even swam away from it again, thinking this doesn't make any sense. Then wondering if I'm the only one who saw her. Did the people across the river even see her? This is a wide visible area where you can see everyone around you. Am I losing it? Then I remember those eyes she had were actually hollow. The smile she made and just kept smiling at me. How she didn't even move from the time I swam towards her. Stopped, made eye contact and said hi. Then kept swimming only a few feet further then turned around to say she was close to the edge, or, where is your mother? Somebody should be with you. I truly believe what I saw was an entity of some sort, and perhaps this little girl might have fell into the river and drowned, right where she was standing. I've heard some stories from here of people dying at the spot by swinging from the rope swings and jumping from the high cliffs, which happened right across from where she was. I also believe I wouldn't be so disturbed by this if it all seemed normal, but it didn't, and for some reason, she didn't seem to fit in. I wrote to ease my mind, and maybe to just get it out somehow. If anything at all, I will probably never know why she picked me to see her, but I will never forget what she looked like, or how she stared at me and smiled for so long. Maybe she was looking out for some people swimming in the river. Who knows? Well, this is the end of my story. Up until I was around 10, my mom, sister, and dad and I lived in a house called Filder's Green, which was in Lanark, Cornwall. The house must have been around 50 years old and was originally two cottages joined together, meaning it was fairly big. To begin, the only things that would happen would be the odd cold spot, and often I felt like I was being watched. Another time, my mom went to use the downstairs bathroom, leaving my dad in the kitchen, when she heard a man cough loudly outside the door. Think he was my dad using the study, she shouted something, only to hear no reply. She left the bathroom. There was no one outside, or even in the study. When she went back to the kitchen, my dad was at the same place. She asked him if he had followed her to the bathroom, which incidentally wasn't near the kitchen, and he said he hadn't moved. There was no one else at the house at the time, apart from me and my sister and we were in bed. Another thing that happened was when my mom, my dad, and my dad's friend were sat in the kitchen late one night, when they suddenly heard an almighty crash from my bedroom upstairs. My mom said it sounded like a full-grown adult being thrown to the floor, thinking maybe my wardrobe had toppled over or had fallen out of bed. They ran upstairs and found me fast asleep, with nothing out of place. Later on, they even got someone to check the chimney in my room to see if a stone had fallen down it, but they found nothing. To this day, we don't know what the crash was, or indeed, who made it. The most unexplained incident, however, was the sound of a singing lady. 
My mom and dad were asleep in bed, and they were woken by a tuneless humming outside their bedroom door. There was no way it would have been me or my sister, as we were only young, and it was quite clearly the sound of a woman. The sound came along the corridor from my room and gradually disappeared downstairs. Another time, my mom, sister, and I were inside my mom and dad's bedroom, helping my mom fold up some laundry. My dad was outside mowing the lawn, and we could see him from the room. After we had finished, we went to open the bedroom door, which was shut. We couldn't get out. The door had no lock on it and wasn't jammed. There was no draft in the room, as it was an airless summer's day. It felt like someone was standing outside, holding onto the handle to prevent us from leaving. My mom, who was obviously stronger than me and my sister, tried the door too, but there was no lock. In the end, we had to shout outside to my dad to come and let us out. He opened the door easily, and there was no sign of it ever being stuck. We left that house when my parents separated, and I found out from someone that knew the current inhabitants that they too were experiencing strange things, such as their child's toys being turned and turned off during that night. My friends and I went to Cypress Valley Cemetery in Villanoa, Arkansas. We come to your site and have tried out some of the places and have gotten good responses. We parked our car out front and went into the gates around 3 in the morning. There were four of us, there were two guys, and then my best friends and I who are girls. The guys went in first and we followed them soon after. Immediately entering, we all had a very strange feeling come over us. My best friend and I decided to go back to the car and let the guys walk around and explore some more. We were alone in the car for nearly 20 minutes with the windows rolled down because we were smoking when we started hearing screams from the distance. They sounded like they were coming from a woman. We saw no one else there. Then a few minutes later, my best friend saw the outline of two men walking on one end of the cemetery. She assumed it was our guys, so she called their cells, which when they answered, the lights from the phone showed us that they were on the complete opposite end. There is no way that they could have made it over there that quick. When we finally decided to leave, they got in the car and we sat for a minute. We had the windows rolled down, but it was about 68 degrees outside, so it wasn't cold at all. We all felt as if the air conditioning was blasting on us, but there was no source of air. It was very strange. Strange things kept happening to us later the next day. We go ghost hunting almost every weekend and have been to many places and this one was by far the scariest place. It just felt very uneasy, very dark. Just thought I'd let you know. Here's one of my stories of paranormal activity. From being very young, my brother and I had always experienced things we knew were not normal, but of course, our grandparents, whom we had lived with since we can remember, brushed it off as childish imagination. As we were growing up, we saw less and less unusual happenings. It all began when I was 15 years old, my brother at the time was 17, and our grandfather passed away. My entire family reported seeing him the night after he passed away. Now, my family has its skeptics and its believers, and every one of them reported seeing him laughing and looking much younger and healthier than they'd ever remembered. He smiled at them all and said goodbye. Now, 
My brother and I had not seen this apparition, so we brushed it off as their subconscious, projecting an image they all wanted to see. Of course we were believers, but we thought if anyone would have seen him, it would have been us, for we had been there for him when nobody else had ever been. Well, our thoughts came to reality one night, around five months after his passing, and this supposed collective haunting. My brother and I were up in his room playing on the PC. My grandmother was out and my little sister in bed. Now my grandfather, or daddy, as was his nickname, always enjoyed his music and always had it on extremely loud. We were laughing at something on the internet when John Lennon, imagine, began playing very loudly downstairs. Well, at first, we thought it was a cruel joke by our neighbors. This particular song had been his first choice for his cremation. And so I, being the braver of us, stormed downstairs to find it was indeed coming from the office room that was my grandfather's. I walked into his old room to find it was freezing and there were no windows or doors open and the CD player was not on and the music was still going. That there was a knock on the back door. Usually our neighbors used our back door and the music stopped. My brother was now downstairs with me and we thought it must have been our neighbors there to complain and the noise so he unblocked and opened the door. Opposite the door was an outside toilet and as my brother opened the door he froze. His face paled and I could tell there was something wrong. I looked outside to see nothing, but incredibly shaken by the music, I slammed and locked the door, turned every light on in the house, bar my sisters as she was seemingly sound asleep, and sat downstairs waiting for my grandmother. To this day, my brother will not tell me what he saw outside, but I doubt it was the friendly spirit of my grandfather coming to say goodbye. The reason I believe this is because the morning after, my little sister said, Do you believe in ghosts? I didn't react and merely asked why. She then replied that the night before daddy had been in her room when she was crying about his passing, telling her the shush that everything was okay and he was happy. Also, my neighbors, who were really quick to complain, never mentioned any loud music coming from our house, so I really want to know why only us heard this music, and more importantly, who had been outside when my brother had opened the door. There is a two-story house right in the center of town that I lived in, in 1958 or 1959. It is known as the old Van Delzim house. Both my cousin and I experienced odd things in that house. There were many times that we would hear footsteps, such as a man wearing boots, walking from the upstairs front bedroom towards the back bedroom to the left of the stairs. My cousin also said that she saw an old apparition in the backyard. I went to see the psychic Carol Pete this week and showed her a picture of the house. She said she felt it was a soldier from the Civil War era. Also, she said that many horrible things happened on the property. No one ever died in the house, so it is connected with the land it sits on. We stayed there only about two or three months and moved to another location in the same town. I also found out that I am a psychic medium, have had many unexplained things happen through the years. This soldier is not threatening, he does not know he is dead, wish the house was mine so I could try to help him. All this has been burned in my memory for nearly 50 years. Hi, my name is David, I am a French student and I wanted to share some eerie things that happened to me and to some of my friends with you readers. 
My grandfather died last year. He was a total atheist and believed that supernatural is just some bullcrap and that people who got interested in it were pitiful fools. What's more, he was a convinced internationalist communist and often led some speeches against God and the church. I was the contrary of my grandfather, a conservative Christian loving God in fatherland so the situation often led to arguments between my grandfather and me as we were obviously on a different wavelength but it didn't matter. He was my grandfather, I was his grandson, he loved me and I loved him as well and we would often laugh together. Well. As a Christian believer, I believe and still believe in hell, and I feared that my grandfather would go there after his death because of his resolute anti-God feelings, so I said a lot of rosaries so that God would put him on the right way. One day, as I went back from the university, I got a phone call from my mother. She told me that my grandfather had been sent to the hospital in order to cure a little pain on the knee, but when the doctors started to inspect his general state of health, they found out that my grandfather had a generalized cancer and that is why he felt so tired. I got so upset hearing that, that I rushed to the church and put a candle to the Holy Virgin so that she would get the forgiveness to my godless, communist grandfather. I went to visit my grandfather in the hospital where he was sadly ending his life and I could notice no changes in his mind and moral and his calvary in the hospital bed lasted for months. Here is the moment when my story becomes interesting. In my prayers, I would always ask the Holy Virgin to save him and let me know by a sign that she had taken him to the right place, near the God and far from hell. It was an ordinary night. I was reading in my bed with my bed light and listening to the outside noises as usual and I closed my eyes to sleep afterwards. Oh God, I can never forget what I lived this night. It was about 5 a.m. because it happened just a moment before I woke up. I had a very powerful dream and it looked so real that it is still sculpted in my memory. I dreamt about a giant curtain of red velvet with a portrait of my grandfather hanging on it. I looked at this picture and my eyes looked leftwards and saw that the curtains were open like on a theater. Behind these velvet curtains, I could see the sky filled with orange clouds lit like on a wonderful sunset or dawn, I don't know, and suddenly I saw a boy kneeling in the darkness in front of the scene and I recognized myself. I can't figure out why, but I know that the boy in this dream kneeling was me in person. A short moment after, a young woman went out from behind the curtain from the lit side. She had a blue dress and a blue veil. Both were blue, one dark, the other clear. She looked like Raphael's holy virgin in the painting. I remember her peaceful face that made me feel peaceful and tranquil. The lady sat in front of the kneeling boy, me, and started talking to him. I would see the lady's lips moving, but no sounds coming from her mouth. But I distinctly remember her beautiful eyebrows. After talking, she showed me something behind her. It was a ladder, a beautiful multicolor ladder that went in the orange clouds. The ladder went through a hole in the clouds and this hole had incredibly powerful light coming right from it and it thrilled rays of light that was noisy like a storm, though not frightening at all, not at the contrary. My dream stopped with this vision of delight. I had forgotten the dream on the following morning and went downstairs for the coffee. My mother was standing in the kitchen and her eyes were painful. As I held my cup, she told me that my sister called from the hospital and that my grandfather passed away. 
I was waiting for this event with pain, but I got psychologically ready. Anyway, tears began to go out from my eyes, and I began to cry and go in the garden to think. And as I was walking through the trees in my garden, I suddenly remembered that strange dream of the night. And I was thinking that it was the sign I was waiting for, and that I beseeched the Blessed Virgin to send me. I was so grateful. I went to the church and told the Holy Virgin thank you. But I wasn't expecting such an intervention, but another prayer of mine had been made. However, if you're thinking that this story is going to be about light and positivity, you thought wrong. Because one day, a few days before the funeral, I was visited by a spirit with horns. That's right. I was lying in my bed asleep when the door slightly opened a little bit, and I was greeted by this creature, this horn figure. It was definitely a black mass, but it was just standing there as I was trying to regain consciousness in the middle of the night. It stared at me with its red glowing eyes. That's all I remember, the dark outline of this dark mass and the horns protruding out of its head. It was there for about 40 seconds, and I'll never forget the sight, and it just slowly disappeared. I have no idea what connection this is to my grandfather, or even if it means something, but it definitely rattled me to my core. I started to get a lot less sleep, and on days that I would get sleep, I would have these terrible nightmares of the same horned figure. In one of those dreams, the horned figure would be seen off into the distance with again those glowing red eyes, and there would be candles scattered about with the only source of light coming from the candles. They were all lined up row by row and in a line that eventually led to this horned figure. I remember waking up instantly after that dream and crying profusely. I yelled out to my grandfather. I said, please save me from these nightmares. I'm sick of these nightmares. Fast forward a few days after the funeral and the most spectacular thing happened, though it was a little unsettling, not even going to lie. And I feel like this was truly confirmation that God was answering my prayers. We have this massive full body mirror that rests in the living room. This is where I saw my grandfather in the mirror, standing right behind me. It happened so fast, and it disappeared so quickly, that I had to regain my composure and not freak myself out too much, because I knew deep down inside that my grandfather was here to tell me it was okay and that I shouldn't fear evil. Was it a possibility that I was so distraught over losing my grandfather that I thought I was losing my mind in the process and I was just imagining everything that I was seeing? I don't know. I can see why people would think that after this story, but what I do know is that I contacted my grandfather and maybe some unruly spirits, maybe deep below the surface, that we can't always reach. And it's really terrifying, but also comforting to know that my grandfather has my back, even in the afterlife. One early morning I had been sitting in my family room, reading the newspaper. It was a very quiet morning, and I was all alone. The sun was coming through a bedroom window off the family room and shining down the hallway. It was one of those extremely bright sunrises, the kind where you can see dust particles floating through the air. I glanced up as I was turning the newspaper page. I then saw in the sun rays the outline of what looked like a man. It had a light black to gray color. It had no details, just the outline of its body. It was about three feet off the floor, 
It had no legs from around the knees down. I could see the arms. It had no hands either. I just remember telling myself, wow, it's a ghost, and I took it all in. I told myself not to turn my head or blink. The ghost appeared to be looking into the bedroom. It turned its head slightly to the right. At that point, I had to blink. My eyes were drying out. When I did that, it was gone. I then got up and put my hands through the spot where it was. I guess I wanted to see if it would be cool or something, but it was the same temp. I just stood there in amazement of how cool that was. I also needed to add, it was no one's shadow, and it's hard to describe, but it was not a shadow. I could see the dust particles going through the figure, and the figure was in the middle of the hallway. It was three-dimensional. It actually looked like a hologram. I really love those rare ghost encounters. My parents bought a house in Newborn, North Carolina in 1970. It was a brand new home in a new neighborhood. I lived in this house with my parents and younger sister until I went to college in 1994. The house was a three bedroom, two full bath ranch with a carport. Before I was born, my father enclosed the carport and turned it into a large den. The original steps, carport door frame, and window frame remained and led up into our kitchen. It was an interesting layout because you could look through the open window frame from the kitchen and see into the sunken den or vice versa. The bedrooms were on a long hallway at the back of the house. The hallway could be reached by two doorways, the kitchen and living room, actually one big circle. The first bedroom in the hall faced the street. The bathroom was next, another bedroom, and then my parents' bedroom at the end of the hall. The room next to my parents' room was mine until my little sister was born. I was five years old. I was moved down to the first bedroom. This room gave me the creeps. The closet door would slide open a bit on its own which my parents said was probably a draft from the heat or air conditioning. However, after someone broke into my bedroom window while I slept and stole a few things from my room, I never stayed in there again, usually sneaking into my little sister's room and sleeping with her or sleeping on my parents' bedroom floor. I constantly slept with the bathroom light on and a bright nightlight or lamp. I would wake up in the middle of the night and hear odd noises that made me feel paralyzed and cold all over. One would think these irrational fears would subside with age, but they seemed to intensify over the years. One reoccurring incident that still bugs me occurred in the kitchen, den area. Whenever I would be sitting on the couch watching TV, I would see the silhouette of a person walk by the window frame from the old carport. I would assume it was my mom or dad because the shape was tall. What would scare me to death was the fact that no one would appear at the door leading to the steps after I would see the shape walk by. Many times I would call out to my parents thinking it was one of them, but no one would answer and that I would walk up the steps and look into the kitchen. There was never anyone there. Most times, this would happen when I was home alone. On numerous occasions, my parents would come home to find me sitting on the front porch steps or sitting in my car with the doors locked. This went on for years and I was very excited when I moved out to go to college. Years later, I went to visit my little sister and stayed with her in her college dorm room. We were telling ghost stories with some of her friends when I told her my accounts of the shadow. I was in mid-sentence when my sister finished my thought 
and described the incident in perfect detail. I had never told my sister about this because she was much younger and I didn't want to scare her. Needless to say, we were both shocked and had goosebumps. We compared stories and it seems we had very similar experiences in that house. My parents eventually built a new house about 10 miles away and sold that house. I wonder to this day if the new owners have ever experienced any of the oddities that my sister and I did. I'm 28 years old now. The paranormal has always interested me, but only recently have I started to research it. I've come to believe now that some things I've experienced as a child were probably more than nightmares. I believe my encounters were that of the paranormal, edited with a touch of child's imagination. Contrary to what you might believe, I think my touch of a child's imagination is what scared me the most. I decided to share with you those experiences that could be considered nightmares for your entertainment, but also those that I truly believe are paranormal. At the age of five to seven, I can't recall for sure. One night, I was lying in my bed, asleep. I felt something moving at the bottom of my bed, and the next thing you know, I felt like I was being dragged out of my bed. My covers had tightly wrapped themselves around my legs, so tight that I couldn't move them. I yelled, my bed is eating me, help, mommy, daddy, help. By the time it stopped and parents got into the room, half my body was hanging off the side of my bed while the other half was hanging on for dear life. You know what my parents' response was? That's what happens when you don't fix your bed every day. Your bed eats you. No, really, I still never fixed my bed after that. I disproved that theory fast. It never happened again. I look back now and realize that whatever it was in that house had a weird and somewhat morbid sense of humor. Check it out. Several other times, I would wake up from a rather deep sleep, turn over, and open my eyes as if something told me, wake up Steph. Sure enough, I would open my eyes and one of two things would be sleeping next to me. A. Bo Duke. He was like a hero to me at the time. Or B. An orange mummified witch with a cone-shaped hat and empty eye sockets. Now, you would think waking up next to Bo Duke saying hi Steph would be cool as all heck. But no, I would freak out, jump so high I would fall off my bed, and thump, and run to my mom's room screaming, Bo Duke is in my bed, help. It was way more dramatic when I saw the witch. Now, here is what really makes me think it was actually a spirit playing games with me. As I got older, about 10 years old I would say, the occurrences were not so graphical. I would still hear a voice say, wake up, Steph. I would open my eyes and see a pitch black silhouette of a man standing in the far corner of my room, about six feet tall. I would blink my eyes a few times. He was still there. I would pull the cover over my head and then peep out. He was still there. Of course, I then freaked out and ran to mommy's room screaming, the boogeyman is here to get me, help mommy, the boogeyman is here. This would happen several times a month, for a good year or so it seemed. The last occurrence was years later, when what believed to be the same silhouette mentioned above ran across my room. First, I saw a blur run down the hall to my left and stop at the middle of the wall near the footboard of my bed. It took a moment for it to take shape, but it was definitely the silhouette of a human. I started to dart, and the moment I moved, 
It darted towards the other wall and vanished. I freaked out and flew to my dad and told him that there was someone in my room. Years later, when I was old enough to understand, my dad told me of the ghost of an old lady that dwelled in the house. She was a nice, but sometimes grumpy old gal. However, that doesn't explain the man that was in my room. I still can't figure out if the Beau Duke, which thing was truly a nightmare, or a spirit messing with my head, using the touch of a child's imagination. I've been to Gibbs Bridge twice, and we have seen something every time. The first time the signs kept changing, there would be a lot of writing on the signs, or not every time we came around. I looked back and thought that someone was messing around with us, and I saw a figure standing alongside of the road, ran by the guardrail, and disappeared. Then. I kept seeing something black out of the corner of my eye. My cousin was with me, and she started the scream, and me and her both heard moaning over her screaming. Then, it was me and my sister and her friend. The sides again kept changing, but only a few, not at all like last time. We took pictures, and got orbs. Then, we saw a figure again by the sign, and disappeared. We went all the way down the street and turned around and saw big bright light. I told my sister it was probably a car, so flash your lights to let them know that you are coming. She did that, and the light was gone. It kind of looked like a motorcycle light with handlebars. I know the whole story about it. Then we turned around again and saw it again. It was not the street light at all, because we turned around going back to the bridge about 10 to 15 times, and only showed up about 3 times. The weirdest part of that night was we left, and my sister's phone was in the center council. Nobody was touching it. Somebody that we know called us, and wondered why we called. Nobody did it. It was in the center council the whole time. My sister looked down and saw her phone hanging up, and they said we left a message. It was all three of us talking, and it was muffled. Tell me what you think, and go out there some time again. Thanks for reading my story. Back in the early 90s, a wealthy family who lived in Corona owned two homes. One large home they owned was on the south side of Corona, overlooking the 15 freeway. The other home, used later as an office, was the old in-town district on Corona's famous Grand Avenue. As the story goes, before the husband and wife met and got married, the husband lived in the large house on Grand Avenue. The house once been a funeral parlor, and almost nightly, the husband would hear talking and other noise coming from the room next to him. He would check the room, only to find it silent and nothing out of place. After he met his wife, they purchased the large house on the south side and turned the Grand Avenue mansion into an office. One of the children of the family went to my school, and he claimed that their family had experienced all kinds of strange phenomena in the old mansion. One instance, a soda can was completely knocked off of a nightstand, right next to a bed that he was sleeping on, and constantly, they would hear footsteps upstairs. And the mother once said she was in the bathroom, and the door suddenly flew open. All of the windows were closed, eliminating any chance of a drift. Another night, the family drove past a mansion as they often would, to make sure it was secure. Remember, nobody lived there at this time. It was only used as an office. As they drove past the house, they noticed every single light in the house was turned on. They went in, turned out the lights, 
and left. They checked with everyone who had a key to the house, and everyone assured them they had not turned on the lights. It is claimed that the atmospheric pressure in the backyard is different from the rest of the area. These stories were all interesting to me, but I still had some skepticism. Until, one year, the family was going to go on vacation to visit relatives in Texas, and they asked my mother and me if we would watch the mansion for them while they were gone. Keep in mind, neither my mother nor I knew anything about the house, including the strange phenomena. So Monday morning, we got to the house and settled in. My mother, a school teacher at the time, was grading some homework assignments, and I, only about five at the time, was fast asleep on the couch. My mother got thirsty, so she stacked the homework assignments in a pile, went to the kitchen for some water, came back, only to find the paper strewn all over the table and on the floor. I was still fast asleep, and there were no open windows. Later on that day, she was in the kitchen again, and she heard me crying in the other room. She ran in to see what was wrong, but again, I was fast asleep. I did not appear to be restless, as if crying in my sleep. Later on that week, we both occasionally would hear footsteps walking around upstairs. It is a very old house, as you can see from the attached photo, so naturally, the floors are very creaky. These were definitely solid footsteps. We constantly went upstairs after hearing the steps, only to find the place empty. After the family returned from their vacation, my mother had mentioned to them the phenomena we experienced. They laughed and explained to us that it happens all of the time. They described the entity as a friendly ghost who likes to play pranks on people, hence the bathroom door flying open. The family eventually moved to Texas and sold the mansion to somebody else. I never return to ask the new owners if they have experienced anything. Perhaps somebody around this area might want to. My name is Prenta. I lived in Hamtramck, a suburb of Detroit, Michigan, in a two-story flat on Crailing Street. The apartment itself has a long and bloodied history of violence and death. Not only did I experience multiple ghostly apparitions, such as a man in a long beard that resembled Abraham Lincoln, but demonic possession, as well as poltergeist activity. The demonic possession was incredibly startling. It wasn't something that occurred inexplicably. I had a boyfriend who was connected to negative energies, and an evil spirit named Harold latched onto him. My boyfriend had never been once an aggressive or temperamental person. However, after staying together in that apartment for a lengthy period of time, our relationship began to sour. He would often talk in his sleep, which was something he had never done in seven years previous, and we had lived together for a long time. One night, he was sleeping right next to me. For some reason, I remember I had a difficult time trying to rest, so I was tossing and turning in bed. My boyfriend was dead asleep. Not a second later, he starts whispering. He keeps repeating, Harold's here. Harold wants to play. Although it scared me half to death, what he said after that truly shook me to my core. He uttered some unnerving words, something about how he was going to take care of my suffering soul. At that point, I couldn't take it anymore, and I woke my boyfriend up. He was in a pure state of delirium. I told him he was talking in his sleep, and when I told him what he said, he looked at me as if you were terrified. That's because he said he had a dream about a man named Harold. My boyfriend told me that in his dream, 
He was in the mafia, and Harold was his mob boss. He wore a pure white suit and looked like a traditional mobster from the 1920s. Well, a couple days later, I was cleaning my apartment when I discovered a secret room that I never noticed before. It was basically a walk-in closet. The room was empty except for a small cabinet with a drawer. I opened the drawer and in it was an old newspaper from the 1930s. I kid you not, in this newspaper was an obituary about a man named Harold. The obituary didn't say he was part of the mafia, but he was a World War I veteran. I believe that Harold used to live in this apartment. My boyfriend told me that Harold appeared once while he was in the shower, and I was away at work. I often worked the night shift at a hospital, so I'm often away at night. He heard a crash coming from the kitchen that startled him. When he went to investigate, the dishes that were on the countertop somehow fell to the floor. He then returned to the bathroom to brush his teeth. When he saw the face of a young man staring back at him in the mirror for a second, right behind him, it was so quick, but long enough to notice. He then had an idea to photograph the bathroom, a picture directly facing the mirror, and then the bathroom itself while standing from the door frame. What he saw was incredible. It was an orb, clear as day, appearing right in the mirror. Either way, I was convinced that later on, my boyfriend was possessed by Harold. He became a shell of his former, laid-back and friendly self. He transformed into a vicious, aggressive, and easily agitated person. We eventually had to have a priest come over to bless the apartment and to perform a prayer on my boyfriend to release the spirit who could be inside of him. After we moved out of the house, the feeling of intense rage and negative energy seemed to subside almost entirely. He stopped talking in his sleep, he was more easygoing, and he started to become the man I fell in love with years ago. Still, there was one experience that I had while in that apartment that I'll never forget as long as I live. It was the evening and I was starting to settle down on my first night off from the hospital in days. I walked to my bedroom to change. In the bedroom, there is this huge mirror that I often use. As I was walking through the bedroom, I was looking at myself in the mirror. That's when I saw a woman dressed all in black with a scarf. It must have been some kind of babushka woman. I instantly closed my eyes out of pure fright. And as I opened them back up again, I returned to look back at the mirror, only to see that this woman had disappeared. I only saw myself. All of these events are 100% true. I know sometimes when people tell these types of stories, they are often met with a high degree of skepticism. I should mention though, that I have high integrity, and I think it is foolish to tell pointless lies just for attention, or to have a good story. The possession, Harold, the poltergeist activity, and the babushka woman were all signs that something awful wouldn't leave that apartment. At this point, I'm just thankful that I don't have to experience that ever again, and that my boyfriend isn't being used as a vehicle for paranormal entities. I would say this is a story of a haunted house, but it isn't. Until about 10 years ago, it was just a haunted house in my book. I met my husband over 30 years ago. He told me about a house that he used to live in that had some very strange things happening in it. It was local, but he never wanted to go anywhere near it. He said that it was very old and had been built by a young person had some of the wood and granite that made the fireplace sent from Ireland. Anyway, the story is that when he married his wife, 
she came with her mother, a real shrew. She harped at him and distressed his wife to the point where he went mad and killed them both, then ran screaming that the demons of the house had made him do it. My husband's family moved into the house in the early 60s. During the years they lived there, they heard doors closing and footsteps on the stairs, as well as the smell of coffee and frying bacon in the middle of the night. His mother was quite a gardener, but could never get flowers to grow in the yard. He said the whole family was quite uncomfortable in the home and eventually moved. We had been together for a few years when we heard that the property had been sold for a mini storage lot. We were talking about it with my sister and some friends when my husband told the story. The friends asked to see the house. I'd never seen it to this point and I'll admit was more than a little bit curious. We finally talked him into going and away we went. When we turned onto the street, we got a really creepy feeling, but when we pulled up to the house, I was absolutely terrified. There was not a living blade of grass or anything else on that lot. We live in Washington State, and this was March. The house was dark and very ominous. I refused to get out of the car, so did my sister. The guys, three of them including my husband, took a flashlight and headed around to the back of the house to see what they could see. After a few minutes, we saw a flash of light on the second floor. A few minutes later, we saw the front door open, but nobody came out. After a few minutes more, they returned to the car. We commented on the fact that we had seen the light and they told us that they had never turned it on. Then we asked them why they didn't come out the front door. They told us it was locked and that they tried it before going around back. I was always skeptical about the stories connected with the house, but after they tore the house down, the mini storage was plagued by problems and eventually went out of business. The property sits abandoned and barren. Still nothing lives there and it's still as creepy as it was years ago. I've got a story to add to your website. I've gone back and forth about someone having come check it out. Just not sure I'm ready for it. But here goes my story. My husband and I moved into a new house built in a minor Civil War battlefield. We know there was another house in the vicinity. There was also a tree that was referred to as the hanging tree, not far from our backyard, on which about Union soldiers were hung. Soon after moving in, we noticed odd shadows and white lights that seemed to move across rooms with no apparent source. We tried to account for them by cars passing on the road, but never could pinpoint anything. One evening, we were watching TV when a shape ran past a door to what eventually would be our deck. The door was a good four feet off the ground, but the person running past ran level with the door itself. My husband and I ran for the door, flung it open, and my husband jumped down and ran in the same direction. At that time, we were the only house on the end of the street, and... Being a very small town, it's very quiet at night, and sounds carry for quite a distance. We didn't hear anyone running, nor did we see anyone. We were spooked, but figured it was a kid, and our eyes played tricks on us. Not long after that, my husband jumped off the couch and ran for the door again, because he said someone was standing there looking in. Again level with the door, and no deck. There was no one we could see when we went outside. Some months later, I was up around midnight, cleaning the kitchen. My husband had gone to bed and shut the bedroom door. The bedroom was at the top of the steps, and the door in plain sight. 
I was watching TV across the great room when I saw the corner of my eye, a man leaning around the corner of the hallway wall and smiling at me. As I turned my head, I was ready to yell at my husband for sneaking up on me when I realized the man's hair was long and blondish and my husband's is dark brown and short. I also realized the man was wearing a white t-shirt with full sleeves, nothing my husband owned. I couldn't see anything from the waist down. While I stood there staring, he simply vanished. I immediately ran to the hall and noticed that the bedroom door was still shut and if anyone had gone out the front door, I would have heard it. There was nothing, no sign of anyone. When my husband got up for work, I told him what happened. He said it was my imagination. I didn't think so, but we left it at that. However, I started turning on the lights when he left the house for work, since he left at 3 a.m. A few weeks later, though, my husband was in the front room at the computer. To the left is a table with an antique mirror hanging over it. My husband saw movement in the mirror and turned thinking it was one of our cats on the table. Instead, he saw a man's shoulder and arm wearing a white shirt walk past in the mirror. My husband simply got up and walked outside until I got home. During this time, my son, who knows no fear, would never stay downstairs at night by himself. He said he was creeped out, like someone was watching him from outside the door. My daughter, a typical teenager at the time who kept to her room, would often come downstairs to hug me and sit close to me. When I'd ask her if something was wrong, she told me that sometimes she felt someone was sitting on her bed and that she saw things move out of the corner of her eye. The strange thing is that my husband and I never told the kids what we saw until they were 18 and 19. There was a time when activity seemed to stop after my husband, getting the idea from my friends, stood in the center of the house and asked whoever was there to not show themselves to him. He was left alone after that. However, recently, we've been experiencing marital problems and my husband moved into another bedroom. I'm now hearing footsteps in my room and I'm constantly woken up by what feels like someone sitting on my bed. I'll roll over, but there won't be anyone there. One night was unusually bad and I had to get up earlier than normal the next day for a class. Around 10 p.m., I said out loud that I needed the sleep, and he wasn't letting me. If he wanted to bother someone, to please go harass my husband. Strangely enough, it got quiet, and I fell asleep, only to be woken at 11 p.m. by my husband, who was in the bathroom, frantically looking for someone to stop an area on his leg from hurting. He has psoriasis, but this particular time, he said it felt like someone was poking him with needles. The area was deep red and gave off heat. A very odd coincidence to say the least. We've also had things go missing. A tablecloth, a 15th century style costume, and various little things that turn up in different areas. We have yet to track down the tablecloth or the costume. I did tell the ghost not to hurt my husband. My uncle and aunt now live in a house near the bank in Auburn town. When I was a little girl, my best friend Stephen and his family lived there. They bought the house and were told that the previous owner, an elderly lady, still haunted the house. They put little faith in the story and never let it bother them. I remember playing in Stephen's room and smelling an old lady smell, like medicine and lilyic perfume. 
we never felt threatened by a presence at all. The smell would usually fade away just as quickly as we smelled it. However, one night, after the family had gone to bed, Stephen's mother was awakened by the sound of toys making noise in Stephen's room. Stephen had one problem. He was highly susceptible to nosebleeds. The slightest bump would set off a massive flow of blood. Stephen's mother thought it was strange that he was awake and playing with so many noisy toys at once in the middle of the night. Also, the rocking chair in his room where she would often read him bedtime stories was rocking so hard that it was banging against the wall. She ran down the hall to his room, and when she opened the door, the toys went silent. The rocking chair slowed down. She looked at Stephen in his bed and saw that his nose was bleeding very badly, and it was going down his throat. He might have drowned in his own blood if the very sweet lady's ghost had not raised such a racket that night. My grandmother Emily was a hard-working wife and mother, and during the Great Depression, she held her family together, even when her husband, Grandma William, died suddenly. He left her widowed with several children to raise. She was a down-to-earth person and a practicing Catholic, so was not given to superstitions, but nevertheless had some encounters with the otherworldly. One time, for example, she was on her way to visit one of her brothers, an elevator repairman. On the way there, getting off the train, she had a sudden premonition of his death. She got a hold of herself and rushed to where she was supposed to meet him. It didn't take long for her to arrive at his workplace, an elevator station, where he had to do a repair job. She saw a noisy crowd assembled there, and she inquired, what was happening? She was told that her repairman had been killed in an accident. It was her brother, the very one whom she had gone to meet and about whom she recently had a deathly premonition about. I explained this as a prelude to her ghost story. Among her other siblings, she had a brother who was a decent man and a barber by profession. Unfortunately, they had a disagreement which escalated into a parting of ways. He uncharitably held a grudge against her all the while. Time passed, and one night, while she was asleep and her husband were asleep in bed, she was suddenly awakened out of a sound sleep and noticed a person kneeling near the side of the bed. It was her estranged brother, garbed in his brother's smock and weeping bitterly. He was apparently suffering. She was startled and confused and didn't know how he got in her house and bedroom in the middle of the night and why he suddenly showed up after choosing to cut himself off because of a silly grudge against her. She began to speak to him and ask him what was wrong, but he interrupted his sobs to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And with that, he completely vanished. She was amazed and woke up her husband, relaying to him what had just occurred. As they lay there discussing it, the telephone rang. Her husband answered, and it was for her. When she got on the phone, she was informed that sadly, there had been a death in the family that very night. It was her estranged brother, the barber. They understood this ethereal visit from beyond the grave to be the soul of the departed brother, and that he was given the grace to appear from his purgatory to his sister in order to make up for his uncharitable bearing of a grudge. A requiem mass was offered for him, and they prayed for his soul. He never appeared again. I come from a long line of psychics, and I must have been about seven when during an afternoon nap, I woke up after a very frightening dream. At the time, we were living in Mount Butler in Hong Kong Island, 
and mom's family lived in Capiz in the Philippines. I ran out of my bedroom and room full of family and friends to tell my mom about it. I saw this Filipino man in a wooden box, dressed in a cream shirt and brown trousers, and lots of her family were around him crying. As a young child, I'd never seen a dead person before, and was distraught at the experience. My family consoled me and told me not to worry, but it brought to their attention that I too had the gift. It was only a few years later that I was told that the person I saw was my uncle, who had been shot by the local militia in my mom's village in the Philippines. And it surmises that the clothes I saw him in were the clothes he was buried in. So it turns out that I had a psychic snapshot of the actual Filipino funeral rites, whereby the body is kept in the family house for a period of weeks so grieving people can pay their respects to him. This brother of my mom's, she had been having prophetic dreams around the time, warning him to leave town because something bad was going to happen to him. He didn't believe her and was shot by the local militia after a dispute. It is Filipino superstition that during this period that the body was stored in the family house, the spirit visits the family on the third, fifth, and seventh day after their death. This, as it turns out, was during this time that we both had these visitations. Mom was in the kitchen washing dishes when she heard who she thought was daddy coming back from work. That's when she saw a man from the corner of her eye, standing in the doorway, wearing a light shirt and brown trousers. So she chatted to Daddy for about five minutes about his day and what he had been up to, when it occurred to her that he didn't answer her back once. She turned around to ask him a question, and then she realized that there was no one in the doorway at all. It was at this point she was a little bit spooked, as she remembered my description of Uncle Fred in his coffin, and hurriedly went to check on Daddy. He had come in when she had heard him come in, but had just fallen asleep on the bed, fully clothed, in knit-wearing brown trousers, and a white shirt. So it was her brother's way of saying goodbye, and I guess to say sorry for not having listened to her when she warned him. A few years later, it was 1987, around about the time that Edward Yule, Hong Kong's governor at the time, passed away. We were still living in the same flat in Mount Butler, but my sister and I had moved from the room we were in, as that had been converted into mom's nursery where she looked after preschool children during the daytime. We were now in the room where I would have my bedroom until we moved over to the new territories. I must have been about nine, so my sister would have been four. We shared a bunk bed, and her being smaller stayed on the lower bunk. I awoke to pitch black, and the sound of flip-flops walking up and down our corridor I thought, this is strange, as it is custom to remove your shoes at the front door and to wear slippers around the house. As I heard these flip-flops getting closer and closer to my door, sheer terror took over. I whispered to my sister, Chris, can you hear that? No one answered back, so I was trapped on the top bunk with nowhere to go with this noise coming closer and closer. I hid my head under my blanket, like most kids do, wishing it to go away. I said this time, more incessantly, Chris, can you hear that? And something hissed back at me, yes. That did not sound like my sister at all. At this point, I was terrified. 
I tried to gather all my strength to get out of the bed, but I was too scared. After what felt like a millennia, I eventually gathered enough courage to jump off the top of my bed, ensuring by no means that I touched the lower bunk and charged into my parents' room across the corridor from our room. I was so embarrassed being so old and being scared, I didn't actually get into their bed, but spent the rest of the night curled up in a ball at the foot of their bed. It turns out that my sister wasn't in our room at all that night. My question was, what was that in the corridor and in the bunk bed with me? The strange pink light. Around this time of the strange occurrences with the flip-flops, we were still living in flats in Mount Butler. My daddy, a complete atheist, had an experience of his own. Daddy does not believe in the supernatural, and if God actually spoke to him, he still wouldn't believe it. He was lying in bed one night, when he woke up for no reason to this pink sphere to appear on the wall opposite their bed. It seemed to come out of the wall and sit there and go back into the wall again. He was puzzled by this and went to investigate. He checked out where the possible light source could be coming from, the curtains. No, we were on third floor, so it could have been vehicle lights. He went into the bathroom, all lights were off, and couldn't have come from there either. He got back into bed and tried to wake mom up to show her. She was having none of it and kept her head under the sheets. Well, the sphere appeared again and came out of the wall, suspended somehow, then sunk back in and disappeared. He never did figure out what that was or where it came from. Running Ghost When he was working in the Royal Hong Kong Police, he had another experience. At this point, he was the superintendent and managed a section of the traffic police. They were doing their rounds when a speed camera on the road flashed for no reason. They went to investigate, and it flashed again, with no cars in the near vicinity. They thought nothing more of it, until the pictures were developed. And on one of the photos, there is a distinct picture of a person, blurred apparently running very fast. So fast, it set off a speed camera. The Ghost Dog When we were living in Mount Butler, I had one other experience that reaffirmed my belief in the supernatural, and two other people I was with experienced it also. I must have been about 14, when my sister and my best friend at the time decided to go for a walk in the countryside. So where we lived was surrounded by Hong Kong countryside, which was perfect for me as I was a tomboy and spent as much of my time as possible out and about exploring and climbing trees. Just before I started university in the UK, I was visiting some friends in Cardiff. I was feeling very odd that night, and as we are heading out into town, a premonition hit me. I turned around to my friend and said, Something very big is going to happen tonight. He just looked at me like I was stark raving mad, so I dropped it. So when we went out and had a lark and came back, thinking nothing more of it, imagine our surprise when we woke up in the morning and splashed all over the news was coverage on Diana's death. This, of course, being the famous... Princess Diana of Wales, who died tragically in a car accident, but I predicted it the day before. At least I feel like I did. Could be a coincidence, 
but I don't think so. Oodle extra cemetery experience. So, I started uni in Derby in the Midlands, and where I was living was student digs on Ulexer New Road. I was heavily into my goth influence back then. Not so much now, but I still love old cemeteries and dramatic clothing. There was this beautiful one on our road that I used to visit regularly and read and draw with many beautiful statues and old, old gravestones. One day, my ex-boyfriend and I went to visit it as it was a lovely day turning to evening. So I wandered around looking at all the gravestones and the statues, trying to find the oldest tombstone we could find. It must have been coming up to winter time as the sun set quickly, and we realized in a panic that the gate had been closed so we were locked in and had to find another way out. So we walked along the perimeter looking for a likely tree to help us over the wall when the sun just disappeared and we were pitched into almost complete darkness. Then, for no reason at all, the mist appeared over the headstones so it was hard to avoid the graves themselves. So it suddenly looked just like a horror movie set, trying to avoid broken tombstones and holes in graves and that dang mist in the dark. By this point, I was pretty panicked, frantically trying to get out with this feeling of overwhelming dread descending over me and all cells in my body telling me to leave right now. We eventually scrambled over a wall into the student bar, and that feeling just lifted, just like that. It's only a few months ago that I was looking online about Ghost and Derby, that I found out that the very cemetery is haunted. Brilliant. My dreams. I thought that was the end of my experiences, but looking at the dream section, I've remembered some more I want to share with you. I've always had very vivid dreams, some not necessarily all coming true, but all seem to have symbolic importance in the coming days, weeks, or even sometimes years. I more often than not have deja vu experiences, even if I haven't ever A, done this before, or B, seen places or people before, or see, really ever thought about these things when I am conscious. I haven't really wanted to tell people about them, as most people, I worry that most people think I'm quite mad. Haunted house. So this also happened just before I finished university in Derby, I think. It was just before my ex-boyfriend and I broke up. The importance of this dream is one that I've been able to break it down and understand it in its composite parts. So both of us were walking around this dark woods, and I was taking all that I had learned from watching horror movies into mind, and was very careful of not wandering off on my own, made sure I had a weapon in hand in case anything happened. We eventually came to this clearing where this ominous house stood at the end of this garden. However, I needed the bathroom, and even though we knew it was a haunted house, I was not one of those people who would go to the loo in a haunted forest. So we walked in, and there were people there. Thankfully, none looking like psychopaths or zombies. Strangely enough, they were people we knew too. There was a feeling of dreaded sadness throughout the house, though, and refused to go anywhere by myself. We are directed to the bathroom, which was at the end of this corridor. He decided to sit and chat with people whilst I did my business. So, I started walking, but the corridor was like the one from the poltergeist. It just kept getting further and further away. 
until I had to break into a run, desperately needing to go and leave this house as soon as possible. I eventually made it and threw the door open and did what I needed to do. Then I woke up and realized that I still needed to go, so I ran for the loo. Luckily, I had the foresight to write this dream down once I had gotten back to bed and knew that we were doomed. The haunted house was a reflection of our relationship, being hounded by our mutual bad doings, and that the end was near. It was just a matter of time, and so it was. Finally, before I finish another of my epic storytelling sessions, I have one more prophetic experience to share with you, but not one from my dreams. It has to do with my pet dog, Sophie. Her name was Sophie. She was lovely, with her white and black patch over her eye and black patch in her back. She was only six months older than me and had been with her family for 16 years. She was the loveliest, sweetest dog in the world, apart from having a penchant for biting socks, eating tissues and rubber bands, and attacking the hoover. She was suffering from basically her insides giving in. She had serious kidney problems, and she couldn't walk very well because of arthritis in her back legs. And because she couldn't help herself anymore, she was kept outside. So one evening, when her parents were out, my sister and I were playing with her in the garden, and I had this weird feeling come over me. I seemed to be able to predict death, unfortunately, amongst other things. I turned to my sister. When I saw the shadow fall on her Sophie, that looked like a cross. It was like it was a sign saying she was going to die tomorrow. So that's what I told my sister, and she kind of brushed it off. She didn't believe me, being much younger than me. But sure enough, after a hard day at school, I was only 14 or so at the time, we came back, and our parents were in pieces. And that's when I knew it had happened. They had to take her down to the vet and have her put down, as it was too cruel to keep her suffering like that. I've never seen my daddy in pieces like that, but because I was strengthened by my foreknowledge, I supported him in his time of need. My poor cat was distraught, as she basically brought him up from when we adopted him as a very small kitten. On a happier note, I had a dream after this terrible day. I was watching my crazy dog run from the front of the house, in and up the stairs with much zest and energy like she would have had as a younger dog, running up to our level of the house, looking like she was having the time of her life, back and forth, giving little yips of happiness, grinning in her quintessentially silly Sophie way. As because of her health problems and her incontinence, she was not allowed in except for very cold weather. I think this was her way of saying that she was free and happy at last, and I knew she was in peace. She still does come and visit us occasionally, and when we walk by the front of the house, and you can, still after all these years, smell her and we know she's still looking out for us. I keep meaning to write a dream diary. I'll do that this year, as these dreams seem to be too important to miss. My husband and myself and my brother were all watching our mother's house while she was out of town on vacation. We had been there for a few days, and all happened to be on this particular evening and night. Well, we had finished dinner, and we were all just hanging out in the living room watching TV. My brother said he was just going to sleep on the couch, and my husband and I said goodnight 
and went to bed in my mother's bedroom because that's where we had been sleeping. We kissed goodnight like usual and turned off the bedside lamp. I myself just can't close my eyes and go right off to sleep. So I was just laying there, looking off into the darkness and trying to wind down. Suddenly, I noticed a very, I mean very dark black mass right by the bedroom door. I blinked my eyes a few times, trying to make them adjust to the dark better, but realized they already had because I could make out the mass that was so much darker than the dark. I began to feel afraid when I saw it moving. I laid there and watched it approach the bed over our bodies. It looked larger than it had by the door. I began to nudge my husband but I decided to lay there a little bit longer to see if it continued to move or even get larger. I laid there and marveled at its darkness and its extremely dark color as opposed to regular darkness. It was pitch black and just floated there above us. Unbelievably, I fell asleep. The next day at lunch, my brother said, hey, last night I saw the weirdest thing when I was trying to fall asleep. A large black mass was hovering above my head and scared me half to death. I stuck my hand in it and it was freezing cold. Before I had a chance to speak, my husband said, me too. I thought I was seeing things. I spoke up and I said I saw it as well and was frightened by it. They both said, wow, I wonder what it was. I had read somewhere that these could possibly be evil. Needless to say, we didn't spend the night there again. I'm a nurse and run our family's assisted living and recently, we had some strange things happen in our care home. I understand with caring for the elderly that sometimes strange things occur in doing this for almost a decade. Recently, I had a resident that started to decline at the age of 93. One night, after helping her get into bed, she asked me if Bernie, her husband, who died 10 years before, knew where she was. I reassured her that he did. It caught me off guard since her mind was intact and she was not forgetful. A week went by and again I assisted the woman into bed. She says to me, I hear Bernie in the hallway. Can you tell him that I'm in here? I told her the to call for him and he would come in. She refused and asked me to. So, I went out to the empty hallway and said, Bernie, he is in here if you would like to visit with her. As a nurse, sometimes you do things out of the better judgment for yourself, as long as it helps your patient. Later that night, I heard the elderly lady talking to no one quietly. I've had some odd things happen in my personal life through the years since childhood, but that is another story. I was once told by an elder Japanese woman not to talk to the dead or invite them into my home. Another week goes by and my resident took a drastic turn for the worst by refusing to eat or drinking fluids. After a week's stay in the hospital, she returned on comfort cares in hospice. The end was near and we knew it. However. While she was in the hospital, I received a frantic call from one of her nursing assistants asking if I would please come back to work because she was really scared. When I got to work, all the lights in the house were on and she was sitting on the couch with her back up against the wall. When I asked what was wrong, she told me wide-eyed and pale that she had seen a mist down at the end of the hallway and was hearing weird popping noises 
coming from the residence room that was in the hospital. After checking the entire house and silently saying the Lord's Prayer, the house felt calm. He spent her last days being pampered and showed care and compassion from staff and family. Many of the staff came in on our days off to sit with her, including myself. The last couple days of her life she was sedated for pain and hallucinations. When no one was in her room and she didn't know we were checking in on her, she was reaching up towards the ceiling and mumbling. The day before she died, we had XM music playing on our TV. A couple of the nursing assistants were performing for their evening cares. When the TV changed to CNN for 30 seconds and turned back to the music by itself, the TV remote was on top of the TV. Since our favorite lady passed away, things have stopped for the most part. My mother passed away June 5th. 2007. Me and my husband were in New Jersey at the time, waiting to get unloaded. We drove an 18 wheeler for a living. My sister had called me the day before and told me that my mom was in a coma and the home health care people said she only had about 24 hours to live and that I needed to come home. So I called our dispatcher and said we needed to be routed back to the Chattanooga terminal so that I could see my mom before she passed. He said no problem. After you and your husband have put tires on, go pick up that load and head for Chattanooga. Well, while they were putting tires on our trailer, we decided to get some sleep. The cell phone rang and it was my sister. She told me that mom had come out of it. It was sitting up and laughing and talking to everybody and that she was okay. So I called my dispatcher and said, we don't have to go home. We can do one more load out here. So it was late that night when they finally got the tires on the trailer and we decided to just stay there in the parking lot till morning so we could get some much needed sleep. We get up that morning and pull out. As we're heading down the highway, my cell rings and it's my sister. She's crying. She tells me that mom passed away that morning early. So to make it a little shorter, our dispatcher gets us home 36 hours later. Now at this time, we are at my mother's house and she has already been picked up by the funeral home before we got there. Later that day, my husband's cell phone rings while we are nowhere near it to answer it. So when we do pick it up to see if our dispatcher is called, it shows we have one voicemail and no number. So my husband listens to the voicemail and it's my mother the day after she died. The message said, Connie, this is your mother. Call me. We decided to check if it was a delayed message, but it wasn't. I even took it to the cell phone company, and they said it was June 6th at 1.25 in the afternoon. My mom died June 5th, 2007, at the times between 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. It has really bothered me that we missed the call, even though she was already dead. She might have been trying to say goodbye to us. A few nights ago, a friend and I took a drive up Angeles Crest Highway. It was a clear night and wasn't too cold. As we entered the parking lot, we noticed there were no other cars there. As I made a U-turn in the lot to face the small building, there we saw a man walking. What got my attention was the fact that my headlights shined bright on the building, yet we only saw the person from the waist down. The rest of his body was a shadow. The man was walking around as if he were looking for something. It appeared he had a flashlight in his hand, the way he was moving, 
there was no light coming from it. The closer we got to him, the smaller the image got. When I shined my brights on him, it looked like he went down a small hallway. Even then, we could not see his upper body. We went back the next day to see if we could find anything. One thing we did notice was the hall we saw the figure walk through was now a wall. Not a wall that was just put up, but one that looked like it was part of the structure since it was built. Three separate spirits are said to walk the halls of the soon-to-be-abandoned Middle Tennessee Medical Hospital in Freesboro, Tennessee, as a new more modern hospital is being built right across the city. In the older section of the third floor, one room is said to be haunted by the ghost of a mental patient who jumped out of a window in the 1960s in the psychiatric ward. 30 years later, in that section, administrative offices were constructed and employees reported sharing running down the hall of someone with bare feet in a light outside the room where the man was said to have jumped turns on and off periodically on some nights. The switch that turns that light on can be found only inside the room, which was not even in use at the time. When the lights were checked by maintenance, they seemed fine. Later, some orderlies enjoying lunch on that same floor reported seeing an IV stem being rolled up the same hallway. They left their food there and didn't return. In what was the pediatric area, the ghost of a red-haired girl in her early teens in a white hospital gown has been spotted at one point by a nurse who also had long dark red hair when the room was used for pharmaceutical storage. She claimed to see the spectral image of the girl staring at her through the glass observation window of the room. The nurse was also a redhead. Finally. The third spirit has been chronicled by the hospital's own sad history and has been spotted in a newer section. A young nurse who had just started was leaving for the night to go out with friends. As she hurried down the stairwell, she dropped her purse over the guardrail, a lunch too far, and fell down the center of the stairwell, landing on her head. She died three days later due to massive brain drama. Ironically, one of the hospital's employees who had the task of cleaning up the bloodstains was the son of the woman who had seen the red-haired girl's ghost as her family worked in the hospital. It is sad that sometimes you can see the girl repeat her fatal fall. I have many stories to share with you, but I'm going to start at the beginning. I grew up in Lawrence Harbor, New Jersey. From the time I was a very young child, I knew that something was not right in our house. Our house was the last house in a dead end street that faced the marsh. In the winter, you could see Highway 35. The surrounding woods were equally as disturbing. I was the only girl in our neighborhood. All my friends were guys. They were like brothers to me. I was a tough kid, and I did not scare easily. However, being alone in our house and going to sleep at night frightened me to death. My father died when I was a baby, and it was just my mother, brother, and myself. There was quite a difference in age between my brother and I. For years, I kept my experiences to myself because I thought it was my imagination, and I also thought that if I told my mother and brother that they would think I was crazy too. It took me a long time to realize that I wasn't crazy. It was not my imagination, and the hard part was that I was a gifted child whose family could not relate to me on that particular level. These are my experiences while I live there. My mother and father bought the house in 1962, and I was born in 1963. We owned the house right up until 2005. To this day, the events are burned into my memory. 
From the time I was about five years old, there hardly was a time that the house was at peace. I would lay awake in bed at night and watch orbs dance across the walls and ceiling. Then, I could feel someone sit on the corner of my bed. It was not a faint feeling either. In retrospect as an adult, you could actually see the corner of the bed being pressed down. My heart would pound in my chest so loudly that I couldn't hear anyone else, and I could feel every hair stand up on my entire body. I would pull the covers and pillows over me in such a way that only my eyes and nose would stick out, even in the summer with no air conditioning. Shadows were commonplace everywhere in the house. You could smell flowers in the middle of the winter as well. Then, just as I would start to fall asleep, I would be jolted awake because something pulled the covers of me so violently that they were on the floor at the foot of the bed. That would send me screaming out of my room to my mother. There wasn't a time that you didn't feel as though you were being watched or that you didn't feel that something was following you from room to room. If you came home and put your car keys down, turn your back for two seconds, they were gone, and then after searching the entire house, they would suddenly reappear where you originally put them in the first place, and you were the only one home the entire time. When I was in high school, I would come home and shower because I played sports. I always locked the bathroom door. Every time I would pull the curtain back when I was finished, the door would be wide open. Once again, no one was home, and our interior doors had no keys. Until now, I've been very vague with you about my experiences, but now I will tell you in detail my most frightening experience. I was engaged to Mitch. We were just both out of high school. My mom was out, and so was my brother. Mitch and I decided to go to my house watch TV and eat some pizza. From the time we entered the house, I could feel that something was really wrong, really out of sync. The air seemed electrically charged. It was as though us being there had interrupted some unseen gathering. I ignored it, even though I was goose flesh from head to toe. Even with all the lights on, my mother's house always seemed dark. Mitch was sitting in the room watching television, and I went into the kitchen to heat some frozen pizza. We were having a conversation as I did so. My back was to the living room as we were talking, and I was placing the pizza on the baking sheet. I heard what I thought was Mitch leave the living room and walk into the kitchen. I became aware that he was standing directly behind me as I was still talking. I turned around to ask him something, but to my shock, it was not Mitch standing there. I felt all the blood drain from my face. My knees went to jello and I gasped and screamed at the same time. Standing face to face with me was a huge black solid apparition. I could make out a head and shoulders, but the rest became more see-through as it went towards the knees and feet area. It felt like slow motion. I think that when I turned around and screamed, I scared it as much as it scared me. As I stood there screaming, the black figure literally whooshed through the kitchen wall. Mitch ran into the kitchen. I was shaking and white as a ghost. It took me a while to collect myself. I shut the oven off and we left and went to the local pizza place where I told them what happened. We didn't spend much time at my mother's house after that. This is just one story out of countless stories that I would be glad to share with you. I'm now 46 years old. My entire life has been one foot in this world and the other in the spirit world. Years ago, I'd contacted Sylvia Brown, who told me that my mother's house 
had many spirits in it, but two stood out. There's the ghost of a baby and its mother. She also said that I was a medium and a psychic, and she was right. This is what I now do. I'm no longer afraid. It gives me pleasure to be able to connect with grieving spirits, with the departed loved ones. I consider this wonderful gift that I will not trade for anything. Thank you for listening. All of my life I had reoccurring experiences of the paranormal, starting at age 7, as far as I can remember, when my father died. I used to believe the experiences were dreams or imagination until recently. I was telling my fiancé of my experiences, voices, mists, noises, marks of my body, being touched, shirt tugged on, hair pulled, etc. His suggestion was that maybe I am a sensitive, so I started thinking about this possibility and decided to explore it further. My fiancé and I previously tried going to paranormal meetings, which would go on ghost hunts. There was one in particular that appealed to me, and we signed up. The building the group was going to was in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, at an old building that was previously the Elka Club, built in 1914. This information was given to us by the leader of the hunt. When we arrived, we went into a room to get the speech about which rooms to be careful of. They would be marked by the yellow tape. Nothing else was told to us about the history of this building. But as I stood there, a name entered my mind and it kept repeating itself, Sarah, 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 over and over again. Well, as the group entered the basement, we divided into small groups of two or three. My fiancé and I were in a small room, in the back, and I felt nothing, so we decided to head out into the main part of the basement. And just as we stepped out of the room, a man that was on tour with us, who has been there before, said, Sarah, if you are here with us, give us a sign. I was flabbergasted. I looked at my fiancé and explained the other shock on my face, and we continued in to other parts of the area. I had entered a room just of the entrance of the basement and instantly was bombarded with intense sadness so much so that I got tears in my eyes. I informed the group leader, and they took pictures around me, but by this time, I already knew that what they were searching for in the building wasn't correct. I knew that what I was feeling was the past, and the child Sarah intended on proving just that to me. She in what I would call it, attached herself to me. She started flashing images in my mind about what the building was before the Elks had been built there. It was her home. It was a beautiful Victorian with a large porch, parlors, a library, you name it, she showed me. She told me that she was sad because of the remodeling that was about to happen in the building. She got her point across by telling me certain rooms did not belong. I also picked up a persistent man in a room on the first floor. I was flashed an image of a podium and people sitting and listening intently to this man. In the ballroom, I was given images of people dancing, only black shadows of such. And at last, the third floor, I approached the end of the main hall and was shoved by something not seen. I took a moment and continued on into a grand circular room with benches attached to the circular walls and had the feeling of being watched. And I kept saying, this feels like judge and jury. It was like you were being persecuted, watched, and the spirits were getting angry. 
So I wanted to step out of the room for a moment, and I took a step forward towards the door and received a sharp blow to my middle back on the left hand side. I went out of the room and was telling the crew about the incident and decided to give it another try. And as I entered, I again got another blow to the right side of my back. At that point, I wanted out of there for good, so the group agreed to leave the third floor. And as I entered the hallway again, I got pushed in the same spot as the first time, which happened to be in front of a very large window. The interesting part was, I said before, I knew nothing of the place, but when we were leaving, I told the owner all the stuff Sarah had told me. I told her of the man in the room that in my mind, I'd seen the podium. I told of getting pushed and hit in the back. Well, she surprised me, not only, but many in the group as well. Come to find out that this is where Sarah's home was. The rooms I was seeing were the rooms in her home. The man at the podium would have been the black preacher that occupied that room after the elk club closed down. That night, I came home exhausted. I fell asleep and dreamt of Sarah. In the dream, she told me her last name, so I searched for her on the internet. I then found something more shocking. Not only did I find her, the year she was born, but I also found the names of her parents. Well, I'd spoken with someone that has been to the club and knows things about it, but they never knew her parents' names which happened to be the same names I came across, and as far as the room on the third floor. The owner informed me that this room was the judging room for the elk members, and where they would hold their remembrances to the dead brothers. The interesting thing was, the women were not allowed in this room, and there was also an EVP that picked up stating, you are being judged. So needless to say, I'm no longer doubting my ability, and I'm more open to my experiences, which have been many since that night. Growing up in rural Michigan, I had several what the heck was that experiences. Most were minor, a moving shadow or an uneasy feeling, but one stands out. I was 8 to 10 years old in the mid 80s and my family had just returned from a vacation. When we got out of the car, my dad headed to the mailbox, my mom to her garden and I lugged my suitcase inside the house. All of the windows were shut and I pulled the garage door closed behind me. Walking through the house, I passed the bay window from which I could see my dad still on the road and my mom picking some vegetables. The house was silent except for my footsteps on the carpet. I walked into my room and put my suitcase down in the corner. I heard a male voice laughing behind me, maybe in the doorway eight feet away. It was a hearty laugh, loud and clear. I spun around, and there wasn't anyone in the doorway. I ran back to the garage, through the door, and outside. My father was just grabbing his suitcase from the car, and my mother was pulling weeds. I wasn't scared when I heard the voice, but not having a tangible body to put it with did unnerve me a bit. Following the event, I was able to forget and had no issues in the rest of the house. It was only after I got older and interested in the paranormal did I realize that I must have had a run in with something. About two years ago, I bought a 126 year old 8,000 square foot mansion in Missouri just outside of Kansas City where I grew up. 
my mother had owned and lived in the house for the previous 15 years, slowly maintaining it. She had done a great job maintaining its mid-1800s character, slowly bringing the woodwork back to life, adding insulation, and replacing all the plumbing and wiring. I mention this because I've heard that a disturbance in the environment can cause spectral activity to begin. I'd seen the house only once, as I live over 2,000 miles away, but I fell in love with it immediately. The first night I stayed over, I woke in the middle of the night to huge blocks, about a dozen, from golf ball to basketball size, floating around the room I was sleeping in. This is the one and only time I've ever experienced anything like that. I closed my eyes, said a prayer, and fell back to sleep in time. I said nothing to my mother the next day until she asked me, Well, did you see the blobs? One of the workers stayed down there the other night and said he wouldn't stay in the house after dark because of the blobs floating around him. She had not seen them and still hasn't. However, the previous owner told my mother a few years later that he loved what she had done to the front room, but he could never stay in there while the house was his because of the blobs. During the summer of 2007, I went back to see my family. I stayed downstairs again and had several things happen. It is important to note that I've never felt in danger, only uncomfortable. My mom and her boyfriend went upstairs to go to bed. I stayed downstairs in the first floor master suite. For the next 45 minutes, the heavy footsteps above my head were attributed to the two of them settling in for the night. Finally, I decided I would go up and find out what was going on. The entire upstairs was dark and still. They were both long in bed. I returned to my bedroom to hear the continued walking above me. So, I went out on the living room to sleep on the couch. The walking continued above me, although there is only one attic above that living room. I could also hear a distant, quiet talk between a man and a woman, but I couldn't make out what they were saying, and it seemed to always be somewhere else from where I was. The next morning, I decided maybe I would have a chat with myself out loud, and if anyone else heard it, then maybe it would be for the better. I sat on the end of the bed. It was now daylight, so I felt comfortable to be in the bedroom again, and said that I was the new owner and the son of the woman they probably knew very well by now. I really liked the house and hoped to continue my mother's good work, but for now, I lived elsewhere. I also mentioned something that I don't suggest, but in this situation, I felt comfortable in doing so. I told them that they seemed to have been there a long time, and so long as they agreed to stay out of the bathroom while I was in there, we could get along just fine together. The following night was as quiet as it could be. I think their interest in me was satisfied. This past summer, 2008, was my third visit back. Absolutely nothing happened. I was ready, and nothing. Hey, that's fine with me. But one side note, my mother sat down to look at an album she had kept for all these years she had been doing the refurbishing. She was showing me the huge change in the house, from walls being ripped out and then rebuilt, and so on, and well over half of the pictures. There were huge light anomalies. There were smears, blobs, and strange twists of the image. I mentioned this to my mother, who looked right at me and said, You know, I haven't taken a decent picture since I've lived in this house. I've owned one crappy camera after another. 
all the pictures look like this. I have to throw most of them away because they are no good. I just smiled. Right, Ma. Every digital and disposable camera she has ever had in the past 15 years has had the same problem. I grew up with a mom who is wicked, and she is very psychic. She has told me accurately if a lover and I will break up, when, if I'll meet someone new, and accurate descriptions of people I'll meet. My mother told my roommate that the child she was having would be a girl, and she was correct. My mom, to my amazement, is the real deal. On Halloween, our house is the most popular because the altar my mother sets up outside is very real. It's very fun, and I grew up with the easygoing view of the paranormal. I do tend to be very logical, and I believe in a paranormal experience if it does not seem like someone is BSing me. I keep my mind open. My mother does have headaches if she is around haunted houses. She has migraines that will make her sick for days after being in one. She's had this happen to her several times in her life, including once when I was a kid. A few years ago, when I was 23, I started having heart palpitations and tachycardia. At one point, my heart rate went up to 181. I spent night after night in the emergency room, and I was recommended to a cardiologist. I went through that for several months before finally someone realized it was a sedative that I took that helped me sleep. The doctors took me off the sleep medication, and I soon found out that I had become dependent on sleep aids. At the same time, I had to get on a Greyhound bus for a two-day trip to move back with my parents because of the health problems. If you've ever traveled on a Greyhound, you know it's really hard to sleep on it. I was sleep deprived. I was told that I was sleeping, but I didn't realize it. I wasn't sleeping through the night. I was exhausted. I was depressed and I developed a phobia of the sound of a beating heart, heart medication commercials, etc. In short, my mental health was suffering. I had to make the choice to go into a psychiatric ward because it took a month to get an appointment with a psychiatrist. I didn't want to wait that long. The ward was in a regular city hospital all the patients were quiet and were there to heal. Nobody was dangerous. There were patients with bipolar and other types of mental illness, and nobody was dangerous. There are different levels of hospitals. This was a ward for anybody going through emotional difficulties. I started to sleep the first two days I was there. I was not dangerous. But they did have to give me something to sleep. I was having dreams in which in my bathroom, patients had bathrooms in their rooms. I could hear a woman crying and throwing up all night. It was horrible and nightmarish. I could never see her because in the dream, I was laying in bed. How can I describe this? Even though I was asleep and dreaming, it felt like I was aware of everything going on. It never sounded quiet. It sounded like patients were throwing fits, and that someone would go by my room and rap on the wall with a walker, and that poor woman threw up and cried. She sounded miserable. The ward was actually always quiet. Nobody threw fits at night. My mom had taught me how to interpret dreams. I figured mine showed my anxieties. I'd been through hell. I wanted to sleep 
and I never gave one thought to the idea that the place was haunted or had residual hauntings. I had greater concerns at the time. However, my mom came to pick me up and she refused to enter the ward. I didn't think anything of that either. We were driving home and she asked me how I had slept and if I did at all. I told her about the nightmares and how it was completely loud and I was still very exhausted. My mother was shocked, and it showed on her face. She said, Sarah, those were not just dreams. This psychiatric ward used to be a cancer ward. I was getting a migraine because there are patients who have not moved on. Wow, that shocked me. I never heard doctors mention that I had been a cancer ward. The idea was never put into my head. Like I said, I wanted to sleep again and to feel happy. I was concerned for my health. I believe my mom. She's usually incredibly accurate about these kinds of things. I honestly have gotten tired of finding out if me and a potential lover are not going to work out. She's that accurate. However, I could not tell you if that ward was the former cancer ward. I simply don't know because none of the doctors ever mentioned it. I was sleep deprived and going through hell at the time. My emotional state could have been reflected in my dreams. However, if I've learned anything about the paranormal is that it can be a very small world. The hospital in question is in Iowa. It is a regular city hospital with an emergency room, surgery room, etc. It is not a psychiatric hospital only. If a former nurse ever writes you, or even a former patient, I'm here to tell you that there may have been something to their experience. The ward in question is still open. This was a few years ago that I was there. This is just a quirky experience that I wanted to share. My story has been going on for a couple of years now. When I was nine, we moved into our house. It's a nice little place, backed by a large ditch. Behind the ditch is a large forest that I used to play in. The house itself is unremarkable. It's three bedrooms. The master bedroom is the first room you come to when you open the front door straight in. To the right, there's a door to the garage, and to the left is the room we use as our living room. To the right of that is the dining room with the entry into the kitchen. On the left of the living room is the hallway, with the bedrooms and the bathroom. From the time when I first moved in, I've never liked the bedroom at the end of the hall. It has a window that looks out into the front yard. The room I shared with my sister has a window that looks out into the backyard. I'm not sure what it is about the room, but it's a creepy feeling. I was around 11 when my older sister moved out. By that time, it had been a while since I'd gotten any creepy feelings in the second bedroom. I was pleased with the idea of having my own room. I moved my bed in there, got everything set up, and prepared for the grown-up life that I wanted. The first couple days were okay. I had strange nightmares about something coming in from the ditch, something I couldn't explain. Finally, after about a month after I'd been sleeping in the room, I woke up suddenly from one of those dreams. I laid there for a while, not really sure of what woke me up. Then, I realized that the music box my grandma had given me a year ago it was odd. 
The music box was shaped like a carousel horse and had a switch on the bottom of it that turned the music on. I sat up and took it down from the shelf above my head and turned the switch off. I figured that maybe my cat went up on the shelf and brushed against it. I laid back down to go to sleep. It was lying there that I first saw him. I don't know what made me look up into the doorway of my bedroom. At the time, I slept with the door open, but I did, and standing there was a man, clear as day. For a moment, I was sure that someone must have broken into the house. The light coming off the nightlight near the door, I saw that his mouth was moving quickly, but no sound was coming out. It was almost like he was screaming at me. He took a step forward and vanished. I slept in the living room that night. I finally got the nerve to sleep in my room again. After about a week of sleeping on the sofa, and that night I had the same creepy nightmares and woke up to find a child sheep sitting on the end of my bed, staring at me. It vanished when I turned the light on. I ended up spending the next year sleeping on the floor in my sister's room because my mom wouldn't let me move my stuff in with her. I also could have changed my room without getting the feeling of being watched. I would glance at the mirror, it's the type that sits on the dresser, and see a face staring at me, one that wasn't my own. My older sister finally moved back home, and I ended up back in the other bedroom with my sister. I thought that would make it go away, but I would sometimes see the man standing in the doorway late at night. He'd stand there staring at me, mouth moving, forming words I didn't understand. Three years ago, some major changes happened. My oldest sister broke up with her husband, lost her house, and had to move in with my mom and dad, along with her two kids. My youngest oldest sister had her boyfriend living in the house with her. The living arrangements were this. My two oldest sisters slept in one room, along with my youngest nephew, belonging to the first sister I talked about. My oldest sister's kids slept in the second bedroom with me, and my sister and her boyfriend had the living room. It was weird at first, but we all got used to it. The weird things had calmed down since I moved to the other bedroom, but it picked up again when my sister moved in. I was trying to get some sleep. It was around one in the morning, and I saw the child's shape again, but this time, it was sitting at the end of my niece's bed. I sat up, but before I could say anything, my niece woke up screaming. She said it was a nightmare, and I had a feeling it was probably the same one I had when I was younger. They moved out last year, and things calmed down for the most part until my youngest oldest sister moved away. I now had a bedroom all to myself. I was trying once again to get some sleep. I've always had trouble sleeping in this house, and I looked at my doorway, and the man was standing there, but this time I could hear him whispering. It was gibberish. I turned over and pulled the pillow over my head. But the room got so cold, I ended up turning my TV on and closing my bedroom door. Another time, I was messing around with a couple of the other teenagers in the area. We were crossing the ditch and going over to the woods behind the houses. The way we cross is there's an area with two large pipes that stick out in the water. Surrounding the pipes are these rocky things that you can slide down, but also grip with your hands. They're kind of smooth, 
and hard to hold one wet. We were coming back. The others had crossed just fine. I was the last one over. The first thing that happened that was really odd was my hand slipped and I started sliding down. I felt as if someone had grabbed my arm and stopped me before I reached the water. I was about to step down into the water to get across when I heard someone yell my name and say very loudly in my ear to stop. I looked down and there was a snake in the water right where I was about to put my foot. My friend came back across and got rid of the snake. I got home okay. When I went to take a shower later that night, I looked at my arm and I had a hard handprint bruise on my arm. I don't know if it was one of the ghosts from the house, but something stopped me from falling and from getting bitten by the snake. So, I guess even if the ghosts scare me, they're looking out for me too. Bonito City, a rather grand name for the cluster of log buildings that house the saloon, post office, schoolhouse, church, general store, a hotel called the Mayberry House, and a number of comfortable residences. Set amid lofty peaks 12 miles northwest of Rizzuto, apple orchards and livestock of the Benito settlers flourished in the 7,000 foot meadows at the edge of the forests. Trout fishing was excellent in the Benito River. God was in his heaven and all was right with the world, or so it seemed, when two events took place that would cause the serene and pleasant community to literally disappear. The centerpiece of Bonito City was the two-story log hotel called the Mayberry House, operated by Mr. and Mrs. John Mayberry. They had three children, John, Eddie, and Nellie. On the night of May 5th, 1885, the Mayberry House leaped into the record books with one of New Mexico's most bizarre crimes. Earlier that evening, a number of miners ate supper there and left. Only two guests had rooms, Dr. R. E. Flynn from Ohio and a youth named Martin Nelson seemed to be pleasant and inoffensive rumors. All were in bed by 10 o'clock. About 1 o'clock in the morning, Nelson arose and knocked on the bedroom door of the two Mayberry boys. John awakened and opened the door, at which point Nelson fired two rifle shots, killing him instantly. He then turned on the seven-year-old boy Eddie, who was screaming in bed. Nelson killed him with a single blast. Dr. Flynn, hearing the shooting, rushed from his room and was shot through the head. John Mayberry, after hearing the screams, was making his way up the dark stairs from the first floor when a shot through the heart dropped him on the landing. Blood was everywhere. Mayberry's daughter, Nellie, appeared and was shot through the side and left for dead. She later recovered. Miss Mayberry ran upstairs where Nelson shot her in the chest, but failed to kill her. She stumbled downstairs with blood streaming all the way to her feet, leaving bloody footprints visible on the stairs, even years later. She fled to the nearest cabin for help, but Nelson followed, executed her, and threw her body into her irrigation ditch. Nelson, the saloon keeper, no relation to Martin Nelson, appeared on the scene, grappled with the youth who was no match for the murderer. Mark Nelson shot him to death and left his body bleeding in the sandy street. The next victim was a storekeeper, Herman Beck, who came out to learn the cause of the gunshots. 
Nelson killed him with one bullet. Bonito's terrified citizens locked themselves in their homes until morning, while Nelson roamed at large, finally climbing up a nearby mountain. Next morning, as Charlie Berry, Rudolph Schultz, and Don Campbell were standing in the street discussing the murders, they sighted Nelson returning down the mountain. He saw the man, brought up his rifle to fire, but was an instant too late. Barry failed him with a bullet through the heart. Nelson's last shot went harmlessly into the air as he fell. Total fatalities were eight killed, including the murderer, and one wounded. It was years before the people of Bonito City recovered from the shock, and for 15 years, nobody set foot in the log hotel. Folks said it was haunted, told stories of shrieks and groans in the dead of night, of seeing lights flicker from room to room, or hearing muffled shots. Those who peeped through the dusty windows could see the bloody footprints left by Miss Mayberry's feet. The murderer was buried at Bonito, with his head pointed down. Folklore say that this custom was to prevent the buried persons from walking as a ghost. The victims were also buried in Bonito, side by side of each other, and a reasonable distance away from the murderer Martin Nelson. Gradually, Bonito City died. The final blow came when the railroad arrived in the desert below, and took a business-like approach to acquiring water rights in the Bonito Valley, and later on, buying out the land in which the remaining residents of Bonito City lived. In 1930, Bonito Dam was built by the Southern Pacific Railroad. The remains of the victims were moved to Angus Cemetery. A large stone marks their resting place, and as for Benito City, it is presently resting under 75 feet of water that is now known as Bonito Lake. Since then, Bonito City has become an old memory and a murder mystery of the past. Some people have claimed that during a well moonlit night, they can see the top of the church steeple shining below the serene resting water of the night. Is it really the church steeple being seen 75 feet below the water's surface? Or is it a haunting image, reminding us of the presence of the city below? You decide. In early November 2006, I went over to visit my grandparents' house and my grandpa wasn't feeling well. He eventually went to visit the hospital. I thought he would just get out in a day or so, because he survived a heart attack before. For the first few days I wasn't worried at all, but after a week in the hospital, I was getting a little worried. About two weeks later, he passed away. I was absolutely devastated. Before his funeral, his brother and sister came down to visit. While they were sleeping in my grandparents' house, this is two days after he had died. My uncle was leaving. He looked back to see if things were all right, and he saw a rather tall figure, wearing a hat, walking in a room. At first he thought it was my grandpa's brother Robert, but he was fast asleep in a different story of the house. He went looking in the room, and the ghostly figure was gone. We all think the figure was our grandpa. He was about 6'1", and always wore a hat. Every time my grandma went to go get food, or to pick up my little cousins, we would get a feeling someone was watching me, but in a good way. In early December, I was decorating the Christmas tree, and I saw a face peek out at the top of the stairs at me. It looked exactly like my grandpa a few years before he died. 
it kind of feels like a little bit of him falls every one of us. All of these accounts have happened in Lake Hathazio, Arizona, each in a different house. My mother and I were driving around town looking for a house to rent when we found a large house in Bayou Drive. This house was an old bluish color with vines creeping up the outer walls and into the fireplace with a large overhang on the front porch. As soon as we started walking up the driveway, a very strong feeling of dread started to creep through my body. I really liked the house, so I ignored the feeling and continued into the backyard. As I entered the backyard, I remembered a dream many months before. The exact backyard was in my dream, and the images of death and demons filled my mind. My mother had the same feeling, so we left without another word, deciding that a door had opened and a demon was dwelling inside the house. We moved into a different house where everything felt normal at first. We lived there for seven years. I soon felt eyes watching me in the shower, which then led gusts of freezing angry wind rushing past my face and arms. Later, I learned my mother was going through the same events, only she experienced only one of the gusts of wind. When we started talking about moving out of the house, things got worse. My mom once felt a figure sit down on the bed beside her and saw the indentation of a person on the bed. There were no dogs in the room, and the entire house was asleep. I saw blinds move with nothing in the room and a shadowy figure walk across the kitchen. I was cleaning out a house and just about to move into it when I repeatedly saw a figure of a little girl out of the corner of my eye. I could sometimes hear her talking softly to no one in particular. Later investigation proved that a little girl had drowned in the pool years before. I've had a lot of things happen to me in my life, from seeing eyes in the corner of my room to being slapped by something I couldn't see, so I'm very open to anything and everything that someone would think was weird or crazy. My mom, however, is not, so for her to tell me about what happened to her, I know it's true. I'm 28 now. And this happened a few years before I was born. My mom was an FHA teacher for 15 years, so she went to FHA meetings a lot. One night she was at a get together for school, and it was getting light, and as she was getting ready to go, one of her friend's cars wouldn't start, so my mom said she would take her home. As they were driving, her friend and her were talking, not even thinking about how far out in the middle of nowhere they were. Finally, they got to her house, and my mom dropped her off and started home. It was a very calm night, and very dark, almost eerily calm. As she was driving down the road, she started to feel uneasy, so she tried to blow it off, until she turned down back road to the highway. I can't think of the name of the road right now, but I do know there was quite a few fatal accidents on that road because of how windy it is. So, as she was driving, she looked over and saw this thing running right beside her. It was as big as a cow and its eyes glowed green. She got so scared, she stepped on the gas and was going 85 miles per hour. And the thing then disappeared. It was almost as if it was there like a flash, and it was gone. She never found out what it was, nor did she ever go down that road again. But she figured 
It might have been a banshee or something. After a long look at things, she has only had two things ever happen to her in her life that she definitely couldn't explain, and that was certainly one of them. The other was when she went to bed one night, when she was a teen. She just got into bed and looked over at her closet, and there was something that looked like a man floating with a glow around it coming at her. She ran and told her mom, and her mom told her it was nothing. So she went back to bed, and she saw it again, and ran out, and slept on the couch for the rest of the night. I'm a clairvoyant, and I'm used to not being alone. The last house I lived in had a number of distinctive entities, and will only share a couple of my experiences with you now. There was a young girl, probably around four or five, who was very prevalent around the time my son was three. One night, I had a contact dream. Usually my dreams are surreal and nonsense, but when I contact someone, they're usually set in whatever house I'm in and are more out-of-body experiences. I walked to the end of my hall and looked through the dining room into the kitchen, and there was a small girl with waist-length dark brown, not black, wavy hair. She had a flowered white nightgown on, and she was pushing buttons on the microwave. When I asked her why she was here, she quickly, and I mean quickly, like Japanese whore across the room in a blink quickly, came up to me. I crouched down, but I couldn't see her face, and somehow I knew she had been badly injured. Think gunshot wounds to the eyes and cheek, so I didn't want to see her face. I explained to her that she needed to move on and go into the light where her family was waiting. And then I walked back to my room, with her following behind me. I woke up, then went back to sleep, and a while later my son woke me up, half ways anyway, enough to answer him and kind of remember. And he asked me to tell the girl that she was not his sister and to leave him alone. I told him to lay down in my bed and explain to her she was about three feet away, that I'm not her mother, and that she needed to move on, that it wasn't her house anymore. I thought that part was a dream when I woke up, until I realized my son was asleep beside me. The other very noticeable energy in my house was that of a woman who was very straight-laced and controlling. She would often sit on a window seat in my bedroom at night. My husband, who was a very skeptical man, would sit up in his sleep staring with closed eyes towards her and ask over and over, Who is that? Who the heck is that? Until I would tell him it's okay. Then he would lay back down. Well, this house was in Oklahoma. And every time there was a tornado weather outside, she would panic and really become agitated and very distracting to those who could sense her. So I'd have to calm her down and watch the storm. When my alarm clock didn't go off, she would bang loudly on the window in time for you to get to work. The only nice thing she would do. But when we were moving out, she really flipped, stirring up whatever else was there. So in the middle of the night, I would hear floor shakings and bangs from completely empty rooms. Tape would be peeled off boxes and placed across the room. Things would be removed from boxes overnight and put in different rooms. Like books stacked in the middle of the kitchen after they were packed. And sounds of the TV coming on after it had been unplugged and wrapped in protective sheeting. All in all, it was not a very fun move, especially when I was alone the last four weeks of packing, and she kept opening the valve on my air mattress at 2am. 
my new house is nice, but I keep hearing a little boy talk to me from a corner of my bedroom. Oh well, I guess. I'm 25 now, and have had strange experiences which, though I'm very analytical and skeptical, can't seem to find out how, or why, or what these things were. I will tell each counter as simply and as accurately as I can. I used to live in Stockton, and my house was built around 1910 to 1912. I was an only child, and my parents were very busy doing their own things. I may have had an overactive imagination, but I don't believe so because what I saw was too clear and not fake and reinterpreted by my brain. The sliding redwood doors that separated our living room from the dining room began to shake before my eyes as if it was locked and someone wanted in. I got up and walked around to the other side thinking it was my cat, but I didn't see her paw and she never shook the doors just nudged them apart. I walked around to the other side of the doors to the kitchen. All the lights were off and I saw no one. I felt very scared suddenly and went to bed, closing my door. Another time I was laying in bed and my mother was on her hands and knees sniffing the floor. A bathroom connected our rooms and I assumed she had begun sniffing in the bathroom. I asked her what she was doing, and she replied, your father and I smelled rotten blood. I can't remember what happened first, but I saw a clear apparition in my living room as I tied my shoes. A man dressed in black with a top hat and coattails, had a cane with a black long beard, walked briskly through the living room, and disappeared. I had a dream that I pulled the back out of the carpets in my parents' bedroom and saw blood stains. I don't know if she was moving them. She denies it still to this day. But I know I wasn't moving them because I was determined to find the truth. The board told this story. A married couple named Mark and Melissa Twain live in the house with a woman's sister. One day, in jealous outrage, she killed them both in the room with a shotgun. I thought it was very fishy the wife had my name, and the husband's name was Mark Twain. But like I said, my cousin says she didn't make the Ouija tell the story. I was under the house one day, bored and playing around, when I found a small handful of large blast bullet casing not as large as a shotgun gazing bullet, I don't think. Other things have happened. I heard a knock on my door late at night. One huge knock, but I was too scared to open it. I told my father in the morning, and he got very angry and shouted at me that I was too stupid. I don't know why that angered him. I surmised the knock was from my dog changing lying positions on the porch. Once a baby bottle just sitting on the counter just seemed to be thrown in the floor. My father said it was because I stomped into the kitchen, perhaps. But the powerful way it fell, I doubted it. I was never able to tear my parents' carpet or find any information on the house that could point me in any direction. Though I did get all the paperwork on who owned the house, and no name Twain ever owned the house. My aunt, who claims to be a psychic, came over to the house and said that several ghosts live here. That was something I didn't hear myself. Another family member told me that. The house, which was always a bit odd, had a stained glass window on the front, not very large. It was of a cross. Later in life, I was in high school, living with a friend. I was trying to go to sleep and heard someone say my name very clearly right next to my ear. I got up and asked my friend what he wanted. 
He was in my grandmother's room, which they shared. I didn't call you, he said. The voice didn't sound like his voice. It had a lisp, as was very girlish sounding. We went to the house in the Delta, abandoned and run down, as well as vandalized. I walked ahead of everyone, always ready to take on whatever. As I walked past a bush, these birds just exploded from it. Before, I heard no burn song, and they surprised. The house was elevated with the basement that had openings for water to flow through. Everything was pretty much ruined. A door opened nowhere, as the staircase had been brought down. It felt like a cemetery, not in a morbid sense, and just so quiet and hollow. We went to the basement, where trash was everywhere. On the door which had been removed then, placed back up, was a crude black painting of a devil or satyr. Being mischievous, I took a wooden bed frame topper. It was painted brown with a carved flower on each side, and it was painted red as well. After I took it home, that's when I heard the voice. My room was cold, and I saw something in the garage, and I had a really weird nightmare. The kitchen was being renovated, so we had to wash and get dishes in the garage. I went out to get a cup and felt very nervous in there. As I was walking to leave, I heard a loud boom in the wall to my right. I looked, not too long, but long enough, and this will be a very hard to explain situation and sound crazy. But this energy waved and glistened in the shape of something human turned its head and looked at me. I ran out, scared for my life. I'd never been so scared. I took the bed knob back, and nothing happened like that again. The site has long since been destroyed. I'm not sure what any of this means, but I do know one thing for sure. I experienced it. Both of these accounts took place within the same week of each other, happening to my brother and I when we were on vacation in London. The Hyde Park Ghost. I was on vacation with my family in London for Thanksgiving, 2001. About 10 in the morning on Thanksgiving Day, we decided to go for a walk around London, starting with Hyde Park, which was about three blocks from the hotel. The park was beautiful against the autumn sky, and both my brother and I found it strange how time seemed to skip, as the park just lay kitty corner from a highly modernized tourist strip. As we waited on the corner for our parents to catch up, I turned to see a great black carriage standing behind us, pulled by a glamorous looking brown and white Clydesdale. I tucked on my older brother's jacket and pointed, and we watched it for a while, thinking it was the coolest thing we'd ever seen. Others in the park didn't take much notice of them at all, walking by in a hurry to get wherever they were going, or that's what we figured. My brother, having his camera with him, took a picture of the carriage and the driver. A slightly portly man with a contented smile and a formal air. He looked at us as my brother snapped a picture, and I felt an unexplainable tingling. Shrugging it off as the autumn weather, I continued to watch the driver. Our parents called our names, and we turned back to look at them agreeing that we should all go for a ride in the carriage. My mom asked what we were looking at, and I turned back and pointed. What happened next is the strangest thing I've ever experienced. There was no carriage standing on the corner with us. My brother just looked as puzzled, and we continued the search about the corner, 
Thinking I must have driven off after we turned to look at my parents. But the carriage, driver, and horse were nowhere in sight. I found it odd also that we had not heard them drive off, as one would think a horse walking on stone could not be terribly quiet. A week or so later, we got the film developed. My brother and I searched through the pictures at least three times, trying desperately to find the one he had taken off the carriage. But though all the exposures from his camera were present, we could not find the one of the gleaming black carriage, Mary Driver, and the magic Cladisdale. We did, however, find a startling shot of the corner it had been on, with the little glowing orb just right center. My brother and I prickled. The real start, however, did not come until about two days after that, when I was reading a book about the ghost of London I'd picked up at the Tower of London for some light reading. I felt the same familiar prickle as I read about a popular ghost in Hyde Park that of a man driving a gleaming black carriage pulled by a huge brown and white Clydesdale, the shadow in the chapel. A few days after walking in Hyde Park, my brother and I were wandering quietly through Westminster Abbey, enjoying the sights. We walked into the chapel that was open and sat for a moment, waiting for our parents to catch up. While we were there, he said he smelled something burning. I sniffed the air, recognizing the strong smell of incense. We looked around, not seeing anyone else in the chapel. My brother poked his head out the door, and he looked around, informing me that no one was there, and no one was burning anything nearby. Thinking this was strange, but not terribly creepy, we hung around in the chapel a while longer, chatting quietly. Our conversation was broken, however, when we heard someone chanting from the front of the chapel. We jumped, thinking we were alone. I looked up towards the front, certain we had been alone. The chanting continued in a foreign language I didn't understand. My brother, a Latin student, said later the chanting was a prayer or something. We stood there, watching the front of the chapel, looking around for anyone who might be chanting. I nearly fell over when I saw someone flicker to my left, a figure wearing a dark robe and moving slowly, walked in front of us at the head of the chapel. I remember taking a sharp step backward and falling into my brother when after a moment's reflection, the being looked up and straight ahead. We couldn't see its face as its profile was towards us, covered by the robe's hood. That didn't matter, however, as in an instant, the being was gone. There was no more chanting, no smell of incest, Nothing about me being supported by my paled and terrified looking brother. We didn't know what to think, neither of us thinking too much of ghosts before, but neither of us could really explain it. One minute, someone standing right in front of us, and the next minute, it was gone, completely and utterly gone, not a trace of it. Her story, I was 11 when this happened. I was spending the night at my best friend's house. It was a pretty Victorian house. It still had the original barn. It was in the back. But anyway, one night we were staying up well past our bedtime, down in the living room, watching TV and talking. Well, our room, which we were supposed to be in, was directly over the living room. Well, we were sitting there, and all of a sudden, we heard what sounded like something being dragged the length of our bedroom. 
It was something heavy. We were so scared, so we stopped talking and muted the TV to listen. It sounded almost like a dead body. All you could hear was thump, thump, slide, thump. It was freaky. We checked on everyone, and everyone was asleep. In my second story, this is my fiancé's story. He's in Germany right now. He would probably be mad at me for telling this, but I have to, because it scared me. Anyway, he's not the type of guy to get scared very easily. He doesn't believe in ghosts. We live in a town called Tacoma. It's south of Seattle. Anyway, a poor town of Tacoma is Lakewood. In this town is an old insane asylum that was torn down about, guessing, 30 years ago, and then rebuilt across the street. Go figure. It's called Western State. My fiancé and a couple of his friends went to the hospital for the fun of it. The ruins are still there. They were down in the basement, which also happens to be the boiler room. They were walking down there and came around a corner and saw a bunch of bugs and such. They figured a bum was staying down there as they turned to leave. Dave is a pretty small guy, so he got pushed to the back. As he was about to leave himself out of the window, he felt someone tap him on his shoulder and heard someone whisper something to him. He figured it was the bomb, so he turned around, but there was nothing there. He freaked out because it was a split second that he'd heard something and felt the tap. So he started screaming for his friends to come and get him. His friends had to pull him out of the window because he was freaking out the whole time. A third story. I was sleeping one time in my bedroom, and it was like 3 o'clock in the morning, and I suddenly woke up because I had the feeling that someone was in the room with me. I had my own room at the time, and it was pitch black in my room, but I looked in the corner where my door was, and I could just barely make out the outline of a man. He was just standing there and watching me. I couldn't breathe or think. I just stayed there for about two minutes, trying to figure out what to do. I finally got the balls to reach over and yank on the lamp. When I did, nothing was there. Fourth story. Me and my sister were at my grandma's visiting, and recently, my uncle had passed away in the house. He had gone missing for about two weeks, my grandma didn't think anything of it, because he did that sometimes. She went in his room looking for something, and there he was, lying on his bed, half decomposed. She said it took forever to get the smell out. On my grandma's TV was a plastic face with a flake flower in it. The TV was off, and my grandma was at work. So me and my two sisters were sitting around and talking. I believe we were talking about my uncle when all of a sudden the vase went flying off the TV. When I say flew, I mean flew. It flew like five feet. We all stopped and decided to go to bed. Fifth story. I was spending the night at my best friend's house. I was like 15 or something. My godmother had just told us to go to bed. We were just getting ready for bed when I hear my godmother yelling at me to get my butt in bed. I came out of my best friend's room and said we were. She then proceeded to tell me that she had seen me in the reflection in the window, walk by from the stairs to the kitchen, but the room we were in was right next to where she was. Freaky. The sixth and final story. I was babysitting my nephew one night. I was sitting on, listening to music and relaxing, when I heard my sister laugh. Thinking that was weird, 
because I hadn't heard them come home. I got up to check. There was no one there. I know my sister's laugh. About 30 minutes later, I heard my sister cough. Again, I got up to check. Nothing. I don't know much about this house. I've only been here about eight months. It's my brother-in-law's house. This house is kind of weird though. When all sounds have died down, you can hear clicking and sometimes even what kind of sounds like walking sounds. I sleep with my door open so I'd hear if my sister had opened her door. But they're like soft walking sounds. Odd. Anyway, I have tons more stories. I'm a very strong believer in ghosts. So if you want to hear more stories, just email me and let me know. I was reading your site around Halloween and noticed Green Man and instantly knew what the reference was. I had heard this story dozens of times by my dad who visited Raymond. Then, I realized the legend was not correct. The legend states that late at night, you could witness a ghost wandering around the tunnels and bridges around town. There have been numerous reports over the years of a man with a green face walking after hours. He is known as the Green Man. This is because when people have seen this figure, the apparition has a terrifying green face as he floats by the local tunnels and bridges of the area. The real version is extremely depressing, but the real version in the least. The horrible accident occurred in Evans City. Raymond, unsure of the last name, and his older brother were flying a kite near some electrical wires next to a tree. The kite got stuck, and Raymond followed his brother up the tree to retrieve it. When Raymond's brother grabbed the kite, both brothers got electrocuted. Raymond's brother was killed, and Raymond was severely burned. He was extremely disfigured, and it was extremely hard for him to walk because of the accident. The residents of Evans City collected nearly 30000 for the boy for his care. His older sister and her boyfriend ran off with the money, leaving Raymond without the money he needed to get well. From then on, the townspeople took him under their wing and took care of him the best they could, but without the funds to do it. My dad's grandmother, who lived in Suiki, told my dad and his brothers and sisters the story of the Green Man when they went to visit her. Raymond, now an adult, walks down the road to and from the tunnel every night. The sun would hurt his eyes since it only had a thin sheath of skin to cover them, so he did not go out in the daylight. He could barely walk, but did so every night regardless. People from all over came to bring him money, gum, and cigarettes, even while he was on his nightly walks to the tunnel and back home. The green man came from the color his skin looked when the headlights would hit him. He had been charred so badly, he was gray, so the headlights actually made him look a greenish gray color. Unfortunately, my dad couldn't confirm this because he is colorblind. Raymond had a hole for a mouth, no nose except for a hole, and holes for ears. My great grandpa, my uncle Carl, then a teen, got out and handed Raymond a pack of lucky strikes and a pack of gum. Raymond talked to them for a bit, though you could barely understand what Raymond was saying. Behind my great grandma's car were many more cars, waiting to see Raymond, as there were more every night. At this point, Raymond was a bit of a celebrity. Raymond was watched by the town and the police, and he never had any trouble with the visitors. My family left and the next car pulled up to visit. My dad recalls hearing of Raymond's passing some years later. 
must have been about 1985. The interesting aspect of the story is that years after Raymond's demise, I've had friends who have passed by the tunnels and have noticed gray mists, orbs, and other strange phenomena. Where that they witnessed phenomena near the very same tunnels that Raymond used to frequent. One of my friends is a non-believer and a true skeptic of the paranormal, and he had experience where he saw the green man years after his death. Just like the story, he shined his headlights as he was driving through the tunnel and nearly wrecked his car. He thought that he had saw a man wandering around who appeared to have a green face. He appeared so quickly that my friend had little time to react. His car came to a complete halt, but there was nobody in sight. Whether Raymond haunts the road and tunnel, I don't know. However, I'd like to believe that the legend is now true. After the experiences that my friends have had, a little ironic, but fascinating, nevertheless. These experiences all occurred at my grandmother's house, which is called Gwimmick Manor. Although the house isn't very big, it's around 200 years old. All my dad's family have lived there, and my grandmother now lives there alone. There have been many different events, things such as footsteps, dogs barking at something unseen, and the shower being turned on and off, or just a few minor things. One time, my uncle fell asleep in the kitchen at night, and the door he was sleeping next to was flung open, waking him up, even though there was no draft, and it was an airless night. The same uncle also had experiences as a young child. When he was younger, he would hear footsteps from outside his window late at night, as though someone was walking hurriedly over gravel. At the same time, he would see two big black dogs sitting by his bed. Another time my grandma was walking upstairs with some laundry, when she dropped something and bent down to pick it up. As she was retrieving it, she saw a pair of shoes on the steps in front of her, as real as a human's. She looked up and saw a long skirt in the start of a shirt, and then the figure disappeared. My grandma swears to this day that the story is true, and says although she didn't feel threatened, she certainly wonders who this woman is. There was no one else in the house at the time, and the stairs are curved, so if someone had walked down them, you would have seen. Most recently, my sister and I were in the corridor, opposite the dining room, which is locked when it's not in use. There is a key on the outside of the door. We were standing there talking, when the key started to move, as if someone was trying to get out from inside. We thought maybe someone was in there at first, but then we remembered that the key had been moving from our side of the door. Most recently, we were sitting on the lawn whilst my dad and uncle played badminton on the court behind us. The garden is raised almost on a hilltop, with steps leading up to it, so the grass we were sitting on was in line with the upstairs bedroom window, if that makes sense. We were facing the window, talking, and looking in at my grandmother's two dogs who could have been sitting on her bed. My grandma had gone out shopping and had left her dog shut in her bedroom. First, we saw one of the dogs start barking urgently at something in the far corner, which was out of sight from us. This continued, and the dog then jumped onto the bed again and started barking directly at us. We thought this was strange, but what happened next couldn't be explained. A white mist, almost in the form of a hand, passed over the dog's head as though it were stroking her. 
She then stopped barking. We both looked at each other in horror, knowing that we both had seen the same thing. There was no sunlight that could have reflected through the windows, and I honestly can't think of another explanation for the hand we had seen. I still feel scared when I go into the house. January 1999, I'd been working for an American company in Evesham in the UK. The company was based in a small industrial state called Briar Close and East. On the edge of this estate is a small pub called the Oddfell Arms. We all used to go to this pub now and then for a quick pint of a lunchtime. I personally used to have a pint, perhaps once or twice a week there. Anyway, as you go in on a fairly regular basis, you tend to get to know some of the locals. There was one couple in particular that the story is about. They were an old couple. He was an ex-counselor and had to use a frame to walk with. He was always with his wife. She used to drive him everywhere. Obviously, he couldn't get anywhere without her assistance. It was just after the Christmas break, first week back at work in January. I decided to go for a sandwich and a drink at the pub. Funny thing was, I noticed that this chap was on his own sat in the corner. He tipped his glass to me as usual to acknowledge me. I thought no more about it. Later that day, I spoke to my warehouse manager. He frequented the pub on a more frequent basis and knew all the regulars by name. So, I mentioned to him how odd it was that the old guy was on his own. Astonished, he replied that's impossible. The old guy had died over Christmas. I have never forgotten this. And some people, including my wife, have told me I must be mistaken, but I know what I saw, and I know when I saw him. For all those people who know the Oddfell's Arms Evesham, perhaps some of you may remember this chap and his wife that frequented the pub, or maybe someone else had seen him too. I'm recently going to a neighboring school by this house, and have visited it frequently. I never get a safe feeling while in there, and recently, we found a mutilated animal, not like it was feasted on, but just torn apart, and left in front of the house, maybe for some sort of omen, or a warning. The body was ripped to shreds, and its skin on the hands were ripped off, to showing its appendages. Later, we found the skull of the animal adjacent to it, and we noticed the jaw was removed, but the skull itself was in a very clean fashion. No blood, or guts, or any kind of fluids, not even dirt marks. The skull almost looked like it had been washed. That not being the strangest thing, I have a friend of mine who is a female, who is as well as extremely interested in the paranormal, and she has recently gone to the house, and the first encounter dealt with her and her best friend going into the house and just walking around. The problem was that they did not even get to enter into the house. Right before stepping on the yard, the house is surrounded by large bushes. They heard a sound coming from one. Other times that I've been with her, we swore we heard footsteps beside us in the bushes, as if being watched. Her best friend saw a shadow and became very frightened and began to flee. My friend was not as scared and refused, and her being the determined person that she is, continued to go forth. The sound was continuing this whole time. Her friend left sprinting, and so just to be a good friend, she decided to go catch up. She was not running so fast, and in her light jog, she turned around and noticed a woman with bright blonde hair 
this being the only thing sticking out, chasing after them, and even got off the yard and continued in the pursuit. When seeing this, my friend began to run even faster and eventually ran to the church where they parked their car. She called me while this was happening, I guess to help us believe, and also she knew I was very interested and I could hear the fear in her voice. When she returned, she told us the story, and one of the girls who was a local asked about what she had saw, and when she said the thing chasing them had long blonde hair, the local freaked and admitted that the woman who was murdered did in fact have long blonde hair. This scared and excited all of us, because my friend who was chased had no idea how the woman looked or anything of that sort. Not being enough for us, we decided to go back with another group of kids who swear they know much about demons. We weren't allowed to go on because the demon group refused to get on because they swore they could just feel the evil. Well, they went back and we ended up going another day with other friends. We just heard small sounds and footsteps. Other friends' stories deal with the chair in the living room that has two missing legs would be dragged across the living room. But one day, my friend, being the brave girl that she is, went into the house by herself one night. And she was walking around and really did not notice anything. She made a comment expressing how upset she was that nothing was happening. And a few minutes later, she heard a high-pitched shriek, and right then she was pushed, what she guessed to be about four feet, and pinned to the wall. She stumbled out of the house, and when she got home, her best friend noticed the scratches on her forehead. She still has them right now. This incident is very recent. That same night, her friend later called me saying that she had fallen asleep and was not responding and that she was breathing normally, but her body was extremely cold. We haven't gone back yet, but we notice that activity is much higher when fewer numbers are around. I look forward to giving you updates. Also, I'm from McAllen, Texas, and there's a building in that area that is rumored to be haunted. There's this building, and it is extremely haunted on the third floor. I'll go ahead and check that out as well, and I'll give you an update as soon as possible. My name is Andrew Pierce, and I'm a local ghost hunter here in Warwick, Rhode Island. Having experience in paranormal investigation helps every time I tell my story, because living with ghosts and experiencing ghosts are two different things for me. I moved into my home 15 years ago, at the age of 6. The first night in my new house, I slept in what is now my mother's room, and before waking that night, I had nightmares of bloody murder, massacres, and deadly beatings. At the time I was just scared, but now, after researching, I have come to the conclusion that this was a ghostly encounter. Between the ages of 7 and 10, I suffered four experiences in my dreams where strange people would walk around in my house. The only problem is that they weren't living, and in each of these dreams, they were foreshadowings of what are now actual hauntings. The area with the most activity is my basement, which has been finished and where several phenomena have occurred. The first came when I was 12. I was headed upstairs from my computer room, when I saw a figure out of the corner of my eye. When I turned around, it was a little girl huddled in the corner and looking at me. She was dressed in 18th century garb and looked like she had just left church or some sort of social gathering. She has never been seen again, but she has been felt throughout the house and even experienced once by someone who had never been in my house before. This occurred when a friend of mine was sleeping downstairs, waiting for us to get back from her on to CVS. 
She was asleep on the couch when a ghostly arm or hand touched her arm and then proceeded to knock over a couple of items on the table. When she had informed me of this, I knew it was the girl. Another haunting would be in my mother's room, where, if you are alone upstairs and my dog is not around, a growling sound comes from her room. It is entirely inexplicable, but I have a feeling an angry ghost lives in there, but cannot gather enough energy to support anything other than making sounds and haunting dreams. Shortly after my neighbor died, he built the house for his children and loved my family very much. Most of the hauntings disappeared, and a sense of comfortability ran through the house. Everything was at normal temperature, and there was no more dreaded sense of being followed or even watched. This has comforted me greatly, but it only lasted for a short time. Since that time, Several newer and less aggressive ghosts have entered the house, and they are seemingly very friendly with my dog. Where he used to bark at them, he is now okay with them, and can even be seen playing with them. This was witnessed when I saw him playing with his ball alone, but then noticed that the ball was rolling to him on its own. He would bring it back, and it would only roll once more. Also. This same ghost apparently hates breakfast because it disturbed us one time by knocking over a bunch of papers on the counter and spinning the trash can lid violently. No explainable cause was determined as it was the middle of winter and no windows were open and we don't have a fan in our kitchen area. Another ghost prefers to walk around the foyer and up and down the stairs but never seems to go past the hallways. That's really all that happens, but I wanted to report these since they are the only real, vivid ghost experiences I could ever recall. Thank you. We bought a house in Yucca Valley in 1988, built during World War II, from what we were told two bomb shelters, house added on to the years to come. Interesting old place, but nothing special other than the fact we thought we could turn it into our dream house, two story, white picket fence, etc. A couple of weeks after moving in, my husband and I were in the kitchen talking when I thought I saw something, a fog, an image of a lady going through the dining room not saying a word, thinking my husband would think I was nuts. He said to me, did you see that? My husband and I choose to sleep in the downstairs bedroom and the girls upstairs at that point. We were in a king size waterbed, framed firmly on the floor, so it's not logically possible for something to be placed underneath it. After we began renovating the upstairs, we moved our bed up there and the girls had the downstairs to sleep. Full sides beds, sitting on regular bed frames. There was nothing on the floor when we moved our bed out. A few weeks later, one of my daughters informed us that something was under her bed. My husband investigated and found a black and white photo as well as some silk scarves. We called the former owner to ask if he knew who or what it might be. He came to look, said the photo was of his dead wife and the scarves had belonged to her. A few months later, my husband found a painted portrait of a young man in his workshop. Again, called the former owner. He said it was of his dead son. A year or so later, one of my daughters saw the same image, the fog, image of a lady. He, or she never caused us any harm, except for the fact that money we hid in one place or another had disappeared. After living there a while, we met the neighbors. They informed us former owner's wife had died from cancer in the bedroom photo and scarves were found. His son, portrait found, 
had offed himself at the Yucca Valley Inn. Ashes had been spread on the property, according to them, the neighbors, but these facts were not disclosed to us at the time that we bought the house. After living there some 19 to 20 years, we decided to move, not because of spirits, just now that the kids have grown up and moved out on their own and wanted to downsize. I used to live at the House of a Thousand Stairs in Redlands, California. I lived there for about 10 years off and on with my godparents. They lived there full time. I came on the weekends and during the summer. This place is very active at night. My god sister and I would see the spirits of ghostly nuns walking down the stairs. They would stop to ring the bells in the bell towers, and then evaporate into a mist. After a while, we removed the bell that connected to the stairs. There were other spirits as well. Some were pleasant, while other spirits we believed were demons. I think the scariest experience we had was one night, when I was sleeping in one of the rooms. I woke up to seeing multiple green lights floating aimlessly around me before disappearing. They had to have been orbs. I remember there was a closet which was slightly open. When I looked at the closet, I noticed the head of a figure peeking out with red eyes. If you've seen the famous Amityville horror picture, that's how it looked to me, except with red eyes of course. There are tunnels that run under the property, and rooms as well, all made out of dirt. Some of the rooms doors have been covered over with dirt and rocks, so that you cannot get in. If you stay down there at night, you will see nuns going in and out of these rooms that have been covered over. I'm not sure what the nuns did in this house, but there are many restless spirits here. I also believe this place draws mentally unstable people to it. While we lived there, on multiple occasions, we had to call the police because people would break into the property, knocking at our door, telling us the spirits told them to come here. There are so many stories I could tell you, but it's a very unusual place after a while. My god sister and I would sleep in the game room next to our parents' room because we were too scared to stay in our room. That's about all I'm willing to share for now, but I hope you enjoyed these stories. I know that most high schools claim to be haunted, but my old alma mater has everything from restless Indian spirits, students that died on campus, as well as the spirits of some priests that passed away at the campus. Its name is Bishop Almy High School. It's located immediately next to the San Fernando Mission, San Fernando Mission Cemetery, and is directly across the street from Eden Memorial Park, a cemetery for Jewish believers. To make this easier, I will list the different stories I've heard and my own limited encounters. 1. Our schools built on what used to be an old orange grove. It was also used as a burial ground for Native Americans who built the mission. Several different faculty members have heard the sounds of an old woman crying right inside our alumni hall, and one claiming to have seen her pacing back and forth. I myself went there late with three friends one night in an attempt to see if we could prove anything for ourselves. We heard the same crying noises and saw a brief glimpse of a black silhouette through the all glass walls of the building. Other faculty members have claimed to see an Indian chief in full ceremonial garb near the school's chapel and the hallways behind it. Three. Members of the water pole, swimming team, and marching band have heard a young boy crying from the old archives.
Caves, located underneath the buildings on the west side of campus. The water polo and swimming teams used to use the old showers that were built for the priests when the school was a seminary, and the band used to store its equipment in spare rooms down there. One story of an eyewitness who saw the spirit is one of the creepiest our school has. A few of the girls on the swim team went down to the showers after practice and found all the shower heads on and a little boy standing in the middle of the room. The boy didn't respond to any attempts at conversation. The girls left to get a coach to try and get the boy to talk. When they got back, all of the shower heads were off and the boy was nowhere to be found. This part of the school is directly next to the graveyard. Only a chain link fence separates the two properties. Our pool is technically rented space from the graveyard. In the new school archives, located on the second floor of the building over the old archives, there have been reported sightings of a priest in his uniform, reading or filing books. This same hallway, nicknamed the Forbidden Hallway by students, because it has all the permanent records in school's computer's mainframes and is off limits to any student without permission, it was once the dorm rooms for the young priests in training when the site still served at the cemetery. A lot of men of God passed on at this location. Five. The hallway behind the school's chapel has had several sightings. The Indian chief, the little boy, and shadowy silhouette have all been seen here. The boy's bathroom is a hot spot for strange happenings late at night. I would be there late for extracurriculars or what have you, and one night when I was there, the door to this bathroom closed and opened twice. No one else was there to do this, trying to test the spirit. I said, is someone here? And the stall door I was in flung open. It didn't feel like a bad spirit, but it was definitely wanting to make itself known. There were plenty of other stories at the school from all different sources. Those are just the ones I've heard the most in my own little two encounters. I really hope this haunting hotspot gets a slot on this website, because I don't think spirits are going anywhere. Yes, great website. When I was a little girl about four or five years old, I remember this clearly as if it happened yesterday. I did something bad to be sent to my room as a punishment. I was laying in bed, not sleeping mind you, just laying there, looking up the ceiling. As you may have guessed, I was bored out of my skull. Anyway, a few moments later, I looked at the head of my bed and saw two white heads, round shaped with red eyes, no teeth or any body for that matter. They just kept staring at me. I screamed as loud as I could and my mother came running into the room. As soon as she did, the image or ghostly figure or whatever it was had vanished. This house that this happened in was known to be haunted. I'm not sure by what. I asked my mother years afterwards if she had any odd experience in that house. After I told her what happened, she said yeah. When she was down in the basement doing laundry, she heard someone call her name. No one was in the house at the time. I'm not sure where I was or my brother were at the time, but I know we didn't call her. We call her mommy, not by her first name, as this thing did. She answered it. Now as I recall, if something unknown calls out your name and you answer it, isn't that an invite? This house is located in Vermont on West Road in Burlington. I forget the number of the house. My mother said I was a gifted child, gifted, meaning able to sense things. 
as well as sometimes able to predict the future, which I've had in the past. It's not something that happens to me all of the time. Just once in a blue moon, I'd get visions in my dreams that had come as warning signs. For example, my brother was going on spring break during the days of his high school years, driving his jeep over to coastal beaches in Florida. I recall having a dream of him doing this, and his jeep caught fire while he was driving down the road. Odd how this dream came about. I told my brother not to go. He thought I was crazy, of course, and he didn't believe in that sort of thing, nor does my husband. Anyway, my brother called me up one day and said that his Jeep caught fire. He had a flat tire and parked on the side of the road. He wasn't going to spring break. He was just heading over to a friend's house when this happened. Come to find out, some punk started the fire to his jeep. In 1977, my friend and I were driving on Old Pleasanton Road during the night. We were heading south when we came upon a woman wearing a black wedding dress. All she was doing was standing there, not moving an inch. We decided to pull over to see if she needed assistance, but didn't go too close, in case it could have been an ambush. No response from the woman. We didn't see that she had a vehicle anywhere around. It was beyond sketch, so we ended up not helping the woman out and continued to drive down the road. As we were driving down the road, we could have sworn we saw the lady through my rearview mirror. She was following us. The only difference was, she was not walking. She was floating towards us. This was after we had driven a mile from where we originally saw her, and there was no way she could have caught up with us in time. Within seconds, the lady disappeared and she was nowhere in sight. We had to stop the car on the side of the road to gather ourselves, because it almost felt like something out of a movie. When I got home, I told my grandma what happened to us, and she was stunned just like I was. A week after this incident, around the same time period, I received a phone call that my friend was found murdered with a knife through his heart, at the same location where we spotted the lady a week ago. My grandma told me that it could have been death coming for him. I still tremble at the thought of reliving all that happened in that dark night in 1977. Great Aunt Amy she lived in a small two-room shack in the middle of a very remote wooded area in northern Michigan, next to her brother and his wife. I remember her writing to me in the mid-60s and telling me they had a road name and a sign now. My younger sister and I loved going there to visit. We would walk in the woods and explore an old cabin and trailer in the woods north of them. They lived very primitively an outhouse with magazines for toilet paper, and slaughtered their own pigs and cows. There was a great green apple tree down the road, and we always stopped to get our pickings before heading home. One time, we heard a weird noise, and my mother told us to hurry up and get in the car. We had to get going. It was a bear calling for a cup, and we were downwind. Mom feared we may have been between the mother bear and her cub. Whenever we went to visit, we went to see the uncle and his wife first, then great aunt Amy. Although we would see her peering over the tiered kitchen curtain when we arrived, great aunt Amy was very short and stout, and you could just see the top of her head from the eyes up over the lower curtain and I'm sure she was on her tiptoes at that. 
but she was always so surprised to see us and just happened to have cookies or rolls just out of the oven. The day of her funeral, the late 1970s, my sister Kathy and I got out of the back seat of the car on opposite sides. I looked at Craig on Amy's cabin and then looked over the top of the car at my sister. I knew she saw her too. Craig on Amy's little head, eyes peering up over the curtain, as she always did when we came to visit. I could almost smell those rolls baking that she just happened to be making. Recently, my sister and I took a random trip to the area and went by to see the little old cabin again. But this time, it was gone. A new home stood just to the east of its location. I was very disappointed. My sister turned to me and said, that's all right. She's still there. Can you feel her? I could. My father remarried three years ago, and when we moved into his wife's house, I began experiencing paranormal things. I've experienced things ever since I was a child. My mom and siblings were always sensitive to the paranormal. My siblings were pretty used to it, but I'd never seen anything significant until we moved into our new home. It started slowly. I couldn't sleep well at night and had been hearing bangs. I dismissed it all at first as being in new surroundings, but it continued. My sister moved in and we began sharing stories about things we had heard in the house. They were matching up pretty well. One night I was laying in bed and I heard hand slams against my window and slide down it. I freaked out because my window had a screen on it. So I went into my sister's room to sleep with her and kept hearing banging from my room. There was no one in there. I slept in my sister's room a couple of times before I could sleep in my room again. I began seeing black masses for brief moments after a while and my sister had one in her room that was about eight feet tall and human shaped. We began doing all that we knew, which was praying. After a few years of this, I got a little used to it, but couldn't wander the halls at night without being terrified. One night, I was playing on the computer and heard a very loud bang like a door slamming, so I went to my room. I shut my door and leaned against it and heard running up and down the hallway. Things like this began happening on a regular basis. And at the time, I felt like my sister was the only one I could talk to. Then one day, something on a different level happened. I was in bed at night, and I had a bunch of glass carousels on my dresser. I'm a firm believer in 3am being the witching hour. And at that time, all my carousels went off playing music, and a couple fell off the dresser. Once again, I played and slept with the lights on. I had one final major experience before I moved out. My dad's room stayed locked during the day, so when we heard scratching on the walls, it sounded like something was scratching the walls and the ceiling. I ran to the bedroom door and it stopped, but could see a shadow moving around under the door. The scratching then continued, so I went outside. I moved and don't experience things like that anymore, but sometimes hear noises in my apartment. I just ignore it because I know my family and I are skeptical to these kinds of things. Just keep my faith and know that I know it's human in my apartment, in my dad's house. I'm not so sure. This happened to my mother's uncle in the 50s. 
her aunt and uncle were coming back to San Antonio, Texas on Highway 87 when their car broke down during the night. Uncle Steve went walking during the midnight hour to get help before he told my aunt to lock all the doors. She did just that. About 3 a.m., three men in a car stopped to help her. They told her that they would help her, but she told them that her husband had gone to get help, and he might be coming back. So, the men told her that they will leave, and they were going to leave her some food in a brown paper bag, which they left on the hood of her car. Hours after she thought about the food in the bag, but she was too scared to get out of the car. Soon, a highway trooper arrived. She told him that her car broke, and her husband had gone, and never returned. The trooper asked her if she had seen a few gentlemen in a 57 Chevy. She told him about the three men that stopped, and before he left, he asked her about the bag on the hood of the car. She told him that the men left her some food, in case she would get hungry. The officer grabbed the bag and peeked in it, and out of the bag, her husband's head came out. She has not been the same ever since then. I live in a small town in Kansas. I've lived in several houses in this town, and in just about each house, have had strange experiences. The first I can recall was in a small farmhouse in the country. My sister and I shared a room and had bunk beds. The head of the bed was the opposite of how most people would set a room up. The head of the bed was by the window and the foot of the bed was flush to the wall. I was in the bottom bunk and my sister on the top bunk. I recall waking up one night and looking out the window to the shed that was across from me. In the top window, the second floor, I noticed a black human figure, no discernible facial features. It had a pale yellow light glowing around it, just purely out of fear and not wanting to experience this alone. I asked my sister, who was supposedly asleep on the top bunk, if she was seeing what I was seeing, not expecting to hear it to really answer me. And she said, yes, we still joke about our psychic connection. When I was in high school and living in a small town as I do, my friends and I would drive around the countryside, mostly because we heard that there was some scary haunted place outside of town and we always liked to investigate. But one night, I was sitting in the front seat of my friend's car and noticed that there was a small boy running in the road ahead of us. It was rather late at night, at least sometime after midnight, a very strange hour for young boys to be running out in the country. I noticed that he had on a red and green striped shirt and brown pants. What was really creepy though, was the way he just kept looking back at us, almost begging to be hit. I could only see this boy at the middle point of the curve in the road. Just as we were rounding the last corner, he would disappear. It would only last several seconds. I questioned whether or not I was losing my mind, or if I really saw it, because no one else did. Another story I have was when I bought the house I live in now, still the same town. I'd fallen asleep on the floor in my living room. My dog was sleeping next to me. I'm not even sure what exactly woke me up, but when I looked towards my bedroom, I could see a small girl in a white nightgown. She had blonde hair, and next to her was a white cat. I could see through them. They had a mist around them, and again, just as it registered what I was seeing, they vanished. A few months later, I was in my room, standing on the edge of my bed, which is right next to the bedroom door. 
I was reaching for the light fixture to change the light bulb. With my arms extended, I noticed a man, dark short hair, and in his 30s, he had dark rimmed glasses, and he walked past me through the living room into my room. As soon as he got past my arm, so he would be standing right in front of me, he disappeared. I've also noticed small dark figures, a possible dog like roaming around me when I was walking in my house at night. I always try to jump over them, thinking that it was my dog, but she was in another room when this happened. In 1978, my parents purchased a relatively new house in Niceville, Florida. The land the house had been built on had previously been a swamp that was drained to make way for the housing subdivision. Nothing bad had ever happened in the house, yet after living in the house for a short time, we all began to notice odd things. It started the night I broke up with my fiance. My parents had got out for the evening, and I was in my bedroom crying. Suddenly, I realized I was not alone. I looked up, and I saw a woman dressed in the turn of the century clothing. She had a look of extreme empathy on her face. I did a double take. Never take your eyes off of them, I've learned, and my visitor was gone. My brother brought our engagement ring into my room so that I could take it to work the next day and have it sized. When I woke up from my nap, I got the ring off the dresser and noticed that it wasn't quite right. I got on my lupe and discovered that the ring had been squashed. I took the ring to my parents and showed it to them. Dad examined the ring. As a scientist, he was a little more observant than I was. He pointed out that the ring appeared to have been squashed from the right beside the head that held the diamond, as if it had been sitting on the rear shank of the ring, and an incredible force put on it that literally broke the head from the shank without leaving a single scratch or gouge mark. That kind of spooked me since I had been sleeping with the ring on the nightstand next to my head, and it had been fine prior to being placed by my bed. However, events would soon unfold that made us all realize that the house was indeed haunted by the lady, but she was a friendly ghost, provided you were nice to her family. After having moved to the house, my mom was in a terrible car accident, which almost killed her. She was in the hospital for over six weeks, and even after she got out, she was in and out of the hospital repeatedly. By this time, I was married and out of the house, but my middle sister's kids would stay over while my sister worked nights. My niece slept in my old room, which seemed to soon become the epicenter for activity perhaps because of the pre-adolescent age. It started with her being awakened by the feeling that someone was sitting on the bed. She turned on the light and saw depression in the bed, as if someone were sitting there. As she watched, the depression slowly lifted out, as if the person sitting there had stood up. She was too frightened to sleep in the room. After that, so her brother slept there for her. He was awakened every night by the sound of a dresser drawer being pulled out and rattled. At first he thought it was Granny, but then he turned the light on and there was no one there. The final straw for my sister's kids came when they were sleeping over one night. Mom had just been released from the hospital yet again and was sitting up in the den. Dad had gone to bed. Suddenly, 
Dad was awakened by the sound of the smoke alarms going off. He ran into the den and found Mom passed out. She had been in incredible pain since her accident and had begun stashing pills for a grand escape. That night, she had gotten so depressed that she ended up taking all the pills that she had been hoarding. There was no evidence of smoke in the house, not even mom's usual cigarette smoke. By this time, the smoke alarms had stopped blaring their alarms, but dad stood there, surveying the scene and thinking about how much pain mom was in and how horrible her life had been since the accident and even going as far as to whether it was even right for him to decide that mom was not entitled to escape the horror her life had become. Then the smoke alarms went off again. Dad figured somebody was trying to tell him something and he called 911. The next day after we had all been to the hospital to make sure that mom was going to be okay, we all gathered at my parents' house. I asked Ed why he had called the paramedics. I felt like the doctors who had saved my mom's life after the accident had not taken into consideration the lack of quality of life she would have, and I felt like mom was entitled to a reprieve from the constant torment she was in. Dad looked at me kind of funny and explained about the smoke detectors. Then he said that when he had gotten home later that night, he had torn each of the smoke detectors apart, and there was nothing wrong with any of them, nor was there any reason they should have gone off in the first place. Once Dad told us this, we all sat there with odd looks on our faces and started talking about the lady. By this time, I'd seen her twice. My older sister had seen her once, and my skeptical scientist dad even admitted to having seen her. We began comparing notes and found us finishing each other's stories and descriptions. We had all seen the same lady dressed in the same clothing, and none of us had mentioned it to the others for fear of being ridiculed. As time went by, the lady continued to watch over her family. After my dad's death in 1998, my then husband and I were in the den of the house after we had cleaned out the possessions and cleaned the house up. I'd left a book on the counter and X went back to get it. Our marriage was on the rocks and he was becoming increasingly abusive to me. Something that the lady didn't seem to care for. He had always laughed at our family ghost stories up till the day. But when he went back in the house to get my book, he came out of the house shaking and white. He had felt a cold hand brush across his face. Then, when he didn't leave fast enough, he felt the same cold hand pushing him in the back, propelling him to the door. The lady was trying to tell him that. She did not appreciate the way she was treating one of her kids, nor was he welcome in her home. After that, the lady began dropping by my house. I always knew she was around because the stove timer would go off for no reason and the dresser drawers would rattle. After I left the abusive hobby and moved to the Midwest, the lady would come by and visit me there from time to time, always setting off the timer on the stove, rattling drawers, playing tricks with the blinds, anything she could do to let me know she was keeping an eye out for me. I realized that this is unusual for ghosts to leave their primary residence and to actually follow people from home to home, but I talked to some friends who all felt like the lady was probably a female ancestor who had died in childbirth, so she felt responsible for looking out for her family. After going through the family archives, we found a photo of my great-grandmother. She had died of appendicitis 
when she was pregnant, the baby also died. The woman in the photo looked like the lady. My sister is now living in the house. When she first moved in, she put some pots in the cabinet, then went to the bathroom for a minute. When she came back out, the pots were sitting on the floor. Earrings and rings that have been lost for years, some in different houses that we lived in, suddenly appeared on the cabinet or in my sister's jewelry box. Unseen hands frequently pull back the curtains to look outside, and my sister's dog loves to romp and play with the unseen visitor. I could go on and on about all the poltergeist activity, some that seemed to be coming from the lady, others that seemed to be coming from my deceased dad. From fax machines that go off when they aren't plugged in, my deceased dad's voice calling me to wake me up when the gas fireplace developed a leak, even luggage being set on its end. Weird stuff just follows my sister and I around. Just two nights ago, while laying in bed, I was awakened by the bed shaking. I sat up and looked around and found my husband sound asleep and the door securely closed against kitty visitors. I laid back down and snuggled up to my hobby, thinking that he just had a chronic jerk that shook the bed when it suddenly hit again. The whole bed kind of went wop, as if a 20 pound weight had been dropped on it. This time, I knew that there were no cats in the room, and since I had been snuggled up to my hobby, I knew he had not jerked in his sleep. It's nice having your own guardian spirit to watch over you, but it can really interfere with your sleeping. I know that some people think that we're all nuts, or engaging in what shrinks call magical thinking, but every time I start to question my own sanity, I get another visit. It should be interesting when we move to my dad's hometown this spring. I imagine the visits will become a regular thing. Growing up in rural northern Wisconsin, there were few opportunities for earning cash aside from service positions and agricultural work. Coming from a farm family myself, as a youth, I would hire myself out to farmers to help with the work on their respective farms, mostly crops and dairy cattle. If you never have this experience, it may come as a surprise that these farms are usually isolated and could be quite unfriendly, creepy, and sometimes dangerous. Physical injuries like losing an eye or a limb or even a life are not uncommon. This is the setting for my story. One January, I was a hired boy at a dairy farm owned by an elderly couple with whom I was acquainted with through a parish church. The farmer's house was heated by a wood furnace in the basement where I was lodged and among my other jobs. I had to bring in the wood and tend the fire. One day, while carrying wood down the steps, I felt pushed, which caused me to slip and fall down the stairs, landing on the concrete floor, which knocked me out temporarily. I must have been out only a minute or two as I awoke in pain and found the wood scattered all over. The farmer was very stern, and I feared how you would react to a mess and me not being busy with the work to which I had been assigned. When he did see me, he asked where I had been and what I had been doing, and so I explained it to him. As I suspected, he was cross with me. Later that night, over supper, he told me a story which made me rethink my staying there. He related that some time ago, his wife, although a Catholic like me, had been dabbling in the occult, 
things like divination, astrology, cards, etc. Odd things began happening around the farm, and it was no longer prospering. He told me that the last straw had been when he awoke to find her levitating above their bed in the middle of the night. They decided to call the parish priest. The priest whom I will call Father X in the story was a mature, spiritual, and virtuous man whom I knew and respected. His brother was likewise a priest and an exorcist. The couple explained what was happening on their farm and house. Father X had to get rid of the occult books and the paraphernalia, and after hearing their confession and absolving them, offered to bless and cleanse the house with a kind of minor exorcism. Before getting out his handbook of rituals and his stolen holy water, he had them close and lock the doors and windows for some reason. He went through the residence, leading the couple in prayers and reciting the house blessing and minor prayers of exorcism, all the while sprinkling each room with holy water. When they reached the last room, which was the kitchen, Father X was finishing the prayers, and after everyone said Amen, the kitchen door, which led outside, unlocked by itself opened and then slammed shut. Father X then explained that this is why he had locked the doors previously, to make sure that by the door opening and closing by invisible force, he could tell by that sign that the spirit had really left. The farmer went on to explain that he liked the instruction that Father X had left him with, namely, that the devil is like a dog on a leash. The demons are all restrained by the power of God, he said, chained, as it were, and they cannot really hurt you, directly, unless you come within their reach. Occult practices, blasphemies, and even grave sins can put people in places within the perimeter of the influence of evil spirits, and so if you want to avoid being harmed by them, don't come near them any more than you would approach a vicious dog that has been chained. I asked the farmer if the basin where I was lodging was also blessed. The farmer thought for a moment and said he did not recall that it was. The door to the basin was right outside of the kitchen door. After the experience with my fall that day, in the story that the farmer told me about what had transpired, I determined that I would not stay there another week. I left and didn't return. I didn't explain why, except to say that I wanted to be closer to the parish church and I wanted to go to daily mass. I did not have my own transportation at that time, except my bicycle. The farmer was unhappy that I left as I was hardworking and well behaved, but for me, there were plenty of other farms where I could work that did not have such problems. Throughout my life I had seen and experienced a few things that I can only describe as supernatural. Everything I'm about to tell you about actually happened and I will describe each experience as I remember them. The first thing I can remember happened whenever I was only a young boy, growing up outside a village in Northern Ireland called Besbrook. It was during the winter because we had a heavy snowfall the previous night, and I was outside playing with my two brothers. After a while, I went inside to warm up because my hands were frozen. My mother told me to take off my boots so that I wouldn't tramp snow all over the house. I sat down at the table with a bowl of soup in front of me, and it was then that I noticed something out of the corner of my eye in the hall leading from the kitchen to the living room. I turned to see what it was, and what I saw 
absolutely terrified me. I saw the figure of a woman walking down the hall towards the kitchen. I just got up and ran out the door without putting on my boots and jacket into the snow and refused to come back inside, even though my mother insisted that there was no woman in the house. Over the next number of years, nothing happened except what sounded like somebody walking around the house. Even when the rest of the household was in bed or away, everyone heard the noises but chose to ignore them. Then one Saturday morning while I was still in bed, I was shook and awake and told to get up and come down to breakfast. Whenever I opened my eyes, there was no one in the room, so I assumed that they had already gone downstairs. While I was getting dressed, a voice was calling from downstairs for me to hurry up. When I did get down to the kitchen, there was no one around. Everyone else was still in bed. A few days after, my youngest brother claims to have saw a young boy standing in my parents' bedroom who just stood there looking at him. Shortly after this, someone unknown tacked my brother in his bed, leaving him with a black eye. The next few years were quiet except for the noises Nothing else that I know of has happened in that house, except for the noises, but I did tell you that I lived outside a village. The best way to get to the village is through a wooded area, and this place is a very strange place. I could distinctly remember a moment when I had to walk through these woods to get to the village, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I saw a circle of people in white robes just standing in a circle and holding hands. I was so scared about what was happening that I ran the other direction and no longer wanted to run through those woods ever again. I actually had a friend of mine who was walking through the woods and he swears to this day that he saw a woman just flying from the distance from one side to the other looked like a witch, but she was floating, had really dark black hair, and it just looked like she faded out. These are the only things I've seen in my life, and with that last story, my friend has seen, but I've heard other stories by people I know. The shop at the bottom of the road is said to be haunted by the ghosts of the seven British people killed there in the 80s whenever the original patrol station was blown up. I mentioned earlier, I'm from Northern Ireland. There is a high viaduct in the area, which is used as a railway line. 18 people died constructing it, one for each arch, and numerous others have off themselves off of it. The stories are that at times, you can see these people and they all look sad. There is also the blood on one wall in a friend's house, and no matter how many times it is painted over, the blood still comes through. All this is true, and has happened within a square mile of where I live. My friend from Arizona and I made our first trip to the Queen Mary together. We happened to run into a paranormal researcher when we were on a tour and decided to stay the night. We rented a room with two beds so the researcher could stay with us and show us around the old boat in the middle of the night when the most activity had been reported. We attempted to fall asleep around 11 p.m. I managed to sleep quite easily and wasn't scared about sleeping in one of the reported haunted rooms. About five minutes after I fell asleep, my friend wakes me up. The first thing I remember was hearing a staticky voice and thought it was a radio. It wasn't until she asked me if I heard the voice. That was when I realized there was no radio anywhere in my room. My instant reaction was to turn on the light 
and look around the room. I reached up and tried turning on the light and nothing happened. We were really freaking out now. The light had just been on. My friend finally turned her light on and we laid there in bed for a few more minutes and I decided to try the light again and this time it turned on no problem. We tried to fall asleep again because we wanted to wander around the ship at 3 a.m. to avoid security guards. As soon as we turned off the lights and laid down, I saw my blanket pushed down and felt something on my arm. My friend also reported feeling things brush against her arm. As tired as we were, we just decided to ignore it all and go to sleep. Three o'clock rolled around and we went to the pool room. Reported to be the most paranormally active area on board. We took several pictures and the researcher and my friend called out to the known ghosts. I didn't want to because I really felt like I was intruding. I felt sad and angry feelings throughout the whole area. I was looking around when we all heard a man moaning. My friend and I booked it back up the stairs and stood against the wall. After a few minutes, we joined the researcher again and he continued to call out to a little girl named Jackie. I wasn't paying attention at the time, but I heard my friend gasp and I looked over and she asked me if I heard that. I missed it. The researcher heard it too. It was the voice of the little girl. She was singing for them. I will never forget my experiences at the Queen Mary and actually plan on going back soon. I came aboard not believing and left a member of a paranormal research group. My girlfriend Liz and I haven't been together for very long, but we share a passion for ghosts and hauntings. On our second date, we went to a couple sites in our county that are supposed to be haunted. The scariest one has to be the Jericho Covered Bridge, located in either Falston or Jarrettsville, depending on who you ask. As Liz and I drove up to the bridge, a heavy fog rolled in, almost like the ones you see in the old movies set in places like London. This was weird because Liz and I have been driving around the county for the last two hours and we had only encountered fog in this one place. Maryland was a neutral state during the Civil War, but racism ran deep here. The Jericho Covered Bridge is a grim reminder of that. It is a well-known local legend that runaway slaves were hung from the rafters of the bridge and sometimes left there for days. As we drove over the bridge, we both felt a chill and a sense of terror in the air. Like the bridge had been in fact the scene of unspeakable horror, neither one of us really wanted to leave the safety of the vehicle to take the pictures we were so willing to take just a few minutes prior. Eventually though, we did take the pictures and when we got them developed, we found only two pictures had turned out. In the first one, you can see some kind of disturbance in the air towards the rafters. And in the second one, we can definitely see an orb in the area where just a minute before the unidentified disturbance had manifested itself. A couple of months ago, I was living in a house with similar history as the Hanging Bridge. It was a super old Victorian style home, very big, wide and spacious, multiple rooms. A few things happened that I thought was very spooky. The first incident happened when I was sleeping with my girlfriend in bed. In one of the rooms upstairs, we had an old music box that was in the dining room. It came with the house. I was awoken by the sounds of the music box playing by itself and could see that the door was slightly opened. Needing answers, I hopped out of bed to investigate, 
not understanding how the music box could play by itself. Needless to say, I made a gigantic mistake. As I opened the door and faced the stairs, I saw a dark shadow move directly up the stairs and then disappear. I froze for a second, almost chickened out, but decided to go downstairs anyway. To my surprise, there was nothing there, and all was silent. The music box had stopped playing. Another time, I was standing in the kitchen with one of my friends, and we were the only two people in the house at this time. We decided to use a spirit box and play with the Ouija board to conduct a session. I was fairly convinced that there was a spirit that needed guidance and was lost. We asked the spirit box multiple questions, but at first, no response was given to us. After nearly an hour, being frustrated, we nearly gave up. That was until we asked the spirit to give us a sign that they were still there. My back started to hurt, like some kind of pressure was being applied to it. I said to the ghost, is that you on my back? Now get this, the spirit box sounded like it said death on the bridge. This immediately startled us, knowing that down the road was the hanging bridge. We tried asking it follow up questions after that, but the spirit didn't say anything. And just like that, the pressure on my back disappeared. I was starting to think that the ghost was trying to tell us that they were one of the ghosts that tragically passed on the bridge. The last incident happened in the kitchen. The kitchen door was slightly opened, and all of a sudden, I heard what sounded like a girl's whisper in my ear. As I looked towards the door, I saw a lady, I think, who walked past the door. At first, I thought it was my friend Laura, who always used to wear jeans. So, I popped my head around the corner to try and scare her, but there was no one there. I wasn't scared, because it was in the middle of the day. I actually found the experience quite exciting, but also unexplainable. To this day, I've always thought these incidents were all related to the hanging bridge. The Job Corps in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was a student there in 1973. Since then, there has been a lot of renovation on the buildings, but when I was attending the Job Corps, it was pretty much the same as it was when it was an orphanage. One night actually at 2 a.m. in the morning, when I came back to the dorms after babysitting, I had to walk across the campus to get to my room at the far end of the campus. While walking down to my room, all was very quiet in the dorms. Out of nowhere, I hear what sounded like children laughter in the distance. It was very faint, but I could definitely hear something. Yet, through the faintness of the sound, you could still hear shouts of glee and anger as little children would do on a playground if that makes sense. This happened behind the little chapel that was there, but the sounds came right there from behind the old chapel. And while I looked and squinted, I didn't see anybody there. I thought to myself at the time, why would parents allow their children to play so late outside? It was cold and it was dark. Meanwhile, my hair was standing on end and I tested the wind to see if the noise was carried from another place. Noises can carry long distances. There was no wind at all. At the time, I didn't know that the job corps used to be an orphanage until the next morning when I was talking to my friend about hearing those children. This service worker told me that she used to work there as a service worker for the orphanage. She told me the voices I heard were probably the little children that died of broken hearts while she had worked there. Her face went pale, 
as she told me that the children she thought were treated cruelly. There are two versions of this legend that I know. It's called the Devil's Footprint. The first is about a construction worker that was aggravated with a boulder that would not budge. The man stepped on the boulder and said, I will give my soul to the devil, this boulder will move. By the next day, the boulder had moved, and there was an imprint of a human foot and a hoof print of the devil. The man was never seen again. The other version is about a farmer that was having a terrible harvest. He then said, I will give my soul to the devil if I had a bountiful harvest. Indeed, the farmer's harvest was bountiful, and he made plenty of money. The farmer was quite pleased with himself until the day the devil came to collect. The farmer refused to give the devil what he wanted, and a chase ensued. They ran all around the farmer's land, and the chase ended when they reached a cliff. I believe the footprints happened when they had their final fight at that cliff edge. I've heard many stories about the devil's footprint being haunted. My fiancé told me about occurrence that happened when he was there with his brothers when he was about 13. He said that his brother was contacted by a ghost, according to him, and his brother swears this very day. He was standing in front of the church doors, and being a rebellious young man that he was, he attempted to kick the doors open. At the moment his foot hit the door, it swung open and knocked him off the steps. Now, you may be thinking that there was probably someone on the other side of the door playing a prank, but keep this in mind, the doors open inward, not outward. I also know someone that was there very late at night, and she swears that she saw hooded men walking in the edge of the woods. I myself had an experience of sorts. One night, a friend and I decided to go find the place. We drove and drove, and we couldn't find it. When my friend was so sure she had driven too far, she turned back. We figured we'd better wait until daylight to look for it, so we turned on the road that we thought would take us home. And what did we see? The old cemetery in that unmistakable white church. Of course, we freaked out. My friend swerved and barely escaped going off the road. By this time, we were both feeling a little unsettling feeling in our chests. Now, whether this was due to some unwelcome presence or fear, I'm not certain. I'm assuming the latter. However, needless to say, we didn't stop there that night. My name is Bobby, and I was checking out your website, and I decided I should send in my own story. We live in Gross Point Shores, Michigan. This event happened on Monday, August 15th, 2005. One day, my brother named Vince was on the computer at about 4 o'clock when he heard a scream. He ran upstairs to find me and my older brother named Sam. Vince asked what was wrong, and we asked him what he was talking about, and he said he heard a woman scream, and we said nobody screamed. We were also the only ones in the house. We got scared, but eventually thought that Vince was probably hearing things, and forgot about it. But a week later, me and Sam saw this website, and decided to check if something was haunting our house. We checked everywhere, but found nothing. But just as we were about to give up, Sam said to me that we never checked the attic. This was the first time that anyone was up there in the attic in a very long time. We got to the attic door and opened up the hatch, and a ladder came unfolded from the top of the door. We started climbing up the ladder and got to the attic, and it was all dark. 
I felt the wall right behind me and found a light switch. I flipped the switch and a dim light turned on. There was this old rocking chair rocking back and forth, the one that my grandmother used to have before she died. We totally forgot that we had gotten it and threw it up in the attic. Either way, we were freaked out. After about two seconds, we heard a scream so loud that it knocked me backward against Sam. We climbed as fast as we could down the ladder and shut the attic door. We were so scared that we didn't tell anyone except Vince about what happened. We checked the time and it was exactly 4.06. We now know that Vince heard the scream from the attic a week earlier. All we know about the people that lived here before us is that they were the Andersons and that they were an old couple that lived here and raised their kids here. I don't think it was my grandma's spirit because she was always a gentle soul and wouldn't scare us like that. Anyway, after all the kids moved out and Miss Anderson died, a short while after that, he sold his house to us about four years ago. I believe Miss Anderson was the one who screamed. I guess she was mad that we stole her house from her. When I was a freshman in high school, my parents moved us from the city in central New York to a big, empty house in the country. Little did we know that the house is haunted. So many things happened there that even my skeptical dad began to believe that we were sharing the house with someone or something else. My best ghost encounter occurred in the middle of the day. I walked into the bathroom and saw from the corner of my eye someone that I thought was my youngest sister. I said hey Lori, but she didn't answer me. Annoyed, I turned to find out what her problem was, only to realize that it wasn't her at the sink. An old woman with gray hair up in a bun, a pink flower dress, and a white apron was drying her hands. She turned to look at me, and then she disappeared. We weren't often frightened of the ghosts and miss them when things seemed to be quiet for too long. We would lament that they didn't like us anymore. One day, I was in the house and I went into the shower. All of a sudden, there was a huge noise. I thought a plane hit the house, or at least there was a terrible car accident outside. I jumped out, grabbed my rope, and went to investigate. I found nothing out of order at all. So I got back into the shower. Not two minutes later, I heard that huge noise again. I jumped out, shaking this time, and checked everywhere. But again, there was nothing to find. I decided to skip my shower. I had a ghostly nightmare about this house before even moving in. My family moved into the house, and from day one, things were creepy. People before had moved out in a hurry, and their family broke apart almost instantly in four months. They all spread to four different places. When we moved in, we all got terribly sick within the first month. My mom had a life-threatening experience. My sister ran away. All the pets in the house died mysteriously, with no known cause of death. My parents divorced. All of this happened in only four months. I walked into the house after school one day, and I heard my name being called. I knew no one was home because none of the cars were in the driveway. The voice calling my name sounded exactly like my mother, and I looked all around for her, even though I knew that she was presently in the hospital. Within the next few days, and a few more creepy, paranormal events, all four of us left in just as much of a hurry as the one before us, leaving most of our personal belongings. We all split 
each of us in a different car, to different places away from each other, and away from the house. I will never go back to see it, nor would I wish the haunting of the house on anyone else. Hello. I lived at this house from 97 to 99. It was in Atlanta. My family and many of my friends were witnesses to the occurrences. Voices, electronics malfunctioning, dark figures. It happened day and night, but mostly at night. It is an older white home near the river, and for a while, we had a rat problem. The plumbers had left a hole under the bathroom sink. The rats, who were fond of shiny objects, left two human molars, complete with silver fillings, on the bathroom floor on two separate occasions. The back of the home had a foul odor off and on, and the crawl space had been cemented over. I'm an investigator for the state, not a hysteric. But the place made a believer out of me, my family, and half a dozen friends. My then four-year-old son complained of the man in the mirror with a string around his neck. Voices were male and female, also a small child. I have often felt the crawl space needed to be examined, just never could figure out a way to ask the officials to do such. I truly think that there is a body her bodies under that house. Myself and a girlfriend watched as a man-shaped shadow moved across the dining room wall into the kitchen where the light turned on while we're checking out if you can get the new owner's permission. So when I was about 17, my family had just moved back to Canada from living in the USA. It was a bit sudden, and being a family of six, it was a little bit of a scramble to find a place to house all of us before the snow hit. So, my mom and dad decided to live in an old house that my grandpa had on his property, just for the duration of the approaching winter ahead. The house was my great uncle's, and my grandpa skidded from my brother's property to his place. Now my grandpa has two quarter sections, and this house is tucked way back away from the main house, so the powers ran from the main house, and with it being so far away, there is no running water. This house is old, so to add to the running water, there also is in heat, only a wood stove, just to give you an idea of where we were living in. Me, being a 17 year old. I often stayed in town, and didn't stay there very often. I specifically remember the first time it happened. I was in my bed. I was the only one who would stay downstairs. With the wood stove, everyone wanted to sleep upstairs since it was warmer. So I was just starting to fall asleep, and I started to feel the room get really heavy. I remember the feeling of not being alone. The doorway didn't have a door on it. It only had a beaded curtain, and I could feel it standing there. I then remember having the feeling of total fear rush over me, and frozen to my core with it. Then, it moved closer, and I felt the bed move, and someone crawl right beside me, not in a way that was super noticeable, but in a sneaky, slow, sloth moving type of way. I specifically remember wanting to vomit with fear. Then I felt it, the feeling of an unshaven face rub against mine. I scrambled out of bed, holding my blanket, and ran up the stairs to my parents' room. I was so out of my mind with fear that I couldn't even scream. I slept on the floor with my dad's side of the bed. The next morning, mom was wondering why her 17-year-old daughter was curled up at the foot of her bed, and I told her what happened. Later that morning, we walked over to my grandpa's house to have breakfast and go chat. My mom brought up my wild story. 
my grandpa and grandma silently listened as my mom was laughing at the last bit of the story. My grandparents got really serious and turned to each other. Apparently, this has been an issue in the old house and they didn't want to tell us, hoping we didn't acknowledge it, then it wouldn't bother us. I can honestly say it didn't feel angry or upset. It just wanted to cuddle. I didn't stay there much after that. I moved in with a cousin in town. Ghost stories are the most popular types of stories to talk about in the curious world that we live in. Some of us are skeptics, while others truly believe that the supernatural world is real. I truly believe that entities are real, and this is a true story involving my cousin. He didn't see a ghost, but he felt their presence, and is now fully convinced that we are visited by spirits, even though this event happened years ago, and at the time, he was truly skeptical. My cousin is a doctor and he lives in the USA. A few years ago, he went out of the United States to Vietnam on business. He ended up visiting Hanoi, Vietnam, which is Vietnam's capital city, and stayed in a hotel with his wife at the time. Immediately after entering the hotel, they were both surprised to see a woman sprinting out of her hotel room and screaming bloody murder. It was such a shock to us at the time, it immediately gave them bad vibes about the property. Nobody knew what happened to her, and for a while, she refused to speak to any of the staff about why she felt so horrified, or what happened. She looked sickly and pale, as if she had just seen something grisly. She was breathing heavily and hyperventilating. My cousin, out of curiosity, came up to the front desk and asked what happened. The staff said they weren't sure exactly what had happened, but my cousin mentioned that he was a doctor and if they needed assistance, he would be happy to help. After a few minutes had passed, she collected herself. My cousin approached her and had a little chat. She swears that she wasn't just having a wild episode of hallucinations and insisted what she witnessed was real. It was early morning and the sun was barely starting to shine through the windows. The room was still dim and the light was off. The woman had just woken up from her sleep again still dark, but light enough to see the room. The hotel room she was staying in was massive, and she was in the kitchen making tea. From the kitchen, you can see into the living room. That's when she saw a man standing right next to the bed. It was the ghost of former president, Nuko Dim Dam. He was president of South Vietnam in the early 1960s, who passed away in a very terrible way. She also said that the night before, she saw a former Vietnam soldier staring at her from the window during the evening. My cousin, being a practical person, kind of dismissed it and advised her to just go home, take some medicine, and relaxed the rest of the night. Even after she had just calmed down a little, it was obvious she was still visibly shaken by this whole ordeal. My cousin and wife didn't take the room, but there was another couple that checked into the same room. When my cousin woke, he went down to the hotel lobby and noticed just outside the main entrance was an ambulance and a stretcher pulling two bodies into it. He asked the front desk attendant what happened. They said that the couple that checked in 
mysteriously passed away in their sleep, and nobody knew the cause. They suspected it was a heart attack. At this point, my cousin was starting to act a little apprehensive about staying the rest of the week there, but he continued to sleep at this hotel. His mind never let him believe that it was related to the last incident with the previous lady or tied to the paranormal. Until a couple nights later, all was silent. My cousin was a few doors down from the cursed room at the hotel. This is where it gets freaky. It was late at night, and my cousin was reading a Vietnamese book when the power started to go off and on. He looked out into the hallway to see if there was anything going on, and all seemed okay. He thought that maybe there was a problem with the electricity, so he called the front desk from his room. What he heard over the phone started to finally freak him out. He said that when he picked up the phone, all he could hear was heavy breathing, and someone hung up. Concerned, my cousin rushed to the desk. A woman was standing right there. He asked her why she didn't say anything over the phone after he had called. The woman said that he didn't make a call. My cousin insisted that he did, that he heard heavy breathing, and that someone else was on the other line. But the woman refused to accept his story. He also said that the lights flickered and the woman began to grow pale. She urged him to bless his room because there is something evil and it's disturbing the room. My cousin refused, saying that it was just a coincidence. Finally, a few minutes later, his wife screams. My cousin rushes to the room and asks her what happened. She tells him that she was walking out of her room when she heard voices talking as if the chatter were coming from inside the hotel room where the couple had passed away. The doctor then demanded the staff open the room, but to their surprise, nobody was there. The staff even claimed that when they went into the room, the bathroom door was open, and a dark shadow moved out of the bathroom and then disappeared. My cousin still dismissed everything. He said that things were just chaotic because of the first lady that stayed in the room, and everyone was on edge because of the death of the couple in the same room. He admitted it still creeped him out, but chalked it up to merely a very scary coincidence. However, if it were a coincidence, then how can anyone explain what happened in that room? It seemed to be the only room having issues, aside from the one my cousin was staying in, where he heard the voice over the phone. Either way, this was a pretty insane experience, and I don't know how I would have reacted if I was the one who was there instead of my cousin. I don't remember the year that this happened, nor the age that I was. I still remember it though, as if it were yesterday. So, my aunt just got a new computer. She was never a technology ace or anything, so she had no idea how to get it started. When all else fails, Oh, my mother. My mom was a whiz at computers, so my aunt asked her to come over and hook up the darn thing. My mother, being the lovely lady that she is, agreed to do it within the week. It was actually that weekend that she decided to do it. So, mom decides she wants to go over my aunt's house, kinda late for some reason. I was very young and couldn't stay by myself, so she took me along, since calling a babysitter at the last minute would be very rude. We finally got there. I look up at the house, 
admiring its large size. I did think it looked pretty scary though. We struggled getting inside because my mom couldn't see the keys. As soon as we did get inside, I was frightened. All of the lights were off and nobody was there. Or so I thought. My mom wanted to get started with her work since it was maybe 9 o'clock already. She told me to stay upstairs and watch TV while she was in the basement, hooking up the computer. After a while of whining and staying upstairs all alone in the large house, I totally agreed. My mother stayed with me for about 5 minutes, showing me how to work the TV. I begged and pleaded for her not to go, but it was her duty as a sister to fix the computer. She finally went downstairs, and I was left alone in the huge living room. I decided to turn on the cartoons, thinking it would cheer me up a little. I finally started to calm down, and even laughed at the silliness of the cartoons. Then, all of a sudden, I heard the loud noises in the kitchen. Apparently, my mom didn't hear it, and to me, she was God, so anything she said went. After she said nothing, I proceeded to ignore the noise, but then it happened again. I ignored it. It happened again. I ignored it again. It happened once more. By that time, I was so annoyed at the noise because it was disturbing my cartoons. I was so mad, I forgot my rule about my mom and I jumped up from the couch, turned around, and almost yelled shut up when I saw this mist in the kitchen. It seemed like it was in the shape of an elderly woman with a long white dress and long white hair. I was so shocked, I couldn't scream. So I ran as fast as my little legs could carry me downstairs into the basement and into my precious mother's arms. I didn't tell her what happened, as I was still in shock, awe, and amazement at the creature that had stood before me. I only explained about the noises. She said she was hearing little noises, not loud noises, around where she was. I stayed down there with her because she said I could, especially when she saw my little white face. As I was sitting on the couch, playing with numerous toys that were scattered about, I heard a soft bark. Then I heard a whimper, and then another soft bark. I knew it was coming from the room that held the water tank and such. I thought about the dog, Oreo. It must have been him. But then I remembered he died about a couple months before. My aunt and uncle at the time owned no animals, not even a bird, and it was way too late for someone to let their dog out. Besides, I don't think I would have hurt a dog, as I don't believe anyone in the community even owned one. What frightened me the most was that poor little Oreo, a dog that had been banished to live outside for no reason and was never fed, died on the ground right above where I had heard the noise. I told my mom about this. She said that she heard nothing. I told her to hurry up with the computer, which she did because she was hearing things too. We both ran up the steps and out the door. After we looked, we ran to the car and got in. I was scared because the car was not starting up. Then all of a sudden, it did. I was so happy to be out of there. My cousin had heard noises such as the one I had heard in the kitchen, except they were outside of the room. Also, my other cousin claims that he heard a noise in the oven, like something was in it. He opened the oven, and nothing was there, but he swears to this day, he did hear something. Now, I mentioned in the title of this story, that this was a traveling ghost. I say this because most, if not all, of that family's houses 
have had some sort of scariness to that. My cousin's current residence is just as haunted. Doors will open and close by themselves. One time, we were watching a movie. It was over, and I wanted to turn the lights on. When I turned them on, I heard a strange buzzing sound in the laundry room. It sounded like when the dryer is done trying clothes, only it was a steady, non-pausing sound. I walked over to the doors and started to put my ear up to make sure the sound was coming from that room. As I did so, all of the lights went off and the DVD player suddenly turned on, much louder than we had it on. But the thing was, the DVD player had been turned off the whole time. When everything came on, I jumped five feet into the air onto my poor cousin, where I proceeded to scratch her neck, holding on for dear life. I don't remember ever watching a movie down there ever again. Later, we asked his mom if she was doing laundry. She asked why, and we told her about the sound. She said she didn't even think about doing a load of laundry. To this day, I'm still scared to stay over my cousin's house. When my sister and I were young, we lived in a newer duplex in California. It was a small place with only two bedrooms, so my sister and I had to share a room. We had our beds on opposite walls, but they both faced the hall. On one side of the hall was my parents' bedroom, on the other was the bathroom, and in the middle of the ceiling was a big square fluorescent light. I think that's where it lived. I can't exactly remember when it started. All I remember is waking up in the middle of the night and seeing what I remember as the electricity man. It seemed to come out of the light, which my parents left on to help us sleep. It looked like a person, but seemed to be made from the light. This happened several times over the next few years we lived in the duplex. I never told anyone about what happened until about 15 years later. My sister and I had come to visit my parents. We were all sitting in the living room talking about our childhood when my sister had asked if I'd remembered anything strange about the duplex. I asked what she meant by strange. She asked if I had ever seen anyone in the wall. I then told her about my experience with the electric man. Turns out she saw the same thing. This is an old story, but was shut on my mind for years and years. It was 1964-65. I was four or five years old. Our family, because of my mother's recurrent mental illness, bounced around from apartment to apartment, from shelter to shelter, with or without one or both of our parents in tow. There were four of us. I do not recall if any of my siblings were with me when this happened. It might have been at a foster parent's house. I just don't know. I remember sitting on the side of a small cot in the waning light of a Chicago winter. There was an odd, really dark shadow on the wall to the left of me. It was the size of a small man, and I stared, and I stared in disbelief because it had a hat on and was in profile. The outline of the lips, the nose, the forehead was perfect. I was a pro at discerning what was real and what was not real even at that age because of my mother's problem. And I tell you, I knew that what I was seeing was real, that I was not asleep and that no shadow could have occurred that so accidentally duplicated the perfection of the human figure that I saw before my eyes. We stared at each other for a very long time, 
the figure never moving. I never told a soul, as I didn't want to be thrown in the loony bin too. This is the first of many encounters of the years. My mother had the gift. My sister really has it, much more than I. About 18 years ago, I was in the Jacksonville Cemetery with my husband and three-year-old son. We were reading headstones. I believe it was in June or July. The sun was out, and there was not a cloud in the sky. As we were walking through the headstones, we saw a woman walk through the trees. Both my husband and I saw her. We thought there was something odd about her, but couldn't figure out what exactly, though. We were walking towards her, and she was probably about 80 yards away. She was walking away from us and stepped behind a tree. Then, we didn't see her again. I said to my husband, where did that woman go? He said, she stepped behind the tree. We continued to walk towards the spot where we saw her. All of a sudden, rain poured down on our heads. We both looked up into the blue sky and water continued to drench us. We ran back towards the car and it was like the rain just disappeared. We got back to our car and we were all soaking wet. The sky was still blue. We left right away. Hello, my name is Wanda. I've experienced a few things in my lifetime. This one recently, not scary or anything, but just strange. I lost a pet two years ago when he was still a puppy. Bernie got hit by a car and died all alone in the road while at my mother's care. I came home from work and we buried him. My brother and I loved him so much, I painted a stone on his grave that I'd done one year. Well, like I said, that was two years ago and twice recently, I've experienced the oddest sensations. Both times I was laying in my bed trying to fall asleep when I felt something like little feet walking on my leg and settling in down around my knee area, like a cat curling up or a small dog. It felt so real, but I tried to explain it away, thinking maybe my circulation was doing something weird in my leg. Then a couple weeks later, it happened again. It walked up my leg and curled up on my knee area. This time, I had no delusions, I was sure it was Bernie who came back to lay down and be with me. Since then, I shared my experience with a girlfriend, and she claims that when she spent the night here on my couch, she felt the same thing. We even got a ghost picture. My sister's dog was here, and my friend Yuri took a picture with her disc camera of the dog and there is a big white circular mass over the dog with what looks to be a foot appearing or taking shape rather. I've no doubt it's Bernie and he's been playing with that dog even as spirit. Sign me up as a believer. Yours truly. It was the fall of 1979. My grandfather passed away in the hospital the previous month my grandmother wanted to rent me her mobile home in Green Acres, Florida, so she could move back permanently to her home in Cocoa Beach, Florida. I was living in a high-priced apartment complex in West Palm at the time, so this would be my chance to save some money and help my grandma at the same time. I cleaned, painted, and fixed. Everything was fine for the first three months. Then on a dark and stormy night, wouldn't you know it, I was home alone, watching TV in the living room. I heard a thud. I looked around behind me, towards the master bedroom, and much to my shock, saw a white, smoky figure, unmistakably my grandfather, walk past the bedroom doorway. Well, 
The first thing I felt was this warm rush of blood through my body, which is probably better defined as fright. I jumped out of the recliner and just kind of stood frozen in the middle of the living room floor, staring at the bedroom waiting for him to walk by again. He never did, at least not that night. Six months later, after I had pretty much forgotten about the incident, it was the middle of the day and I was at the kitchen sink washing dishes, listening to TV. Something came on the program I wanted to see, so I walked to the living room, watched a few minutes, then turned around to go back into the kitchen. Yes, you guessed it. There was the exact same ghostly figure walking past the master bedroom doorway. This time I was taken back but braver. Maybe because it was daylight? I ran back to the bedroom but there was nothing. No ghost, no smoke, not even a sense of smell. Nothing. I told some family and friends both incidents and got the usual, are you crazy, yeah right kind of looks. 1981, two years later. My life is very different. My Cuban girlfriend's mother is living with us. She stays home all day cooking and cleaning. One night at dinner, she tells us about the ghostly figure she has been seeing while past her bedroom doorway. She didn't want to say anything because she didn't want us to think she was crazy. Needless to say, I was in shock and wanted to know more. She couldn't tell me more. She only saw on numerous occasions a white ghostly figure walking past the master bedroom doorway. But what did it look like I asked? She described my grandfather to a T. She had never met him. He usually wore a beige khaki work shirt and pants, a hat, and always chewing on an unlit cigar. I ran for my box of photographs, found one of my grandfather, and now she was in shock. That's the ghost, she cried. That's him. 1992, 11 years later. My grandparents' mobile home had been long sold. I lived in Okeechobee County, Florida for about five years with a little plot of land and a lot of farm animals. I was driving up to the lake one day to go fishing. While I was sitting at the traffic light, I glanced over at the mobile home business in the corner. In the rear of the lot were the used mobile homes. Was that my grandparents' mobile home I could see way in the back? There was that warm rush of blood again. Called the creeps this time. I had to be sure, so I drove over to investigate. It was pretty much in shambles. No front door, broken windows, holes in the floor, completely falling apart. Is this really it? What was it doing in Okeechobee about 100 miles from Green Acres? I still had to be sure, so I went inside snooping around. No. I didn't see any ghosts, but I found the weathered plastic numbers from the top of the old mailbox of the Green Acres address on the floor of my old bedroom closet. I will never understand if the ghost was trying to communicate something or why it chose to only show itself to my ex-girlfriend's mother and me. But more strangely, why did that old trailer seem to follow me all the way out to the country in Okeechobee? Oh yeah, I didn't take that souvenir I found in the bedroom closet. After I found those plastic numbers, I dropped them in a mad rush to get out of there. This happened to me in the summer of 1991, and it's all true. I was pregnant with my son who is now 13. I have a daughter who is 15, who at the time was 2. My husband and I moved into a trailer house. I always felt uneasy there, but passed it off. This trailer was a 3 bedroom. The layout of the house was so. The front door. The living room. To the left of this a bedroom. On the right side of the living room was the kitchen, then a hall. In the hall to your left was a bedroom, then the bathroom, and then straight ahead was the master bedroom. We never noticed anything unusual until my brother moved in with us. He slept in the bedroom next to the living room. This room always stayed ice cold. We know it wasn't the air conditioner because it had broken and the landlord couldn't fix it. If you've ever been in Texas during the summer, it is extremely hot. This room was always cold. Some other strange things that occurred there were the fact that my two dogs would never go down the hall. One day, I was cleaning and my daughter was in the first bedroom in the hall. She was in there playing and I heard her talking to someone and someone answer her back. I ran to her room and no one was there. I asked her who she was talking to and she said Tommy. I instantly felt a cold spot and something breathed down my neck. I went into premature labor. After I spent three days in the hospital, I went home only to go back into labor the moment I walked into the door. I finally told my mom what was going on 
and she told me to ask what it wanted. I got back home after a few days and nothing happened. Then one day, my daughter fell asleep in my bed. I decided to watch some TV for a while. When I sat down on the couch, she started crying. When I got to my room, she was still asleep, but I could still hear the crying and it wasn't her. That night, I went into labor again. A week or so later, I was washing dishes when I sensed something behind me. I turned around but seen nothing. I finally asked it what it wanted and it growled at me. Needless to say, I grabbed my daughter and left. I never went back and never went into premature labor again. My mom thinks the spirit wanted the soul of my son. What do you think? Any ideas? Sorry this was so long. Thanks for your time. When I was about 11 or 12 years old, I went over to my best friend's house at night. She was sitting outside in her front lawn, looking at the house directly across the street. I asked her what she was watching for as I sat next to her. She said that for the last couple of days, she noticed some strange people coming to the house, some wearing black robes. She liked the lady very much and visited her often, so she told me earlier in the day she had gone and knocked on the door to check on her. A stranger answered the door and then the woman's husband came to the door. He was very sharp with her and told her everything was okay and not to bother them anymore. After she finished telling me this, we sat in silence, contemplating the situation. All of a sudden, the camper owned by my friend's family, which was parked in the driveway to our right, began shaking violently. Our first thought was an earthquake. We lived in California. Quickly, we noticed that nothing else was moving. As the camper continued to shake, we each ran around either side until we met on the other side. Nobody was moving it from the outside. Somebody must be inside, we thought. My friend ran into the house to get her father, yelling someone had broken into the camper. Just as she and her father had come around the corner, the shaking stopped. Her father unlocked the camper and bounded in. We stayed out of the way, ready to get help. After a couple of minutes, her father came out looking pissed off. Was this a joke, he asked? No one was in the camper. All the closets and drawers had been opened and everything was flung all over. We were practically in tears, trying to convince him that we hadn't done anything. I guess he believed us, because then he went in the house and yelled at her brother. About six or seven years ago, my family lived along Taze Valley Road before the big industrial boom of Putnam County. Seems like it went from a farming community to a city right before my eyes. Well, anyway, we rented land off of a fellow by the name of Jim Umbaker. On this land was an extravagant pre-Civil War, almost Victorian house. It was simply beautiful. Off to the side of this massive antique sat our trailer. Now, I was awfully young through all of this, and kids will have their fabled ghost stories. But there was something quite odd about this house. Something was downright sour. The story had it, and I know nothing of the truth in this. A family was brutally butchered in the house. Back then, there was a whole lot of nothing for miles around so no one even found these folks for a good long time. As a youngster, I had the creeps about anything just about, but I've never been quite as frightened of a place as I was here. The place had an eerie air to it. To make things even more insane, my step-grandmother Evelyn died of brain cancer there, in our trailer of course. My other grandmother's entire cancer-eaten body seized up and shut down on her, yet she died officially in a hospital. Strange things went on at this trailer, Pockets of not cool but cold air in the middle of July, for example. Once in the winter, my mother was out on the town. My younger brother and I were watching some TV when there was a knock on the door. There, on the freshly fallen snow, was nothing. No footprints, no tire tracks, absolutely nothing. Needless to say, I spent the rest of that night with my head buried under the covers. Speaking of doors, once I heard the doorbell ring, seemed innocent enough, but we didn't have a doorbell, pictures falling off the wall, creaky floors, and long sleepless nights were only minor nuisances we had to deal with every day. The most disturbing incidences, however, and the most annoying were when the smoke detectors, located in various parts of the trailer, would take turns going off one at a time. After that, they'd go off simultaneously, quite a ruckus. For a long time, 
I thought I was the only one who felt a presence. Then one night, my mother went completely irate screaming, show yourself Evelyn, I'm tired of these freaking games, show yourself. We never saw anything. Things continued as they were until we moved. Mr. Umberger sold the land to someone, and it became Southbrook, a ritzy subdivision with $500,000 houses that want to hear of her humble trailer deprecating their property. However, I believe they'll get theirs. Although they tear the house down for the project, there is a well and a system of underground streams and springs which probably render the whole operation illegal. The thing about the springs and wells may not sound important, but in my own personal research, I found negative forces and spirits can channel themselves through waterways. I'd like to see how Southbrook lights his new neighbors. I believe I have some pictures of that house somewhere in the mess that is my apartment. Thanks for reading. This is a true story that happened to me, my friend, my boyfriend, his brother, and my brother about a year ago. About a year ago, my friend Courtney, my boyfriend Josh, his little brother Brian, my little brother Jared and I were staying down at our trailer in Sagner. It was about 3 in the morning, and Jared and Brian were already asleep. In our trailer there was a downstairs, the living room, and an upstairs, the kitchen, three bedrooms, dining room, and when you walk out the front door you are in a carport, looking out into a blank field. Well, another friend of mine had lived in the house before me, and said that there was an old lady that walked down the hall at night. Me. Josh and Courtney were downstairs watching TV when we heard some noise come from the bedroom Brian and Jared were sleeping in. So we ran in and checked on them. There was nothing there. So we sat back down on the couch and started watching TV again. About 15 minutes later, we heard what sounded like someone knocking on the door. So I went and looked through the peephole, but when I didn't see anything, I walked outside and looked out into the field. I listened really closely and heard what sounded like a knife being sharpened. I ran in the house and deadbolted the door. Then it sounded like someone was trying to get into the back door, which was boarded up. I started getting this really scared feeling in the pit of my stomach. I was sitting on the couch. Josh had his arm around me and the front door flew open. I jumped up and ran into the bedroom that Jared and Brian were in. Josh and Courtney soon followed. They came in and we locked the bedroom door. We sat there for about 15 minutes and heard somebody walk in, up the steps, and stop at the door. At this point, we were really freaking out. Suddenly, I then heard my stepmom's voice in the outside of the door say, What are you doing in there? We told her the whole story, and she just laughed and blamed it on the wind. Thanks for reading. It all started when my Aunt Crystal moved into a little trailer that belongs to my grandmother. Now I live there, going on three years. There were three occasions when this, or these ghosts were encountered. We're still not sure if it was the same ghost. They both happened at night, in the same room. Well, on with the stories. The first person to see the ghost was my Aunt, Crystal. She would always stay up late and wait for her husband Tony to come home from his night shift. This is how she says it happened. She was in the back room of the trailer, built on, cleaning up. This room was used as a playroom for my three little cousins. So she is back there cleaning when she starts to feel a cold chill or a draft, which is normal because the trailer isn't but about 50 feet in front of a creek. So the place stays chilling in the winter and humid in the summer. So she got up and changed into a sweatshirt. When she re-entered the room to resume on cleaning, she felt an eerie presence in the room, like someone was looking over her shoulder. She finally decided to turn and look, and that's when she saw it, a small figure over by the closet, just staring at her and seemed to be smiling. One of those evil, wretched smiles. She jumped up screaming for the ghost, or whatever it was, to leave now. My aunt never saw the ghost again. She said after she yelled for it to leave the strange feeling went away, and when she went back into the room, she noticed it had warmed up. On another occasion, it was my Uncle Denny, my aunt's brother. He needed a place to stay for a while, so she gave him that same back room. Well, I'm not going to go into detail about the room and just tell you what happened to him. All I know is he underwent a series of different events all in one night. He was in the bed not quite asleep, but kind of dozing off one night in late October. 
The first thing that happened to him is that he felt a gentle tug on the covers. He was still kind of out, but it was enough to wake him up a little. He ignored it and pulled the covers over his head. Then he says about half hour later, he heard a small click and the stereo that he had set up beside his bed had come on. He loves to listen to Tupac a lot, so that is what was playing. He had been listening to it earlier, so that it was really loud, and there were other people trying to sleep, so he reached over and turned it down. Now, he was starting to get a little scared. He sat up and studied his room. Nothing. But, despite the fact that he couldn't see anything in the room, he thought that didn't mean that there was nothing there, so he got up and opened his door. Now keep in mind, this is something that he never actually does, no matter what. He didn't leave the room but he did get pretty spooked about it. When Crystal woke the next day, she asked him, why'd he left the door open? He said so whatever was in there with him could leave if it wanted to. He swears to this day that after he opened the door, nothing else happened. The third and final story is about my encounter with the bedroom ghosts, or ghosts. After my aunt moved out of the trailer, my sister, mother, and stepdad moved in. Guess where my room was? Yep, the back room. Well, this is what happened. I love to read, and I love to read by lamplight at night in my room with the door closed tight. After about two months living in that trailer, I still hadn't seen anything. Just when I was starting to believe that my aunt and uncle were just trying to scare me with those stories, I finally had my little experience with the bedroom ghost. Anyways, I was laying in my bed and reading one of my mystery books one night in December, I think. When I felt a little bit of pressure on my bed, kind of like someone was sitting down at the foot of it. I figured my cat Tabby had been hiding under the bed and had jumped up on top of it or something, so I just kept on reading. Then about 15 minutes later it happened again, only this time it was like someone had flopped down on my bed, which is too much for my little cat to have done, so I sat up in surprise. No one was there. I sat there and just stared, waiting for another flop or something to hit my bed, and it didn't come. I figured at this point it was just my imagination. Then, just when I'd settled down and began to read again, it happened again, more like someone jumping on my bed. I was sure it hadn't been my imagination that time, so I jumped up and ran out of the room. I didn't come back into the room that night, I just bunked on the couch. Well, there you have it, three stories that I swear are true. Thank you for reading this, and have a good one. I want to say that I've been brought up with stories of ghosts and haunted houses. I live in the South, Louisiana to be exact, and tales of the supernatural are nothing new to this area. I have many stories I can share, but the better ones all include my grandma's house. The house is located in a small town called Swords, and my mom would tell me stories of when she was a kid growing up with a ghost that lived there in the house with her and her siblings. The ghost does not have a name. She is only known as the White Lady, since she wears a white dress. My mom told me stories of seeing this White Lady many times as a child, but she never was scared of the White Lady. She told me she felt as if the ghost was watching over her and her sisters, and that they never felt threatened. She told me she would see the ghost at night, walking in the hallway or on the staircase. Other times she just felt the presence of the ghost. She would be in her room after school doing homework, and she knew someone was in the room watching her. When I was a kid, going to grandma's was always something special because I would look for this ghost. I remember very well the first time I saw the white lady. I was 14, and my friend Chad was with me in my grandma's. We had just gotten home from school, and I had the key to grandma's because that's where I went after school until my mom picked me up when she got off work. Grandma was not there. So Chad and I made ourselves at home. He knew of the stories about the house and was very skeptical. We made some snacks and went into the den to sit and watch TV. The staircase is in full view from the den, and as we watched TV, I felt a presence. Chad felt it too. He claimed it got really cold. I thought it was a draft, so we went into the hallway and checked to see if any windows were open. As we were going to the living room, my eye caught something. I stopped and grabbed Chad's arm. There, at the bottom of the staircase, was a figure of a woman. At that moment, she looked at us 
and that cold chill went right through me. She proceeded to go up the stairs. I watched her details. Her hand was on the banister, but you could see right through it. She was transparent all the way through her figure, and she looked up as she walked, as if looking for something. Chad and I were literally paralyzed. We watched her, not knowing what was going to happen. For a second there, the figure paused, glanced back at us, and then continued walking up, but she never made it to the top. She vanished on the fourth step just before the landing. When she disappeared, Chad ran up the steps. I guess he wanted to catch her? Idiot. He said the spot where she disappeared was so cold. At that point, I wanted to get out of the house. We both grabbed our book bags and ran outside and stayed out on the front porch until my mom came. We told her what happened and she told us not to be scared. This being our first time seeing the spirit, hell yeah we were scared. But mom came in the house with us and we felt better with her there. The second time I saw the white lady was Thanksgiving, 1997. I had not been to grandma's much before then. Things at my house got complicated and I had to take care of things so there was not much time left for visits. But then, Thanksgiving did roll around and all of my family came to grandma's. My mom has 10 siblings, so it was quite the event. Grandma has a huge dining room table that seats 24 in the main room of her house. We were all sitting down at dinner, having a good time. I was between my uncle Kevin and my cousin Joseph. We call him Shacks. People were coming and going through the doors that led to the kitchen, and clean out of nowhere, I looked up and I saw a lady, wearing white, come in from the door on the right and walk from there to the left side of the room, then disappear into the wall. I jumped up. I was startled. She had passed right by everyone and right through my Uncle Patrick who was standing by the wine cart. He didn't even flinch. I looked over to my mom. She saw her too, but she put her finger on her mouth, mentioning me to keep quiet. I didn't say anything, but Shags was nudging me under the table. I turned to him. And he whispered to me, did you see that? I told him yes. After dinner, I was helping grandma with the dishes and I told her what I saw. She saw her too, but she said it did not surprise her at all. The white lady likes to show up when there are a lot of people at the dinner table. All she does is walk from one side of the room to the other, then disappear into the wall. But not everyone sees her. That's what I find odd. I told her how she just walked through Pat and he didn't notice anything. Weird. A number of days later, I found out that only four other people saw her that day in the dining room. My Aunt Jen, my cousin Brad, his girlfriend Ashley, and my aunt's husband Mark. Grandma told me that they phoned her and told her about the white lady. I haven't seen the white lady since that Thanksgiving day. Grandma says she's still around. She had company over this past September. Some friends had come from Florida and stayed the night there. They witnessed a white lady on the staircase disappearing, but something else occurred. Grandma and others are now hearing footsteps and laughter in the upstairs bedroom that is used as a drawing room. I'll have to do some investigating on that one. Thanks for reading. When I was about 13, my father was a professor at a college in California. The campus was built during the 1600s and was originally a Catholic boys' home. There are catacombs where the boys would hide when people came to persecute them. The story goes that one particular night, a well-known Christian hater came to kill the boys. They all went down into the tunnels. One eight-year-old boy got lost and was so scared he hung himself. His body was never recovered. Anyway, back to my personal story. We lived on campus and my father was also a night guard. He had a tendency to get preoccupied with different things and he often didn't get home until an hour after his shift was over. On one particular night he was later than usual. My mother sent me to go check on where he was. The other guard said he was still on the rounds, so I rode my bike around looking for him. I saw a light on in the library. So I parked my bike and went in. The staircase to the aforementioned tunnels, or catacombs, is in the back of the library, off to the left, 
and there's a cemetery under the staircase. I looked all through the library, and suddenly, the light turned off. A little boy, about eight years old, came running through the door of the staircase, right where another certain eight-year-old's body was rumored to be. Needless to say, I hauled out of there, and I have not gone back in the library since. The first thing I must explain is that I lived in a place where there was a horrible fire in the late 1800s. Across from my house was a cemetery where all of the 800 people that perished in that fire were buried. My best friend had come over, and we were wanting to be alone, so we scampered up to our room. Shortly after that, we began to hear strange noises, like footsteps running up and down our spiral staircase. We yelled to my sister to stop bothering us, but she was nowhere in sight. We closed the door and backed up our trunks against it. While we sat there, a pattern knocking sound began on the wall. An eerie feeling came over us, and we no longer felt safe there. We rushed out of the door, and the room was filled with blue smoke. I never ventured up there alone again. It's strange that everything weird that ever happened, happened in my bedroom, because there was another night I remember vividly. The night I saw a figure dressed in a red and blue checkered smock standing there. She smiled and waved, but then, when I went to touch her, she disappeared. Thank you for letting me share my experience. My friend would love you for it. It's important to be able to share these experiences. I don't think their ghosts were unfriendly, but they sure scared the living daylights out of me. Thanks for reading. This is a story that my mom told me about when my grandma worked as a maid for a rich family in England. The house she worked in was haunted, and some really weird things happened there. The most interesting was whenever someone cooked bread in the oven, it would come out smeared with blood. So after that happened several times, they blocked off the kitchen with a wall. Another neat thing happening occurred there when my grandma woke up in the middle of the night and heard the table being set, but then she found out that no one was up and it was the middle of the night. To make things even more creepier, whenever she was cleaning the third floor and she knew that no one was up there with her, she got the strangest feeling she wasn't alone. One night, a thunderstorm was so loud it woke her up, yet her room was the only one that had the thunder that could be heard. Another night she woke up and her bed was rocking. In the morning, she asked the people who owned the house about it, and they said that her room was once the room of a young boy who became very sick, and every night his mother would rock him to sleep. Interesting story, and thank you for reading. The story I'm about to tell happened when I was about 15. For the last month or so, when we talked on the telephone, my friend had been telling me that during the middle of the night, when he was in bed, he could hear rocks bouncing off the roof, and this would go on for hours every single night. His parents also heard this and would go outside during the middle in the dark night to find nothing. Needless to say, it kept happening night after night. As time went by, the events got worse. Mr. Knock Knock, as they called him, started knocking on the door in the middle of the night and also during the day, which of course, when they would go to look, nobody was there. At this point, I didn't know if I believed him or not. One time, when I was talking to him on the telephone, I heard a really big boom and he told me, Oh my God, Mr. Knock Knock just knocked the door open. Of course, he went and looked, but as always, nobody was there. This got me excited. I said to him I want to stay over and hear Mr. Knock Knock. Now, I don't know if it was that night, but I did stay over. It was late in the afternoon, and we were in the kitchen, and I made the remark that I wanted to hear Mr. Knock Knock. Right after I said that, boom, on the door. We went outside and found nothing. Finally, they had the police install cameras around the whole house, mostly in the trees, but they never recorded anything. They say that a man many years before hung himself in the shed. The same events went on for a period of time, then they just stopped. I think it was the man who hung himself many years ago, 
I know it was some spirit, but what it wanted, I don't know. I hope you all enjoyed the story, though. Thanks for reading. The following incident is significant because it put me on the path where I am today and it will be important to know when I submit my other stories. On Saturday, Halloween Day, 1992, my friend Debbie and I decided to go to a neighborhooding park in St. Louis, bordering on South Grand and Arsenal, for those who hail from there. We'd stop at our favorite donut shop, then went to a little lake we knew of to sit and gossip. There happened to be a wedding photo group there at the same time, so we sat on a bench nearby and critiqued the dresses, etc. I wasn't paying attention to my surroundings, and Debbie and I chattered for about 15 minutes before she got an odd look on her face and whispered to me, What is this? A rumble? I cautiously glanced around and saw several youths drawing up to the lake on various sides. Debbie said, I think it's time we leave. Walk slowly and don't look back at them. We got up and began walking to my car. Some 300 yards off, we got about halfway there when we heard a pop, pop, pop. Being a city girl, it didn't register in my brain what it was at the moment. It sounded like firecrackers. Needless to say, that's not what it was. Get down, she screamed. Before I could react, Debbie had thrown me down on the ground as she was going down herself. I know we were both praying as this occurred. Suddenly, the shooting got louder, and we both realized that there was a gunman firing about three feet behind me, over our heads. The way we were lying on the ground, Debbie could see behind me, and I could see behind her. She told me not to look, so I just kept my head down. We heard clicking and cursing. The guy's gun jammed. He ran off. As suddenly as it began, it was over, and all the gang members were running their separate ways. Badly shaken but not hurt, we took off running to my car, jumping in and flooring it to her house a few blocks away. When we were safely inside and slightly more calm than we had been, Debbie said, I just can't believe it. I can't believe it. I was warned about this, and I didn't listen. I asked what she meant. She said her father appeared to her in a dream the night before. I don't remember the details exactly, but it was in the kitchen with the back door open. In the dream, he was warning her about some danger and wanted her to be careful. Debbie's father died when she was a teenager. At the time of the occurrence, she was in her late 20s. A weird, though not really scary, closure. At the time of this occurrence, Debbie and I worked together at a local newspaper and our office was based in the basement of City Hall sharing a room with the office attached to a recorder of deeds. Four ladies worked for the city there, and we knew them pretty well. On Monday morning, one of them described how her daughter had come to her in a previous Saturday afternoon and told her of the horrific shootout that occurred at her friend's wedding party in the park near the lake. No one was hurt, but the limo took two slugs in the door and fender. Prior to the shooting, both Deb and I would have long discussions about the afterlife ghosts, and etc. And we are both believers in the power of the mind and spirit. But this experience set me on a path of dealing with spirits that I still encounter today. These will be submitted for your approval at a later date. Back in 1986, when my daughter was three years old, she was playing in her bedroom and I was watching all my children on television. When all of a sudden, she came out of her room asking me to tell the man to leave her alone. Startled because she and I were the only ones in the house at the time, I said, what man? She said, the man in my room, he keeps talking to me. So I got up and went into the room and looked for this man. In fact, I decided to look all over the house for this man and could not even find him. I then made sure all the doors and windows were locked and I told my daughter that there is no man in the house, so she went back to playing. About 10 minutes later, she came back into the living room and announced, Tell the man to leave me alone. This time I freaked out and told her, Dana, there is no man in the house. I looked everywhere for him. I do not see anyone here. And she replied to me, He's right here. 
I asked, where? And she pointed to the hallway, and she acted like she was holding someone's hand. I asked, what are you doing? She replied, he just wants to say hi to you. Incredulous and open mouthed, I asked, me? What happened next sent chills down my spine. My three-year-old daughter walked with this man to the wall as if she was still holding his hand. I asked her, what does this man want from you? She said, he says he loves you. I asked her for the man's name and she simply replied, monk. Almost in shock, I got out, what did you say? She looked up at this man and said, as if to the air, what did you say your name was? And then she once again looked back at me and said, Monk. I asked her several times if the man's name was Monk, and every time she said yes. But then I was freaking out, because my grandfather's nickname was Monk. Still not believing, I told her this isn't funny, and she said, He just wanted me to tell you he loves you, and he wanted to say hi. I asked her to describe him, and then he described my grandfather to a T. You see, my grandfather died in 1969 in Illinois when I was four years old. It was so long ago, there is no way my three-year-old could possibly have known this. He couldn't have even seen what he looked like because he did not have any pictures of him until 1991. That was the only time my child had an encounter, but what encounter it was. And I'm left to scratch my head thinking if it was actually my grandpa or not. I'd like to think it was. But at the time, it was so terrifying not knowing who this person was at the moment. Wasn't it a intruder? Was it someone else? But no, it was my grandfather checking in on me to see if I was okay. What a man he was. A former associate and friend told me this once. Her parents once lived in Lee Master, a little hollow in Buchanan County. While they lived there, they could hear a baby crying outside. When they went out on the porch, it would stop. But as soon as they went back in, it would start again. This went on for a long time, until one day, a bunch of young boys were digging in the dirt, playing with their trucks and such, when they happened upon an old buried jar. After further inspection by the children and my friend's father, they found it contained the remains of a baby submerged in alcohol to keep it in good condition. Turns out, a young girl had once lived in the area and had a miscarriage. Instead of having a proper funeral, she put it in the alcohol and buried it afterwards. After the discovery by the children, the crying stopped, the baby found peace, and all was quiet again. Thanks for the short read. This is a strange event that I experienced when I was very young, around the age of three and a half years old. I'm 24 now. But ever since this occurred, it has burnt deep in my mind and I can still go back and remember vivid details of what had happened. It began as a dream and I remember it was my dad, older brother and myself waiting at the local bus stop for the 9 bus to arrive, an actual location. Behind the bus stop was an abandoned building that for some reason had my attention while we waited. So I wandered off to get a closer look and the whole front of the building was boarded with the exception of the entrance doors, which were missing the glass frame, making it easily accessible for anyone to enter. So I advanced further, entering the building, and was standing on shards of crushed glass, and as I looked to my left, there was a register booth with a glass display underneath, which also was smashed with popcorn spilled all throughout the display case and the floor below. I also remember a red carpet that was torn throughout the lobby, at this point, I realized that apparently, I was in a movie theater, and I was excited because I remember as a child, I loved going to the movie theaters to see the action flicks, and this is probably what drove me further into the theater. Behind me, I could hear my dad calling out for me warning me that, if I didn't listen to him and get back to the bus stop, that he and my brother would leave me. I was stubborn and ignored my dad and continued to walk further inside the theater and entered the auditorium where the lights were off and the projectile screen was brightly lit with nothing playing. There were also a few seats accompanied by guests. They had an eerie stillness to them. As I advanced down the aisle, I began to make out the features of the individuals that were seated 
and their flesh seemed severely burnt, and they were all dead. The chairs were also in bad shape, but now I was scared and didn't know what to do. Then I noticed from down the aisle, one of the emergency exit doors swung open and something made its way through. It strolled at a fast pace towards the middle of the aisle and began to come directly towards me. To describe what it was, I only remember it being not much taller than I was and it had arms that were so long that they dragged along the ground as it walked. I started to run back to the bus stop where I was hoping my dad was still waiting for me as this creature continued its pursuit of me. To my horror, the bus stop was completely empty and there was no one there to help me. I then turned and ran around the building till I was tackled down by this thing. I screamed, then I woke up. Now, I know for sure that I had been conscious when I saw my closet door open slowly and out came the same creature from the dream I had. As frightened that I was, I did my best to keep focused on it. I remember looking over to where my brother was sleeping but he was completely sleeping and I was just terrified. It continued to approach me and I noticed it was dragging along a toy fire truck I had at the time. As it got to my bed sided, it extended its arm and appeared to be handing me over a truck, but that's when I screamed for my parents who were sleeping in the next room. I covered my blanket over my face and screamed for the life of me when finally the door to my room flew open and my mom and dad entered the room turning on the light. My parents were very concerned about me at that point and I remember just crying in relief from their comfort. The creature was no longer in the room and my dad checked the closet to find nothing there. I slept the rest of the night with my parents and worrying about my older brother the whole night. All I remember after that was I never wanted to sleep in that same room again and in fact, sometime later, our rooms were switched over. Now that I think back, there's a lot of things I wonder about that experience. Like what was the meaning of the whole movie burnt theater and the creature trying to give me the fire truck toy when I woke? Was there some kind of connection to the fire, creature, and myself? Was it some kind of warning? I don't know, but every time I think back, I only wish that this had occurred later in my life as I would know a little more on how to react to such a situation. This is a true experience, and I've long come to terms that it could have been anything from it being all just a dream, or possibly something much more unexplained. Recently, I brought up the topic to my mom, which I do every now and then, if she remembers that night, and she still recalls it faintly. She then told me something that she experienced during the time when our rooms were changed around. She claimed that during the time she and dad had separated, she was laying in bed one night, and woke to someone or something crawling from the foot of her bed behind her as she was facing the opposite direction. She described that it felt like a person going to lay down beside her, but then she felt the arms wrap around her upper body, and she said she closed her eyes because she somehow knew if she looked back, she would not see something pleasant, so she kept her eyes shut. The next thing she remembers is it was morning, and she had all the bed to herself. My mom is very credible, and I know she would not make up such a thing, especially with my awareness that something was not right about the room we had in our old apartment. Thanks for reading. A good few years back now, me and two mates were traveling home from the city center of Birmingham to Woolly Castle on the 21 bus. The bus must have been early as it pulled up outside the school in Harburn Road. It was there about five or six minutes when we heard someone shout, look, look. As we looked out the window, we could see this figure of what looked to be a man, dressed in a black robe with a hood and a tie around his waist. It had no face, hands, or feet, and floated through the railings opposite the school from the small grassland. It then proceeded to float across the road and headed in the direction of the bus, but by this time was about 18 feet away. It really scared me as it resembled what I saw on the TV, like the Grim Reaper but without the scythe. As it floated, it made slight sways from side to side, like we do when we walk, but as I said, without the feet. It did look evil, although looking back now, the clothes slightly resembled a monk's. I was scared stiff for months after that, as I thought it may resemble death or something. I'm happy to say that me and my friends are still alive, 
Although we all had some pretty bad luck for years after, that may just be coincidental though. I'm not sure if the bus driver saw it as well, but we know what we saw is there was about another near dozen people upstairs with us. Most of them stood up or was in total awe looking out of the window. Thanks for reading. This morning at 5 a.m., I boarded the same bus I always take to work. As I looked out the window, I caught the reflection of a woman smiling. I turned to look across the aisle where I thought the woman was sitting, but there was nobody there. I looked back at the window and there she was, still smiling. As I surveyed the bus for the second time, I realized there were only three other people on the bus with me and none of them was this woman smiling at me. When I turned back to the window, she was gone. I was paralyzed for a few seconds and my body trembled with goosebumps. I took off my headphones and sat there, occasionally looking around for the woman, but I never saw her again. I'm neither a religious or spiritual person and never believed in ghosts until now. I don't know why this woman wanted me to see her. Maybe I reminded her of someone she used to know. I'm not sure, but thanks for reading. One time when I was 9 years old, I visited the Aroma Southern Pacific Depot, which was built in 1931 and was in use until the 1930s. The old train station stands derelict today. Strange events happen there. You can see lights in there late at night. If you take a compass in there, the needle points away from north. If you take pictures in there, there are bright spots on pictures. I went in there once late at night. I was shining the flashlight around the room when the light fell on someone else who was in there. It was a girl my age, about 9 years old. She was totally nude. She had a Victorian hairstyle. I was so surprised I dropped the flashlight. When I picked it up again, she was gone. Later my mother told me that she had once seen the same girl in an orchard when she was a little girl. As it turned out, other people had seen this girl as well about nine years old, always in the nude, over an area of several square miles. She usually appeared near large concentrations of walnuts, such as a walnut orchard, a warehouse full of walnuts, or even the walnut section of a grocery. The story goes like this. In the 19th century, several young girls were skinny dipping in a canal. All of a sudden, boys showed up. Most of the girls tried to hide themselves by running into a nearby walnut orchard. One girl tried to hide by ducking under the water and staying under until the boys had left. Unfortunately, she was the one who drowned. If she hadn't went to the walnut orchard, she would have lived. She now tries to be near large quantities of walnuts in order to make up for her mistake, although it's too little too late. She almost always appears to females because she doesn't want males to see her in the nude. She's particularly attracted to girls her own age which would explain the incidents of me and my mother. Perhaps she was able to appear in this train station because it's a physically active region. Thanks for reading. About nine years ago, me and May used to go to this caravan site a couple of miles up the coast from where I used to live. During the summer, we used to drink in the site's pub called The Mermaid, booze on the beach, and chat up the holidaymaker's daughters, etc. One year, a couple of months after the summer crowds had left, we'd gone to the bonfire that they have there to watch the fireworks and generally just join in with festivities. We ended up staying late, just wandering about the site before finally ringing a taxi and waiting for it outside the mermaid, inside the doorway of a run-down toilet block near the edge of the cliff. It was quiet, but there were still a few people about. Anyway, after a couple of minutes of us standing there, I'd see something at the edge of the cliff, in a shallow ditch around 30 yards away. It looked like the startings of a fire, and I mentioned it to my mate. I remember saying, what the hell is that? And I think his response was something along the lines of, I don't even want to think about what that might be. We carried on watching and the fire grew, until finally, something blue became apparent in its center. I couldn't tell what it was at first, but it quickly materialized. It, or rather he, was a man in a blue boiler suit 
with shoulder straps, wearing a tan cowboy hat and an orange shirt, and he was digging hard into the ditch. As he dug, he got lower, until around the point only his torso was visible. The image seemed to evaporate, the fire closely following suit. Me and my mate didn't speak during the sighting, and I don't think we spoke much on the subject on the ride home, but whenever I talked to him about it afterwards, he'd always make a joke or fobbed it off. I reckon some people just don't believe in ghosts. As it is, I haven't seen this mate for years, and that experience is the only thing I really remember regarding him. That caravan site, Tunstill, near the city of Hull, England, and that, what I can only describe as a spirit. Some woman who I told about it in a nightclub years later said maybe it meant something. I can't think what, but sometimes I think maybe she had a point. Thanks for reading. Hi, my name is Leanne and I live in Australia. I have six children and this story is about my eldest child, Amy, who is 12 now. I've experienced a lot in my life, ranging from getting a freezing feeling on my head whenever a spirit is near me, to seeing my relatives, one alive at the time, to being touched and feeling all four fingers, thumb and palm. This experience, however, is the freakiest one I've had to date. My daughter Amy was two years old. I'd been shopping in my local shopping center, and they had a crush there to mind your children while you shopped. I did some shopping, and then went across to the pub across the road from the shopping center, thinking that the crush would be open for at least another couple of hours. I started playing the poker machines, and about 20 minutes after I started playing, I heard this voice in my head saying, would the mother of the little girl with red hair, who is two, and whose name is Amy, Please come to the center management office now. I dismiss this completely. About 10 minutes later, I heard the voice again, a little more insistent this time. Would the mother of the little girl with red hair who is two and whose name is Amy please come to the center management office now? I continued playing, but felt a bit weird that I was hearing this voice, but still, I dismissed it. Then, would the mother of the little girl with red hair who is two and whose name is Amy please come to the center management office immediately? I just froze. I was hearing all of this in my head, and I couldn't figure out what on earth was happening to me. I had to decide at that moment whether to change the more money to coin to put in the machines or to go. I decided that I should go. I went across the road to the shopping center, and I got very scared. I virtually ran into the car park, and as the sliding doors opened, I heard, Would the mother of the little girl with red hair who is two, and whose name is Amy, please come to the center management office immediately? Now, take a breath. I was absolutely staggered. I just froze. I couldn't believe what I was actually hearing. I started to cry. I looked around everywhere, but I didn't know where the center management office was. A security guard noticed me crying and asked me if I was the mother they were looking for. I said yes, and he took me to the center management office. There I found my daughter Amy, who was crying, and two police officers. It turned out that the crash had only been open for another half an hour after I had put my daughter in. There was a sign outside apparently, but I had not seen it. The police officers told me that if I had been a half hour late, they would have charged me with abandonment. Can you believe that? I tearfully grabbed my daughter and cried the entire taxi ride home. I almost lost custody of my child because I didn't listen to that voice. I don't care if it was God or the spirits of my ancestors or my guardian angel, but someone, something, changed my life forever that day. My daughter is truly a wonderful human being, and somehow I think that day we shared a psychic connection that still freaks me out. Thanks for reading my story, and feel free to contact me if you would like more stories or details. This story is completely 100% true. My two brothers each have a home, located two in a row, right next to each other along US Highway 136 on the east edge of Hamilton, Illinois. Hamilton is a small town on the mighty Mississippi, located where Iowa, Missouri, and Illinois meet, tri-state area. Hamilton is around 30 miles upriver from Hannibal, Missouri, the famous boyhood home of American writer Mark Twain and his legendary tales of Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer. My brother Bill and his wife Rhonda reside in a split-level home 
which was built roughly 30 years ago, and is next door to my parents' house, which is located a few hundred yards away. The accident occurred in the summer of 2003. It was a very hot, dry summer that year, and in the middle of July, the temperature would stay in the 90s and would go over 100 degrees for several days in a row. It was on one of those sweltering hot July days when it happened. My brother Bill and his wife Rhonda run a small county newspaper, Hancock County Shopper in Hamilton. Our homes are located about a mile up from the highway from the newspaper office. It was Friday afternoon around 5 p.m. and Rhonda was driving home from work. On her way home, there were two cars traveling behind her on the highway making a total of three cars traveling at close proximity to one another. As Rhonda approached the driveway to their home, she put on her turn signal and slowed down to pull in the drive. Apparently, the third car in the sequence did not realize she was slowing down to turn, and that car slammed right into the back of the second vehicle, which was behind Rhonda's car. When the third car made impact with the second car, it shoved that car into the opposite lane, and the second car was hit again, this time head on by an oncoming tractor trailer. The direct impact of the semi truck smashed the car up into Bill and Rhonda's front yard, less than 25 yards from their front door. Rhonda's car was luckily not hit, and she pulled into the driveway and immediately went in the house and called 911. She then called Bill, expressing feelings of extreme guilt that she was somehow to blame. Bill raced home immediately. When Bill arrived at the accident scene, which was in his front yard, he ran straight for the car to see if he could be assistance to the trapped passengers inside. Bill found all four people in the devastated car deceased. He said the frozen looks on their gruesome dead faces were full of horror, with their eyes still bulging wide open. Fortunately though, nobody was injured in the other car or the semi that was involved in the accident. A few minutes later, police and many emergency vehicles arrived and secured the scene. After a few minutes of investigation, the Illinois State Police approached Bill and informed him that the two cars involved in the accident that were behind Rhonda were all members of the same family. It was one family, Mormons from Chicagoland visiting Illinois, traveling together in two cars. The parents and grandparents were traveling in the car, in which all four were killed. The other car, which no one was injured, contained the children of the family. The state police asked Bill if he would have the children of the family come into his air-conditioned home out of the blistering heat and wait inside Bill and Rhonda's home. Thereby, the children would not witness the morbid task of excavating the dead bodies of their parents and grandparents out of the mangled car in the front yard. Bill readily agreed and took the three children into his finished basement, away from the front windows. The children, age 18, 12, and 9, were obviously very upset in a state of shock. They were crying, yelling, and moaning. Rhonda tried her best to calm and console them. Bill and Rhonda have a full bath in their basement, and all the children were sick, vomiting, and bad diarrhea. A couple hours later, when it was all over, after the accident scene had been cleared, the police came to Bill and Rhonda's front door and got the children. After they had left, Bill and Rhonda cleaned up the bathroom, which had vomit all over the walls with diarrhea on the floor and running down the sides of the stool. A day or so later, Bill and Rhonda started to feel relieved, thinking they could finally calm down a little, that the nightmare was over. Little did they realize that it had just begun. Bill and Rhonda are very down-to-earth people, and neither of them had ever believed in the supernatural, the paranormal, or physical phenomena, until a couple days immediately after the accident. As I mentioned earlier, this all happened in the middle of July 03, and the miserable temperatures soared above a 100 degree mark. Bill and Rhonda kept their windows shut and the air conditioning on. Two days after the accident, Bill stopped in the house in the middle of the afternoon. He and Rhonda are the only two people who live there. He unlocked the house and went inside to discover one of the front room windows mysteriously open. He didn't think much about it and shut the window, then double check the rest of the house to make sure no other windows were open. Bill then left and drove to the newspaper office where Rhonda was working. Bill asked why in the house she would open the front room window in 100 degree heat with the air conditioning on. Rhonda replied that she had not opened the window and did not know what he was talking about. That evening, around 5 p.m., when they came home from work, the window was open again. Over the course of the next few weeks, 
they would come home to mysteriously find windows open in the house, with no logical explanation as to why. During the same period of time after the accident, Bill and Rhonda felt a very dark, dreary feeling in their home. While laying in bed watching television in the night, they said they could see dark shadows move across the ceiling in the bedroom in the upstairs hallway. They report feeling a very dark, foreboding presence occupying their home. The bedroom television shut off by itself. Their dog of 12 years, Eddie, would stand up at the foot of the bed and growl at the shadows that would move across the ceiling and walls. Eddie had never felt threatened like this before, growling at the walls and ceilings, but all three of them sensed this horrific, real presence of hell about the home. They were literally becoming scared shitless. It wasn't enough, the accident and all, let alone now this. Bill's daughter, Andrea, came home for a visit. She said while she was there, a bedroom door slammed shut by itself. It scared the shit out of her, and she left the house right away. Bill and Rhonda, even though they have never believed in the paranormal, began to think that a spirit or the spirits of the deceased family members from the freak accident followed their children into the home after they were killed and the dead spirits were somehow trapped there, angry and haunting the hell out of them. Soon after the accident, a family member of the victims involved drove down to Hamilton from Chicago to tie up some loose ends with the local police regarding the accident. On her way out of town, she stopped by Bill and Rhonda's house to introduce herself and personally thank them for watching the children after the tragedy. Immediately after the family relative visited then left Bill and Rhonda's home, the strange and unexplained phenomena stopped as suddenly as it started. The oppressive atmosphere in their home lifted, and nothing like that has happened to them to date. Thanks for reading. Everybody loves spending their weekend going out somewhere. So do I, but what if something creepy happens? It once happened with me and my cousin. We both just freaked out, but it wasn't a big deal to a person we met there. So the story starts like this. I live in Mumbai, India. Once, I was sitting playing video games with my younger brother. My mom and dad were deciding on going out one weekend, and so they called up my uncle and asked that if he and his family can join us. And so the very next day, we left our house and went to catch up the train, which led us to our destination, Marathon, a very beautiful tourist spot surrounded by mountains in India. It took the whole day to reach there. It was lovely being there, and now we had to find a hotel to stay in. The only bad thing about this place is... It being the tourist spot has hotels far away from each other so that if there is a hotel in front of you, the other hotel will be one or two kilometers away. Half of our day wasted in search for this hotel, but finally we found the hotel that was just right for us. Not a big one, but a cheap hotel. We then registered over there, took our keys for our rooms. We took three rooms on rent, one for my parents, one for my uncle, and his wife, and one for me, my brother, and my two cousins. We got all of our three rooms on the first floor of the hotel. When our parents slept, we all kids turned on the TV and watched movies. After some time, we heard some classical music coming out of the room beside ours, and it was too loud. So loud that we weren't able to listen to the movie dialogues. Then classical music was turned off, and suddenly it started again. We all decided to go and ask the neighbors to slow a bit the volume, but it was so dark that I, my brother, and one of my cousins didn't go out of the room, but my other cousin was kind of fearless, so we went alone. Now, it's not like he went and never came back, but he experienced something that he will never forget. So we went to the neighbor's door. It was a little bit dark over there, and rang the bell of their room, but the bell didn't work, so he looked at the door, and he was surprised to see that the door was locked from the outside. So he looked through the keyhole, and all he saw was a green light, and nothing else, and when he looked into the keyhole, the music stopped. He then returned to our room, and he told us that the room was locked 
and inside there was only a green light. Now, there was no music to be heard. We slept after some time. The next day, we went down in the lobby and asked the manager if there was anybody in the room staying beside us. Why, he asked. We told him everything that happened last night, and also that my cousin saw a green light through the keyhole. He was calm, like it wasn't a big deal to him. He told us that the room was closed from the last three years. Three years back, a girl committed suicide in that room, who came to Marathon to participate in a singing competition held over there. No one knows why she killed herself, and she was having green eyes, so the green light my cousin saw was nothing else but the girl's eyes. She was looking my cousin through the keyhole the same time he was looking through it. The manager stated whenever he gave a room beside the haunted one on rent, he got complaints about the loud classical music being played. When me and my cousin came to know this, we freaked out, and we forced our parents to change the hotel. That was the first and last time my cousin experienced something that creepy. But I experienced a few more, and I'll share them with you eventually. It was just after 11ish at night in the Christmas holidays. Everyone had gone to bed. Some were still up reading, though. I was feeling a bit tired, so I thought I would try to sleep. I turned off my light and laid down, but try as I might, I could not get to sleep. It got to about half past and I was still awake. It was like my body was asleep, but my mind was racing. I could hear footsteps down the hall. I thought it was my sister coming home from work. My bedroom door opened slightly. Maybe she was checking in on me, although she didn't usually do this. I then felt something on the bottom of my bed, next to my foot. My original thought was it's only the cat, but then I felt pressure on the other side of my feet. By this time, I was done convincing myself it was my sister or my cat, and was at the point of freak out. I clenched my jaw and didn't dare to move. I felt the original pressure be taken off, but quickly put back down, only this time, it was around my knees. The same happened with the second place and continued alternating faster and faster until finally I felt a weight on my chest, but I didn't want to open my eyes. It felt so heavy that I couldn't breathe or move, and I had to do something. I opened my eyes and looked. Green eyes looked back at me. I couldn't help myself. I screamed as loud as I could and my grandmother came running. My door flung open on its own, and my grandmother stopped in the cross-section of the hall in front of my room. She waited a moment and came in. I was sitting up in bed, and I felt so hot, and I asked my grandmother if I had a fever. She put her hand on my head and said, No, your skin is ice cold. I don't think I'll ever forget those eyes. Or how hot I was. When I was younger, my parents and I tended to move a lot, mainly because my mom despised staying in one place for too long. As she often said, there are simply too many things to do and see, so why settle? I was seven when we got a job offer in Springfield, Missouri at the primary school. Of course, she jumped on the opportunity, and we said goodbye to Lebanon, packed up our few belongings, and were off. She had found a nice apartment for us. It was a two-story, three-bedroom, two-bath, and cozy yet spacious, with lots of children for me to play with, and only five minutes from the school she would be teaching at. Within a week... We were settled, and Mom was pushing me outside to socialize. I was always a socially awkward child, mainly because I was shy, making it really hard for me to relate with other kids, nonetheless communicate. I hopped on my bike and started riding the sidewalks, watching for someone close to my age to play with. Oddly enough, for a sunny Saturday, there wasn't a lot of people out and about, so I headed towards a small playground that was between the two apartment buildings. 
It had a large tire swing and a slide attached to what looked like a clubhouse. So I parked my bike and started swinging. I decided to get lost in my thoughts when I heard a female voice from behind me. Hey, mind if I swing with you? I turned startled, toppling over the tire swing into the sand. A tall, thin girl with long, wavy brown hair, wearing a button-down yellow sleeveless shirt and white caprice was staring at me, trying not to laugh. You all right there, Jumpy? <laughs> she chuckled, extending a hand towards me. Yeah, you just startled me, I said, brushing the sand off my back. What's your name? Rebecca, but you can call me Becca, and you? Elena, you still want to swing? She smiled and climbed on the tire swing, waiting for me to join her. So are you new here? I don't think I've seen you around. Yeah, we just settled in not long ago. How long have you lived here? A pretty long time, I guess. I looked at her puzzled. How could she not know? I shrugged it off and changed the subject. We talked for the longest time about anything and everything that came to mind. For the first time in a long while, I had finally found someone that I had something in common with. Maybe I've actually made a friend, I thought to myself, smiling, as I watched the little boy and his mom heading towards the playground. You want to come to my apartment and get a drink? It's kind of hot and you can meet my mom, I said, stopping the swing. No sooner I had finished my sentence, the little boy's mom walked up and placed a hand on my shoulder. Sweetie, who are you talking to? I turned around and Becca was gone. I looked around to see what direction she had ran, but she was nowhere in sight. I was talking to Becca. She's the girl that was swinging with me. Did you see the way she went? The woman studied me and shook her head. She's loco, mama, laughed the little boy. I thanked her, blushing with embarrassment, and got on my bike to look for Becca, but I never saw her again, nor did I ever mention her until now. I'm not sure why she approached me, or why she was lingering around the apartment complex, but I will never forget my disappearing friend. My story took place in Colmar, France. It's a town near Germany. My grandparents were quite young during World War II and told me many stories about that town. When I was four, my parents and my mother's parents bought a two-story house in Colmar with a beautiful garden. My grandparents lived on the first floor and my parents and me on the second floor. There was a basement which was separated in three rooms, a storage room, a room for my father, and a laundry room, an attic, and next to the attic, a small storage room at the time. I loved the basement. I always played there or in the garden. I never was afraid of the basement, but the attic terrified me. I remember I was four and my mother put some boxes in the attic. I followed her and felt very uneasy. It was dark, and I felt eyes on me. I looked in every direction, but I never saw anything. I was little, and I thought that there was a beast up there. Not a monster. A beast. I don't know why. Fast forward. I'm eight years old. In the summer of 1991, I played every Saturday with a friend, Melanie. I had this genius idea of searching the house to find a secret passage. I had read a book about a girl finding a secret passage in her house, and I was sure there was one, because my house was quite old. We searched the basement, but found nothing. So we eventually went to the attic. It was such a strange place. It was L-shaped, but the left part of that place was totally dark, so we had to bring a flashlight. What I could never explain was a hole in the wall at the right corner of the attic. It was three feet tall and quite narrow, but by looking into it with the flashlight, one could see a room, but there was no entry, just this hole. 
Nobody could enter in. This room was actually behind a small storage room next to the attic. Maybe there was a passageway, but we never found any. So we were looking through this hole. When I felt uneasy again, I felt something in the attic with us. I kept looking at the far end, where there was no light, and was sure that something would come at us. I saw nothing, and we went out playing in the garden. We went back to the attic. We were fearless young girls. My friend never felt anything, so I thought that I had an overactive imagination. So this time, I was looking through the hole, and my friend had the flashlight. She was standing at the far end of the attic, and suddenly, she asked me, What's that? I looked in the beam of the flashlight and froze. There was a young man sitting on the floor, his knees against his chest. His arms were crossed on his knees, like he was hugging himself. He turned his head towards us and smiled. We bolted out of the room and went to the storage room. My heart was pounding. I was out of breath. I first thought that it was a real, live person, but he had no color. It was like a 3D dark shadow, and we never heard any footsteps. My friend refused to admit that we saw a ghost, and we never talked about it. I never saw him again, but the storage room became my room when I was a teen, and sometimes I heard strange noises bangings on the wall, the wall which was connected to the secret room, and scratching noises. My grandmother learned, later, that our house was a clandestine printing office for World War II. The owners printed slogans against the Germans, but I think there was something else in that house. I believe that the secret room was used to hide people. But forever and ever, I'm terrified of the addict. We moved out three years ago, but I still have nightmares. Man in a trench coat staring at me. After being considerably bored at work one day, I decided to Google ghost stories, as I've personally seen and dealt with them before, and came across this site. I love reading the stories and it got me all jazzed up to tell mine. It probably all started when I was 14. I'm now 24. My family and I were on a week-long camping trip when my dog passed away. This dog that we had, Max was his name, was the family dog, but being at a young age when we got him, I became the closest to him. After I had learned that he died, I was so upset that my family had to cut the vacation short just to get me home. I had just moved into a room in my parents' basement, and it had no door to it. Now, where my bed was located, when looking out the door, you could see the furnace to the house. One night, I woke up and grabbed a sip of water from a water bottle I always keep beside my bed and happened to look towards the entrance of my room. Sitting in the doorway was my dog, Max. Now, since this happened so long ago, I've constantly said to myself that this was a dream only because when I started calling Max to me, I remember specifically his eyes glowing red and him then jumping on my bed and trying to attack me. That ended up scaring the bejesus out of me. After the whole dog dream, I've not seen Max since. Later when I would wake up and roll over, I would steal a look to the door and I would see a giant man, like a silhouette, standing in my doorframe staring at me. To me, it looked like he was wearing a huge trench coat with some sort of hat with a huge brim. The first time this happened, I was so frightened that I dared not to stare at him too long, as he would attack me like my dog. It became constant, like every night I would see him and for the first while, it scared me to no ends, but I became used to it, and later when I would see him, 
I would just roll over, smile, and go back to sleep. One morning, after seeing the dude in my doorway the night before, I was speaking with my parents about a bad dream I had the night before. My mom chuckled as my dad also had a nightmare the same night and told me to go ask him about it. When I asked Pops about his dream, he told me that he was dreaming about a guy who broke into the house, made his way into my sister's room, and ended up killing her. This woke him out of his sleep and when he looked out the hallway into the kitchen, he said he actually saw someone leave my sister's room. The two rooms are right beside each other that lead into the hall that leads into the kitchen and walk into the kitchen. He said he got up and ran to the kitchen and when he flipped the light on, no one was there. It was then that I told him that I always see someone standing in the doorway every night and he just told me it was the furnace. What the hell? After I turned 18, I was still seeing this guy. My friends would spend the night, and in the morning, they would explain to me how they saw a guy standing in the middle of the room, thinking it was me, and then explain what he looked like. That was when activity in the house started to pick up. My family and I would constantly see things out of the corner of our eyes. My mother one night told me about a floating person with a tiny smile on their face, waving to her. Loud, unexplained noises followed up by things. One night, it was all of our empty bottles lined up on our freezer, which I thought was hella cool. Moving unexplained. I feel like I might be dragging this on, and I have a bit more to talk about, so I think I will make a part two about my experiences in the future. Looking back to them, I think things only get worse for me. Nightmares with ghosts and demons. And we ended up getting the house blessed. But like I said, that will be another story. Thanks for listening and reading my story. Indonesian Black Magic I was reading another story here about black magic which reminds me of an incident that occurred almost 20 years ago. It's probably not as scary as other stories on here, but it's definitely odd. My family immigrated to Canada when I was nine. Years later, I was living with my mom, brother, grandma, cousin, and an Indonesian houseworker. My maternal relatives are all Chinese Indonesians. At that time, my mom was too busy to take care of us, so our aunt found a houseworker, cleaner, caretaker from Indonesia to help around. I can't remember her name. We always change houseworkers, but let's call her Mia. She is quite an easygoing person. I was probably the only one who casually talked and joked with her the most, regardless of her status. One day, when I returned home from school, I didn't see Mia. She was usually in the kitchen or somewhere on the first floor at this hour. So I asked my grandma about it. She told me Mia was in the basement, resting in her room. Then she said, in the early afternoon, Mia suddenly came up from the basement, crying uncontrollably and trying to hug my grandma for comfort. Her hair was cut short, like really short to the point some parts of her scalp were almost exposed. It was not nicely cut either, as if someone had randomly snipped her hair strand by strand. She looked like a mess. I remember my grandma saying that Mia got snipped hair all over my grandma's clothes when Mia was hugging her. A while later, Mia calmed down and went back down to the basement for a sleep. I should know that my grandma doesn't speak Indonesian or English, so she couldn't communicate or ask what was going on. One thing for sure is, no one else was in the house except Mia and my grandma. For the next few days, Mia still cleaned around the house, but she looked really down and emotionless. I was a bit scared to talk to her. My cousin bought her a wig and... That was what she wore every day. 
No one else told me what really happened that day. Slowly, things went back to normal, and Mia was also returning to her usual self. I forgot how the conversation started, but she opened up the details to me about that weird incident. She was just resting in her room, and then the next thing she remembered was her hair was cut short, and her hair was everywhere. To her surprise, she was the one holding the scissors. By the time she realized it, she broke down and rushed upstairs. The rest was what my grandma told me. Then she was telling me about her life back in Indonesia. She had a boyfriend back home and had often dreamed about him, always telling her to come back to Indonesia. Her parents hate him, though, and instead wanted her to marry another rich man. She doesn't like him at all, which was why she left home to work in Canada, so she could avoid him. She suspected that man probably hired someone to cast a spell on her and made her cut her own hair as a punishment for running away from him. At that time, I didn't know much about black magic or voodoo. Actually, even now I still don't know much about it. I just had an idea that it's something similar to cursing someone and causing them to have bad luck. Weeks after the incident, my mom said Mia had returned to Indonesia. I asked her why. All she said was because her contact terms had ended with us. Although I really didn't believe that. My mom was probably afraid more unusual events might somehow get us all involved. Thanks for reading. Now to start with a little background, I was five years old at the time this occurred, living with my mom in an apartment my parents had recently separated. The layout of the apartment was, you walk in, and to the right is the kitchen. Beside the kitchen, to the further right, is the dining area. Go forward from the door, and there is a hallway on the left, where the bathroom and my mom's room were. Go straight and take a step down into a sunken living room. To the left of the living room looks like closet-type horizontal wooden slat doors, but those were actually the doors to my room. Moving along. That day, I was at home sick. I had a terribly sore throat and could barely speak. I had cream of tomato soup and a toasted bologna sandwich for lunch and could not finish the sandwich as the toast was too hard and hurt my throat. The point of me telling you this is so that you know that I remember the details of the day leading up to my experience. I digress. I spent the day with my mom and cuddled with her while we watched Young and the Restless. A movie, of course. In the middle of the night, I was woken up by the sound of the chain coming off the door and the deadbolt unlocking. I thought that it was my mom letting her boyfriend into the apartment as he worked until late at night. I heard footsteps coming through the hall and down into the living room, stopping right outside my door. At that point, I was terrified. I didn't hear my mom talking to her boyfriend or him say anything at all, and it was completely silent. The wooden slats in my door shifted and opened and I saw a six-foot cartoon clown standing outside the door, looking in at me. I know it might sound funny that it was a cartoon, but I guarantee you that it was terrifying. It opened the door and came into my room. It walked over to me, standing above me in my bed. I was trying to scream, but because my throat was so sore, I couldn't make any noise. It had a teapot or something in its hand and was holding it over me and was starting to pour something onto me. I started thrashing around in my bed, trying to make it go away. It worked. It was like I hit rewind on a video. A slow rewind, but a rewind nonetheless. The clown backed out of my room, closed the door, the slats closed again. I heard the footsteps retreating through the apartment, 
the door open and close, and the deadbolt and chain go back on the door. I tried calling my mom, but my voice still wasn't working. I finally got up the courage to go and get my mom, and she came and slept with me. She didn't believe me and her, along with the rest of my family, laughs hysterically and brings up my little story. I know more than anyone how ridiculous it sounds to have a cartoon clown torment you. I also know that most of you will not believe me and say that because I was a child that I was just imagining things. But I wasn't. I know what I saw. And I know it was terrifying. The Joker. I was eight years old when my Aunt Wendy, who lived in Tennessee, gave me a porcelain Joker doll that had what looked like a red teardrop. We were getting ready for bed, and since we were staying with them, we didn't have anywhere to put it. My mom set it on the shelf in the front room. While my mom and I were lying there talking, we got the feeling that something was watching us. When we looked around, no one was in there, and everyone was asleep. My mom looked over to the Joker doll and noticed it was pointed towards us. Knowing she had faced it towards the door, my mom got up and, and turned it to face the wall. We laid there talking for a few minutes when we heard a scratching noise on the shelf, like something heavy was being turned around. When we looked over to the shelf, the Joker doll was pointed towards us again. Thinking it was my cousin, we went in her room to see. She was asleep. I knew this as I hit her leg, and she was never a good faker. After realizing she was asleep, we went back into the front room and laid the Joker flat on its face. Later that night, with everyone still asleep, my mom got up to use the bathroom and realized that the Joker was lying on its back. So my mom got it and put it in the back with our clothes, and the feeling as if something was watching us left. The next morning, we got a call about a house. In the process, my mom told my dad that she wanted to get rid of the doll. My dad said no, because my aunt gave it to me. We were unloading some stuff, and my mom put the Joker doll in our hallway closet, hoping my dad wouldn't find it. Much to our dislike, my dad watched my mom put it there. My dad brought it in my bedroom and put it on my dresser. He said, this is where I want it to stay. The feeling of being watched returned. I was lying there and glanced at my dresser to the Joker doll and noticed it had an evil smile on its face. I hollered for my mom and when she came in, she noticed it too. So she put it in my drawer. The next morning, we were telling my dad about what happened. He was not believing in that stuff, told us to shut up, and that we were making it up. My mom decided to call my aunt, Wendy, and asked her if they ever noticed anything out of the ordinary. And my aunt said yes. That was the reason they put it in the shed out back. Later that night, my dad came home from work, and we told him what my aunt had told us. Unfortunately, my aunt denied it all, making my mom and I look like idiots. So again that night, my mom put it back in the dresser drawer. She went to turn the coffee pot on so dad would have coffee the next morning and went to bed. The next day, my mom and I were sitting in the kitchen. My dad came into the kitchen holding the Joker doll and told us that he said he wanted it to stay on my dresser. Being eight years old, I knew I had better listen to him, so I went and put it on my dresser. He then started cussing, saying that he didn't see any problem with the Joker doll, and we'd better keep it on my dresser. He didn't believe in stuff like that. I asked my mom if she would lie down with me, and she said yes, still feeling an evil presence in the room. My mom said a prayer with me, and we fell asleep. The next morning, when my dad got up, he came into the room where we were and told my mom he wanted the doll out of there. My mom says that she thought he didn't believe in things like we had been telling him. Yet he just now decides 
that he wants the doll out of the house? He began telling her that the night before, he got up to use the bathroom, stepped into my room, and the Joker doll had an evil smile on its face, and he heard an evil laugh. Now believing us, he went in my room, got the Joker doll, and took it outside and tried to burn it. Only the clothes burnt, and the face turned black from the smoke. Then he got it out of the trash barrel and hit it with a hammer, but only part of its face chipped. Getting freaked out, he took it to the neighborhood dumpster and threw it in there. We never saw it again, and everything in my room went back to normal. A week later, I became friends with a boy in my class, and we were all over at his parents for supper. When I looked in the front room, on a shelf, there was a Joker doll, just like the one I used to have. Later, my mom asked if she could look at it, and she noticed a mark where it was made that mine didn't have, and it didn't have the red teardrop. After seeing that, my mom asked where they got it from. They told her what store, and my mom called my aunt Wendy to ask her about my doll. She told my mom the same store. My mom asked my aunt about the teardrop, and my mom called my aunt Wendy to ask her about my doll. She told my mom the same store. Mom asked my aunt about the teardrop, and my aunt said she asked the store clerk about it, as it was the only one. The teardrop didn't look like any kind of paint, that it looked more like blood. When my dad got on the phone, he asked my aunt about it again. My aunt told him what they had experienced. They thought that it didn't have anything to do with the Joker doll. Even though she said they felt an evil feeling, like someone watching them, which went away when the Joker doll was in the shed. You can choose to believe this or not, but if you don't, please don't post any rude comments. I was wondering if the reason the Joker doll was like that could have been made by someone who was really into witchcraft. Thanks for reading. Another clown? During the early 70s, when my family lived for a time in Fresno, my mom decided to divorce my dad and moved herself, me, and my little sister, Ruth, into government housing, which was not bad. I thought the little semi-detached two-story houses were cute with their wooden floors. When my dad was around, my parents would argue loudly, so I thought it was just as well they were getting a divorce, whatever that was. To my six-year-old mind, divorce was what happened to your family when you got to a certain age, like your teeth coming in. At least that's what it seemed like. Once I fell down the stairs, maybe pushed... But I was very adventurous and was probably practicing my flying. Luckily, I didn't break my neck and was only a little bruised. Another time, I rolled off my bed and fell into my metal dollhouse. There were no lawsuits back in those days, so the manufacturers of metal dollhouses were at liberty to produce razor-sharp objects for small children to disassemble and play with. But nothing supernatural ever happened that I knew of. Then, just a few years ago, my mother mentioned the ghost her sister used to see in our house in Fresno, and I soon got the story out of my sister. This is what she says happened to her to the best of my recollection. One moonlit night, she awoke on her little bed next to my big bed. She got up, wearing her itchy, footy pajamas, and toddled down the hall to use the toilet. When she returned... There on the floor was something she had never seen before, nor has she seen since. Something that looked like a clown's head was moving back and forth around the floor. It was slightly larger than a volleyball and had a painted look, white skin, wide, grimacing reddish lips, and huge yellow, googly eyes that were rolling around in their sockets. She remembers nothing definite after that which I have read indicates a possible nightmare in children. She says she may have run into our mom's room and jumped into her bed with her, but she's not sure. You left me in there with that thing? I asked her. You were asleep, she answered. 
I asked her how she felt this experience affected her life. You become very open-minded about certain things, she said. One thing I know, Ruth was an extremely intelligent child who well knew the difference between make-believe, dreaming, and reality. Thanks for reading. Hope it wasn't too long and boring. This happened a couple of years ago. We had just moved into a new house. I was getting used to living in a different neighborhood, and it wasn't really easy. One night, my parents weren't home, so I invited my friend over. We were sitting in my room, talking about boys, when my friend said she had to go to the washroom. While she was in the washroom, I went downstairs to go get a snack for us to eat without telling her. As I went downstairs, she came out of the washroom and was stunned I was coming back upstairs. She asked, how did you leave so quickly when I was just talking to you? I was shocked. I told her that I had been downstairs and I didn't even talk to her while she was in the bathroom. We both were freaked out and she told me the voice sounded exactly like mine. That night, when my parents returned home, me and my friend were getting ready to go to bed. We fell asleep at around, oh gosh, I would say 1.30 a.m. The next morning, I awoke and my friend left to go home. I was walking up the stairs. I had this feeling as if someone was following me. I looked back and I saw this dark thing walking behind me and as it walked after me, its hood came out of nowhere and just became more visible. I ran to my bedroom and locked the door. I told my parents about what had happened. They didn't really believe me. So I asked my mom who had lived in this house before us and she told me that this lady and her kids had lived here. She had this worried look on her face. I asked her what had happened, and in a light voice, she said the woman who lived here before had committed suicide in our laundry room. I was terrified. Sometime after that, I went to do my laundry when the door had slammed shut. I was scared to death. I quickly opened the door and ran out of the laundry room. After that day, I never saw anything again until I had to take care of my baby cousin with my friend. We were playing with her in the spare room when she pointed up at the ceiling and started to cry uncontrollably. I ran and got my camera. When I took a picture of where she was pointing, I could see this white weird shaped thing. We were terrified. After that, I showed my parents the picture and they invited the priest to bless our house. Ever since that day, I haven't seen a ghost. Thank God, peace and love. Monster in the Laundry Room In September 2005, my husband, myself, our three children, and of course, the lovable dog, moved into our house. It is a renovated lakefront cottage built in the 1930s in a rural town of upstate New York. We were drawn to the house for its charm and the peaceful lake. But I must say that I did feel a bit uneasy when we first moved in. Within the first few weeks of living there, I experienced some strange happenings. The house is a ranch style with a partially finished basement, an unfinished laundry room, and workshop. There is also a dirt floor, crawl space that you can only access from an outside door. I still can't bring myself to go in there. One night, 
while carrying a basket of laundry up the basement stairs. The stairwell light flickered out. I tried the light switch at the top of the stairs a few times, but could not get it to work. I told my husband that we needed a new bulb, and when he flicked the switch, the light went on. It happened again the next night, and I made him change the bulb. Well, this flickering continued for a couple of weeks, even after the bulb changed. While this was happening, my dog was also acting bizarre. After I would get up to the top of the stairway, he wouldn't follow me up like he normally would, but instead would sit at the bottom of the stairs and bark at me as if he didn't know me, almost as if he was staring right through me. He did this every day. A short time later, I woke early one morning before my husband left for work and found the front door wide open. Now, I know that I shut and locked the door before going to bed, and when I questioned my husband about it, he denied leaving it open. Hmm. I decided to mention what was going on to a co-worker of mine who had some knowledge of spiritual activity, and she suggested talking to the spirits and asking them to leave. I did, and other strange noises every now and then started to appear. Everything seemed to stop after that, though. Until last night. We recently finished renovating part of the basement, which is actually ground level because of the grading of the land, and closed off two doors that used to give access to the basement from the outside. We made a master bedroom, a bathroom, and my four-year-old son's bedroom. There's a door from the master that goes into the laundry room, which is in the unfinished part of the basement. Well, my son woke up in the middle of the night last night and climbed in between my husband and I. He had a hard time falling back asleep. After my husband left for work in the morning, my son and I were laying in bed and he was staring at the open laundry room door. He said, Mom, when I move close to you, the monster has a sad face, and a very angry one too, but when I move to daddy's side, the monster smiles. I said, where is the monster? And he replied, right there in the laundry room. He has a white face and red feet, and his head is up to the ceiling. When I move next to you, he gets a mad face. I asked him if the monster talks to him, and he said, No, but he puts his hand next to his mouth and whispers only at night. He also told me that the monster thinks this is his house. We got out of bed, and I walked towards the laundry room to take a closer look. But my son said, No, don't go in there. He gets mad. I didn't see anything, so I asked my son to show me where the monster was, but he couldn't look. He seemed terrified. He just said, tell him to leave mom, he freaks me out. We went upstairs, and my son was telling his 10 year old sister about the monster. She asked if she could show her where he was, so he brought her down to the basement. He came running upstairs a minute later, saying, Yep, he's still there. His sister couldn't see it. After thinking about this, and what happened when we first moved in, I then remembered that when our next door neighbor came to introduce herself, she mentioned a couple who used to live in our house, several owners ago, that would always argue and fight. Well, apparently the husband went missing, but that was all she had said. It all seems too coincidental now. I have a feeling it will be a long night. Laundry Visitor I'm sharing this story on behalf of my dad. 
this experience occurred to him almost 20 years ago. But I was at home asleep at this time, in my bedroom upstairs. My dad is originally from Europe, and most of his family still reside over there. The way they lived many years ago is certainly a lot different to how we live now. The toilet was outside. They had to wash all their clothes by hand, in the river, etc. Of course, since then, many things have changed, which is great for them. It was a Saturday morning, and my dad was downstairs in the laundry, sorting out the washing. All of a sudden, from the corner of the room, he saw a white mist appear. It then turned into the apparition of his sister, who had died many years before. He told me by this point, she appeared like a real human. In a soft voice, she said to him, Dear, look how lucky you are now to have a machine to do your washing. When I had to use my hands in the river. After that moment, she faded into a swirling mist, into a corner of the ceiling, and disappeared. Dad did not even have a chance to say anything to her. He just stood there completely shocked, but certainly not scared. After that moment, he tells me to this day, he could not believe what he had seen, and he felt very at peace with their presence there in front of him. Needless to say, he says he made himself a very strong cup of coffee after that experience. Has anyone had any experience where a loved one who has passed has gone to greet another loved one before they could get a chance to speak in such a manner and respond, before evaporating into the cold air. This all started about two years ago. Just like the rest of the house, the laundry room and garage has always given me the creeps. The laundry room is located in a small room in what we call the far garage. We have two, two car garages, and it is located in the furthest one. This far garage has always been the epicenter for creepiness. One day, I was going out to switch the laundry from washer to dryer, and as I got there, I saw that both the washing machine and dryer lids were open mid-cycle. I just thought, okay, Someone came out here looking for something and forgot to close them. I asked my mom and boyfriend if they had been out there. Both said no. Seemed kind of strange. Then, it happened again. Both lids open, mid-cycle, nothing missing. Only this time, I had been home alone the entire time the clothes had been going. This has happened to me maybe four or five times. It's not that I left them open. The washing machine's lid is located on the top, so it didn't fall open. Plus, they won't start unless the lids are shut, so I didn't forget to shut them. Nothing blatantly scary, just unsettling. I have yet one more story about the experiences I've had in my home. And it really takes the cake on full-out scariness. In another post, I will detail this event. Thanks for reading. The Washing Machine Just a short story here. And it is true. I'm not a believer in ghosts, and not an easy guy to scare, but this, this did the trick. I'll tell you in advance 
that I don't have an answer to what happened, but would like to hear your thoughts. It's all true and a major puzzle to me. Our top loading washing machine is in the basement. It's a nice basement, not a dark, spooky place. The room has bright lights. And because it's in the basement, there is no way to enter this room from the outside of this house. Okay, here we go. At least half a dozen times in the past year, I've gone done to put the wash into the dryer after the washing time should have long elapsed. Imagine my surprise to find the wash not finished and the top cover of the lid of the washing machine up. The fact that the lid is up means that the washing cycle has not been completed. Each time, I just scratched my head and wondered how this could happen. Just the other day it happened. This time, as I went back into the washroom, I switched on the light and looked to see the top up once again. But this time, I heard something move in the room. It was the sound like a dog would make if he woke him up from sleeping and he just bounced up. And we don't have any pets. The hair on my arms went straight up as I looked around the room, but I never found anything. We saw John F. Kennedy in the early 1990s. I know that you probably won't believe my story, but it is true. My honor and dignity as a Christian is important to me. Even today, I am still frightened by what I saw that day back in the early 1990s. I live in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and was working in a retail store as a sales manager back then. The day was as usual as a summer day is, June or July, and the sun was shining bright. Inside the store, I began walking to the back of the store to go on break or to get my paperwork. I can't remember which. This store was large, and when I had walked a certain distance, it seemed like time had stood still, and nobody was around me. It was really strange. Only a good friend and fellow sales manager was near me, and then we both saw him. A man came walking forward towards us, and we just stood in awe at what we were seeing. We both knew instantly who the man was. You see, the man was President John F. Kennedy. At an age, he would have been in the early 1990s, in his early 70s, with gray hair. Well, you might ask, could it have been a person who resembled the late President Kennedy? No, because something about him made us know who we were seeing. The man wore ordinary clothes, but he had a massive scar down the entire left side of his skull. The very area of the fatal headshot was fired and killed the president in Dallas, Texas on November 1963. It looked as if that side of his entire skull had been blown away and reattached somehow. The scar marks were plainly visible to see. He looked right at me and continued walking until he got out of sight. My friend and I just stood there staring at each other. I said, did you just see what I saw? And my friend replied, yes, but I'm sure not going to tell anybody about it. We agreed to keep quiet. I ran to find the Kennedy ghost man again, but he was gone. He simply vanished. This story is absolutely true, and I never even told my fiancé about it. I keep asking myself today why the deceased president, John F. Kennedy, would contact me, of all people. He had always been my favorite U.S. president, but this was truly a crazy experience. I indeed saw John F. Kennedy in some sort of purgatory spirit world, or his spirit contacting me in one form or another. John Lennon's Ghost On December 8, 1980, 
Former Beatle John Lennon and his wife, Yoko Ono, were just returning home to the Dakota, a luxury apartment building in Manhattan, when a deranged fan shot Lennon five times in the back near the entrance to the Dakota. En route to Roosevelt Hospital, John Lennon died. John Lennon was 40 years old. Lennon had an open mind when it came to the paranormal. While traveling and living at the Dakota, he reported seeing a spectral figure walking down the corridors, which he referred to as the crying lady ghost. He told his first wife, Cynthia Lennon, that if he passed away, he would contact her. In 1986, Cynthia reported that John had indeed sent her a sign. She found a dead Jack doll wrapped in old newspapers dated 1956 behind the fireplace in her home in Cumbria. John had told her if there was life after death, he would prove it by sending her and Julian, their son, a feather as a sign. John's ghost has been seen at the Dakota on several occasions. In 1983, three years after Lennon's death, Joey Harrell, a musician accompanied by a writer friend, Amanda Moores, spotted Lennon near the entrance where he was shot. Moores stated she was tempted to approach Lennon and talk, but his expression dissuaded her. Harrell reported that when Lennon appeared, an eerie light surrounded him. Yoko Ono also encountered John Lennon's ghost at the Dakota. She stated that she saw him sitting at his white piano. He turned to her and said, Don't be afraid. I am still with you. Paul McCartney described these encounters he had with Lennon's ghost. In 1995, when he, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr were singing Lennon's song, Free as a Bird, during a recording session, McCartney stated he felt Lennon was in the studio with him. As it turned out, this was more than just a feeling. McCartney went on to state, There were a lot of strange going-ons in the studio, noises that should have been, and equipment doing all manner of weird things. In another encounter, McCartney said that during a photo shoot for the single, a white peacock wandered over from the neighboring farm. At the last minute, the beautiful bird made its presence known. McCartney felt it was the spirit of John Lennon hanging around as they wrapped the recording. McCartney stated to Harrison and Starr, That's John. Spooky, eh? After the recording, while McCartney, Harrison, and Starr listened to the single's B-side, he stated that John again was making his presence known. McCartney explained they had just put a spoof backwards recording on the end of the single for a laugh and to amuse fans. As they listened to the finished single, One Night in the Studio, McCartney swears as it got to the end, they heard John Lennon in the recording itself. Paul McCartney stated that he and George and Ringo, after this, knew it was John and that he was sending his approval. This story begins when I was a child, probably about seven years old. My mom and aunts threw a huge Halloween party for all the kids in the family. I think there were 16 of us at the time, ranging in age from probably 5 to 13. It was awesome, but the coolest part came about the time it just got really dark. We took a hayride to a cemetery a few miles down the road from my aunt and uncles where the party was being held. My mom told us about some of the people buried there and how some of them were not resting in peace. Typical urban legend stuff. When we got there, the adults said they wanted us to show us the grave of an old man whose ghost was seeking revenge for his wrongful death. We were all scared and excited, creeping through the cemetery in the dark towards the largest tombstone. When we were about halfway there, my dad and uncles popped up from behind the graves wearing scary masks. The kids all screamed and ran for the wagon while the ghosts and moms all laughed. For years, the adults retold this story, laughing over the details of our panicked faces and terrified attempts to get away. When I was a teenager, my sister and two of my cousins decided to get our moms back for this prank. 
Our parents got together once a month to play cards. So that October, we made sure we were around for card night. We waited until our fathers went for a beer run, which inevitably meant an hour or two at the bar. We told our moms about a legend we had heard about a sad ghost that could be seen weeping at her husband's grave when the moonlight hit. We made this story up and convinced them to take us to see it. My cousin secretly called his best friend, who had agreed to go there in a mask and hide to scare them. The prank worked perfectly, and our mothers nearly peed themselves. We all laughed hardly as we went back to our car. When we got to it, the car would not start. We laughed some more about the ghost sabotaging it and decided to walk where my cousin's friend had hidden his car. We would send our dads to get the car later. But of course, his car would not start either. We started to feel a little weird about this since neither car had problems recently. But what could we do? This was before everyone had cell phones, so we started walking towards the closest house, which was about a mile or two away. Though none of us knew them well, we knew the name of the people who lived there. As we walked up their long driveway, we started to worry because there were no cars parked by the house, and it looked pretty dark inside. We knocked anyway, but got no answer. We were about to leave, not having nearly as much fun thinking we would have to walk the long distance to the next house, when we heard voices coming from the back of the house. We went to the backyard, looking for the people we heard, but it was pretty dark and nobody was around. We yelled hello a few times and identified ourselves, but got no answer. The backyard had a fair amount of trees and suddenly large branches started falling. This scared us since there was no apparent cause. In just a few seconds, at least a dozen branches bigger than your arm fell from the five or six trees closest to us. It was utterly crazy. We all ran for it. We were around the end of the driveway. My cousin screamed and pointed towards the house. It looked like several pairs of red eyes were peering around the house at us. We ran straight back to our car and tried it again. It started no problem. We did not stop at my cousin's friend's car. We went right back to the house. Later that night, my uncle and dad and cousin took his friend back and got his car, which also started on the first try. When they drove past the house, it looked completely normal, and there was a car in the driveway. We have never been sure if the people there saw us mucking about in the graveyard and decided to prank the pranksters, or if it was something else. If it was a prank, they put it together awfully fast and never laughingly confessed. We felt too foolish to ask. It was in 1971. I was in my late 20s. I was then staying in Rose Hill in a different country, not married yet and staying at my folks. One day, my dad came home with a South African couple. He met them while coming back home and they were tourists visiting Meredith with their back bags, tents and sleeping bags. Meredith was still safe in that period, but independence was given by Great Britain in 1968, and a civil war had just come to an end a few months before. Two communities had fought for some political reasons. Anyway, my dad invited them home to sleep over for a few days. I remember the guy had a big blonde beard. He was very kind. His wife was as well but I forgot her face. 
We decided to organize camping during a weekend on the west coast of Meridus. This place, which is now pretty developed, was at the time very wild with just a few houses. We went on a Saturday morning, found a nice place to put a tent, and organized the day. The South African man and his wife were very good swimmers and divers. We spent a lot of time in the sea, catching fish, crabs, some lobsters, which were getting scarce then. We don't find them anywhere by the coast, and cooked all these goodies on a small homemade barbecue set. All of us, mom, dad, the couple and I really enjoyed the day. The sunset was beautiful. It was warm. We were in summer, and everything was perfect. When night came, we prepared a nice barbecue with chicken, beef, and pork, and a few shrimps we had caught earlier. The night was starry. My dad was happy and drunk, and the couple was obviously having a great time. Since we were not fluent in English, I was improving then. Communication was a bit difficult, but we could make ourselves understand with gestures and sometimes drawing on the sand. It was a great fun seeing my dad, trying to converse with them with a very limited knowledge of English. Anyway, it must have been around 9 p.m. We were all seated on the beach, watching the ocean as well as the starry sky by the campfire. It was so beautiful. Then we started to hear like a complaint. We couldn't determine the origin of the sound, but it was like a woman wailing. It was faint, but clear, since the place was wild and remote. The wailing was not constant, but would be heard from time to time. We put it on the sound of some sorts of animal. Since we were not people living on the coast, thus being ignorant of animals, which could be active at night. We were seated on the beach, facing the ocean, when suddenly, we noticed someone coming out from the sea, on our left, at about 30 to 40 meters away. It looked like a woman with a long white dress, just walking from the sea, to the beach. We could not see her face, but could guess she had long hair. The only lights were the stars and our bonfire. She silently walked straight and disappeared from our view in the vegetation. We found this very odd. I knew it was not normal, but did not know what the others were thinking. My dad was drunk and watched the scene with a little smile on his face. I think he was lost in his thoughts. We all looked at each other and did not know what to think. I tried to check if there was a house where the woman walked to. I just stood up and walked towards the sea and looked on my left to see where she went. There was only green, bush, and trees. There were no lights or any constructions around. I was now scared because I was realizing that we must have seen a ghost. I walked back to the bonfire and sat and told everyone that I did not find any house there. We stopped talking and everyone kept alert. We could now hear all the little noises of the night. We heard faint crackling like someone or an animal quietly walking on dry leaves. Then, suddenly, we heard loud flapping noises on a tree nearby. It looked like large birds, pigeons or bats, flying away. It scared us. Then my mom told me quietly she felt that something was not right, and I and she were feeling watched. The couple was looking around with their glass in their hands. Then, suddenly, something heavy fell in front of us on the beach at about five or six meters. I stood up to see what it was, but could not find anything. 
Everybody stood up and looked around. Nothing was found. Despite the fact that the night was clear and sweet, the atmosphere had changed. Apart from my father, who was in a trip because he was too drunk, we were all scared by then. The couple talked between them, and I could not understand. They seemed quite concerned about the situation. I did not know what to do. Could we stay there, or maybe go to sleep, or maybe we had to leave? That was a pity. We were enjoying such a nice time before seeing that woman. Then, in the middle of the night, we heard this bone-chilling scream like a woman being attacked. It seemed close to our camp. We were on our feet with eyes about to pop out from our sockets. My heart was pounding so loud that I thought others could hear it. The couple started to pick up their stuff, and my dad followed them. Mom and I packed away everything quickly. As we were doing so, some coconuts fell and rolled on our camp as if someone had thrown them away. We were now scared to death, and no one would talk. We heard running on the beach, then in the woods, but could not see anything. We quickly put stuff in the car, and it was not easy because we did not have a big car, and we had taken time to pack things so that they could fit in when we came down. Now we had to pile up things. The worst was the barbecue. It was hot and dirty, and we did not want to leave it. I burnt myself twice while trying to put it away. While we were packing away, things were happening around us. The screams seemed to originate from different places, and there was a lot of noises going on. We all got into the car practically, one upon the other with stuff on us. I decided to take the wheel because my dad was too drunk. As we moved away, we got a shock. We saw a woman dressed in white standing by the little lane looking at us. It was bone chilling. I stopped the car. She was standing about four to five meters away. I didn't know what to do. I was too scared to move closer to her, but it was the only way out. We waited a few minutes as she was standing there, staring at us. I heard my mom praying and the South African couple mumbling something between them. Suddenly, we heard a bang, like something hit the car behind. We all turned to see what had happened. The atmosphere was very tense, and I think my dad was becoming sober very quickly. He was now swearing. We did not see anything behind, but when I looked forward, the woman was not there anymore. But the scariest thing happened. She was now standing by my door, looking at me. I can't describe the utter fear which took hold of me then. I released a scream. My throat was sore several days after and pushed the gas pedal. I think everybody screamed then, but with panic, the car choked and the woman was still there looking at us. I remember not seeing her eyes or features because it was dark. I switched on the car again and drove off as fast as I could. The poor car got shaken on the dirt road. We reached the main road, relieved and shouting. What the hell had we seen and experienced? Fortunately, Rose Hill is not far from that area we were just at. But when we reached the town, the car broke down. The fan belt of the car had broken and the engine stopped from overheating. 
We were in the 70s, no cell, or anything like towing services available a Saturday evening. The couple and my mom walked home, which was not far. My dad and I stayed by the car. At home, mom phoned a friend of my dad, who was not staying far, to tow away our car. We finally reached home at around 11.30 p.m., completely exhausted. My dad's friend who had helped us was invited to have coffee, and we told him what had happened. He said that we were lucky because there had been accounts of people walking to the sea, like being in a trance and never coming back, getting drowned by possession, really scary and unbelievable. Some would be hurt by objects being thrown at them. A woman apparently lost her baby while being pregnant. She was a few weeks away from delivery, but after coming to that place and seeing the ghost, she had pain in her tummy and started to bleed a few hours later. She had to go through surgery where they noted that the baby had died. These events would not always happen, but would take place randomly. The South African couple stayed two more days at home and left. We never heard or saw from them afterwards. I later discovered that there was a cemetery on the other side of the road. Not too close to the road, though. I never knew who that woman, ghost, was. But it seemed that regularly she would come out of the ocean and walk to the cemetery. However, in the late 80s, there was no accounts of seeing her up to today. My brothers and I have been living in our townhouse for eight years now. Ever since I entered college and my brothers entered high school in an exclusive school in Quaison City, Philippines. Our townhouse is only a 10 minute walk away from the school, which is very convenient for us. However, because our family business is in the province, my parents have to live there while my brothers and I live in our townhouse alone. Several incidents happened in our house, which we chose to ignore. In one instance, when my dad paid us a visit, he and my brother were in the kitchen. My brother was washing dishes while my dad was chopping vegetables for lunch. They were both facing the wall. Their heads turned away from the door leading to the washroom at the end of the kitchen. From behind them, they heard my voice say, May I use the restroom? My brother answered back, What's wrong with you? Because he was surprised I was asking permission in our own house. They both turned around and saw no one. They checked the bathroom. It was empty. They went around the house. I wasn't there. I received a call in myself from my brother that day asking where I was. I was at work the entire time. But my brother and father were both certain it was my voice they heard. Now the second incident was more creepy because I myself experienced it. I was leaving for work. My youngest brother was already in school while my younger brother was in his room. I stepped out the door and stood by the front steps locking the door with my keys. Suddenly, I heard my voice in the living room calling my brother's name. Rap, come down here. I fumbled my keys and tried to open the door. Except this time, the locks won't open. I heard my brother running down the stairs, so I went to the window to see what will happen. The living room was empty. My brother opened the door for me and asked why I was calling him. I told him it wasn't me calling him and he couldn't believe it. After telling the story again, I left him to go to work. The third incident happened in my room. More than a year after the second incident. 
I woke up in the middle of the night, which always happens to me. The first thing I did is check my bedside clock, which I always check when I wake up in the middle of the night for comparison. It was two o'clock in the morning. At the corner of my bed is a full length mirror, which normally faces and reflects the image of my bedroom door. After checking my clock, I checked my mirror and saw myself standing and staring at myself in a dead pan away. At first I thought I was looking at my reflection and I even asked myself in my mind, why the hell am I sleeping standing up? But then I felt the bed and I knew I was lying down. After a few seconds of staring at my standing reflection, I turned to the other side of the bed and decided just to ignore it. The last incident did not happen to me, but to my youngest brother, who has always been in touch with the supernatural. It happened just last year, in 2007. According to him, he woke up at 5 a.m., and took a bath for school. While getting dressed, he noticed that his reflection in the mirror was grinning at him, though he wasn't smiling at all. He got terrified and decided to go to school though it was too early. When he was locking the door, he practically screamed when he saw his own head grinning at him from his right shoulder. He walked to school the whole time with the grinning face that looks like him on his shoulder, which he could see through his peripheral vision. On the way to school, he passed by some shops and saw his reflection still grinning at him. He noted that although his reflection looks like him exactly, the eyes were somewhat different. My brother chose to ignore the doppelganger, who stayed with him at school the whole day. A doppelganger of my classmate. It was Saturday morning. Some of our classmates, including me, were tasked to go to the school to finish our beautification project. We were done exactly at 11 a.m. All of our classmates, excluding Trisha, Karen, Ariana, and me, went home. Ariana told us to wait here at school while she will go and buy something to eat. She didn't eat any breakfast. So we agreed, and we waited for her. Since there is nothing much to do, we decided to go on ghost hunting. We went up to the second floor and began filming all around us with Trisha's phone while walking. As we passed by the library, we all felt a very cold wind around us. Trisha screamed, run. Then we ran outside the gate and we saw the guard. The guard is very angry with us and so he tells us to go home. We text Ariana to go to my place after she is done eating. At my place, we replayed the video. As the film passes by the library's glass window, we saw Karen's reflection wearing a blue t-shirt in front of Trisha. Trisha was so shocked and said, wait, you're at my back, right? And are you wearing a white t-shirt back there? Karen said, yes. Why will I be in front? Clearly, you're the one who is in front, right? And I'm still wearing the exact same white t-shirt. We tried to replay it again and again. And still the same. I really want to know what you think, because I'm still baffled by this whole situation. If anybody has any idea as to what this could be, 
please put it in the comments below. D is for doppelganger. As would be expected, a lot has happened since I was last on here. In due time, I'll explain my absence. But for now, I'll start with what is troubling me the most. I have been with my partner, hmm, we'll call Michael for privacy reasons, for nearly a year now. And this started happening in November of 2012. Now, before I delve into it, at all times when these sightings have occurred, he has not been on any medication, drugs, of any kind, nor had he been consuming alcohol. To better understand the story, I better give you a layout of the house. Walk through the front door, you are greeted by the dining room with an open plan kitchen at the end of it. Take four steps forward, and to your left you have the lounge which is connected to the dining room by two doors which are kept open at all times. Next to the lounge is a small extension of the house, which is Michael's little sister's playroom. The playroom is separated from the dining room by a glass wall and a glass door. Keep walking straight from the front door and to your right is a door leading to the garage and laundry room. Next to the laundry door is the hallway. The hallway is L-shaped, and the first room to your right is his mother's and sister's room. Go to the corner of the L, and you'll find the main bedroom, which his grandmother resides in. At the corner of the L, and slightly off to the right, is Michael's room, and at the very end of the L, is the bathroom. Michael has been seeing my doppelganger. The appearances have been happening generally once or twice a month and it was usually just out of the corner of his eye. My doppelganger has usually been seen in and around his room and up and down the hallway. After grilling him for details, I found out that before these sightings he would always get a whiff of my perfume that I tend to always wear. Now, the sightings have only ever been at his house, and no one in his family has my perfume, and none of my clothing is actually at his house. Doppelganger seems to have my sense of style down to a fine art, as it has always been seen wearing my usual attire. Michael has always picked up a feeling of sadness every time he's seen my doppelganger. Now, here's where it picks up a notch. A few months back in June, I was on the phone with Michael when he suddenly stopped mid-sentence and everything went dead, quiet. Thinking something happened, I immediately got worried and asked what was wrong. All I got in reply was very frightened whispers. Getting slightly frustrated, I asked, yet again, what was wrong? Michael finally told me he was seeing my doppelganger. I then got very worried as he was very frightened. I asked Michael what happened and he said he had been walking around the dining room table talking to me when out of the corner of his eyes, he saw someone sitting on the couch in the lounge. All his family had retired to bed for the day, so he was very surprised. As he turned to face it, he saw that it was my doppelganger, clear as day, casually sitting on the couch. Scaring the bejesus out of him, he ran into the playroom. My doppelganger then proceeded to get up from the couch, walk towards the kitchen, and, from what Michael heard, as he couldn't see at this point, get a glass of water. No glass was ever found as proof of this, by the way. As I calmed him down over the phone, I asked him if he got any vibe from the doppelganger. He said he picked up an obvious negative vibe, not in a menacing way, just down and unhappy. He also said it looked like my doppelganger was in pain. Can doppelgangers even feel pain? Now, I definitely know Michael wasn't bluffing to me, as this happened over the phone 
and no one can fake the kind of fear that was in his voice. Another thing to note is the doppelganger had brown hair, whereas I have dyed my naturally brown hair blonde. That seems to be the last sighting of it he's had for a while. What happened? Help would be greatly appreciated here, as I am going out of my mind with questions. What is this thing? What does it want? Why imitate me? No one else in his family has seen it other than Michael. Thank you for reading. Doppelgangers, oh my. I can't say I've ever seen a doppelganger. However, some of my family members have. 2010. At this time, the family members residing in our home were our oldest daughter and her husband, our youngest son, and our youngest daughter. My husband saw the first one sometime in 2010. He came home from work at midnight. I was asleep on the couch in the living room. He was on his way through our room to the bathroom to take a shower when he saw our youngest daughter sitting at my computer. He called out to her. She didn't answer or even move. He assumed she had earphones in and didn't hear him. He realized he had forgotten to grab a towel from the laundry room, so he turned around and headed that way. Our bedroom is on one end of the house. The laundry is on the opposite end. He walked down the hall, though the dining room and the kitchen were in between. Just as he was about to open the laundry room door, M, our youngest daughter, stepped out. My husband asked if she had just been on my computer. She said no. She had been in the laundry room this entire time. We all picked at him about getting old and seeing things. That's before I did some research on doppelgangers. Shortly after my husband saw our youngest daughter's doppelganger, our youngest son saw mine. This happened about 6 o'clock on a Saturday evening. I had just finished cooking dinner and was waiting for my family to come home. Except our youngest son, Z, who had gone into work about an hour before. I decided to do some laundry while I waited. I always had to keep myself busy when I was home alone. I still had the notion that if I was doing something there, was less of a chance for me to encounter anything ghostly. Plus, staying busy made the time go by faster. I was in the laundry room when the door shut, when I felt or maybe heard someone come into the house. And as a side note, there is absolutely no way anyone could ever come into my house without me knowing it, whether I'm awake or asleep. When our kids were younger, they used to try to fool me. Never happened. I can feel the least change in air pressure. Drove them crazy. I asked, who is here? Z answered me and said his new manager sent him home to shave because he had a five o'clock shadow. He was fussing about as he went down the hall into the bathroom. I stayed in the laundry room folding clothes. We have never kept our clothes in our bedrooms. I have a huge laundry room, so everything clothing-wise is kept there. Oddly enough, I was folding Z's clothes when I heard, Mom, why are you putting those in my room? I opened the laundry room door, walked out into the kitchen just as Z walked into the dining room from the hall. The look on his face frightened me. It looked as if he had just seen a ghost. I watched as all color drained from his face. I asked him if he was okay. He just stared at me. After about a minute, he snapped out of his trance. The following is what he told me. He was standing in front of the bathroom mirror shaving when he heard a shuffle. He looked up and out the door. 
He saw me dressed in a red robe, walking really fast, holding a stack of clothes. I entered his bedroom. So he stepped out of the bathroom to ask me what I was doing. I didn't come from the direction of the laundry room. I came from the opposite end of the house, from the other bedrooms. His is the first bedroom in the hall before you get to the bathroom. I did own a red robe at that time. However, I was fully dressed in jeans and a t-shirt. Nothing red. Before that day, Z was a non-believer of the paranormal. For years, he swore he still was. He refused to talk about that day. About a year ago, he and his wife bought a house built in 1940. He's now coming around to the fact that there are some things that have no other explanation. Last week, April 22nd, 2016, my oldest daughter was visiting. She and I were laying on my bed talking. I fell asleep. She got up to get a drink from the kitchen. As she was leaving my room, she saw Ems, the youngest daughter, boyfriend coming from her bedroom, which is directly across from mine. She said he had a faraway look in his eyes. He was laughing as if something he and M had shared moments before was extremely funny. He walked down the hall into the bathroom and shut the door. S continued on to the kitchen. She got her drink and started back down the hall. As she was right outside of the closed bathroom door, she noticed Jay was stepping out of M's bedroom. He looked as if he was half asleep. He asked her if someone was in the bathroom, to which she replied, You. She reached over and opened the bathroom door. It was empty. It was the vacation of a lifetime. Just my best friend Nicole and I going away to Ireland. I was very excited as we were going to stay in a famous castle, which of course had some history of its own. I believe it was Capra Castle, of something to that effect. I recalled as it was yesterday. We were in rooms number 71. We left our room to go through the courtyard to the main castle for dinner. We then proceeded to go look for this haunted bridge or something. We made a few jokes about how we were going to hang each other from the bridge. We had a bit of fun with that, hit the bar, and then went back towards our room. After returning, our luggage was messed up on the floor. We thought nothing of it. Could it have been the maid for all we know? I'm not sure. But we noticed that the dog that went around the hotel courtyard was outside of our room. Was an Irish wolfhound. So we got to bed about an hour or so after we had got back. And we locked the door and the dog got up and went away. So it was now about 1 a.m. I was sleeping through the night, and around 3 a.m., I had a rude awakening. I started freaking out because I felt like someone was on top of me and that I was being scratched at. I was freaking out, and I started screaming and moving around, and I was hitting Nicole, trying to wake her up. I felt that my face was bleeding and could taste the blood. I was in a state of panic. I managed to get Nicole up, and she was trying to calm me down. I was telling her I was bleeding and to get help right away. As she felt my face, she felt the blood. She was in shock. So she said she would turn on the light and call the desk for help. She reached for the phone and light, which were right by one another, and she got, as she described, brutally pushed aside, brutally pushed aside, hitting her head on the floor. She reached for her pocket keychain light to search for the light. She crawled over to the light switch and came running back to the bed, where I was still feeling as if I was pinned down. She got on the bed to check on me, and I felt as if I could freely move up. So I sit up. I was feeling pinned down this whole time, hence my freaking out. She checked me for blood, and there was no sign of blood. We went to open the door, 
and checked to see if there was any sign of forced entry into our hotel room in case it was something else. There we saw the dog walk back to the front of our door, and he laid down there. We couldn't get back to sleep after all of that. The whole thing freaked me out, and I'm not sure why exactly that did happen. Why was the dog back after the attack? Why could I taste blood and then be fine? I couldn't move, and I did not shove Nicole off the bed. It was one of the most freaky experiences ever. Did I anger a spirit, and they were being spiteful? This isn't my first encounter of strange beings, just the more physical. Woodsford Castle I've had a few weird experiences, but this is by far the scariest. Me, my sister, my parents, and my grandparents all went and stayed in a natural trust place called Woodsford Castle. It was really old-fashioned with the decapitated stacks and stuff mounted on the wall along with chandeliers. In the visitor's book, there was loads of questions about whether the castle was haunted or not. The room me and my sister stayed in was the oldest room in the castle. It was always quite dark and cold in the room, even if we had the lights on, and you always got a chilled prickly feeling when you were in there alone. Whenever I went into the room, I felt a huge urge to leave and felt like someone was trying to make me get out. One night, I went to the toilet, and as I was coming back up the stairs, I heard footsteps clicking up the steps, which sounded like high-heeled boots. This confused me a bit, but I passed it off as my imagination and walked back to the room me and my sister were staying in. When I opened the door, I saw someone standing over my sister. It wasn't any of my family because they all denied being awake at that time. I couldn't see what she looked like because she was mainly a shadow, but all I could really see was what looked like a long dress suggesting she was a woman. As I walked into the room, there was a sudden chill, and the woman vanished. I told my mom, who was a real believer of spirits, and she said that the woman may have wanted me out of the room so she could be with my sister alone. But we don't know why she wanted my sister. We were all really scared and left a day early because we didn't feel safe. If anyone has any idea why this woman wanted my sister alone, it would be really helpful to know. Castle Leslie Haunting So I just got home from a two-night stay at Castle Leslie in Co. Monaghan. I was aware that there was reported hauntings prior to going out, but did not want to read any stories before I went, and my wife was totally unaware of any stories relating to the castle. We stayed in Norman's room, and a series of events happened between 1 a.m. and first light, which would have been around 5 or 6 a.m.-ish. The night is in question was Monday night, Tuesday morning, the 4th and 5th of April, 2016. Firstly, we returned to the room around 12 a.m., and we both were very tired after the drive up from Co. Wexford. I was awoken, and I could feel a presence in the room and I could make out the figure of a man sitting in the chair next to the bed. The hair was standing on the back of my neck, and I couldn't move. I then saw what I can only describe as a mist cloud over the right-hand side of the bed. I had a restless night of dreams. One of those was a dream of being in the bed, and others which I can't recall. It was very warm in the room, and I was too scared to move or even hang my leg outside the covers. In the morning, my wife confirmed she too had a night of vivid dreams and awoke to see a cloud of mist at the foot of my bed. No windows in the room were open. I was glad to see the morning and went to the bathroom. Our room overlooked the vast gardens and lake, and whilst looking out over the lake, it looked like a wave or wall of water around 10 feet was moving across very slowly. My wife confirmed the same, but by the time I got my camera to take the picture, it had disappeared. 
The following night, we told the night porter our experience and he mentioned that there were reports of the bed being haunted and offered to move us into another room. Nothing like this has happened before and I would say I was open-minded yet very skeptical. We had a sound sleep on Tuesday night with the help of a different set of spirits. I can't explain what we saw, and we will return there one day, but won't be staying in Norman's room. An audible manifestation. My only ghostly experience came in the fall of 1986. I had lost most of my vision from diabetes and had entered a residential rehabilitation facility in the capital city of a southern state. Rumors had been shared among clients about odd things that occurred on the campus that encompassed an entire city block. Because many clients came to the rehabilitation facility with secondary medical complications, there had been cases of clients passing on in their dormitory rooms. Odd things have been reported, such as the elevator engaging and moving from one floor to the other, when only one person, the business officer manager, sat in his office in the administration building. More than once, he had charged out of his office into the elevator doors to see who was coming from the second floor, but the elevator was always empty when the doors slid open. That to me could be easily explained as an electrical glitch versus something paranormal. But that same office manager was in the small first floor reception area of the training hall with two men who were hired as security guards during the week-long Christmas closure. One of the guards was a regular member of maintenance and the other a part-time staff member and both fully knowledgeable about the entire campus. The clients and all staff had departed except for these three men. They stood quietly chatting when they all heard a sound. It sounded like someone had dragged a heavy pile of furniture across the floor, directly over their heads. They rushed to the second floor, but nothing was moved or out of place. This they could not explain. My experience took place in the hall, where my room, along with three other rooms, were located. There was a fire stairway at one end of the short hall that led either upstairs to the woman's second floor dorm rooms or outdoors and into the courtyard. Double swinging doors on the other end of that hall opened into the first floor women's lounge and then either led out the courtyard or through a second set of swinging doors that led to the counseling hall. It was a Friday night and I had just finished supper. Using my white crane, I made my way out of the cafeteria, into the training hall's reception area, and down through the hall, up the short set of stairs, and through the counseling hall. I passed through the first set of swinging doors and walked across the first floor of women's lounge and through the second set of doors and into my hall. My room was the first door on the left. The hall was very short and you needed to take only one step to cross the hall to the door directly across from mine. I removed my door key and using my left hand located the keyhole and just begun to insert the key with my right hand when I heard five taps on the door across the hall from my own. It sounded like someone tapped with just one finger. I straightened my position and spun on my heels feeling somewhat foolish for not having realized that there was someone in the hall with me. I said a pleasant hello but received no answer. I could only imagine the look on my face when no response came. Finally, in shrugging my shoulders, I turned my back to my own door. As I was again about to insert my key into the slot, a thought struck me. Knowing that it was a habit for all diabetics to be housed on the first floor in the event of needing assistance quickly for a low blood sugar, I again turned to the door across from mine. My thought was that perhaps one of the two ladies sharing the room had knocked from the inside and was in need of help. I took the one step necessary to reach their door. In a loose fist, I raised my hand to knock on their door, but before I could, I again heard the five taps on the door, but this time there was no question that those taps came from my side of their door and that I was the only person standing in the hall. Then I heard one of the ladies in that room say, 
Yes, someone is at the door. See who it is. Well, when they opened the door, there I was standing transfixed with my right hand still in the air as if to knock. When they asked what I might need, it took me a moment until I found my voice. I knew what just had happened and was trying to process what I knew had just happened, but was finding it difficult to admit that I knew in my heart what I knew, that someone or something had tapped on the door right beside me. I finally was able to explain what I had heard from inside the hall, the two sets of five taps on the door. They both said they heard the taps too. We stood there puzzled when I burst out laughing. I was still not ready to face the reality of what I had known I had heard. I said, oh, I know. Your guard dog was leaning against the door and scratch which caused the tapping sounds. But, one lady said, neither of us have a guide dog. She replicated the tapping sound exactly as we all heard it. I know those tappings came from the hall side of their door. The sound was not a foot to my right and at eye level as I stood there. Had it been a real person, we would have been all but touching shoulders. Together, we three ladies attempted to replicate the sound by going through the swinging doors, opening and closing the stairwell door, and even the doors leading out into the courtyard from the women's lounge. We could not replicate those tappings, no matter what we tried, and despite not having vision, I slept that night with all my room's lights on. The following Monday, as I walked to the administration building, I caught up with the director of vocational training. I asked her if, to her knowledge, anyone had ever passed on that floor. She said that yes, years before, an older woman who once occupied one of the rooms on the far right side of the woman's lounge had gone to lay down after a double period of orientation and mobility, instruction for using a white cane, and had expired in her sleep. When I explained what we three ladies had experienced that Friday night, she made me vow that I would never share the story with other clients so as not to frighten them. I know what I heard. I know what we three ladies heard. I have no rational explanation except to speculate that the former, and now departed, client was visiting one of her fellow dormies in my hall. I'm 33 years old, and I live in the Ocean Parkway section of Brooklyn in New York City. When I was 15 years old, I was living in a house not far away from where I live now. My friend Rob asked me to come visit him after school one day. It had been raining the whole day, so he decided to wait until the rain stopped before he went to his house. The rain stopped around 5 p.m., and I thought it was kind of late, so I called him and told him I decided not to go. For some reason, he was insistent, because he bought some $1,000 bike and wanted me to see it. I got there around 8.30 p.m., because I had to eat dinner and do my homework. As I was walking towards a stoop, I stopped hearing the cars passing by in all the city confusion. Everything was quiet, very unusual for Brooklyn, a place where two million people live, but I figured that was nothing. As I got closer to the house, there was an odd wind that flew by me, but I didn't hear its wake. I just felt a cold, chilling sensation. Then suddenly, I saw a man who looked gray and gloomy, smoking a guinea stinker, Brooklyn word for an old Italian man's cigar, without any smoke. I thought maybe it was one of Rob's father's friends, but I knew that was wrong when I was about to get on the stoop. The old man got up, opened the front door with the stinker still in his mouth, and he just disappeared. Even though the door was open, he still kind of passed through it. I went into the house and asked Rob who the man was, but Rob looked at me as if I was a moron and told me to stop messing around. But his mother, who was always on edge about something, had a smile on her face. She pulled me aside when Rob went to the bathroom and said that the figure was evil and his vision had been tormenting her since she bought the house 17 years before. Maybe he had lived in the house previously and died there. I don't know. I never saw the man again and Rob moved to Queens because his dad opened a bakery in the Bronx and wanted a closer commute. 
Since then, I never went to that house, and I have no reason to. From the first moment we moved into our new duplex in Carroll Gardens, Brooklyn, we all had an eerie feeling that something was weird about the place. It was a dark, damp, and dingy place with an incredibly cold feeling about it. No matter how hard we tried to make the place warmer, it never seemed inviting or comfortable at all. We were never able to get a phone connected, so to add to the sense of foreboding, we were also isolated from the outside of the world. Within two weeks of living there, I was raped in my own bedroom. Our next door neighbor, a 60-something year old woman who had lived next door, informed us that our house had never been occupied for more than a year. Every tenant prior to us also had incredible tragedies occur within the first few weeks of moving in, and they soon left. My brother and I both heard children playing one night, and when we went to open our bedroom door, it would not open for nearly an hour. Thumpings on the wall, strange cold spots, and peculiar noises were all commonplace. No one in my family felt comfortable being there alone, nor did any guests who stayed over. It felt as if you were being watched by someone who hated you every moment. My mother, not to mention everyone else, especially hated the basement. There were weird marks and handprints on the walls. One day, she was going downstairs and came screaming back up them, saying that some cold, clammy hand had grabbed her upon reaching the washing machine. Lights went on and off, and the odd occurrences became so serious that we left for fear we would all die in that hellhole. The ceiling toppled in above my brother's bed. An unexplained fire, whose cause was never determined, almost killed me. My mom developed cancer, and we all were going crazy from all of these things occurring within a year. Upon moving out, we found out that two people had been whacked by the mob during the 60s, a young boy had died in a fire in the 40s, and they had uncovered the bodies of two young children buried in the basement walls sometime during the 80s. No one has stayed in that apartment since, and with good reason. Everyone who has lived there befell huge tragedies that followed them until they moved out. In 1970, my boyfriend Ray and I were living in Brooklyn, New York in an Italian neighborhood near Park Slope. We rented a small apartment above a grocery store on Fifth Avenue. There were two apartments on the second floor, and we moved into the one facing the street. Just after moving in, I was talking to a shopkeeper who had lived in the neighborhood a long time. She told me that the building we lived in had been owned for many years by a family who ran a printing business. The business was located on the first floor, and the family lived upstairs. When their son grew up and married, they had the upstairs split into two small apartments. The son and his wife lived in the front apartment, where we now lived, and the older couple lived in a back apartment. Just a few months before, the older man had died. After his death, the family had sold the business and moved away. To Queens, I think. The neighbor I was talking to said, Don't worry, he died in the hospital. When I looked puzzled, she explained that I probably didn't have to worry about ghosts. The thought had never crossed my mind before, but it returned quite soon. After getting settled, we went grocery shopping and explored the neighborhood a little. About a week or so after moving in, Ray and I were gone for most of a Saturday. When we returned, some things in the apartment seemed quite strange. There were dark footprints on the living room carpet, where we knew none had been when we left. We had brought dinner home, and Ray wanted to use hot sauce on his, but he couldn't find it. I couldn't find it either, which was puzzling since I remembered putting a new bottle of Red Devil hot sauce in the upper kitchen cabinet when I put the groceries away. Later, we noticed that all the clocks were set at exactly the same time, which was not the correct time. When we left the apartment, they had all been set at approximately the correct time, but each had been a couple of minutes different from the others. The stove was the kind where you could store pots and pans in one side. The next day, I went to get a pan out, 
and found a strange little bottle right in front of the upper shelf. I knew it hadn't been there before because I would have seen it or knocked it down when I cleaned the shelf and put pots and pans on it. When I examined it, I found it was a little plastic container, like the kind you would get prescription pills in. It was very dusty. When I opened it, I found it was full of those red-hot candies we used to get when we were kids. Heart-shaped, I think. Ray and I were both a little freaked out by that. After that, there were a couple of instances in which Ray came out of the bedroom at night and found the phone off the hook, instead of sitting on the cradle as it should. It had been set directly across the cradle. Finally, I made a little speech to the ghost. I explained to him that we wished him well, but that his family had moved to Queens. There were no further odd occurrences after that. A year or so later, I was watching a show about ghosts. The host said that the ghosts sometimes take things and leave similar things in their place. I immediately thought of the red-hot sauce that had disappeared and the red-hot candies that had been left in their place. I hope the elderly gentleman found his family or achieved some peace. A whole bunch of weird events have been happening around my school lately. I attend the learning clinic, a co-ed boarding school for kids with learning, behavior, or social disorders. The only weird thing I have experienced happened yesterday. I was walking from Brooklyn Building to Overlook Building when I saw a thing, perhaps a squirrel or a bird, go darting across the road, Route 169. It moved towards me very quickly on the stone path and I thought that I might be able to catch it as it ran by. On impulse, I stuck my foot out into its way. Upon impact with my foot, the thing, what appeared to be some kind of small animal, went shooting up my leg, made three circles around my chest, then zoomed up my neck and jumped, or maybe flew, off the top of my head. The overlooked driveway is a ten-foot wide barren rock path, and I searched around for the creature, or whatever it was, but couldn't find it. It then struck me how much the sensation of the thing climbing me had reminded me of receiving an electrical shock, and I was very shaken due to many recent reports of varying credulity of ghostly encounters from my fellow students. I do not believe in ghosts, and thus am hesitant to even classify my encounter with Mystery Mammal as a paranormal experience. However, some things need to be looked at for what they are, and I can honestly say what happened was certainly not an occurrence with the normal ways of things as I know it. A couple of minutes passed, and then I observed a second creature running across the street. This one I let pass, though I still couldn't get a good look at it. It looked grayish, probably a quadruped, but I couldn't discern much more than that. It ran down the length of the overlooked driveway and disappeared into Breeze Field, a field behind a residential house. I sat down and waited longer, being in no hurry, and observed two more of the things pass. Then, realizing I was late to civics, I hurried into the building, shaken but not really upset. Throughout my life, I've experienced plenty of ghost phenomena, and I've had direct contact with plenty of demonic spirits. I was once a preacher and wasn't afraid of demons or ghosts. I've been involved in exorcisms, whereby some of the demons, upon being expelled, made the hideous sounds upon leaving. I've never heard any animal that sounds like those demons leaving a person's soul. I've seen shadows on the wall made by demons. I myself was once possessed by a demon before I started my ministry. My wife and I have heard loud footsteps from a deceased friend from our neighborhood just dropping in to say hello. I've heard banging noises from angry spirits that vibrated my whole house. I've encountered so many hauntings, seen plenty of ghosts, and personally dealt with plenty of ghosts and demons. Each story is so haunting that I feel I could write a book about it. but. I will tell you a story of my first haunting, because my first haunting is the one that scared me the most. Usually, when I verbally tell people of my first haunting, they don't believe me. In fact, it's hard to believe. But it did happen, just as I write it, 
I have no explanation as to how this happened. But first, please read my haunting story. My first haunting started when I was about six years old. I was raised at Park Place, Brooklyn, New York. I played with a particular clown doll that was most unusual in its appearance. Its face was fully painted like a clown, and its hat was long and pointed with a small ball on top, and it stood straight up. That doll was quite haunting just looking at it, especially his smile, but for some reason, that was my favorite doll. For some reason, I loved to play with that doll and nothing else. I didn't want to play with the neighborhood kids. I was a lonely child, and most of my day was spent rocking in my little red rocking chair. Usually, all day, and I would daydream, but I always had my favorite clown doll with me. My mother recently told me that she gave me the clown doll and my little red rocking chair, which would explain my fascination for the doll and my little red rocking chair because I longed to be with my mother, but I was raised by my aunt and uncle. My aunt and uncle raised me because my father was killed in a car accident when I was just one years old. My mother couldn't afford raising two children alone, so she sent my brother to North Carolina to live with her sister and brother-in-law. However, I stayed in New York with my father's sister and her husband. My aunt thought that I was missing out on my childhood by rocking in that chair and playing with the clown doll all day, but I had my reasons. I kept rocking and playing with my doll. One evening, my uncle was out all night playing cards with his friends. Usually, when my uncle was out for the night, my aunt would ask me to sleep with her, and on this particular evening, she woke me from my sleep and asked me to sleep with her. Of course, I obliged. I now believe that my aunt had seen ghosts in her bedroom and was afraid to sleep alone. My little red rocking chair was in her bedroom near the window, and there was a flower in a flower pot on the windowsill. My clown doll was sitting in the little red rocking chair, facing the window and the flowers. I was very sleepy when my aunt woke me up to sleep with her, and it took no time for me to fall back to sleep in her bed. For some reason, I was awoken around 3 o'clock that morning and heard my chair rocking by itself. My clown doll was in that chair, and as I turned my head in the direction of the rocking chair, I witnessed the most profound thing that has haunted me from that evening. My clown doll was rocking in the chair and playing with flowers on the windowsill. The moon reflection gave the most frightening silhouette image. The shadow of my doll rocking in my rocking chair and moving around like a person playing with the flowers terrified me. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was not dreaming. This was real life, and I was really scared like never before. But my fears would heighten when the doll stopped rocking and turned its head in my direction. My heart stopped. My doll was looking in my direction and proceeded to get out of the rocking chair and walk in my direction. Immediately, I pulled the covers over my head and held close to my aunt with fear that I never thought possible. That night was the longest night of my life. The fear of my clown doll pulling the covers from me froze me with sweat dripping madly from my body. Thank God that my clown doll never touched the covers. What seemed like hours later, I finally fell back to sleep, of course, hugging very close to my aunt. When I woke up in the morning, I found my doll still sitting in my little red rocking chair with the most hideous smile on its face. I screamed like a baby and asked my aunt to remove the clown doll from my little red rocking chair and to please throw the doll away. I never told my aunt this story, and I never saw that doll again until about 40 years later, when a co-worker bought the clown doll from a website that was selling old dolls from the 50s over the internet, and a co-worker bought the same doll. The doll was delivered wrapped, and he unwrapped the doll in his office. It had the same hideous smile on its face. As soon as I saw that doll, I asked my co-worker to please put it away immediately and explain my childhood fears surrounding that clown doll. This is a true story. Now here's my explanation. Through my ministry years, I've been involved with many demons and angels. I've seen things move around my apartment as though someone was there moving the objects themselves. In fact, poltergeist activities have been known to throw or move items around. Therefore, 
Mischievous spirits can make things like dolls move at their will. I have two incidents to tell you about. I was nine months pregnant with my first daughter, and on the day of her birth, I experienced something that was strange. It was about 3.30 in the morning on March 22nd, 1993. I suddenly awoke with a weird feeling. I sat up from the bed and sat there a little dazed. I looked towards my closet, which did not have a door. As I looked towards the closet, I saw a black shadow, a big black mass hovering in the closet. It appeared to have wings. I stared at the closet for a while without moving. I must have dozed off, but was awoken again by some kind of feeling I had. I started having sharp pains, so I was rushed to the hospital and my daughter was born. There was a nurse there and I tried to tell her what had happened to me and she said something odd. She told me, I know dear, you must protect yourself. I asked to see that nurse to talk to her, but it seemed no nurse of that description worked on the maternity floor. I was staying at my mother's house with my daughter and that night everyone went to bed about 11 p.m. So after I went to sleep also, about 2.45 a.m., I woke up, but I couldn't get up. I was paralyzed. The only thing I could move was my eyes. Then the fear started to set in as I started to see dark figures, dark shadows flying over my daughter's bassinet, but I couldn't get up. It was like pressure on my chest. I couldn't scream. Only in my head I could hear myself yell, get away from her, get away, but nothing came out. I stared praying. They just keep flying all around the room. Then all of a sudden, they were gone and the pressure I felt was lifted. I sprinted up so fast I tripped over myself. I grabbed my baby, turned on the lights, and stood up for the rest of the night. Since then, I've experienced little things through the course of my life. Thanks for reading. I have posted here before a few years back. Since then, paranormal episodes in my life have not completely stopped, but I have not kept a journal or written about it. Today, I want to talk about what has been happening for the last four years, but first, a brief story of my neighborhood. I now live in Woodland Heights, the Bronx Woodland, a population of about 7,000. It's an Irish middle-class neighborhood at the very north end of the borough of the Bronx in New York City. The place is very old, interesting, and rich in history. There are some old beautiful places here, parks, churches, and the Woodland Cemetery, which just turned 150 years old this past weekend. On August 1778, this land witnessed the massacre of the Mohican warriors, who are fighting on the side of patriots against the British. They died courageously at the hands of Colonial James Grave and his Queen Rangers. To keep this story short, the neighborhood where I have resided for the last four years was built directly on top of Indian battlefield and burial grounds. I first moved here a few months before my first daughter was born. Ever since things have happened at home that defy what most believe to be logical, my place is less than half a block away from the cemetery. Ever since my family and I moved here, we always felt a presence, never threatening, but a presence. My wife feels less comfortable with it than I do. It feels like a male presence, but I'm not sure if he has acknowledged us. It feels as if he is just doing his own thing most of the time. The first time my wife and I sensed it, or him, was in the bathroom. One of us would be in there alone, and we would surely think that the other one was on the other side of the shower curtain. Then, when the curtain was pulled, there was nobody there, and she would have asked me if I was in the bathroom when she was there. Surely, I was not. The next episode consisted of the toys that my child were turning on at nighttime by themselves and appearing in different places that I had placed them before. I know the toys were off before it went to bed. Other episodes involved my wife and I were sitting in the living room, watching TV, and we could feel sudden movement behind us. Yesterday, something dropped on the kitchen that was well-placed and could not have just dropped. Sometimes I can feel him or see some blurry shadow from my peripheral view, and I let him know that I've just acknowledged him. When my wife does feel him, she asks me, Did you just feel that or see that? My child has felt him too. 
I remember a specific episode where she walked from the living room to her room by herself, said something to someone, and then came out of there running and scared. Yesterday, she and I were playing in the living room when all of a sudden she looks towards the room and stares. I did not say anything and just looked at her. Then she looked at me and asked, who is that in the room? I told my wife this and she told me that this happened to her in the past too when the two of them were at home. In addition, the other night, I woke up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom when I saw a figure in the doorway. I stopped on my tracks. I noticed he was not looking straight at me, but when he did, he disappeared. That is all I got for today, even though those are not the only occurrences and I'm sure my wife does not tell me everything. I will try to keep a journal and give some more updates. Thank you. Any comments are welcome, and if you ever are in the New York City area, come by my neighborhood and explore its city. I wrote about this briefly in a prior article in 2001. To recap, we moved into 455A Sackett Street when I was 14 years old on April 1st, 1998. From the moment we moved in, something was so not right. It was an incredibly dark apartment, though we would have been thrilled because it was the first apartment we'd ever had with more than one floor. There were three floors, including the basement, and it was nice if you could ignore the feeling of someone standing just behind you or staring at you wherever you went. Within two weeks of moving in, I was raped in my own bedroom by a man from the neighborhood. An elderly woman who'd lived right next door for most of our life informed us that no one had occupied our apartment for more than a year at a time, since as long as she could remember. She also related that terrible tragedies befell of all said people, with only a few weeks of moving in, continuing through the day they moved out. Though we all had eerie feelings in the apartment, we had not noticed anything too weird. The apartment was very uninviting, cold, and damp. We tried to decorate it, warm it up a little, but nothing helped. Another thing was that no matter what we did, we could never get a phone installed. We had the phone company over about four times to fix the wires, but no matter what they did, we would absolutely get nothing, not even static. So we were pretty isolated. The entire time we were there, the weird happenings continued. The ceiling above my brother's bed collapsed. The only reason he wasn't hurt is because he got to use the bathroom. A fire started in my room. The fire department never determined why. If my friend hadn't stopped by and rang my bell, I would have continued sleeping. Within five minutes of answering the bell, my neighbor came out screaming that my room was on fire. I ran up and the entire back wall was in flames. I tried to put it out with a blanket, and unbeknownst to me, the door had closed behind me. It went from daylight to dark in two minutes, and I started to pass out. Thankfully, my friend ran up and opened the door, carrying me down the stairs, or I would have been literal toast. After that, my neighbor confided in us that strange things have always gone on in my building. In the 30s or 40s, a fire had killed a little boy within a month of the family moving in. And in the 60s, a couple were whacked by the mob because of some insidious affair. There were no records because the children's records had been burned in a fire, so we couldn't get any information more than what the people said. There were other things that happened. A friend of mine coming into my apartment and seeing a little boy in burnt racks staring at her in my bathroom mirror. She ran out crying and refused to set foot in my door again. Another friend who slept over, note, both friends were not told of our experiences, and awoke in the middle of the night swearing that she saw a woman walk into my room through the door. My brother and I heard children crying and laughing one day downstairs, and when we tried to leave my mother's room, we were locked in, even though there was no lock, for an hour before it finally opened. My mother was downstairs doing the laundry when the lights turned off in the basement and she felt a cold, scaly hand grab her shoulder. Needless to say, my dad did the laundry after that. Weird smells, sounds, and the feeling that something or someone did not want you there. That something bad was going to happen to you and that you were not welcome at all. 
We moved out a year later to the day later, as soon as we could find a new apartment. We found out some more after that. The people that moved in after us tried to renovate the basement and found the body of a little boy in the wall. They left suddenly one night not too long after and never returned. Another couple moved in and left as inexplicably as the last, and so on and so forth to this day. Since then, we met a woman whom had gone to my mother's office. She's a nurse that works in a doctor's office because of a nervous condition. My mother noticed the address on her insurance card didn't match the one listed, and the woman explained she only lived at 55 A. Sackett Street for a few months and had to leave because her mother had died along with various other tragedies from the first week of moving in. My mother asked if the woman ever noticed anything weird. Well, the woman explained exactly what we had gone through. Perhaps the cause of her condition? We're all fine now, happy to be out of there, and we've moved on. We still see our old neighbor once in a while, and she always says the best thing we ever did was move out of that godforsaken house. Needless to say, we agree. We've not been haunted since, and life is good. If there's one thing we learned, I'd say it was to trust our instincts. Being fortunate enough to stay in New York over the winter, I've been visiting some of our ordinary New York tourist destinations, and some not so ordinary. A few weeks ago, after learning there was a free ferry between Lower Manhattan and Staten Island, I decided to hitch a ride. Not only would it offer me the chance to get that money shot of the Statue of Liberty, but it would also enable me to check out Staten Island and say that I've been there. Unsure of what to do when arriving at Staten Island, I pulled out my phone while waiting at the ferry terminal and started researching potential attractions. One which was easily accessible on foot was the Staten Island Museum. As I happened to discover though, there are actually two buildings called the Staten Island Museum, each run by the same organization. One is only a couple of blocks from the St. George Ferry Terminal, and the other is at the Snug Harbor Cultural Center and Botanical Gardens, around a 20-minute walk along the terrace. Unaware of this fact at the time, I was being directed by the map on my phone to the latter of those two. It didn't bother me, though. Upon arriving at Snug Harbor, I found that there was far more to see and do than I would have had the chance to experience staying within a small radius of the ferry terminal. Inside the museum, I was alone within the exhibit rooms for the most part. The only exceptions to this were in the first two rooms, where there were some professional photographers taking shots of the items on display. As I made my way around the exhibits, I consistently experienced the eerie feeling that I was being watched. I tried to chalk this down to paranoia and softly hum some hymns to myself to calm my nerves. At one point, I was freaked out by the sound of footsteps behind me, but was relieved to learn that they were just coming from a security guard patrolling the hall between exhibits. Throughout my wanderings around the rest of Snug Harbor's grounds and gardens, the same eerie feeling continued to plague me. Despite this, I still had a fantastic time. As I walked the grounds, I ran into a museum staff member who I had met earlier, and we had a brief discussion. She was returning to the museum after going out to buy herself a cup of tea. Beautiful, yet haunting, was how I described the center's grounds to her. I couldn't have known at the time how appropriate my description would be. A few days later, I was transferring all of my photos from my stay in New York up until that point onto my computer. Friends back home had encouraged me to take lots of pictures and upload them to Facebook so that I could share my adventures with them. While sifting through the photos to decide which ones to upload, one particular shot caught my eye. It was a photo in which I had taken at the entrance to the Snug Harbor Cultural Center upon first arriving at the site. What it must have initially brushed off as lens flare or mist began to strike me as having much more of a defined shape, that of a hooded robe or cloak, to be more precise. I messaged my best friend, who is in New York with me, and staying in the same apartment building. I think I've caught an apparition on camera, I told him. My friend and I took a closer look at the photo in his room, and soon we began to also spot a face in the midst of the apparition. 
I've uploaded the original photo taken with an iPhone camera. The face is positioned from the first pillar on the left of the building to the second pillar. It may be difficult to spot at first. I've some friends who have seen it who have spotted the figure and face instantly. Some who have had to take a look at the photo for a while before seeing it. And some who cannot see it at all and conclude it to be paranoia. Further research on the Snug Harbor site since spotting the figure in my photo has revealed to me that the location is famously haunted by a number of spirits, which was a nice find for me, as it backed up what I had experienced there. I had a dream the night before about driving around Vermont, a small town a few miles from where I live. I was in a car with my sister and suddenly got an agonizing pain in my head that was clouding my vision. A few seconds later, a very angry young girl was in the seat between us. She was partially burnt and could only be described as glaring at me. I felt like she was trying to tell me something, but I was in so much pain, I couldn't understand her. I woke up the next morning and kind of brushed it off. I've had dreams like this before. I ended up hearing later that day a 15-year-old girl was murdered in Vermont near an infamously haunted cemetery. She suffered a fatal blow to the head, then was set on fire, but she was only partially burned. Since then, I've had this dream two more times. I don't know if she was trying to reach out to me or what. I've had encounters in the past, but none quite this strong. I'm not really sure what to do. I fooled around with some voodoo not thinking that I was real. And two years later, something happened. For three nights I was visited by what I thought was a young girl in need of help. The first night wild hallucinations, regular faces turning into creatures, a guy hanging himself from a chandelier, sexually explicit acts, etc. The second night, motion picture of the girl's ordeal of parting with two men or who raped and beat her to death. No sound, but color, motion picture style. The third night she manifests with another little girl and points to the ceiling to reveal a slideshow of family photos. She never spoke except what I believe heard coming from my husband's snore. Mama, yes, my husband was in a deep sleep all three nights while I was talking aloud. I was so tired from being up for three nights that I began to hear voices in my head, and I realized that there was more than one presence in the house. We set up a video camera and went to the hotel. I was completely freaked out when I realized that in my dreams, the presence was still with me. Still, there was no sound, but each one introduced themselves. When the one girl told me I hate you, they allowed me to sleep maybe three hours that evening, with frequent interruptions of singing through the air vents at the motel. Go back to sleep. Sleep. Go back to sleep. They said they knew about the video camera and that I was going to get the investigators. When I returned home, I had my husband sleep on one side and my son on the other. Since I had been up for four days now with only three hours sleep, I was catching a cold and was having coughing fits. I was mocked. It was 12 a.m., and I told my son to drive me to my grandmother's house, and that I didn't know why, but I knew that if I stayed, something bad was going to happen to me. My husband said that just 20 minutes after we left, we had to get up to go see about a loud crash we heard in the kitchen. He said it turned out to be nothing, and he slept that night. During the 40-minute drive to my grandmother's house, I felt like something was in the back seat, and the whole way, I kept saying the Lord's Prayer. After the first 15 minutes, the feeling was gone. My grandmother is a Southern Baptist. Nothing bothered me there, but I was a mess, and my whole family rallied to get me help. I went to three doctors who all found nothing physically wrong with me. I ended up with sleeping pills. After a week, my grandmother said that I needed to go home. A Catholic priest blessed our house, but I was still afraid and always felt a presence. My father and his wife visited a week after that and stayed in our room. She is Catholic, and she also heard a person walk down the hallway and stand at the bedroom door several times that evening, but she said her rosary and it stopped. Around 1 a.m. that same evening downstairs when my husband, my son, and I slept, my son and I both had dreams. In my son's dream, a dark shadow was walking down our stairs, carrying a wine bottle. 
In my dream, someone unearthed the voodoo doll that I buried two years ago by the pond I have in my backyard. That day, my father and his wife were putting a puzzle together in our living room, so I decided to go on the computer to check email. I began to answer someone on the message board at some paranormal site, and there was a loud thump on the wall behind the computer, and then a forest. I was resting my leg up on the table, and it was as if something was pushing the whole table against my leg. I checked with everyone in the house, and everyone thought somebody dropped something heavy or something. I went out to the deck later to smoke, and my dog was sniffing the chair directly across from me, and then cowered away. That was the week of April 8th. Since then, I pray, I pray, and I pray. I keep a white candle burning the whole time I am at home, and I have crosses in every room. I don't stay home unless she is here. I don't work, so I just drive around. Basically, I have no life, and our house is now up for sale. I've done everything the paranormal website said. Brooms, hazelnuts, dirt to cemetery, everything. Things are getting better, but I know it is still there. There are still rapings here and there. My computer acts up, the dog acts funny, and just last night, I had more sex dreams. What am I dealing with? How do I undo what I have done? Do they want me, or have I just opened up a portal here at the house? Will moving help? Please help me. My husband and son do not get it, and this subject sometimes causes arguments. My husband, who supposedly loves me, sometimes gets cruel with me by teasing me about the boogeyman. This hurts me because he just does not get it. I guess nobody does, but that dark side is frightening. I don't want any part of it, and I never want to go there. I just want my life back. My mother says I need to do whatever is best for me, even if it means leaving my family and moving out on my own. That seems to be my only alternative now. I am in touch with my Irish heritage, and I recently found out just how in touch I really was. I started having these dreams every night for a week straight about a banshee. I thought someone in my family was going to die. I was very worried. I called around desperately trying to find out who was very sick, but I couldn't find anyone in my family who appeared to be sick or very old. I told my husband and my mother about my dreams, who know that I have premonitions in my dreams anyway, but never dreams about death. Two nights before my dreams ended, my neighbor, who is Irish as well, came to my home and told me her husband is in the hospital. He had a heart attack that day. She was getting some clothes and stopped by so we could pray for him. That's when the dreams and the reality started to clash together. I didn't want to let her know what I already knew, so I hugged her and told her I would pray for him. The night my dream stopped, my neighbor's husband passed away. I've had more dreams about death since. I wasn't surprised when I heard of instances of huge tragedies in the past on the news, because I predicted those as well. But I don't think there's anything I can do if I try to even prevent it. Is that even possible? I'm dumbstruck on how to work on my sixth sense, and I won't be able to do something to help rather than just know. My father passed away on September 23rd, 1998. I was not particularly close to him as he tended to push everyone away. I loved him dearly, though. He was dying slowly of emphysema, and my siblings and I had been called to the hospital several times to say goodbye to him, only to find that he was fine the next day. So when my brother called me one morning to say he passed away, it was a shock. I had asked Dad for a favor one day, kind of in jest, but partly seriously too. I asked him to let me know somehow if he could, if he was still around after he died. He promised he would. Two things happened after he died. The evening of his funeral, my family and I saw the most beautiful exhibition of the Northern Lights ever seen in Wisconsin. We stared at the beautiful sight for quite a long time, and I thought I saw a pattern of an angel in it. I didn't say anything because I thought I was the only one who saw this, but then one of the neighbors spoke up that she saw the angel pattern too. Then everyone else was pointing out the angel pattern. The display of lights went on for hours, and my daughters laid on the grass that night watching it. I suspected it was Dad, telling me he was still there. Then, 
About a year after he died, I began having dreams where I would see Dad, just grinning at me off in the parameters of the dream. I had this happen for about a month. Then one night, he appeared in a dream and was sitting right in front of me, smiling like he always did. His mouth was moving, but no words were coming out, that I could hear at least. I began crying in my dream and woke up crying and knowing without a doubt that my dad had come to visit me. He left messages that were special to me, my mother, and several of my brothers which had promptly passed on. These messages gave my family comfort and peace. I have not dreamed about Dad since that time. I truly believe that he came to let me know he is still with us because I asked him to. Thank you, Dad. The encounter that I had was not only involving myself, but at the time, five-year-old cousin. My family has always been very close. Many things float throughout our family that involve spirituality. For instance, my mother, her aunt, her grandmother, and myself all share the ability to have dreams and thoughts that come true. I have encountered feelings or senses so overwhelming that I have had to go to bed and stay there for fear of something happening, which it usually does. Sometimes this can be a very painful gift. Until this incident, I thought it was just that our family was so close that we'd sort of developed a sixth sense about each other, or we were tuned in with the more spiritual side of our world. I'd always thought it was passed on to the second child of each generation until my then five-year-old cousin encountered her first contact. My uncle had just bought a new house and was well on his way to accomplishing the American dream. He had a loving wife, a five-year-old daughter who was very smart, and had a job that he enjoyed, and now their first house. But after a while, things did not seem so perfect. The electricity seemed to be bad, and fuses would blow quite often. The sewer began backing up, and a cool draft made for a very noisy house. My uncle worked and worked until everything seemed to be fixed, and that is where the story really begins. My cousin sleeps with her mother and for some reason wasn't used to her new bed, so she slept with her mother. In her mother's bedroom, there are two other doors. One leads to a very large walk-in closet, the other to a small bedroom that has a stand-up shower, among other bathroom fixtures. For some reason, the bathroom always stayed real cool, no matter how high the heat was. My aunt always slept with the door open to the bathroom in case my cousin needed to use it or just for a little light to shine in the bedroom so Emily could sleep better. One night Emily woke her mom. She was standing up in the bed, shaking, and as white as a ghost, with a horrified look on her face just staring at the bathroom. My aunt tried to get her attention, but Emily just kept on staring. Finally, my aunt got out of the bed and turned the light on, at which time Emily finally responded by asking, Did you see her? Her mother asked who, and Emily went into great detail describing a young girl in a red coat. She explained that it looked like a soft coat and that the girl had long, shiny hair. The description was very detailed, like she knew her, and things that a normal five-year-old wouldn't notice. My aunt, a little freaked out, dismissed the occurrence to her as a dream, but took it very seriously. As my aunt drifted back to sleep, She had noticed her clock had been reset, and it stopped around 1 o'clock. The next couple of nights, the same thing happened, and they kept happening until my aunt finally closed the bathroom off, so it was not used anymore. But things didn't stop there. During the summer, I became a live-in nanny for my uncle. I watched my cousin late at night while they worked and slept in a spare bedroom. One night, I was awakened by the presence of three beings standing beside my bed. They weren't mean, but nevertheless, I was scared. The next morning, I woke up and felt extremely good and well-rested. Later, during the summer, I was awakened up again by another presence in the room, but this time was not a very friendly vibe I received. That spirit was overtaken by an older spirit that had entered the room and turned the recliner across from my bed into an old-fashioned rocking chair. This older spirit began rocking and humming. At this point, I felt very safe and fell back to sleep. Since then, my cousin has slept with her mom, and I have moved in with them. The lights flicker and the electricity in my room does not work at all regardless of what we do to it, but nothing major has happened in a long time. I am just thinking that now the spirits know we are part of the house, 
but we still don't use the back bathroom. I was sleeping in my bed and was having a mild bad dream. The content of the dream, though, I can recall perfectly, doesn't really matter. It was a rather silly and incoherent dream, and though the end was nightmarish, it wasn't exactly horror story material. Somehow during the dream, I knew it was a dream. I'm no stranger to bad dreams, and very often, I would try to struggle my way out of them. So I struggled to wake up from it. Suddenly, my vision shifted, and I could see the corner of my room, so I knew I was being awake. But that's not all I saw. I also saw a faint profile of an elderly Caucasian man, I'm of Chinese descent, probably wearing glasses, standing next to my bed with an apprehensive look to his face. He appears to be clothed in white. The vision was very faint, and I could not really make out the exact features of his face, but I'm rather sure I do not know this man personally and have never even met him before. I immediately thought he was a spirit, and though I could not move at all at the time, I struggled yet harder to wake up. As I regained control of my body and my vision became less blurred, I also saw an expression of awe on his face. As he vanished, I could literally feel the vibrations of an external force, possibly the very same which paralyzed my body, crumbling down. Shaken by just what happened, and unsure about the nature of his intentions, I calmly and slowly said, I don't know who you are, I don't care who you are, I don't have anything to do with you, so please leave. I've had many experiences of being paralyzed during sleep, and though I sometimes suspect it's spirit-related, this is by far the most explicit case and the closest thing to an encounter I've had. I'm Buddhist, and as such, I do believe in spirits, and yet I can also honestly say that I do not fear them. I'm just perplexed by his intentions. On one side, I fear that he was trying to prey on me during my most vulnerable time. Chinese people believe that, during one's depression or nightmares, he or she is most vulnerable to ghosts and spirits. And yet, on the other hand, because of his seemingly benevolent appearance, curiously, his appearance reminds me of a Catholic priest. I also suspect he was trying to rescue me from my nightmare. I live in a newly built townhouse in the suburbs that has no previous owner. And as far as I know, the land on which it is built had never been home to another residence. As the days go by, I'm becoming more and more inclined to brush off the incident as simply my own hallucination, but the image of this creature, the look on his barely visible face, is still very real to me. On October 2nd, 2004, I gave birth to my daughter who passed away 18 minutes after she was born. The whole time while she was alive, I kept saying to her, come on baby, breathe for mama, cry, do something for mama. But unfortunately, she didn't because of her condition. That night in the hospital, I was having a hard time sleeping. When I finally dozed off, I saw an image in my dreams of my grandfather who had passed when I was six, both of my great-grandmothers who had passed a few years back, and both my great-grandfathers who passed away before I was born. All I had seen of them were pictures. They were holding Peyton, my daughter, smiling and waving, letting me know she was in good hands. That's not even the weird part. When I finally got back home in Wyoming, I was in my apartment in my bed sleeping. My boyfriend at the time and I got a two-bedroom apartment and fixed her room up just for her. That night I was sleeping and awoke to my baby crying in the other room. I ran to her room and had forgotten that she had passed away. I broke down crying and held on to her teddy bear that I had bought for her. As I was crying, I felt the tiniest little lips kiss my cheek. It was so cold. I knew that it was her telling me that if she could, she would have cried for me at the hospital. Every once in a while, I'll have dreams of her, letting me know that she is still okay. I've heard a lot of ghost spirit encounters by my friends, but I was not completely convinced. But then I had my encounter. It happened to me in my room as I was sleeping. Around 2 to 3 a.m., I suddenly felt my arms go numb, and I felt like something was pulling from the top of me. I was lying on my back. I opened my eyes and saw a figure with long hair and white clothing, but without a face. Within a second, the figure disappeared in front of my eyes. 
I was shocked for a few minutes. At first it felt like I was dreaming, but it was so real. I couldn't sleep after that, and I started to say the Lord's Prayer for about 15 minutes, and I finally dozed off. I never told anyone about this experience except one of my friends. This friend of mine has the ability to see spirits, and he communicates with them all over the time. He said he was sure that what I saw wasn't a dream, as he felt like he was dreaming too every time he encountered such situations. I really couldn't understand this, as I have an altar and crosses around the house. I welcome feedback. This happened about 15 years ago, and is something that has puzzled both myself and my two friends who witnessed what we saw to this day. It was on my 10th or 11th birthday, and it was late August. I live in a normal suburban development just outside of Buffalo, New York. Before I tell the story, please, if anyone reading this has any idea of what it was we saw, please reach out, because I have no clue to this day what or whom we saw. Like I said, it was either my 10th or 11th birthday. It was late at night, and the summer was just about over. My two friends and I were out on my driveway playing around, while our parents hung out inside. Adjacent to my house is another house that has a small creek, with a guardrail bridge that essentially almost faces my house. While we were playing, all three of us stopped, as we heard and saw a woman making loud frustrated sounds and almost stopping our feet, walking across the street from the creek or bridge. She had red curly hair, and was dressed not of this time at all. She wore a robe that looked to be black, with a rope around it, and from what I can remember, her outfit seemed plaid, but again, unlike anything I had seen anyone wearing, even in the late 90s when dressing gothic was at an all-time high. This kind of freaked us out, so we ran into my garage. Not even 10 seconds later, mind you, we decided that she was just a girl and it was nothing to be afraid of, so we mustered up some courage grabbed a hockey stick and came back outside. When I say back outside, we stayed in the corner of my garage and peered out to where she was stomping around across the street. She was gone, and a late fog had suddenly arrived, mainly around where we last saw her and the bridge across the street. Then all three of the pits of our stomachs dropped, and we knew without seeing her exactly where she was. When we did look, she was now fully cloaked standing on the bridge, staring down into the water. Then one of us whispered something to the other, and I swear she had to have heard it, because as we spoke, she looked up slowly and turned looking right at us and into us. We couldn't see her anymore. It was just a cloak shadowy figure at this point. Needless to say, this felt like a horror movie, and we ran as fast as we could into my house, closing the garage door and telling our parents who, naturally, didn't believe us. Since that day, a lot of weird things have happened, and honestly, the three of us have never been the same. If anyone knows anything of what that might have been, please reach out. I've avoided knowing for a long time, and I just can't avoid it any longer. Any help would be appreciated. This happened over the summer a few years back, when my brother invited my cousin and me to join him and his girlfriend to join them for a week-long vacation around Texas. We didn't go to Travel Channel destination sites, mind you. It was just a trip head to Six Flags over Texas, and then off to Austin and San Antonio. Honestly, the overall trip was so much fun, but the first night would be the one that changed my perspective of hotel rooms forever. We left on a Wednesday morning at around 6am. We planned to head to Dallas and sightsee for a little bit before making our way to Arlington and checking into our hotel. I'm from South Texas, so the drive is about a good 8 hours or so. Also, Texans measure the distance from city to city by how long it takes to get there than actually noting the miles between them. Anyway, everything went well day one and we had a lot of fun in Dallas. We headed to the hotel around 5pm and once we got there we checked in and unpacked our bags. Honestly, nothing felt weird about the room and my cousin and I were pretty comfortable. Sometimes people will tell you that you can feel a presence, and usually it's when the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. After we unpacked, we hung out in our room for about an hour before heading back down to the lobby to grab dinner. We got back to the hotel a few hours later, absolutely stuffed. Our room was on the third floor, so we made our way up and set a plan on what to do at the amusement park. 
So around 11 p.m., I decided it was time to shower before heading to bed and did so. My cousin was already passed out, but I stayed up watching Knocked Up on TV. After my shower, I jumped in bed, fairly content with the progression of the day and looking forward to the following morning. Except, something else had other plans in mind. As I lay in bed, my body was closer to the window in the room and my head on one half of the pillow. My eyes were closed and I was trying to lose myself in thought so I could fall asleep. A few minutes into that, I felt a tapping on the other half of the pillow. I thought it was my cousin at first, but then I realized my cousin was still snoring. I panicked but didn't move. I felt and heard the taps on the pillow again, and this time I was in full on this can't be happening again mode. I mustered some courage and pulled the blanket over me so I can begin to process what was going on. As I laid there waiting, I started hearing footsteps walking at the foot of our beds. Then the ceiling fan turned on and started rotating. I was terrified at this point. I thought I started feeling the bed itself starting to shake, but after calming myself down, I realized it was me. I was trembling in fear. I slowed my breathing down and recomposed myself and continued to listen. My cousin was still snoring. The footsteps continued pacing back and forth, and then I heard the restroom light and vent come on. Then the toilet flushed once. The light and vent turned off. They turned on again a few seconds later. The toilet flushed again. It continued like this for what felt like an eternity. Every part of me wanted to jump out of bed and leave the room, but I didn't. I don't know why I stayed, but I just did, eventually falling asleep. I was woken up in the morning, and I was extremely tired. I don't know how long I was up that night, but I know it was for several hours. As soon as I woke up, it was the first thing I wanted to get off my chest. I recounted the story to my cousin, my brother and his girlfriend, and they didn't know what to say. My cousin didn't hear a thing and slept through it all. My brother and his girlfriend had no problems on their end either. To this day, I hate staying in hotel rooms, but I do it anyway. Only difference is now I go in, say a prayer, and ask any visitors to vacate for the night. So far, so good, but definitely one of those things I'll always remember. It was Thanksgiving, as I rode home from my sister's house in San Fernando Valley. The streets at night in Los Angeles are normally pretty barren, but since it was a holiday weekend, I felt like I was pedaling through a ghost town. I was 22 at the time and sharing a one-bedroom apartment in Van Nice. My roommate was out of town, so I was preparing myself for a quiet night. No crazy girlfriends nor any of my alcoholic friends would be banging on my door tonight, so as I made my way down the boulevard, a smile of relief spread across my face. When I finally reached my building, though, this was far from peaceful as the night progressed. There was an older lady standing outside my building. She was alone and dressed in a fur coat with a matching hat. She looked out of place. I don't know if it was her apparel or how she was just standing there staring off into space, but something was off. There was also a large stack of books and boxes with her, as if she was moving or something. And when I passed her on my mountain bike, Goosebumps shot up my arms and back. There was a liquor store next to my apartment complex, so I figured a beer was in order. It must have took me less than a minute to make my purchase, and when I came back outside, she was gone. Weird, I mumbled to myself, so I shrugged it off and made my way to my humble abode. As soon as I entered my apartment, though, red flags shot up. It was strangely chilly in my place. It was almost winter, but this apartment never had gotten cold before. It had always remained an even 70 degrees all year round, but on this night, it felt like it was in the low 40s. The cold was coming from a corner of the living room, and as I walked by it, baffled, something grabbed me. It squeezed the lower side of my back. I swung around with my fists up, but the only thing there was the cold. So, I just sat down and opened my beer. What to do, right? A few minutes had passed and the cold remained. It felt like I was having a stare down with something I couldn't see. So out of nowhere, I blurted out, get out of my house. And sure enough, that's all it took. The temperature began to rise to its normal 70. And after that, 
I never had any other visitors from the land of the dead. Crazy girlfriends and drunk friends excluded, of course. The house was on Kenton Street, and my family had lived there since I was two years old. The white elephant still stands, and has gone through many changes since my father lost a house sometime in the 1980s. There are some very interesting stories that center around that house. The earliest one, my first encounter with a spirit, took place when I was five and my sister was three. My mother and father were divorced. A judge declared my father unfit to raise my sister and I, so our father received custody. All three of us slept mainly downstairs in the living room on the two couches. Our bed was against the side window. That night, my sister and I just received a little spanking because we were not going to sleep. My sister cried herself to sleep, and I was awake and staring out the window. If you looked out that window, you would see a line of bushes, broken only by a very large maple tree. The bushes had been planted many years ago as the property line. As I stared out the window that night, the maple tree and the bushes seemed to fade away, and there stood a young girl with an updo and a red dress with white spots. She was gesturing with her hands, and she seemed to be trying to tell me something. I could not hear her, and finally, she faded away, and the tree and the bushes reappeared. I eventually fell asleep. The next morning, I told my father about what I had seen. He never laughed at me. He listened to my story, and at some point, he did some investigation into the past. He even told me what he had found out. The following was told to me by him, and the two of us were in our right minds. Though it may sound like an urban legend, it's not. My father had bought the house from a Springfield police officer, whose last name I believe was Miller. Officer Miller had purchased the house from a German couple. The German couple had no longer wanted to live in the house because of the death of their only child, a daughter. My father had stated that the girl had been out late at night with her boyfriend, that the vehicle they were in broke down on the railroad tracks and a train had made impact. She was wearing a white dress that had been covered with her blood. Even after all these years, I never checked that story in the microfilm of the Springfield News and Sun at the Warder Public Library, but for many years after that visit in 1966, I'd seen and heard many things in that house. I think the German lass had made her presence known with laughter from upstairs, whistling, humming, singing, and whispering. The first time I even realized that the old auditorium of our school was haunted was during a fall play near the beginning of November. Before I can account to you the details of these encounters, I must explain a few things. I can see auras. An aura is kind of a light that forms around anything living, once living, or in contact with something living. In the case of something living, it contains an array of colors that correspond with the emotions one is feeling. In the case of unliving things, like objects or spirits, it is a faint white glow, and in the case of bad things, it is a strong blackness that can even be seen in the dark. My eyes are now trained to see auras, only when I want to, so during the play, I looked out to the set with no distracting colors. Seated to my right was my mate, A. I shall call him as I do not want to post real names. T was to my left, and P was sitting in front and one seat over from me. I was decidedly enjoying Dracula's Widow when a scene came where a small mirror hanging on the set wall was knocked down in accordance to the play's script. I could feel a sudden tension about me. Then A said to me in a low voice, I want you to look around the room and tell me if you see the aura of someone other than our classmates. At his implications, I looked around, focusing my eyes on the level that auras appear on. First, looking to the right of our group, I saw a slender aura of a spirit in the second top top row of seats. Five rows below that, I saw a larger one. By now, P had seen what I was doing and informed me that he had also felt a disturbance. P was an empath. I then looked to my left, and to my horror, saw the darkest aura I have never encountered sitting right next to T. Then it moved and was gone. My eyes could still see a wave in the air where it was. It was keeping me from seeing it. For some reason, this frightened me even more. The play had only a few more moments to go, and I whispered to my three companions of what I had seen. 
Abe protectively moved closer to me, not only because I was his mate, but also because I was the only girl in our group, so I was considered by the men more vulnerable. So we waited out the play to the end. After it was done, we hurriedly rose from our seats and walked to the exit. Turning back, I saw the black aura again. It was following us. I told my friends and we quickened our pace, hoping that the spirit would be gone as soon as we left the school. As we entered the courtyard, I turned back. It was right behind us. We ran the rest of the way to A's car and he drove each of us home. All the way home, I felt a disturbing cold enshrouding me and an unusual prickling down my body. A few weeks later, ATM, another friend of mine who was the head of a paranormal investigations team, and I went back into the auditorium. It was dark and deserted. M had brought a digital camera and a specially designed audio voice recorder. I opened my eyes and scanned the room. The same two white auras that were in there during the play were still there. At first I could not see as to what we referred to as the other. M took pictures of where I said the spirits were and showed all of us the odd white circles on the screen. Those circles would be the heads as that was the strongest part of the aura. I was not worried until M started doing something that no one should do. He started taunting the spirits. Then I saw it. The other was sitting in a seat right in front of us. I tried to warn M, but he demanded a reaction from the spirit that he could see. I saw the horrible dark aura rise and draw near. Then I looked at M as he fell back onto the floor hard. T helped him up and I looked up to see the other still progressing towards us. We hurried from the auditorium. We have not been in there because the principal keeps it locked during school hours because someone told him we were in there. But M is working on getting us back in with more equipment. It makes me frown that there is such a horrible thing right in my high school. Our family, from my mother on down, has always had a sensitivity for the paranormal. Now it was my son's turn a confirmed non-believer. He had taken a temporary job a few buildings down from the Essex stream train. It was his duty to work alone in the basement, sorting box files and setting them up systematically in filing cabinets. It was going to be a long haul. The first day, however, he noticed a ball of white light hovering in midair. Skeptic that he was, he called his dad, the scientist. They discussed all possible things that could cause such a phenomenon. Light from a window or a reflection, but nothing explained it. It seemed to have a life of its own. Next thing was to ask mom, Wow, you've got yourself an orb, which is the first stage in the manifestation of a spirit, I said. He was less than impressed and shrugged it off. The orb continued to show up daily for about a week at different times, on and off, when he least expected it in different parts of the room. Then one day, it didn't appear. Instead of black, shadowy figure came out of the wall in front of him and hovered in space. This sent him flying up the stairs to the receptionist. What's with you? You look like you've seen a ghost, she said. As he caught his breath, he replied, No, don't mind me. I was just wondering how old this house is. Oh, it dates back to the early 1900s, she answered. Has anything strange ever happened around here? He pressed on. Why? Did you see or hear anything strange in the basement? She inquired. Maybe, he nervously replied. She went on to tell how according to historical records in town, back when the house was new, a couple owned the home. Somehow or another, the man ended up either falling or being pushed down the stairs, resulting in his death. It's been reputed as being haunted ever since. We constantly have doors mysteriously opening and closing, things being moved, and our office's machines turn on and off on their own. And as far as the basement is concerned, no one likes it down there. We've had so much trouble keeping temps. I hope we're not going to lose you too, she told him. No, he replied. I don't believe in that stuff. He then went back downstairs, still a little bit unnerved by the whole experience. He called me to keep his mind off of his new friend. I said, way cool, a shadowy apparition, You've got yourself a ghost. He was less than thrilled. This thing kept coming back and was making him very nervous. I told him, as long as you plan to stay with the job, 
You might as well get used to it and remember ghosts used to be people. Talk to him. He might not be able to talk back, but I'm sure he'll appreciate the company. Soon Bryant stopped complaining about it. I wasn't sure if the ghost was gone or if he had grown accustomed to him. By chance, I landed a temp position across the street. I walked over to meet him and they directed me downstairs. The office was extremely hot that day, but you could feel the temperature drop as soon as you hit the stairs. When I got to the bottom, Brian took one look at me and blew his top. What are you doing down here? I'm here to go to lunch with you. But I admit, I was curious about my impressions of the basement, which indeed, I could feel a strong presence. With that, Bryant chided me saying, you're just trying to exploit him. Maybe those two are getting too friendly. A few days later, he called me excitedly. Mom, I just walked to the back of the building to get some boxes. I turned around and saw someone come down the stairs, then began walking towards me. It was an older man. I didn't recognize him. He was dressed sort of strange. He then stopped, turned, and disappeared into the wall. When I heard this, I admit I was outright jealous. Wow, a full body apparition. Now that's rare. Your ghost must really like you. When he told his father about it, it made a believer even out of him. So it looks like my mother's and my genes for sensitivity for the paranormal have been passed down to yet another generation. Atheist and believer in ghosts. I just don't get it. And it's a happy March, everybody. Welcome to almost spring. I can see the warm weather settling in almost. And hopefully, if you're in a place that snows a lot, you can get a lot less snow. And you can look forward to the great outdoors. You know, it's been a long winter. And if we don't have um, a sunny day to appreciate life, then, you know, we got to go through, you know, the dreary winter days, I guess. Anyway, guys, if you could please leave a like, share, and subscribe. That way you can help this channel out. We can get the 35,000 subscribers. The goal for this year is 40,000 subscribers. So if you guys can hit that subscribe button, like it, share the video all across social media, it really helps no matter who you are. It really does. Um, you can be, you know, Mr. Nobody or Mrs. Nobody. I'm Mr. Nobody, too. So, you know, it doesn't really matter who you are. But everybody on my channel, if you watch my channel, you're somebody. You matter to me, and that's why it's big effort. So, guys, I love you so much, and I will see you in the next video. The key word, if you got to the end of this video, is hat. H-A-T. I mean, you guys know how to spell, but you guys know what I mean. Whoopsie-daisy. Gotta go. Love you guys.